preface of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Latham. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Preface. The Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge provides basic knowledge that is essential for pilots. This handbook introduces pilots to the broad spectrum of knowledge that will be needed as they progress in their pilot training. Except for the Code of Federal Regulations pertinent to civil aviation, most of the knowledge areas applicable to pilot certification are presented. This handbook is useful to beginning pilots as well as those pursuing more advanced pilot certificates. Occasionally the word must or similar language is used where the desired action is deemed critical. The use of such language is not intended to add to, interpret, or relieve a duty imposed by Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR. It is essential for persons using this handbook to become familiar with and apply the pertinent parts of 14 CFR and the Aeronautical Information Manual, AIM. The AIM is available online at www.faa.gov. The current Flight Standards Service Airman Training and Testing Material and Learning Statements for all Airman Certificates and Ratings can be obtained from www.faa.gov. This handbook supersedes FAA-H-8083-25, Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, dated 2003. This handbook is available for download in PDF format from www. FAA.gov. This handbook is published by the United States Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation Administration, Airman Testing Standards Branch, AFS-630, P.O. Box 25082, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73125. Comments regarding this publication should be sent in email form to the following address, AFS-630- Comments at FAA.gov. End of preface. Recording by Dale Latham. Part 1 of Chapter 1 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Latham. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Introduction to Flying Introduction The Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge provides basic knowledge for the student pilot learning to fly, as well as pilots seeking advanced pilot certification. For detailed information on a variety of specialized flight topics, see specific Federal Aviation Administration, FAA handbooks, and advisory circulars, ACs. This chapter offers a brief history of flight, introduces the history and role of the FAA in civil aviation, FAA regulations and standards, government references and publications, eligibility for pilot certificates, available routes to flight instruction, the role of the Certificated Flight Instructor, CFI, and Designated Pilot Examiner, DPE, in flight training, and practical test standards, PTS. History of Flight From Prehistoric Times Humans have watched the flight of birds, longed to imitate them, but lacked the power to do so. Logic dictated that if the small muscles of a bird can lift them into the air and sustain them, then the larger muscles of humans should be able to duplicate the feat. No one knew about the intricate mesh of muscles, sinew, heart, breathing system, and devices not unlike wing flaps, variable camber and spoilers of the modern plane, that enable a bird to fly, still Thousands of years and countless lives were lost in attempts to fly like birds. The identity of the first bird men who fitted themselves with wings and leapt off the cliff in an effort to fly are lost in time. But each failure gave those who wished to fly questions that needed answering. Where had all the wing flappers gone? Philosophers, scientists, and inventors offered solutions. But no one could add wings to the human body and soar like a bird. 
During the 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci filled pages of his notebooks with sketches of proposed flying machines, but most of his ideas were flawed because he clung to the idea of bird-like wings. See figure 1-1. By 1655, mathematician, physicist, and inventor Robert Hooke concluded the human body does not possess the strength to power artificial wings. He believed human flight would require some form of artificial propulsion. The quest for human flight led some practitioners in another direction. In 1783, the first manned hot air balloon, crafted by Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier, flew for 23 minutes. Ten days later, Professor Jacques Charles flew the first gas balloon. A madness for balloon flight captivated the public's imagination, and for a time, flying enthusiasts turned their expertise to the promise of lighter-than-air flight. But for all its majesty in the air, the balloon was little more than a billowing heap of cloth, capable of no more than a one-way, downwind journey. Balloons solved the problem of lift, but that was only one of the problems of human flight. The ability to control speed and direction eluded balloonists. The solution to that problem lay in a child's toy, familiar to the East for 2,000 years, but not introduced to the West until the 13th century. The kite, used by the Chinese, manned for aerial observation and to test winds for sailing, and unmanned as a signaling device and as a toy, held many of the answers to lifting a heavier-than-air device into the air. One of the men who believed the study of kites unlocked the secrets of winged flight was Sir George Cayley. Born in England ten years before the Montgolfier balloon flight, Cayley spent his 84 years seeking to develop a heavier-than-air vehicle supported by kite-shaped wings. See figure 1-2. The father of aerial navigation, Cayley discovered the basic principles on which the modern science of aeronautics is founded built what is recognized as the first successful flying model and tested the first full-sized man-carrying airplane. For the half-century after Cayley's death, countless scientists, flying enthusiasts, and inventors worked toward building a powered flying machine. Men such as William Samuel Henson, who designed a huge model plane that was propelled by a steam engine housed inside the fuselage, and Otto Lilienthal, who proved human flight in aircraft heavier than air was practical, worked toward the dream of powered flight. A dream turned into reality by Wilbur and Orville Wright at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on December 17, 1903. The bicycle-building Wright brothers of Dayton, Ohio, had experimented for four years with kites, their own homemade wind tunnel, and different engines to power their biplane. One of their great achievements was proving the value of the scientific rather than the build-it-and-see approach to flight. Their biplane, the Flyer, combined inspired design and engineering with superior craftsmanship. See figure 1-3. By the afternoon of December 17th, the Wright brothers had flown a total of 98 seconds on four flights. The age of flight had arrived. History of the Federal Aviation Administration FAA. During the early years of man flight, aviation was a free-for-all because no government body was in place to establish policies or regulate and enforce safety standards. Individuals were free to conduct flights and operate aircraft with no government oversight. Most of the early flights were conducted for sport. Aviation was expensive and became the playground of the wealthy. Since these early airplanes were small, many people doubted their commercial value. One group of individuals believed otherwise, and they became the genesis for modern airline travel. P.E. Fansler, a Florida businessman living in St. Petersburg, approached Tom Benoist of the Benoist Aircraft Company in St. Louis, Missouri, about starting a flight route from St. Petersburg across the waterway to Tampa. Benoist suggested using his Safety First airboat, and the two men signed an agreement for which would become the first scheduled airline in the United States. The first aircraft was delivered to St. Petersburg and made the first test flight on December 31, 1913. See figure 1-4. A public auction decided who would win the honor of becoming the first paying airline customer. The former mayor of St. Petersburg, A.C. File, made the winning bid of $400, which secured his place in history as the first paying airline passenger. On January 1st, 1914, the first scheduled airline flight was conducted. The flight length was 21 miles and lasted 23 minutes due to a headwind. 
The return trip took 20 minutes. The line, which was subsidized by Florida businessmen, continued for four months and offered regular passage for $5 per person or $5 per 100 pounds of cargo. Shortly after opening the line, Benoist added a new airboat that afforded more protection from spray during takeoff and landing. The routes were also extended to Manatee, Bradenton, and Sarasota, giving further credence to the idea of a profitable commercial airline. The St. Petersburg-Tampa airboat line continued throughout the winter months with flights finally being suspended when the winter tourist industry began to dry up. The airline operated for only four months, but 1,205 passengers were carried without injury. This experiment proved commercial passenger airline travel was viable. The advent of World War I offered the airplane a chance to demonstrate its varied capabilities. It began the war as a reconnaissance platform, but by 1918, airplanes were being mass-produced to serve as fighters, bombers, trainers, as well as reconnaissance platforms. Aviation advocates continued to look for ways to use airplanes. Airmail service was a popular idea, but the war prevented the Postal Service from having access to airplanes. The War Department and Postal Service reached an agreement in 1918. The Army would use the mail service to train its pilots in cross-country flying. The first airmail flight was conducted on May 15, 1918, between New York and Washington, D.C. The flight was not considered spectacular. The pilot became lost and landed at the wrong airfield. In August of 1918, the United States Postal Service took control of the airmail routes and brought the existing Army airmail pilots and their planes into the program as postal employees. Transcontinental Airmail Route Airmail routes continued to expand until the Transcontinental Mail Route was inaugurated. See Figure 1-5 this route spanned from San Francisco to New York for a total distance of 2,612 miles with 13 intermediate stops along the way. See figure 1-6. On May 20, 1926, Congress passed the Air Commerce Act, which served as a cornerstone for aviation within the United States. This legislation was supported by leaders in the aviation industry who felt that the airplane could not reach its full potential without the assistance from the federal government in improving safety. The Air Commerce Act charged the Secretary of Commerce with fostering air commerce, issuing and enforcing air traffic rules, licensing pilots, certificating aircraft, establishing airways and operating and maintaining aids to air navigation. The Department of Commerce created a new aeronautics branch, whose primary mission was to provide oversight in the aviation industry. In addition, the aeronautics branch took over the construction and operation of the nation's system of lighted airways. The Postal Service, as part of the Transcontinental Airmail Route System, had initiated this system. The Department of Commerce made great advances in aviation communications as well as introducing radio beacons as an effective means of navigation. Built at intervals of approximately 10 miles, the standard beacon tower was 51 feet high, topped with a powerful rotating light. Below the rotating light, two course lights pointed forward and back along the airway. The course lights flashed a code to identify the beacon's number. The tower usually stood in the center of a concrete arrow 70 feet long. A generator shed, where required, stood at the feather end of the arrow. See figure 1-7. Federal Certification of Pilots and Mechanics The Aeronautics Branch of the Department of Commerce began pilot certification with the first license issued on April 6, 1927. The recipient was the Chief of the Aeronautics Branch, William P. McCracken, Jr. See Figure 1-8. Orville Wright, who was no longer an active flyer, had declined the honor. McCracken's license was the first issued to a pilot by a civilian agency of the federal government. Some three months later, the Aeronautics Branch issued the first federal aircraft mechanic license. Equally important for safety was the establishment of a system of certification for aircraft. On March 29, 1927, the Aeronautics Branch issued the first airworthiness type certificate to the Buell Airster CA-3, a three-place open biplane. In 1934, to recognize the tremendous strides made in the aviation and to display the enhanced status within the department, the Aeronautics Branch was renamed the Bureau of Air Commerce. See Figure 1-9.
Within this time frame, the Bureau of Air Commerce brought together a group of airlines and encouraged them to form the first three air traffic control, ATC, facilities along the established air routes. Then, in 1936, the Bureau of Air Commerce took over the responsibilities of operating the centers and continued to advance the ATC facilities. ATC has come a long way from the early controllers using maps, chalkboards, and performing mental math calculations in order to separate aircraft along flight routes. The Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938 In 1938, the Civil Aeronautics Act transferred the civil aviation responsibilities to a newly created independent body named the Civil Aeronautics Authority, CAA. This act empowered the CAA to regulate airfares and establish new routes for the airlines to service. President Franklin Roosevelt split the CAA into two agencies, the Civil Aeronautics Administration, CAA, and the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB. Both agencies were still a part of the Department of Commerce, but the CAB functioned independently of the Secretary of Commerce. The role of the CAA was to facilitate ATC, certification of airmen and aircraft, rule enforcement, and the development of new airways. The CAB was charged with rulemaking to enhance safety, accident investigation, and the economic regulations of airlines. Then, in 1946, Congress gave the CAA the responsibility of administering the Federal Aid Airport Program. This program was designed to promote the establishment of civil airports throughout the country. The Federal Aviation Act of 1958 By the mid-century, aircraft had increased and jet aircraft had been introduced into the civil aviation arena. A series of mid-air collisions underlined the need for more regulation of the aviation industry. Aircraft were not only increasing in numbers, but were now streaking across the skies at much higher speeds. The Federal Aviation Act of 1958 established a new independent body that assumes the roles of the CAA and transferred the rulemaking authority of the CAB to the newly created Federal Aviation Agency, FAA. In addition, the FAA was given complete control of the common civil military system of air navigation and ATC. The man who was given the honor of being the first administrator of the FAA was former Air Force General Elwood Richard Pete Quesada. He served as the administrator from 1959 to 1961. See figure 1-10. Department of Transportation, DOT. On October 15, 1966, Congress established the Department of Transportation, DOT, which was given oversight of the transportation industry within the United States. The result was a combination of both air and surface transportation. Its mission was and is to serve the United States by ensuring a fast, safe, efficient, accessible, and convenient transportation system meeting vital national interests and enhancing the quality of life of the American people, then, now, and into the future. At this same time, the Federal Aviation Agency was renamed to the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. The DOT began operation on April 1, 1967. The role of the CAB was assumed by the newly created National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, which was charged with the investigation of all transportation accidents within the United States. As aviation continued to grow, the FAA took on additional duties and responsibilities. With the hijacking epidemic of the 1960s, the FAA was responsible for increasing the security duties of aviation both on the ground and in the air. After September 11, 2001, the duties were transferred to the newly created body called the Department of Homeland Security, DHS. With numerous aircraft flying in and out of larger cities, the FAA began to concentrate on the environmental aspect of aviation by establishing and regulating the noise standards of aircraft. Additionally, in the 1960s and 1970s, the FAA began to regulate high altitude, over 500 feet, kite and balloon flying. 1970 brought more duties to the FAA by adding the management of the new Federal Airport Aid Program and increased responsibility for airport safety. Air Traffic Control, ATC, Automation by the mid-1970s, the FAA had achieved a semi-automated ATC system based on a marriage of radar and computer technology. 
By automating certain routine tasks, the system allowed controllers to concentrate more efficiently on the vital task of providing aircraft separation. Data appearing directly on the controller's scope provided the identity, altitude, and ground speed of aircraft carrying radar beacons. Despite its effectiveness, the system required enhancement to keep pace with the increased air traffic of the late 1970s. The increase was due, in part, to the competitive environment created by the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. This law phased out CAB's economic regulation of airlines, and CAB ceased to exist at the end of 1984. To meet the challenge of traffic growth, the FAA unveiled the National Airspace System, NAS, plan in January 1982. The new plan called for more advanced systems for en route and terminal ATC, modernized flight service stations, and improvements in ground-to-air surveillance and communication. The Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, strike. While preparing the NAS plan, the FAA faced a strike by key members of its workforce. An earlier period of discord between management and the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, culminated in a 1970 sick-out by 3,000 controllers. Although controllers subsequently gained additional wage and retirement benefits, another period of tension led to an illegal strike in August 1981. The government dismissed over 11,000 strike participants and decertified PATCO. By the spring of 1984, the FAA ended the last of the special restrictions imposed to keep the airspace system operating safely during the strike. The Airline Deregulation Act of 1978 until 1978, the CAB regulated many areas of the commercial aviation, such as fares, routes, and schedules. The Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, however, removed many of these controls, thus changing the face of civil aviation in the United States. After deregulation, unfettered free competition ushered in a new era in passenger air travel. The CAB had three main functions, to award routes to airlines, to limit the entry of air carriers into new markets, and to regulate fares for passengers. Much of the established practices of commercial passenger travel within the United States went back to the policies of Walter Folger Brown, the United States Postmaster General during the administration of President Herbert Hoover. Brown had changed the mail payment system to encourage the manufacture of passenger aircraft instead of mail-carrying aircraft. His influence was crucial in awarding contracts and helped create four major domestic airlines, United, American, Eastern, and Transcontinental and Western Air, TWA. Similarly, Brown had also helped give Pan American a monopoly on international routes. The push to deregulate, or at least to reform the existing laws governing passenger carriers, was accelerated by President Jimmy Carter, who appointed economist and former Professor Alfred Kahn a vocal supporter of deregulation, to head the CAB. A second force to deregulate emerged from abroad. In 1977, Freddie Laker, a British entrepreneur who owned Laker Airways, created the SkyTrain service, which offered extraordinarily cheap fares for transatlantic flights. Laker's offerings coincided with the boom in low-cost domestic flights as the CAB eased some limitations on charter flights i.e., flights offered by companies that do not actually own planes but lease them from the major airlines. The big air carriers responded by proposing their own lower fares. For example, American Airlines, the country's second-largest airline, obtained CAB approval for Super Saver tickets. All of these events proved to be favorable for large-scale deregulation. In November 1977, Congress formally deregulated air cargo. In late 1978, Congress passed the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978, legislation that had been principally authored by Senators Edward Kennedy and Howard Cannon. See figure 1-11. There was stiff opposition to the bill from the major airlines who feared free competition, from labor unions who feared non-union employees, and from safety advocates who feared that safety would be sacrificed. Public support was, however, strong enough to pass the act. The act appeased major airlines by offering generous subsidies and it pleased workers by offering high unemployment benefits if they lost their jobs as a result. The most important effect of the act, whose laws were slowly phased in, was on the passenger market. For the first time in 40 years, airlines could enter the market or, from 1981, expand their routes 
as they saw fit. Airlines from 1982 also had full freedom to set their fares. In 1984, the CAB was finally abolished since its primary duty of regulating the airline industry was no longer necessary. End Part 1 Chapter 1 Part 2 of Chapter 1 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Latham. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. The Role of the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. The Code of Federal Regulations, CFR. The FAA is empowered by regulations to promote aviation safety and establish safety standards in civil aviation. The FAA achieves these objectives under the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, which is the codification of the general and permanent rules published by the executive departments and agencies of the United States government. The regulations are divided into 50 different codes, called titles. These represent broad areas subject to federal regulation. The FAA regulations are listed under Title 14, Aeronautics and Space, which encompasses all aspects of civil aviation from how to earn a pilot certificate to maintenance of an aircraft. Title 14 CFR Chapter 1, Federal Aviation Administration, is broken down into subchapters A through N as illustrated in Figure 1-12. Figure 1-12, Overview of 14 CFR. Available online free from the FAA or for purchase through commercial sources. Figure 112 reads, Code of Federal Regulations, Aeronautics and Space. Chapter 1, Federal Aviation Administration. Subchapter A, Definitions, Definitions and Abbreviations. Subchapter B, Procedural Rules, Rulemaking Processes, Claims and Enforcement. Subchapter C, Aircraft. Aircraft Certification Procedures, 21, Airworthiness Standards, Parts 25 through 33, depending on the type of aircraft, Airworthiness Directives, 39, Maintenance, 43, Aircraft Registration, 47. Subchapter D, Airmen, Certification of Pilots and Instructors, 61, Medical Standards, 67. Subchapter E, Airspace. Designation of airspace classification, 71. Special use airspace, 73. Subchapter F. Air traffic and general rules. General operating and flight rules, 91. Special air traffic rules and airport traffic patterns, 93. Subchapter G. Air carriers, air travel clubs, and operators for compensation or hire. Certification and Operations. Subchapter H. Schools and Other Certified Agencies. Subchapter I. Airports. Subchapter J. Navigational Facilities. Subchapter K. Administrative Regulations. Subchapter L through M. Reserved. Subchapter N. War Risk Insurance. End of Figure 1-12. For the pilot, certain parts of 14 CFR are more relevant than others. During flight training, it is helpful for the pilot to become familiar with the parts and subparts that relate to flight training and pilot certification. For instance, 14 CFR Part 61 pertains to the certification of pilots, flight instructors, and ground instructors. It also defines the eligibility, aeronautical knowledge, flight proficiency, as well as training and testing requirements for each type of pilot certificate issued. 14 CFR Part 91 provides guidance in the areas of general flight rules, visual flight rules, VFR, and instrument flight rules, IFR, while 14 CFR Part 43 covers aircraft maintenance, preventative maintenance, rebuilding, and alterations. Primary Locations of the FAA The FAA headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and there are nine regional offices strategically located across the United States. The agency's two largest field facilities are the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center, MMAC, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and the William J. Hughes Technical Center, WJHTC, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Home to the FAA Training and Logistics Services, 
the MMAC provides a number of aviation safety-related and business support services. The WJHTC is the premier aviation research and development and test and evaluation facility in the country. The center's programs, including testing and evaluation in ATC, communication, navigation, airports, aircraft safety, and security. Furthermore, the WJHTC is active in long-range development of innovative aviation systems and concepts, development of new ATC equipment and software, and modification of existing systems and procedures. Field Offices Flight Standard Service Within the FAA, the Flight Standard Service promotes safe fares transportation by setting the standards for certification and oversight of airmen, air operators, air agencies, and designees. It also promotes safety of flight, of civil aircraft, and air commerce by accomplishing certification, inspection, surveillance, investigation, and enforcement, setting regulations and standards, managing the system of registration of civil aircraft in all airmen records. The focus of interaction between Flight Standard Service and the aviation community, general public, is the Flight Standards District Office, FSDO. Flight Standards District Office, FSDO. The FAA has approximately 130 FSDOs. See figure 1-13. These offices provide information and services for the aviation community. FSDO phone numbers are listed in the telephone directory under government offices, DOT, FAA. Another convenient method of finding a local office is to use the FSDO locator available at www.faa.gov forward slash about forward slash office underscore org forward slash headquarters underscore offices forward slash avs forward slash offices forward slash afs forward slash afs 600 in addition to accident investigation and enforcement of the aviation regulations, the FSDO is also responsible for certification and surveillance of air carriers, air operators, flight schools, training centers, and airmen including pilots and flight instructors. Each FSDO is staffed by Aviation Safety Inspectors, ASIs, who play a key role in making the nation's aviation system safe. Aviation Safety Inspector, ASI the Aviation Safety Inspectors, ASIs, administer and enforce safety regulations and standards for the production, operation, maintenance, and or modification of aircraft used in civil aviation. They also specialize in conducting inspections of various aspects of the aviation system, such as aircraft and parts manufacturing, aircraft operation, aircraft airworthiness, and cabin safety. ASIs must complete a training program at the FAA Academy in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which includes airman evaluation and pilot testing techniques and procedures. ASIs also receive extensive on-the-job training and recurrent training on a regular basis. The FAA has approximately 3,700 inspectors located in its FSDO offices. All questions concerning pilot certification and or request for other aviation information or services should be directed to your local FSDO. FAA Safety Team FAST Team the FAA is dedicated to improving the safety of the United States civilian aviation by conveying safety principles and practices through training, outreach, and education. The FAA safety team, FAST team, exemplifies this commitment. The FAST team has replaced the Aviation Safety Program, ASP, whose education of airmen on all types of safety subjects successfully reduced accidents. Its success led to its demise because the easy-to-fix accident causes have been addressed. To take aviation safety one step further, Flight Standard Service created the FAST team, which is devoted to reducing aircraft accidents by using a coordinated effort to focus resources on elusive accident causes. Each of the FAA's nine regions has a regional FAST team office, dedicated to this new safety program and managed by the regional FAST team manager, RFM. The FAST team is teaming up with individuals and the aviation industry to create a unified effort against accidents and tip the safety culture in the right direction. To learn more about this effort to improve aviation administration, to take a course at their online learning center, or to join the FAST team, visit their website at www.faasafety.gov forward slash 
default.aspx. Obtaining assistance from the FAA. Information can be obtained from the FAA by phone, internet, email, or mail. To talk to the FAA toll-free 24 hours a day, call 1-866-TELL-FAA. 1-866-835-5322. To visit the FAA's website, go to www.faa.gov. Individuals can also email an FAA representative at a local FSDO office by accessing the staff email address, available via the Contact FAA link at the bottom of the FAA homepage. Letters can be sent to Federal Aviation Administration, 800 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20591. FAA Reference Material The FAA provides a variety of important reference materials for the student, as well as the advanced civil aviation pilot. In addition to the regulations provided online by the FAA, several other publications are available to the user. Almost all reference material is available online at www.faa.gov in downloadable format. Commercial aviation publishers also provide published and online reference materials to further aid the aviation pilot. Aeronautical Information Manual, AIM The Aeronautical Information Manual, AIM, is the official guide to basic flight information and ATC procedures for the aviation community flying in the NAS of the United States. See Figure 1-14. An international version containing parallel information as well as specific information on international airports is also available. The AIM also contains information of interest to pilots, such as health and medical facts, flight safety, and pilot controller glossary of terms used in the system, and information on safety, accidents, and reporting of hazards. This manual is offered for sale on a subscription basis or is available online at http colon forward slash forward slash bookstore dot gpo dot gov. Order forms are provided at the beginning of the manual or online and should be sent to the Superintendent of Documents, United States Government Printing Office, GPO. The AIM is complemented by other operational publications, which are available via separate subscriptions or online. Handbooks. Handbooks are developed to provide specific information about a particular topic that enhances training or understanding. The FAA publishes a variety of handbooks that generally fall into three categories. Aircraft, Aviation, and Examiners and Inspectors. See Figure 1-15. 1-15 reads, A few samples of the handbooks are available to the public. Most are free of charge or can be downloaded from the FAA website. Aeronautical Information Manual. AIM. The Aeronautical Information Manual is designed to provide the aviation community with the basic flight information and ATC procedures for use in the NAS of the United States. It also contains the fundamentals required in order to fly in the United States NAS, including items of interest to pilots concerning health, medical facts, factors affecting flight safety, etc. Airplane Flying Handbook. The Airplane Flying Handbook is designed as a technical manual to introduce basic pilot skills and knowledge that are essential for piloting airplanes. It provides information on transition to other airplanes and the operation of various airplane systems. Aviation Instructor's Handbook The Aviation Instructor's Handbook provides the foundation for beginning instructors to understand and apply the fundamentals of instructing. This handbook also provides aviation instructors with the up-to-date information on learning and teaching how to relate this information to the task of conveying aeronautical knowledge and skills to students. Experienced aviation instructors also find the new and updated information useful for improving their effectiveness in training activities. Instrument Flying Handbook The Instrument Flying Handbook is designed for use by instrument flight instructors and pilots preparing for instrument rating tests. Instructors find this handbook a valuable training aid as it includes basic reference materials for knowledge testing and instrument flight training. Instrument Procedures Handbook The Instrument Procedures Handbook is designed as a technical reference for professional pilots who operate under IFR in the NAS and expands on information contained in the Instrument Flying Handbook. End Figure 115 These handbooks can be purchased from the Superintendent of Documents or downloaded 
www.faa.gov forward slash regulations underscore policies. Aviation handbooks are also published by various commercial aviation companies. Aircraft flight manuals, commonly called pilot operating handbooks, POH, are documents developed by the airplane manufacturer, approved by the FAA, and are specific to a particular make and model aircraft by serial number. This subject is covered in greater detail in Chapter 8, Flight Manuals and Other Documents, of this handbook. See Figure 1-16. Advisory Circulars, ACs. Advisory Circulars, ACs, provide a single, uniform, agency-wide system that the FAA uses to deliver advisory materials to FAA customers, industry, the aviation community, and the public. An AC may be needed to provide an acceptable, clear, understood method for complying with a regulation, standardize implementation of the regulation, or harmonize implementation of the international aviation community, resolve a general misunderstanding of the regulation, respond to a request from some government entity such as General Accounting Office, NTSB, or the Office of the Inspector General, help the industry and FAA effectively implement a regulation, explain requirements and limits of an FAA grant program, Expand on standards needed to promote aviation safety, including the safe operation of airports. There are three parts to an AC number, as in 25-42C. The first part of the number identifies the subject matter of the AC and corresponds to the appropriate 14 CFR part. For example, an AC on certification, pilots and flight and ground instructors is numbered as AC 61 through 65E. Since ACs are numbered sequentially within each subject matter, the second part of the number beginning with the dash identifies the sequence. The third part of the number is a letter assigned by the originating office and shows the revision sequence if the AC is revised. The first version of an AC does not have a revision letter. In the figure 1-17, this is the fifth revision as designated by the letter E. Flight Publications the FAA, in concert with other government agencies, orchestrates the publication and changes to publications that are key to safe flight. Figure 1-18 illustrates some of the publications a pilot uses. Pilot and Aeronautical Information Notices to Airmen No TAMs Time Critical Aeronautical Information which is of either a temporary nature or not sufficiently known in advance to permit publication or aeronautical charts or in other operational publications, receives immediate dissemination via the National Notice to Airmen, NOTAM, system. NOTAMs contain current notices to airmen, which are considered essential to the safety of flight as well as the supplemental data affecting other operational publications. NOTAM information is classified in two categories. NOTAM D or distant, and Flight Data Center, FDC, NOTAMs. NOTAM D information is disseminated for all navigational facilities that are a part of the NAS, all public use airports, seaplane bases, and heliports listed in the Airports Facility Directory, AFD. NOTAM D information now includes such data as taxiway closures, personnel and equipment near or crossing runways, and airport lighting aids that do not affect instrument approach criteria, such as Visual Approach Slope Indicator, VASI. FDC NOTAMs contain such things as amendments to the published instrument approach procedures, IAPs, and other current aeronautical charts. They are also used to advertise temporary flight restrictions caused by such things as natural disasters or large-scale public events that may generate a congestion of air traffic over a site. NOTAMs are available in printed form through a subscription from the Superintendent of Documents, from an FSS, or online at the pilot website, http colon forward slash forward slash pilotweb.nas.faa.gov forward slash distribution forward slash atcscc.html, which provides access to current NOTAM information. See figure 1-19. Safety Program Airman Notification System, SPANS. The FAA recently launched the Safety Program Airman Notification System, SPANS, 
an online event notification system that provides timely and easy-to-assess seminar and event information notification for airmen. The SPAN system is taking the place of the current paper-based mail system. This transition will provide better service to airmen while reducing costs for the FAA. Anyone can search the SPANS system and register for events. To read more about SPANS, visit www.fasafety.gov forward slash SPANS forward slash default dot ASPX. Aircraft Types and Categories Ultralight Vehicles An ultralight aircraft, see figure 1-20, is referred to as a vehicle because the FAA does not govern it if it is used or intended to be used by a single occupant, is used for recreational or sports purposes, does not have an airworthiness certificate, if unpowered, weighs less than 155 pounds, if powered, weighs less than 254 pounds empty weight, excluding floats and safety devices that are intended for the deployment in a potentially catastrophic situation, has a fuel capacity not exceeding 5 gallons, is not capable of more than 55 knots calibrated airspeed at full power in level flight, has a power off stall speed which does not exceed 24 knots calibrated airspeed. Ultralight vehicles do not require any form of pilot license or certification if they are flown within 14 CFR 103 operating rules, which generally limit the ultralight vehicle to uncontrolled airspace and no flight over populated areas. Every person flying an ultralight should be familiar with the rules specified in 14 CFR 103. Light Sport Aircraft, LSA Category In 2004, the FAA approved a new pilot certificate and aircraft category program to allow individuals to join the aviation community by reducing training requirements that affect the overall cost of learning to fly. The Sport Pilot Certificate was created for pilots flying lightweight, simple aircraft and offers limited privileges. The category of aircraft called Light Sport Aircraft, LSA, includes airplane, land and sea, gyroplane, airship, balloon, weight shift control, land and sea, glider, and powered parachute. See figure 1-21. In order for an aircraft to fall in the light sport category, it must meet the following criteria. The maximum gross takeoff weight may not exceed 1,320 pounds or 1,430 pounds for seaplanes. Lighter than air maximum gross weight may not be more than 660 pounds. The maximum stall speed may not exceed 45 knots, and the in-flight maximum speed in level flight with maximum continuous power is no greater than 120 knots. Seating is restricted to single or two-seat configuration only. The power plant may be only a single reciprocating engine, if powered, but may include rotary or diesel engines. The landing gear must be fixed, except gliders or those aircraft intended for operation on water. The aircraft can be manufactured and sold ready to fly under a new special LSA category, and certification must meet industry consensus standards. The aircraft may be used for sport, recreation, flight training, and aircraft rental. The aircraft will have an FAA registration in number and may be operated at night if the aircraft is properly equipped and the pilot holds at least a private pilot certificate with a minimum of a third-class medical. Pilot Certifications The type of intended flying will influence what type of pilot certificates is required. Eligibility, training, experience, and testing requirements differ depending on the type of certificate sought. See Figure 1-22 Sport Pilot To become a sport pilot, the student pilot is required to have the following hours depending upon the aircraft. Airplane, 20 hours. Powered parachute, 12 hours. Weight shift control, trikes, 20 hours. Glider, 10 hours. Rotocraft, gyroplane only, 20 hours. Lighter than air, 20 hours. Airship, or 7 hours. Balloon. To earn a sport pilot certificate, one must be at least 16 to become a student sport pilot, 14 for a glider. 
be at least 17 to test for a sport pilot certificate, 16 for gliders, be able to read, write, and understand English, hold a current and valid driver's license as evidence of medical eligibility. Recreational Pilot To become a recreational pilot, one must be at least 17 years old, 16 to be a private glider pilot or be rated for free flight and balloon, be able to read, write, speak, and understand the English language, pass the required knowledge test, meet the aeronautical experience requirements, a logbook endorsement from an instructor, pass the required practical test, third class medical certificate issued under Part 14 CFR Part 67, except for gliders and balloons, medical eligibility is not required. As a recreational pilot, Cross-country flight is limited to a 50 nautical mile range from departure airport, but is permitted with additional training per 14 CFR section 61.101C. Additional limitations include flight during the day and no flying in airspace where communications with air traffic control are required. The aeronautical experience requirements for a recreational pilot license 30 hours of flight time, including at least 15 hours of dual instruction, 2 hours of in-route training, 3 hours in preparation for the practical test, 3 hours of solo flight. Private Pilot A private pilot is one who flies for pleasure or personal business without accepting compensation for flying, except in some very limited specific circumstances. The private pilot certificate is the certificate held by the majority of active pilots. It allows command of any aircraft, subject to the appropriate ratings, for any non-commercial purpose and gives also unlimited authority to fly under VFR. Passengers may be carried and flight in furtherance of business is permitted. However, a private pilot may not be compensated in any way for services as a pilot, although passengers can pay a pro rata share of flight expenses, such as fuel or rental costs. If training under 14 CFR Part 61, experience requirements include at least 40 hours of piloting time, including 20 hours of flight with an instructor and 10 hours of solo flight. See Figure 1-23. Commercial Pilot A commercial pilot may be compensated for flying. Training for the certificate focuses on better understanding the aircraft systems and a higher standard of airmanship. The commercial certificate itself does not allow a pilot to fly in instrument meteorological conditions, IMC, and commercial pilots without an instrument rating are restricted to daytime flight within 50 nautical miles, NM, when flying for hire. A commercial pilot must be able to operate a complex airplane, as a specific number of hours of complex or turbine-powered aircraft time are among the prerequisites and at least a portion of the practical examination is performed in a complex aircraft. A complex aircraft must have retractable landing gear, movable flaps, and a controllable pitch propeller. C-14 CFR Part 61, Section 61.31C, for additional information. See Figure 1-24. Airline Transport Pilot The Airline Transport Pilot ATP is tested to the highest level of piloting ability. The ATP certificate is a prerequisite for acting as a pilot in command, PIC, of scheduled airline operations. The minimum pilot experience is 1,500 hours of flight time. In addition, the pilot must be at least 23 years of age, be able to read, write, speak, and understand the English language, and be of good moral standing. See figure one 25. End Part 2, Chapter 1. Recording by Dale Latham. Part 3 of Chapter 1 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Selecting a Flight School. Selection of a flight school is an important consideration in the flight training process. 
FAA-approved flight schools, non-certificated flying schools, and independent flight instructors conduct flight training in the United States. All flight training is conducted under the auspices of the FAA, following the regulations outlined in either 14 CFR Part 141 or 61. 14 CFR Part 141 flight schools are certificated by the FAA. Application for certification is voluntary, and the school must meet stringent requirements for personnel, equipment, maintenance, facilities, and teach an established curriculum, which includes a training course outline, TCO, approved by the FAA. The certificated schools may qualify for a ground school rating and a flight school rating. In addition, the school may be authorized to give its graduates practical flight tests and knowledge computer-administered written tests. AC-140-2, as amended, FAA Certificated Pilot Schools Directory, lists certificated ground and flight schools and the pilot training courses each school offers. AC-140-2, as amended, can be found online at the FAA's Regulations and Guidance Library, located on the FAA's website at www.faa.gov. Enrollment in a 14 CFR Part 141 flight school ensures quality and continuity and offers a structured approach to flight training because these facilities must document the training curriculum and have their flight courses approved by the FAA. These strictures allow 14 CFR Part 141 schools to complete certificates and ratings in fewer flight hours, which can mean a savings on the cost of flight training for the student pilot. For example, the minimum requirement for a private pilot certificate is 35 hours in a Part 141 certificated school and 40 hours in Part 61 schools. This difference may be insignificant for a private pilot certificate because the national average indicates most pilots require 60 to 75 hours of flight training. Many excellent flight schools find it impractical to qualify for the FAA Part 141 certificates and are referred to as Part 61 schools. 14 CFR Part 61 outlines certificate and rating requirements for pilot certification through non-certificated schools and individual flight instructors. It also states what knowledge-based training must be covered and how much flight experience is required for each certificate and rating. Flight schools and flight instructors who train must adhere to the statutory requirements and train pilots to the standards found in 14 CFR Part 61. One advantage of flight training under 14 CFR Part 61 is its flexibility. Flight lessons can be tailored to the individual student because 14 CFR Part 61 dictates the required minimum flight experience and knowledge-based training necessary to gain a specific pilot's license, but it does not stipulate how the training is to be organized. This flexibility can also be a disadvantage because a flight instructor who fails to organize the flight training can cost a student pilot time and expense through repetitious training. One way for a student pilot to avoid this problem is to ensure the flight instructor has a well-documented training syllabus. How to find a reputable flight program To obtain information about pilot training, contact the local FSDO, which maintains a current file on all schools within its district. The choice of a flight school depends on what type of certificate is sought, whether an individual wishes to fly as a sport pilot or wishes to pursue a career as a professional pilot. Another consideration is the amount of time that can be devoted to training. Ground and flight training should be obtained as regularly and frequently as possible, because this assures maximum retention of instruction and the achievement of requisite proficiency. Do not make the determination based on financial concerns alone, because the quality of training is very important. Prior to making a final decision, visit the schools under consideration and talk with management, instructors, and students. Be inquisitive and proactive when searching for a flight school. Do some homework and develop a checklist of questions by talking to pilots and reading articles in flight magazines. 
The checklist should include questions about aircraft reliability and maintenance practices, questions for current students, such as whether or not there is a safe, clean aircraft available when they are scheduled to fly. Questions for the training facility should be aimed at determining if the instruction fits available personal time. What are the school's operating hours? Does the facility have dedicated classrooms available for ground training required by the FAA? Is there an area available for pre-flight briefings, post-flight debriefings, and critiques? Are these rooms private in nature in order to provide a non-threatening environment in which the instructor can explain the content and outcome of the flight without making the student feel self-conscious? Examine the facility before committing to any flight training. Evaluate the answers on the checklist and then take time to think things over before making a decision. This proactive approach to choosing a flight school will ensure a student pilot contracts with a flight school or flight instructor best suited to individual needs. How to choose a certificated flight instructor, CFI. Whether an individual chooses to train under 14 CFR Part 141 or Part 61, the key to an effective flight program is the quality of the ground and flight training received from the CFI. The flight instructor assumes total responsibility for training an individual to meet the standards required for certification within an ever-changing operating environment. The CFI should possess an understanding of the learning process, knowledge of the fundamentals of teaching, and the ability to communicate effectively with the student pilot. During the certification process, a flight instructor applicant is tested on the practical application of these skills in specific teaching situations. The flight instructor is crucial to the scenario-based training program endorsed by the FAA. He or she is trained to function in the learning environment as an advisor and guide for the learner. The duties, responsibilities, and authority of the CFI include the following. Orient the student to the scenario-based training system. Help the student become a confident planner and in-flight manager of each flight and a critical evaluator of their own performance. Help the student understand the knowledge requirements present in real-world applications. Diagnose learning difficulties and helping the student overcome them. Evaluate student progress and maintain appropriate records. Provide continuous review of student learning. Should a student pilot find the selected CFI is not training in a manner conducive for learning, or the student and CFI do not have compatible schedules, the student pilot should find another CFI. Choosing the right CFI is important because the quality of instruction and the knowledge and skills acquired from this flight instructor affect a student pilot's entire flying career. The Student Pilot The first step in becoming a pilot is to select a type of aircraft. FAA rules for getting a pilot certificate differ depending on the type of aircraft flown. Individuals can choose among airplanes, gyroplanes, weight shift, helicopters, powered parachutes, gliders, balloons, or airships. A pilot does not need a certificate to fly ultralight vehicles. Basic Requirements a student pilot is one who is being trained by an instructor pilot for his or her first full certificate and is permitted to fly alone, solo, under specific limited circumstances. Upon request, an FAA-authorized aviation medical examiner, AME, will issue a combined medical certificate and student pilot certificate after completion of a physical examination. Student pilot certificates may be issued by an FAA inspector or an FAA-designated pilot examiner. To be eligible for a student pilot certificate, an individual must be 16 years old, 14 years old to pilot a glider or balloon, be able to read, write, speak, and understand English, hold a current third-class medical certificate, or for glider or balloon, certify no medical defect exists that would prevent piloting a balloon or glider. Medical Certification Requirements The second step in becoming a pilot is to obtain a medical certificate and student pilot's certificate, 
if the choice of aircraft is an airplane, helicopter, gyroplane, or airship. See figure 1-26. The FAA suggests the individual get a medical certificate before beginning flight training to avoid the expense of flight training that cannot be continued due to a medical condition. Balloon or glider pilots do not need a medical certificate, but do need to write a statement certifying that no medical defect exists that would prevent them from piloting a balloon or glider. The new sport pilot category does not require a medical examination. A driver's license can be used as proof of medical competence. Applicants who fail to meet certain requirements or who have physical disabilities which might limit but not prevent their acting as pilots should contact the nearest FAA office. A medical certificate is obtained by passing a physical examination administered by a doctor who is an FAA-authorized AME. There are approximately 6,000 FAA-authorized AMEs in the nation. Medical certificates are designated as first class, second class, or third class. Generally, first class is designed for the airline transport pilot, second class for the commercial pilot, and third class for the student, recreational, and private pilot. A student pilot certificate is issued by an AME at the time of the student's first medical examination. This certificate allows an individual who is being trained by a flight instructor to fly alone, solo, under specific, limited circumstances, and must be carried with the student pilot while exercising solo flight privileges. The student pilot certificate is only required when exercising solo flight privileges. The student certificate is valid until the last day of the month, 24 months after it was issued. Student pilot solo requirements. Once a student has accrued sufficient training and experience, a CFI can endorse the student certificate to authorize limited solo flight in a specific type, make, and model of aircraft. A student pilot may not carry passengers, fly in furtherance of a business, or operate an aircraft outside of the various endorsements provided by the flight instructor. There is no minimum aeronautical knowledge or experience requirement for the issuance of a student pilot certificate, other than the medical requirements for the class of medical certificate the student certificate is based upon. There are, however, minimum aeronautical knowledge and experience requirements for student pilots to solo. Becoming a Pilot The course of instruction a student pilot follows depends on the type of certificate sought. It should include the ground and flight training necessary to acquire the knowledge and skills required to safely and efficiently function as a certificated pilot in the selected category and class of aircraft. The specific knowledge and skill areas for each category and class of aircraft are outlined in 14 CFR Part 61. Eligibility, aeronautical knowledge, proficiency, and aeronautical requirements can be found in 14 CFR Part 61. Certification, pilots, flight instructors, and ground instructors. Recreational pilot, see subpart D. Private pilot, see subpart E. Sport pilot, see subpart J. The knowledge-based portion of training is obtained through FAA handbooks such as this one, textbooks, and other sources of training and testing materials which are available in print form from the Superintendent of Documents, GPO, and online at the Regulatory Support Division, www.faa.gov slash about slash office underscore org slash headquarters underscore offices slash avs slash offices slash afs slash afs 600. The CFI may also use commercial publications as a source of study materials, especially for aircraft categories where government materials are limited. A student pilot should follow the flight instructor's advice on what and when to study. Planning a definite study program and following it as closely as possible will help in scoring well on the knowledge test. Haphazard or disorganized study habits usually result in an unsatisfactory score. In addition to learning aeronautical knowledge, such as the principles of flight, a student pilot is also required to gain skill in flight maneuvers. 
The selected category and class of aircraft determines the type of flight skills and number of flight hours to be obtained. There are four steps involved in learning a flight maneuver. The CFI introduces and demonstrates flight maneuver to the student. The CFI talks student pilot through the maneuver. The student pilot practices the maneuver under CFI supervision. The CFI authorizes the student pilot to practice the maneuver solo. Once the student pilot has shown proficiency in the required knowledge areas, flight maneuvers, and accrued the required amount of flight hours, the CFI endorses the student pilot logbook, which allows the student pilot to take the written and practical exams for pilot certification. Knowledge and Skill Examinations Knowledge Examination The Knowledge Test is the computer portion of the exams taken to obtain pilot certification. The test contains questions of the objective, multiple-choice type. This testing method conserves the applicant's time, eliminates any element of individual judgment in determining grades, and saves time in scoring. If pursuing a recreational pilot or private pilot certificate, it is important to become familiar with 14 CFR Part 61, Section 61.23, Medical Certificates, Requirements and Duration. 14 CFR Section 61.35, Knowledge Test, Prerequisites and Passing Grades, and 14 CFR Section 61.83, Eligibility Requirements for Student Pilot, for detailed information pertaining to prerequisites and eligibility. If pursuing a recreational pilot certificate, it is important to review 14 CFR Section 61.96, Applicability and Eligibility Requirements, General, for additional detailed information pertaining to eligibility. And if pursuing a private pilot certificate, 14 CFR Section 61.103, Eligibility Requirements, General, contains additional detailed information pertaining to eligibility. Sample test questions can be downloaded from Airmen Knowledge Test Questions www.faa.gov slash training underscore testing slash testing slash test underscore questions slash. Each applicant must register to take the test and provide proper identification and authorization proving eligibility to take a particular FAA test. The option to take an untimed sample test will be offered. The actual test is time limited but most applicants have sufficient time to complete and review the test. Upon completion of the knowledge test, the applicant receives an Airman Knowledge Test Report that reflects the score and is embossed with the testing center's seal. To pass, a minimum score of 70 must be attained. When to take the examination The knowledge test is more meaningful to the applicant and more likely to result in a satisfactory grade if it is taken after beginning the flight portion of the training. Therefore, the FAA recommends the knowledge test be taken after the student pilot has completed a solo cross-country flight. The operational knowledge gained by this experience can be used to the student's advantage in the knowledge test. The student pilot's CFI is the best person to determine when the applicant is ready to take the knowledge exam. Where to take the examination the FAA has hundreds of designated computer testing centers worldwide that administer FAA knowledge tests. These testing centers offer the full range of airman knowledge tests. Applicants will be charged a fee for the administration of FAA knowledge tests. A complete list of test centers, their locations and phone numbers, can be downloaded at Airmen Certification Frequently Asked Questions, located at www.faa.gov slash training underscore testing slash testing slash or www.faa.gov slash licenses underscore certificates slash airmen underscore certification slash airmen underscore uppercase FAQ slash an applicant can also contact the local FSDO to obtain this information. If the student pilot chooses a 14 CFR Part 141 flight school with test examining authority, the school will administer the knowledge test 
during the curriculum. Practical Examination the FAA has developed PTSs for FAA pilot certificates and associated ratings. See figure 1-27. These practical tests are administered by FAA, ASIs, and DPEs. 14 CFR Part 61 specifies the areas of operation in which knowledge and skill must be demonstrated by the applicant. Since the FAA requires all practical tests be conducted in accordance with the appropriate PTS and the policies set forth in the introduction section of the PTS book, the pilot applicant should become familiar with this book during training. The PTS book is a testing document and not intended to be a training syllabus. An appropriately rated flight instructor is responsible for training the pilot applicant to acceptable standards in all subject matter areas procedures, and maneuvers. Descriptions of tasks and information on how to perform maneuvers and procedures are contained in reference and teaching documents such as this handbook. A list of reference documents is contained in the introduction section of each PTS book. Copies may be obtained by downloading from the FAA website www.faa.gov, purchase of print copies from the GPO, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or via their official online bookstore at www.access.gpo.gov. The flight proficiency maneuvers listed in 14 CFR Part 61 are the standard skill requirements for certification. They are outlined in the PTS as areas of operation. These are phases of the practical test arranged in a logical sequence within the standard. They begin with pre-flight preparation and end with post-flight procedures. Each area of operation contains tasks, which are comprised of knowledge areas, flight procedures, and or flight maneuvers appropriate to the area of operation. The candidate is required to demonstrate knowledge and proficiency in all tasks for the original issuance of all pilot certificates. When to take the practical exam. 14 CFR Part 61 establishes the ground school and flight experience requirements for the type of certification and aircraft selected. However, the CFI best determines when an applicant is qualified for the practical test. A practice practical test is an important step in the flight training process. The applicant will be asked to present the following documentation. FAA Form 8710-1 8710-11 for sport pilot applicants, application for an airman certificate and or rating, with the flight instructor's recommendation. An airman knowledge test report with a satisfactory grade. A medical certificate, not required for glider or balloon. And a student pilot certificate, endorsed by a flight instructor for solo, solo cross-country, airplane and rotorcraft, and for the make and model aircraft to be used for the practical test, driver's license or medical certificate for sport pilot applicants, the pilot logbook records, a graduation certificate from an FAA-approved school, if applicable. The applicant must provide an airworthy aircraft with equipment relevant to the areas of operation required for the practical test. He or she will also be asked to produce and explain the Aircraft's Registration Certificate, Aircraft's Airworthiness Certificate, Aircraft's Operating Limitations, or FAA-approved Aircraft Flight Manual, if required, Aircraft Equipment List, Required Weight and Balance Data, Maintenance Records, Applicable Airworthiness Directives, ADs. For a detailed explanation of the required pilot maneuvers and performance standards, Refer to the PTSs pertaining to the type of certification and aircraft selected. These standards may be downloaded free of charge from the FAA. www.faa.gov They can also be purchased from the Superintendent of Documents or GPO bookstores. Most airport fixed base operators and flight schools carry a variety of government publications and charts, as well as commercially published materials. Who administers the FAA practical examination? Due to the varied responsibilities of the FSDOs, practical tests are usually given by DPEs. 
An applicant should schedule the practical test by appointment to avoid conflicts and wasted time. A list of examiner names can be obtained from the local FSDO. Since a DPE serves without pay from the government for conducting practical tests and processing the necessary reports, the examiner is allowed to charge a reasonable fee. There is no charge for the practical test when conducted by an FAA inspector. Role of the Certificated Flight Instructor To become a CFI, a pilot must meet the provisions of 14 CFR Part 61. The FAA places full responsibility for student flight training on the shoulders of the CFI, who is the cornerstone of aviation safety. It is the job of the flight instructor to train the student pilot in all the knowledge areas and teach the skills necessary for the student pilot to operate safely and competently as a certificated pilot in the NAS. The training will include airmanship skills, pilot judgment and decision-making, and good operating practices. A pilot training program depends on the quality of the ground and flight instruction the student pilot receives. The flight instructor must possess a thorough understanding of the learning process, knowledge of the fundamentals of teaching, and the ability to communicate effectively with the student pilot. He or she uses a syllabus and teaching style that embodies the building block method of instruction. In this method, the student progresses from the known to the unknown via a course of instruction laid out in such a way that each new maneuver embodies the principles involved in the performance of maneuvers previously learned. Thus, with the introduction of each new subject, the student not only learns a new principle or technique, but also broadens his or her application of those principles or techniques previously learned. Insistence on correct techniques and procedures from the beginning of training by the flight instructor ensures that the student pilot develops proper flying habit patterns. Any deficiencies in the maneuvers or techniques must immediately be emphasized and corrected. A flight instructor serves as a role model for the student pilot, who observes the flying habits of his or her flight instructor during flight instruction, as well as when the instructor conducts other pilot operations. Thus, the flight instructor becomes a model of flying proficiency for the student, who, consciously or unconsciously, attempts to imitate the instructor. For this reason, a flight instructor should observe recognized safety practices as well as regulations during all flight operations. The student pilot who enrolls in a pilot training program commits considerable time, effort, and expense to achieve a pilot certificate. Students often judge the effectiveness of the flight instructor and the success of the pilot training program based on their ability to pass the requisite FAA practical test. A competent flight instructor stresses to the student that practical tests are a sampling of pilot ability compressed into a short period of time. The goal of a flight instructor is to train the total pilot. Role of the Designated Pilot Examiner The DPE plays an important role in the FAA's mission of promoting aviation safety by administering FAA practical tests for pilot and flight instructor certificates and associated ratings. Although administering these tests is a responsibility of the ASI, the FAA's highest priority is making air travel safer by inspecting aircraft that fly in the United States. To satisfy the need for pilot testing and certification services, the FAA delegates certain of these responsibilities to private individuals who are not FAA employees. Appointed in accordance with 14 CFR Section 183.23, a DPE is an individual who meets the qualification requirements of the Pilot Examiner's Handbook, FAA Order 8710.3, and who is technically qualified, holds all pertinent category, class, and type ratings for each aircraft related to their designation, meets requirements of 14 CFR Part 61, Sections 61.56, 61.57, and 61.58 as appropriate, is current and qualified to act as PIC of each aircraft for which he or she is authorized, maintains at least a third-class medical certificate if required, maintains a current flight instructor certificate if required, designated to perform specific pilot certification tasks on behalf of the FAA, a DPE may charge a reasonable fee.
Generally, a DPE's authority is limited to accepting applications and conducting practical tests leading to the issuance of specific pilot certificates and or ratings. The majority of FAA practical tests at the private and commercial pilot levels are administered by DPEs. DPE candidates must have good industry reputations for professionalism, integrity, a demonstrated willingness to serve the public, and adhere to FAA policies and procedures in certification matters. The FAA expects the DPE to administer practical tests with the same degree of professionalism, using the same methods, procedures, and standards as an FAA ASI. Chapter Summary The FAA has entered the second century of civil aviation as a robust government organization and is taking full advantage of technology, such as global positioning system, GPS, satellite technology, to enhance the safety of civil aviation. The Internet has also become an important tool in promoting aviation safety and providing around-the-clock resources for the aviation community. Handbooks, regulations, standards, references, and online courses are now available at the FAA website. In keeping with the FAA's belief that safety is a learned behavior, the FAA offers many courses and seminars to enhance air safety. The FAA puts the burden of instilling safe flying habits on the flight instructor, who should follow basic flight safety practices and procedures in every flight operation he or she undertakes with a student pilot. Operational safety practices include, but are not limited to, collision avoidance procedures consisting of proper scanning techniques, use of checklists, runway incursion avoidance, positive transfer of controls, and workload management. These safety practices will be discussed more fully within this handbook. Safe flight also depends on scenario-based training, SBT, that teaches the student pilot how to respond in different flight situations. The FAA has incorporated these techniques along with decision-making methods such as aeronautical decision-making, ADM, risk management, and crew resource management, CRM which are covered more completely in Chapter 17, Aeronautical Decision-Making. End of Part 3 of Chapter 1。Part 1 of Chapter 2 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Aircraft Structure. Introduction. An aircraft is a device that is used or intended to be used for flight. According to the current Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR Part 1, Definitions and Abbreviations. Categories of aircraft for certification of airmen include airplane, rotorcraft, glider, lighter-than-air, powered lift, powered parachute, and weight shift control. 14 CFR Part 1 also defines airplane as an engine-driven, fixed-wing aircraft that is supported in flight by the dynamic reaction of air against its wings. Another term, not yet codified in 14 CFR Part 1, is Advanced Avionics Aircraft, which refers to an aircraft that contains a global positioning system, GPS navigation system, with a moving map display, in conjunction with another system, such as an autopilot. This chapter provides a brief introduction to the structure of aircraft and uses an airplane for most illustrations. Light Sport Aircraft, LSA, such as weight shift control, balloon, glider, powered parachute, and gyroplane have their own handbooks to include detailed information regarding aerodynamics and control. Lift and Basic Aerodynamics In order to understand the operation of the major components and subcomponents of an aircraft, it is important to understand basic aerodynamic concepts. This chapter briefly introduces aerodynamics. A more detailed explanation can be found in Chapter 4, Aerodynamics of Flight. 
Four forces act upon an aircraft in relation to straight and level on accelerated flight. These forces are thrust, lift, weight, and drag. See figure 2-1. Thrust is the forward force produced by the power plant propeller. It opposes or overcomes the force of drag. As a general rule, it is said to act parallel to the longitudinal axis. This is not always the case, as explained later. Drag is a rearward retarding force and is caused by disruption of airflow by the wing, fuselage, and other protruding objects. Drag opposes thrust and acts rearward parallel to the relative wind. Weight is the combined load of the airplane itself, the crew, the fuel, and the cargo or baggage. Weight pulls the airplane downward because of the force of gravity. It opposes lift and acts vertically downward through the airplane's center of gravity, CG. Lift opposes the downward force of weight, is produced by the dynamic effect of the air acting on the wing, and acts perpendicular to the flight path through the wing's center of lift. An aircraft moves in three dimensions and is controlled by moving it about one or more of its axes. The longitudinal, or roll axis, extends through the aircraft from nose to tail, with the line passing through the CG. The lateral, or pitch axis, extends across the aircraft on a line through the wingtips, again passing through the CG. The vertical, or yaw, axis passes through the aircraft vertically, intersecting the CG. All control movements cause the aircraft to move around one or more of these axes, and allows for the control of the airplane in flight. See figure 2-2. One of the most significant components of aircraft design is CG. It is the specific point where the mass or weight of an aircraft may be said to center, that is, a point around which, if the aircraft could be suspended or balanced, the aircraft would remain relatively level. The position of the CG of an aircraft determines the stability of the aircraft in flight. As the CG moves rearward, towards the tail, the aircraft becomes more and more dynamically unstable. In aircraft with fuel tanks situated in front of the CG, it is important that the CG is set with the fuel tank empty. Otherwise, as the fuel is used, the aircraft becomes unstable. See figure 2-3. The CG is computed during initial design and construction, and is further affected by the installation of onboard equipment, aircraft loading, and other factors. Major Components Although airplanes are designed for a variety of purposes, most of them have the same major components. See figure 2-4. The overall characteristics are largely determined by the original design objectives. Most airplane structures include a fuselage, wings, an empennage, landing gear, and a power plant. Fuselage The fuselage is the central body of an airplane and is designed to accommodate the crew, passengers, and cargo. It also provides the structural connection for the wings and tail assembly. Older types of aircraft design utilized an open truss structure, constructed of wood, steel, or aluminum tubing. See figure 2-5. The most popular types of fuselage structures used in today's aircraft are the monocoque, French for single shell, and semi-monocoque. These structure types are discussed in more detail under aircraft construction later in the chapter. Wings the wings are airfoils attached to each side of the fuselage and are the main lifting surfaces that support the airplane in flight. There are numerous wing designs, sizes, and shapes used by the various manufacturers. Each fulfills a certain need with respect to the expected performance for the particular airplane. How the wing produces lift is explained in Chapter 4, Aerodynamics of Flight. Wings may be attached at the top middle, or lower portion of the fuselage. These designs are referred to as high, mid, and low wing, respectively. The number of wings can also vary. Airplanes with a single set of wings are referred to as monoplanes, while those with two sets are called biplanes. See figure 2-6. 
Many high-wing airplanes have external braces or wing struts, which transmit the flight and landing loads through the struts to the main fuselage structure. Since the wing struts are usually attached approximately halfway out on the wing, this type of wing structure is called semi-cantilever. A few high-wing and most low-wing airplanes have a full cantilever wing designed to carry the loads without external struts. The principal structural parts of the wing are spars, ribs, and stringers. See figure 2-7. These are reinforced by trusses I-beams, tubing, or other devices, including the skin. The wing ribs determine the shape and thickness of the wing, airfoil. In most modern airplanes, the fuel tanks either are an integral part of the wing's structure or consist of flexible containers mounted inside of the wing. Attached to the rear or trailing edges of the wings are two types of control surfaces referred to as ailerons and flaps. Ailerons extend from about the midpoint of each wing outward toward the tip and move in opposite directions to create aerodynamic forces that cause the airplane to roll. Flaps extend outward from the fuselage to near the midpoint of each wing. The flaps are normally flush with the wing surface during cruising flight. When extended, the flaps move simultaneously downward to increase the lifting force of the wing for takeoffs and landings. See figure 2-8. Alternate Types of Wings With the Federal Aviation Administration's, FAA, recent addition of the LSA category, various methods are employed to control flight and to produce lift. These methods are discussed in Chapter 4, Aerodynamics of Flight, which provides information on the effect controls have on lifting surfaces, from traditional wings to wings that use both flexing due to billowing and shifting through the change of the aircraft's CG. Handbooks specific to each category of LSA are available for the interested pilot. LSA illustrate various lifting surfaces and control methods. For example, the wing of the weight shift control aircraft is highly swept, and the shifting of weight to provide controlled flight. See figure 2-9. Empennage. The empennage includes the entire tail group and consists of fixed surfaces, such as the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer. The movable surfaces include the rudder, the elevator, and one or more trim tabs. See figure 2-10. The rudder is attached to the back of the vertical stabilizer. During flight, it is used to move the airplane's nose left and right. The elevator which is attached to the back of the horizontal stabilizer, is used to move the nose of the airplane up and down during flight. Trim tabs are small, movable portions of the trailing edge of the control surface. These movable trim tabs, which are controlled from the flight deck, reduce control pressures. Trim tabs may be installed on the ailerons, the rudder, and or the elevator. A second type of empennage design does not require an elevator. Instead, it incorporates a one-piece horizontal stabilizer that pivots from a central hinge point. This type of design is called a stabilator and is moved using the control wheel just as the elevator is moved. For example, when a pilot pulls back on the control wheel, the stabilator pivots so the trailing edge moves up. This increases the aerodynamic tail load and causes the nose of the airplane to move up. Stabilators have an anti-servo tab extending across their trailing edge. See figure 2-11. The anti-servo tab moves in the same direction as the trailing edge of the stabilator and helps make the stabilator less sensitive. The anti-servo tab also functions as a trim tab to relieve control pressures and helps maintain the stabilator in the desired position. Landing gear. The landing gear is the principal support of the airplane when parked, taxiing, taking off, or landing. The most common type of landing gear consists of wheels, but airplanes can also be equipped with floats for water operations or skis for landing on snow. See figure 2-12. The landing gear consists of three wheels, two main wheels, and a third wheel positioned either at the front or rear of the airplane. 
landing gear with a rear mounted wheel is called conventional landing gear airplanes with conventional landing gear are sometimes referred to as tail wheel airplanes when the third wheel is located on the nose it is called a nose wheel and the design is referred to as a tricycle gear a steerable nose wheel or tail wheel permits the airplane to be controlled throughout all operations while on the ground most aircraft are steered by moving the rudder pedals whether nose wheel or tail wheel additionally some aircraft are steered by differential braking the power plant the power plant usually includes both the engine and the propeller the primary function of the engine is to provide the power to turn the propeller it also generates electrical power provides a vacuum source for some flight instruments and in most single-engine airplanes provides a source of heat for the pilot and passengers see figure 2-13 the engine is covered by a cowling or a nacelle which are both types of covered housings the purpose of the cowling or nacelle is to streamline the flow of air around the engine and to help cool the engine by ducting air around the cylinders the propeller mounted on the front of the engine translates the rotating force of the engine into thrust a forward acting force that helps move the airplane through the air the propeller may also be mounted on the rear of the engine as in a pusher type aircraft a propeller is a rotating airfoil that produces thrust through aerodynamic action a low pressure area is formed at the back of the propeller's airfoil and high pressure is produced at the face of the propeller similar to the way lift is generated by an airfoil used as a lifting surface or wing this pressure differential pulls air through the propeller which in turn pulls the airplane forward there are two significant factors involved in the design of a propeller which impact its effectiveness the angle of a propeller blade as measured against the hub of the propeller keeps the angle of attack relatively constant along the span of the propeller blade reducing or eliminating the possibility of a stall the pitch is defined as the distance a propeller would travel in one revolution if it were turning in a solid these two factors combine to allow a measurement of the propeller's efficiency propellers are usually matched to a specific aircraft power plant combination to achieve the best efficiency at a particular power setting and they pull or push depending on how the engine is mounted subcomponents the subcomponents of an airplane include the airframe electrical system flight controls and brakes the airframe is the basic structure of an aircraft and is designed to withstand all aerodynamic forces as well as the stresses imposed by the weight of the fuel crew and payload the primary function of an aircraft electrical system is to generate regulate and distribute electrical power throughout the aircraft there are several different power sources on aircraft to power the aircraft electrical systems these power sources include engine driven alternating current ac generators auxiliary power units apus and external power the aircraft's electrical power system is used to operate the flight instruments essential systems such as anti-icing etc and passenger services such as cabin lighting the flight controls are the devices and systems which govern the attitude of an aircraft and as a result the flight path followed by the aircraft in the case of many conventional airplanes the primary flight controls utilize hinged trailing edge surfaces called elevators for pitch ailerons for roll and the rudder for yaw these surfaces are operated by the pilot in the flight deck or by an automatic pilot airplane brakes consist of multiple pads called caliper pads that are hydraulically squeezed toward each other with a rotating disc called a rotor between them the pads place pressure on the rotor which is turning with the wheels as a result of the increased friction on the rotor the wheels inherently slow down and stop turning the discs and brake pads are made either from steel like those in a car or from a carbon material that weighs less and can absorb more energy 
Because airplane brakes are used principally during landings and must absorb enormous amounts of energy, their life is measured in landings rather than miles. End of Part 1 of Chapter 2「Part Two of Chapter Two of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Kachuk. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Types of Aircraft Construction. The construction of aircraft fuselages evolved from the early wood truss structural arrangements to monocoque shell structures to the current semi-monocoque shell structures. Truss Structure The main drawback of truss structure is its lack of a streamlined shape. In this construction method, lengths of tubing, called longerons, are welded in place to form a well-braced framework. Vertical and horizontal struts are welded to the longerons and give the structure a square or rectangular shape when viewed from the end. Additional struts are needed to resist stress that can come from any direction. Stringers and bulkheads, or formers, are added to shape the fuselage and support the covering. As technology progressed, aircraft designers began to enclose the truss members to streamline the airplane and improve performance. This was originally accomplished with cloth fabric, which eventually gave way to lightweight metals such as aluminum. In some cases, the outside skin can support all or a major portion of the flight loads. Most modern aircraft use a form of this stressed skin structure known as monocoque or semi-monocoque construction. See figure 2-14. Monocoque Monocoque construction uses stressed skin to support almost all loads, much like an aluminum beverage can. Although very strong, monocoque construction is not highly tolerant to deformation of the surface. For example, an aluminum beverage can supports considerable forces at the ends of the can, but if the side of the can is deformed slightly while supporting a load, it collapses easily. Because most twisting and bending stresses are carried by the external skin rather than by an open framework, the need for internal bracing was eliminated or reduced, saving weight and maximizing space. One of the notable and innovative methods for using monocoque construction was employed by Jack Northrop. In 1918, he devised a new way to construct a monocoque fuselage used for the Lockheed S-1 racer. The technique utilized two molded plywood half-shells that were glued together around wooden hoops or stringers. To construct the half-shells, rather than gluing many strips of plywood over a form, three large sets of spruce strips were soaked with glue and laid in a semicircular concrete mold that looked like a bathtub. Then, under a tightly clamped lid, a rubber balloon was inflated in the cavity to press the plywood against the mold. Twenty-four hours later, the smooth half-shell was ready to be joined to another to create the fuselage. The two halves were each less than a quarter-inch thick. Although employed in the early aviation period, monocoque construction would not re-emerge for several decades due to the complexities involved. Everyday examples of monocoque construction can be found in automobile manufacturing where the unibody is considered standard in manufacturing. Semi-monocoque Semi-monocoque construction, partial or one-half, uses a substructure to which the airplane skin is attached. The substructure, which consists of bulkheads and or formers of various sizes and stringers, reinforces the stressed skin by taking some of the bending stress from the fuselage. The main section of the fuselage also includes wing attachment points and a firewall. On single-engine airplanes, the engine is usually attached to the front of the fuselage. There is a fireproof partition between the rear of the engine and the flight deck or cabin to protect the pilot and passengers from accidental engine fires. This partition is called a firewall and is usually made of heat-resistant material such as stainless steel. However, a new emerging process of construction is the integration of composites, 
or aircraft made entirely of composites. Composite Construction History The use of composites in aircraft construction can be dated to World War II aircraft, when soft fiberglass insulation was used in B-29 fuselages. By the late 1950s, European high-performance sailplane manufacturers were using fiberglass as primary structures. In 1965, the FAA type certified the first all-fiberglass aircraft in the normal category, a Swiss sailplane called a Diamant HBV. Four years later, the FAA certified a four-seat, single-engine, Windecker Eagle in the normal category. By 2005, over 35% of new aircraft were constructed of composite materials. Composite is a broad term and can mean materials such as fiberglass, carbon fiber cloth, Kevlar cloth, and mixtures of all of the above. Composite construction offers two advantages, extremely smooth skins and the ability to easily form complex curved or streamlined structures. See figure 2-15. Composite Materials in Aircraft Composite materials are fiber-reinforced matrix systems. The matrix is the glue used to hold the fibers together, and, when cured, gives the part its shape, but the fibers carry most of the load. There are many different types of fibers and matrix systems. In aircraft, the most common matrix is epoxy resin, which is a type of thermosetting plastic. Compared to other choices, such as polyester resin, epoxy is stronger and has good high-temperature properties. There are many different types of epoxies available, with a wide range of structural properties, cure times and temperatures, and costs. The most common reinforcing fibers used in aircraft construction are fiberglass and carbon fiber. Fiberglass has good tensile and compressive strength, good impact resistance, is easy to work with, and is relatively inexpensive and readily available. Its main disadvantage is that it is relatively heavy, and it is difficult to make a fiberglass load-carrying structure lighter than a well-designed equivalent aluminum structure. Carbon fiber is generally stronger in tensile and compressive strength than fiberglass, and has much higher bending stiffness. It is also considerably lighter than fiberglass. However, it is relatively poor in impact resistance. The fibers are brittle and tend to shatter under sharp impact. This can be greatly improved with a toughened epoxy resin system, as used in the Boeing 787 horizontal and vertical stabilizers. Carbon fiber is more expensive than fiberglass, but the price has dropped due to innovations driven by the B-2 program in the 1980s and Boeing 777 work in the 1990s. Very well-designed carbon fiber structures can be significantly lighter than an equivalent aluminum structure, sometimes by 30% or so. Advantages of Composites Composite construction offers several advantages over metal, wood, or fabric, with its lighter weight being the most frequently cited. Lighter weight is not always automatic. It must be remembered that building an aircraft structure out of composites does not guarantee it will be lighter. It depends on the structure as well as the type of composite being used. A more important advantage is that a very smooth, compound, curved, aerodynamic structure made from composites reduces drag. This is the main reason sailplane designers switched from metal and wood to composites in the 1960s. In aircraft, the use of composites reduces drag for the Cirrus and Columbia line of production aircraft, leading to their high performance despite their fixed landing gear. Composites also help mask the radar signature of stealth aircraft designs, such as the B-2 and the F-22. Today, composites can be found in aircraft as varied as gliders to most new helicopters. Lack of corrosion is a third advantage of composites. Boeing is designing the 787 with its all-composite fuselage to have both a higher pressure differential and higher humidity in the cabin than previous airliners. Engineers are no longer as concerned about corrosion from moisture condensation on the hidden areas of the fuselage skins, 
such as behind insulation blankets. This should lead to lower long-term maintenance costs for the airlines. Another advantage of composites is their good performance in a flexing environment, such as in helicopter rotor blades. Composites do not suffer from metal fatigue and crack growth, as do metals. While it takes careful engineering, composite rotor blades can have considerably higher design lives than metal blades, and most new large helicopter designs have all composite blades, and in many cases, composite rotor hubs. Disadvantages of Composites Composite construction comes with its own set of disadvantages, the most important of which is the lack of visual proof of damage. Composites respond differently from other structural materials to impact, and there is often no obvious sign of damage. For example, if a car backs into an aluminum fuselage, it might dent the fuselage. If the fuselage is not dented, there is no damage. If the fuselage is dented, the damage is visible and repairs are made. In a composite structure, a low-energy impact, such as a bump or a tool drop, may not leave any visible sign of the impact on the surface. Underneath the impact site, there may be extensive delaminations, spreading in a cone-shaped area from the impact location. The damage on the back side of the structure can be significant and extensive, but it may be hidden from view. Any time one has reason to think there may have been an impact, even a minor one, it is best to get an inspector familiar with composites to examine the structure to determine underlying damage. The appearance of whitish areas in a fiberglass structure is a good tip-off that delaminations of fiber fracture has occurred. A medium energy impact, perhaps the car backing into the structure, results in local crushing of the surface, which should be visible to the eye. The damaged area is larger than the visible crushed area and will need to be repaired. A high-energy impact, such as a bird strike or hail while in flight, results in a puncture and a severely damaged structure. In medium and high-energy impacts, the damage is visible to the eye, but low-energy impact is difficult to detect. See figure 2-16. If an impact results in delaminations, crushing of the surface, or a puncture, then a repair is mandatory. While waiting for the repair, the damaged area should be covered and protected from rain. Many composite parts are composed of thin skins over a honeycomb core, creating a sandwich structure. While excellent for structural stiffness reasons, such a structure is an easy target for water ingress, entering, leading to further problems later. A piece of speed tape over the puncture is a good way to protect it from water, but it is not a structural repair. The use of a paste filler to cover up the damage, while acceptable for cosmetic purposes, is not a structural repair, either. The potential for heat damage to the resin is another disadvantage of using composites. While too hot depends on the particular resin system chosen, many epoxies begin to weaken over 150 degrees Fahrenheit. White paint on composites is often used to minimize this issue. For example, the bottom of a wing that is painted black facing a black asphalt ramp on a hot, sunny day can get as hot as 220 degrees Fahrenheit. The same structure, painted white, rarely exceeds 140 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, composite airplanes often have specific recommendations on allowable paint colors. If the airplane is repainted, these recommendations must be followed. Heat damage can also occur due to a fire. Even a quickly extinguished small brake fire can damage bottom wing skins, composite landing gear legs, or wheel pants. Also, chemical paint strippers are very harmful to composites and must not be used on them. If paint needs to be removed from composites, only mechanical methods are allowed, such as gentle grit blasting or sanding. Many expensive composite parts have been ruined by the use of paint stripper, and such damage is generally not repairable. Fluid spills on composites. Some owners are concerned about fuel, oil, or hydraulic fluid spills on composite surfaces. These are generally not a problem with modern composites using epoxy resin. 
Usually, if the spill doesn't attack the paint, it won't hurt the underlying composite. Some aircraft use fiberglass fuel tanks, for example, in which the fuel rides directly against the composite surface, with no sealant being used. If the fiberglass structure is made with some of the more inexpensive types of polyester resin, there can be a problem when using auto gas with ethanol blended into the mixture. The more expensive types of polyester resin, as well as epoxy resin, can be used with autogas, as well as 100-octane aviation gas, avgas, and jet fuel. Lightning Strike Protection Lightning strike protection is an important consideration in aircraft design. When an aircraft is hit by lightning, a very large amount of energy is delivered to the structure. Whether flying a light general aviation, GA, airplane, or a large airliner, the basic principle of lightning strike protection is the same. For any size aircraft, the energy from the strike must be spread over a large surface area to lower the amps per square inch to a harmless level. If lightning strikes an aluminum airplane, the electrical energy naturally conducts easily through the aluminum structure. The challenge is to keep the energy out of avionics, fuel systems, etc., until it can be safely conducted overboard. The outer skin of the aircraft is the path of least resistance. In a composite aircraft, fiberglass is an excellent electrical insulator, while carbon fiber conducts electricity, but not as easily as aluminum. Therefore, additional electrical conductivity needs to be added to the outside layer of composite skin. This is done typically with fine metal meshes bonded to the skin surfaces. Aluminum and copper mesh are the two most common types, with aluminum used on fiberglass and copper on carbon fiber. Any structural repairs on lightning strike protected areas must also include the mesh, as well as the underlying structure. For composite aircraft with internal radio antennas, there must be windows in the lightning strike mesh in the area of the antenna. Internal radio antennas may be found in fiberglass composites because fiberglass is transparent to radio frequencies, whereas carbon fiber is not. The Future of Composites In the decades since World War II, composites have earned an important role in aircraft structure design. Their design flexibility and corrosion resistance, as well as the high strength-to-weight ratios possible, will undoubtedly continue to lead to more innovative aircraft designs in the future. From the Cirrus SR-20 to the Boeing 787, it is obvious that composites have found a home in aircraft construction and are here to stay. See figure 2-17. Instrumentation. Moving into the future. Until recently, most GA aircraft were equipped with individual instruments utilized collectively to safely operate and maneuver the aircraft. With the release of the electronic flight display, EFD, system, conventional instruments have been replaced by multiple liquid crystal display, LCD, screens. The first screen is installed in front of the left seat pilot position and is referred to as the primary flight display, PFD. The second screen, positioned approximately in the center of the instrument panel, is referred to as the multifunction display, MFD. These two screens declutter instrument panels while increasing safety. This has been accomplished through the utilization of solid-state instruments, which have a failure rate far less than those of conventional analog instrumentation. See figure 2-18. With today's improvements in avionics and the introduction of EFDs, pilots at any level of experience need an astute knowledge of the onboard flight control systems as well as an understanding of how automation melds with aeronautical decision-making, ADM. These subjects are covered in detail in Chapter 17, Aeronautical Decision-Making. Whether an aircraft has analog or digital glass instruments, the instrumentation falls into three different categories, performance, control, and navigation. Performance instruments. The performance instruments indicate the aircraft's actual performance. Performance is determined by reference to the altimeter, airspeed or vertical speed indicator, VSI, heading indicator, and turn and slip indicator. 
the performance instruments directly reflect the performance the aircraft is achieving. The speed of the aircraft can be referenced on the airspeed indicator. The altitude can be referenced on the altimeter. The aircraft's climb performance can be determined by referencing the VSI. Other performance instruments available are the heading indicator, angle of attack indicator, and the slip skid indicator. See figure 2-19 and errata. Control instruments. The control instruments, see figure 2-20 and errata, display immediate attitude and power changes, and are calibrated to permit adjustments in precise increments. The instrument for attitude display is the attitude indicator. The control instruments do not indicate aircraft speed or altitude. In order to determine these variables and others, a pilot must reference the performance instruments. Navigation instruments. The navigation instruments indicate the position of the aircraft in relation to a selected navigation facility or fix. This group of instruments includes various types of course indicators, range indicators, glide slope indicators, and bearing pointers. Newer aircraft with more technologically advanced instrumentation provide blended information, giving the pilot more accurate positional information. Navigation instruments are comprised of indicators that display GPS, very high frequency, VHF, omnidirectional radio range, VOR, non-directional beacon, NDB, and instrument landing system, ILS, information. The instruments indicate the position of the aircraft relative to a selected navigation facility or fix. They also provide pilotage information so the aircraft can be maneuvered to keep it on a predetermined path. The pilotage information can be in either two or three dimensions relative to the ground-based or space-based navigation information. See figure 2-21 and errata and figure 2-22. Global Positioning System, GPS. GPS is a satellite-based navigation system composed of a network of satellites placed into orbit by the United States Department of Defense, DOD. GPS was originally intended for military applications, but in the 1980s, the government made the system available for civilian use. GPS works in all weather conditions, anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day. A GPS receiver must be locked onto the signal of at least three satellites to calculate a two-dimensional position latitude and longitude, and track movement. With four or more satellites in view, the receiver can determine the user's three-dimensional position, latitude, longitude, and altitude. Other satellites must also be in view to offset signal loss and signal ambiguity. The use of the GPS is discussed in more detail in Chapter 15, Navigation. Additionally, GPS is discussed in the Aeronautical Information Manual AIM. Chapter Summary. This chapter provides an overview of aircraft structures. A more in-depth understanding of aircraft structures and controls can be gained through the use of flight simulation software or interactive programs available online through aviation organizations such as the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA. Pilots are also encouraged to subscribe to or review the various aviation periodicals, which contain valuable flying information. As discussed in Chapter 1, the National Air and Space Administration, NASA, and the FAA also offer free information for pilots. End of Part 2 of Chapter 2「Part 1 of Chapter 3 of Pilot's Handbook」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 3 Part 1 Principles of Flight Introduction This chapter examines the fundamental physical laws governing the forces acting on an aircraft in flight. 
and what effect these natural laws and forces have on the performance characteristics of aircraft. To control an aircraft, be it an airplane, helicopter, glider, or balloon, the pilot must understand the principles involved and learn to use or counteract these natural forces. Structure of the Atmosphere The atmosphere is an envelope of air that surrounds the earth and rests upon its surface. It is as much a part of the earth as the seas or the land, but air differs from land and water as it is a mixture of gases. It has mass, weight, and indefinite shape. The atmosphere is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases, such as argon or helium. Some of these elements are heavier than others. The heavier elements, such as oxygen, settle to the surface of the earth, while the lighter elements are lifted up to the region of higher altitude. Most of the atmosphere's oxygen is contained below 35,000 feet altitude. Air, like fluid, is able to flow and change shape when subjected to even minute pressures because it lacks strong molecular cohesion. For example, gas completely fills any container into which it is placed, expanding or contracting to adjust its shape to the limits of the container. Atmospheric Pressure Although there are various kinds of pressure, pilots are mainly concerned with atmospheric pressure. It is one of the basic factors in weather changes, helps to lift an aircraft, and actuates some of the important flight instruments. These instruments are the altimeter, airspeed indicator, vertical speed indicator, and manifold pressure gauge. Air is very light, but it has mass and is affected by the attraction of gravity. Therefore, like any other substance, it has weight. And because of its weight, it has force. Since it is a fluid substance, this force is exerted equally in all directions, and its effect on bodies within the air is called pressure. Under standard conditions at sea level, the average pressure exerted by the weight of the atmosphere is approximately 14.70 pounds per square inch, PSI, of surface, or 1,013.2 millibars, MB. Its thickness is limited. Therefore, the higher the altitude, the less air there is above. For this reason, the weight of the atmosphere at 18,000 feet is one-half what it is at sea level. The pressure of the atmosphere varies with time and location. Due to the changing atmospheric pressure, a standard reference was developed. The standard atmosphere at sea level is a surface temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit, or 15 degrees Celsius, and a surface pressure of 29.92 inches of mercury inches Hg, or 1,013.2 Mb. See figure 3-1. A standard temperature lapse rate is one in which the temperature decreases at the rate of approximately 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, or 2 degrees Celsius per thousand feet up to 36,000 feet, which is approximately negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 55 degrees Celsius. Above this point, the temperature is considered constant up to 80,000 feet. A standard pressure lapse rate is one in which the pressure decreases at a rate of approximately 1 inch of mercury per 1,000 feet of altitude gain to 10,000 feet. See figure 3-2. 
the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, has established this as a worldwide standard, and it is often referred to as International Standard Atmosphere, ISA, or ICAO Standard Atmosphere. Any temperature or pressure that differs from the standard lapse rates is considered non-standard temperature and pressure. Since aircraft performance is compared and evaluated with respect to the standard atmosphere, all aircraft instruments are calibrated for the standard atmosphere. In order to account properly for the non-standard atmosphere, certain related terms must be defined. Pressure altitude Pressure altitude is the height above a standard datum plane, SDP, which is a theoretical level where the weight of the atmosphere is 29.92 inches of mercury, 1013.2 MB, as measured by a barometer. An altimeter is essentially a sensitive barometer calibrated to indicate altitude in the standard atmosphere. If the altimeter is set for 29.92 inches of mercury, SDP, the altitude indicated is the pressure altitude. As atmospheric pressure changes, the SDP may be below, at, or above sea level. Pressure altitude is important as a basis for determining airplane performance, as well as for assigning flight levels to airplanes operating at or above 18,000 feet. The pressure altitude can be determined by either of two methods. 1. Setting the barometric scale of the altimeter to 29.92 and reading the indicated altitude. 2. Applying a correction factor to the indicated altitude according to the reported altimeter setting. Density altitude. SDP is a theoretical pressure altitude, but aircraft operate in a non-standard atmosphere and the term density altitude is used for correlating aerodynamic performance in the non-standard atmosphere. Density altitude is the vertical distance above sea level in the standard atmosphere at which a given density is to be found. The density of air has significant effects on the aircraft's performance because as air becomes less dense, it reduces power because the engine takes in less air, thrust because a propeller is less efficient in thin air, lift because the thin air exerts less force on the airfoils. Density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. As the density of the air increases, lower density altitude, aircraft performance increases, and conversely, as air density decreases, higher density altitude, aircraft performance decreases. A decrease in air density means a higher density altitude. An increase in air density means a lower density altitude. Density altitude is used in calculating aircraft performance because under standard atmospheric conditions, air at each level in the atmosphere not only has a specific density, its pressure altitude and density altitude identify the same level. The computation of density altitude involves consideration of pressure, pressure altitude, and temperature. Since aircraft performance data at any level is based upon air density under standard day conditions, such performance data apply to air density levels that may not be identical with altimeter indications. Under conditions higher or lower than standard, these levels cannot be determined directly from the altimeter. 
density altitude is determined by first finding pressure altitude and then correcting this altitude for non-standard temperature variations. Since density varies directly with pressure and inversely with temperature, a given pressure altitude may exist for a wide range of temperature by allowing the density to vary. However, a known density occurs for any one temperature and pressure altitude. The density of the air has a pronounced effect on aircraft and engine performance. Regardless of the actual altitude at which the aircraft is operating, it will perform as though it were operating at an altitude equal to the existing density altitude. Air density is affected by changes in altitude, temperature, and humidity. High density altitude refers to thin air, while low density altitude refers to dense air. The conditions that result in a high density altitude are high elevations, low atmospheric pressures, high temperatures, high humidity, or some combination of these factors. Lower elevations, high atmospheric pressure, low temperatures, and low humidity are more indicative of low density altitude. Effect of pressure on density. Since air is a gas, it can be compressed or expanded. When air is compressed, a greater amount of air can occupy a given volume. Conversely, when pressure on a given volume of air is decreased, the air expands and occupies a greater space. At a lower pressure, the original column of air contains a smaller mass of air. The density is decreased because density is directly proportional to pressure. If the pressure is doubled, the density is doubled. If the pressure is lowered, the density is lowered. This statement is true only at a constant temperature. Effect of temperature on density. Increasing the temperature of a substance decreases its density. Conversely, decreasing the temperature increases the density. Thus, the density of air varies inversely with temperature. This statement is true only at a constant pressure. In the atmosphere, both temperature and pressure decrease with altitude and have conflicting effects upon density. However, the fairly rapid drop in pressure as altitude is increased usually has the dominating effect. Hence, pilots can expect the density to decrease with altitude. Effect of humidity, moisture, on density. The preceding paragraphs refer to air that is perfectly dry. In reality, it is never completely dry. The small amount of water vapor suspended in the atmosphere may be almost negligible under certain conditions. But in other conditions, humidity may become an important factor in the performance of an aircraft. Water vapor is lighter than air. Consequently, moist air is lighter than dry air. Therefore, as the water content of the air increases, the air becomes less dense, increasing density altitude and decreasing performance. It is lightest or least dense when, in a given set of conditions, it contains the maximum amount of water vapor. Humidity, also called relative humidity, refers to the amount of water vapor contained in the atmosphere and is expressed as a percentage of the maximum amount of water vapor the air can hold. This amount varies with temperature. Warm air holds more water vapor, while colder air holds less. Perfectly dry air 
that contains no water vapor has a relative humidity of 0%, while saturated air, which cannot hold any more water vapor, has a relative humidity of 100%. Humidity alone is usually not considered an important factor in calculating density altitude and aircraft performance, but it does contribute. As temperature increases, the air can hold greater amounts of water vapor. When comparing two separate air masses, the first warm and moist, both qualities tending to lighten the air, and the second cold and dry, both qualities making it heavier. The first must be less dense than the second. Pressure, temperature, and humidity have a great influence on aircraft performance because of their effect upon density. There are no rules of thumb that can be easily conveyed, but the effect of humidity can be determined using online formulas. In the first case, the pressure is needed at the altitude for which density altitude is being sought. Using figure 3-2, select the barometric pressure closest to the associated altitude. As an example, the pressure at 8,000 feet is 22.22 inches of mercury. Using the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA website http colon slash slash www.srh.noaa.gov slash elp slash wxcalc slash density altitude dot html for density altitude enter the twenty two point two two for 8,000 feet in the station pressure window, entering a temperature of 80 degrees and a dew point of 75 degrees. The result is a density altitude of 11,564 feet. With no humidity, the density altitude would be almost 500 feet lower. Another site, HTTP colon slash slash w-a-h-i-d-u-d-d-i-n dot net slash c-a-l-c slash density underscore altitude dot h-t-m provides a more straightforward method of determining the effect of humidity on density altitude without using additional interpretive charts. In any case, the effects of humidity on density altitude include a decrease in overall performance in high humidity conditions. Theories in the Production of Lift Newton's Basic Laws of Motion The formulation of lift has historically been the adaptation over the past few centuries of basic physical laws. These laws, although seemingly applicable to all aspects of lift, do not answer how lift is formulated. In fact, one must consider the many airfoils that are symmetrical, yet produce significant lift. The fundamental physical laws governing the forces acting upon an aircraft in flight were adopted from postulated theories developed before any human successfully flew an aircraft. The use of these physical laws grew out of the scientific revolution, which began in Europe in the 1600s. Driven by the belief the universe operated in a predictable manner, open to human understanding, many philosophers, mathematicians, natural scientists, and inventors spent their lives unlocking the secrets of the universe. One of the best known was Sir Isaac Newton, who not only formulated the law of universal gravitation, but also described the three basic laws of motion. Newton's First Law 
every object persists in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line, unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed on it. This means that nothing starts or stops moving until some outside force causes it to do so. An aircraft at rest on the ramp remains at rest until a force strong enough to overcome its inertia is applied. Once it is moving, its inertia keeps it moving, subject to the various other forces acting on it. These forces may add to its motion, slow it down, or change its direction. Newton's Second Law Force is equal to the change in momentum per change in time. For a constant mass, force equals mass times acceleration. When a body is acted upon by a constant force, its resulting acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the body, and is directly proportional to the applied force. This takes into account the factors involved in overcoming Newton's first law. It covers both changes in direction and speed, including starting up from rest, positive acceleration, and coming to a stop, negative acceleration or deceleration. Newton's Third Law For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In an airplane, the propeller moves and pushes back the air. Consequently, the air pushes the propeller, and thus the airplane, in the opposite direction, forward. In a jet airplane, the engine pushes a blast of hot gases backward. The force of equal and opposite reaction pushes against the engine and forces the airplane forward. Magnus Effect In 1852, the German physicist and chemist Heinrich Gustav Magnus, 1802-1870, made experimental studies of the aerodynamic forces on spinning spheres and cylinders. The effect had already been mentioned by Newton in 1672, apparently in regard to spheres or tennis balls. These experiments led to the discovery of the Magnus effect, which helps explain the theory of lift. Flow of air against a non-rotating cylinder if air flows against a cylinder that is not rotating, the flow of air above and below the cylinder is identical, and so the forces are the same. Figure 3-3a A rotating cylinder in a motionless fluid In figure 3-3b, the cylinder is rotated clockwise and observed from the side while immersed in a fluid. The rotation of the cylinder affects the fluid surrounding the cylinder. The flow around the rotating cylinder differs from the flow around the stationary cylinder due to resistance caused by two factors, viscosity and friction. Viscosity Viscosity is the property of a fluid or semi-fluid that causes it to resist flowing. This resistance to flow is measurable due to the molecular tendency of fluids to adhere to each other to some extent. High-viscosity fluids resist flow. Low-viscosity fluids flow easily. Similar amounts of oil and water poured down two identical ramps demonstrate the difference in viscosity. The water seems to flow freely, while the oil flows much more slowly. An excellent website to demonstrate types of viscosity is found at the Cornell University website on viscosity, located at http colon slash slash www.geo.cornell.edu slash hawaii slash 220 slash PRI slash viscosity 
www.mtbrain.html. Since molecular resistance to motion underlies viscosity, grease is very viscous because its molecules resist flow. Hot lava is another example of a viscous fluid. All fluids are viscous and have a resistance to flow whether this resistance is observed or not. Air is an example of a fluid whose viscosity cannot be observed. Since air has viscosity properties, it will resist flow to some extent. In the case of a rotating cylinder within an immersed fluid, oil, water, or air, the fluid, no matter what it is, resists flowing over the cylinder's surface. Friction Friction is the second factor at work when a fluid flows around a rotating cylinder. Friction is the resistance one surface or object encounters when moving over another and exists between a fluid and the surface over which it flows. If identical fluids are poured down the ramp, they flow in the same manner and at the same speed. If one ramp's surface is coated with small pebbles, the flow down the two ramps differs significantly. The rough surface ramp impedes the flow of the fluid due to resistance from the surface, friction. It is important to remember that all surfaces no matter how smooth they appear, are not smooth and impede the flow of a fluid. Both the surface of a wing and the rotating cylinder have a certain roughness, albeit at a microscopic level, causing resistance for a fluid to flow. This reduction in velocity of the airflow about a surface is caused by skin friction or drag. When passing over a surface, molecules actually adhere, stick, cling to the surface, illustrated by the rotating cylinder in a fluid that is not moving. Thus, 1. In the case of the rotating cylinder, air particles near the surface that resist motion have a relative velocity near zero. The roughness of the surface impedes their motion. 2. Due to the viscosity of the fluid, the molecules on the surface entrain or pull the surrounding flow above it in the direction of rotation due to the adhesion of the fluid to itself. There is also a difference in flow around the rotating cylinder and in flow around a non-rotating cylinder. The molecules at the surface of the rotating cylinder are not in motion relative to the cylinder. They are moving clockwise with the cylinder. Due to viscosity, these molecules entrain others above them, resulting in an increase in fluid flow in the clockwise direction. Substituting air for other fluids results in a higher velocity of air movement above the cylinder, simply because more molecules are moving in a clockwise direction. A rotating cylinder in a moving fluid. When the cylinder rotates in a fluid that is also moving, the result is a higher circulatory flow in the direction of the rotating cylinder. See figure 3-3C. By adding fluid motion, the magnitude of the flow increases. The highest differences of velocity are 90 degrees from the relative motion between the cylinder and the airflow. Additionally, as shown in figure 3-4, at point A, a stagnation point exists where the air stream impacts, impinges, on the front of the airfoil surface and splits. Some air goes over and some under. Another stagnation point exists at B, where the two airstreams rejoin and resume at identical velocities. 
when viewed from the side, an upwash is created ahead of the airfoil and downwash at the rear. In the case of figure 3-4, the highest velocity is at the top of the airfoil with the lowest velocity at the bottom. Because these velocities are associated with an object, in this case an airfoil, they are called local velocities as they do not exist outside the lift producing system, in this case an airfoil. This concept can be readily applied to a wing or other lifting surface. Because there is a difference of velocity above and below the wing, the result is a higher pressure at the bottom of the wing and a lower pressure on the top of the wing. This low pressure area produces an upward force known as the Magnus effect. The physical phenomenon whereby an object's rotation affects its path through a fluid, to include air. Two early aerodynamicists, Martin Kutta and Nikolai Joukowsky, eventually measured and calculated the forces for the lift equation on a rotating cylinder, the kutta joukowsky theorem. To summarize the Magnus effect, an airfoil with a positive angle of attack, AOA, develops air circulation about the upper surface of the wing. Its sharp trailing edges forces the rear stagnation point to be aft of the trailing edge, while the front stagnation point falls below the leading edge. See figure 3-4. Bernoulli's Principles of Differential Pressure A half century after Newton formulated his laws, Daniel Bernoulli, a Swiss mathematician, explained how the pressure of a moving fluid, liquid or gas, varies with its speed of motion. Bernoulli's principle states that as the velocity of a moving fluid, liquid or gas, increases, the pressure within the fluid decreases. This principle explains what happens to air passing over the curved top of the airplane wing. A practical application of Bernoulli's principle is the Venturi tube. The Venturi tube has an air inlet that narrows to a throat, constricted point, and an outlet section that increases in diameter toward the rear. The diameter of the outlet is the same as that of the inlet. At the throat, the airflow speeds up and the pressure decreases. At the outlet, the airflow slows and the pressure increases. See figure 3-5. Since air is recognized as a body, and it is accepted that it must follow the above laws, one can begin to see how and why an airplane wing develops lift. As the wing moves through the air, the flow of air across the curved top surface increases in velocity, creating a low pressure area. Although Newton, Magnus, Bernoulli, and hundreds of other early scientists who studied the physical laws of the universe did not have the sophisticated laboratories available today. They provided great insight to the contemporary viewpoint of how lift is created. End of Part 1 of Chapter 3《Part Two of Chapter Three of Pilot's Handbook》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge》by the FAA《Chapter Three, Part Two Airfoil Design》An airfoil is a structure 
designed to obtain reaction upon its surface from the air through which it moves, or that moves past such a structure. Air acts in various ways when submitted to different pressures and velocities. But this discussion is confined to the parts of an aircraft that a pilot is most concerned with in flight. Namely, the airfoils designed to produce lift. By looking at a typical airfoil profile, such as the cross-section of a wing, one can see several obvious characteristics of design. See figure 3-6. Notice that there is a difference in the curvatures, called cambers, of the upper and lower surfaces of the airfoil. The camber of the upper surface is more pronounced than that of the lower surface, which is usually somewhat flat. Note, the two extremities of the airfoil profile also differ in appearance. The end, which faces forward in flight, is called the leading edge, and is rounded. The other end, the trailing edge, is quite narrow and tapered. A reference line often used in discussing the airfoil is the cord line, a straight line drawn through the profile connecting the extremities of the leading and trailing edges. The distance from this cord line to the upper and lower surfaces of the wing denotes the magnitude of the upper and lower camber at any point. Another reference line, drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge, is the mean camber line. This mean line is equidistant at all points from the upper and lower surfaces. An airfoil is constructed in such a way that its shape takes advantage of the air's response to certain physical laws. This develops two actions from the air mass a positive pressure lifting action from the air mass below the wing, and a negative pressure lifting action from lowered pressure above the wing. As the air stream strikes the relatively flat lower surface of a wing or roller blade when inclined at a small angle to its direction of motion, the air is forced to rebound downward, causing an upward reaction in positive lift. At the same time, the airstream striking the upper curved section of the leading edge is deflected upward. An airfoil is shaped to cause an action on the air and forces air downward, which provides an equal reaction from the air, forcing the airfoil upward. If a wing is constructed in such a form that it causes a lift force greater than the weight of the aircraft, the aircraft will fly. If all the lift required were obtained merely from the deflection of air from the lower surface of the wing, an aircraft would only need a flat wing like a kite. However, the balance of the lift needed to support the aircraft comes from the flow of air above the wing. Herein lies the key to flight. It is neither accurate nor useful to assign specific values to the percentage of lift generated by the upper surface of an airfoil versus that generated by the lower surface. These are not constant values and vary, not only with flight conditions, but also with different wing designs. Different airfoils have different flight characteristics. Many thousands of airfoils have been tested in wind tunnels and in actual flight, but no one airfoil has been found that satisfies every flight requirement. The weight, speed, and purpose of each aircraft dictate the shape of its airfoil. The most efficient airfoil for producing the greatest lift is one that has a concave or scooped out lower surface. As a fixed design, this type of airfoil sacrifices too much speed while producing lift and is not suitable for high-speed flight. 
Advancements in engineering have made it possible for today's high-speed jets to take advantage of the concave airfoil's high lift characteristics. Leading edge, Kruger, flaps, and trailing edge, Fowler, flaps, when extended from the basic wing structure, literally change the airfoil shape into the classic concave form, thereby generating much greater lift during slow flight conditions. On the other hand, an airfoil that is perfectly streamlined and offers little wind resistance sometimes does not have enough lifting power to take the airplane off the ground. Thus, modern airplanes have airfoils that strike a medium between extremes in design. The shape varies according to the needs of the airplane for which it is designed. Figure 3-7 shows some of the more common airfoil sections. Low pressure above. In a wind tunnel or in flight, an airfoil is simply a streamlined object inserted into a moving stream of air. If the airfoil profile were in the shape of a teardrop, the speed and the pressure changes of the air passing over the top and bottom would be the same on both sides. But if the teardrop-shaped airfoil were cut in half lengthwise, a form resembling the basic airfoil, wing, section would result. If the airfoil were then inclined so the airflow strikes it at an angle, angle of attack, AOA, the air moving over the upper surface would be forced to move faster than the air moving along the bottom of the airfoil. This increased velocity reduces the pressure above the airfoil. Applying Bernoulli's principle of pressure, the increase in the speed of the air across the top of an airfoil produces a drop in pressure. This lowered pressure is a component of total lift. The pressure difference between the upper and lower surface of a wing alone does not account for the total lift force produced. The downward-backward flow from the top surface of an airfoil creates a downwash. This downwash meets the flow from the bottom of the airfoil at the trailing edge. Applying Newton's third law, the reaction of this downward-backward flow results in an upward-forward force on the airfoil. High pressure below. A certain amount of lift is generated by pressure conditions underneath the airfoil. Because of the manner in which air flows underneath the airfoil, a positive pressure results, particularly at higher angles of attack. But there is another aspect to this airflow that must be considered. At a point close to the leading edge, the airflow is virtually stopped, stagnation point and then gradually increases speed. At some point near the trailing edge, it again reaches a velocity equal to that on the upper surface. In conformance with Bernoulli's principle, where the airflow was slowed beneath the airfoil, a positive upward pressure was created. That is, as the fluid speed decreases, the pressure must increase. Since the pressure differential between the upper and lower surface of the airfoil increases, total lift increases. Both Bernoulli's principle and Newton's laws are in operation whenever lift is being generated by an airfoil. Pressure Distribution From experiments conducted on wind tunnel models and on full-size airplanes, it has been determined that as air flows along the surface of a wing at different angles of attack, there are regions along the surface where the pressure is negative or less than atmospheric and regions where the pressure is positive or greater than atmospheric. This negative pressure on the upper surface creates a relatively larger force on the wing 
and is caused by the positive pressure resulting from the air striking the lower wing surface. Figure 3-8 shows the pressure distribution along an airfoil at three different angles of attack. The average of the pressure variation for any given angle of attack is referred to as the center of pressure, CP. Aerodynamic force acts through this CP. At high angles of attack, CP moves forward, while at low angles of attack, the CP moves aft. In the design of wing structures, this CP travel is very important since it affects the position of the air loads imposed on the wing structure in both low and high AOA conditions. An airplane's aerodynamic balance and controllability are governed by changes in the CP. Airfoil Behavior Although specific examples can be cited in which each of the principles predict and contribute to the formation of lift, Lift is a complex subject. The production of lift is much more complex than a simple differential pressure between upper and lower airfoil surfaces. In fact, many lifting airfoils do not have an upper surface longer than the bottom, as in the case of symmetrical airfoils. They are seen in high-speed aircraft having symmetrical wings or on symmetrical rotor blades for many helicopters whose upper and lower surfaces are identical. In both examples, the relationship of the airfoil with the oncoming airstream, angle, is all that is different. A paper airplane, which is simply a flat plate, has a bottom and top exactly the same shape and length. Yet these airfoils do produce lift and flow turning is partly or fully responsible for creating lift. As an airfoil moves through the air, the airfoil is inclined against the airflow, producing a different flow caused by the airfoil's relationship to the oncoming air. Think of a hand being placed outside the car window at a high speed. If the hand is inclined in one direction or another, the hand will move upward or downward. This is caused by deflection, which in turn causes the air to turn about the object within the airstream. As a result of this change, the velocity about the object changes in both magnitude and direction, in turn resulting in a measurable velocity force and direction. A third dimension. To this point, the discussion has centered on the flow across the upper and lower surfaces of an airfoil. While most of the lift is produced by these two dimensions, a third dimension, the tip of the airfoil, also has an aerodynamic effect. The high pressure area on the bottom of an airfoil pushes around the tip to the low pressure area on the top. See figure 3-9. This action creates a rotating flow called a tip vortex. The vortex flows behind the airfoil, creating a downwash that extends back to the trailing edge of the airfoil. This downwash results in an overall reduction in lift for the affected portion of the airfoil. Manufacturers have developed different methods to counteract this action. Winglets can be added to the tip of an airfoil to reduce this flow. The winglets act as a dam preventing the vortex from forming. Winglets can be on the top or bottom of the airfoil. Another method of countering the flow is to taper the airfoil tip, reducing the pressure differential and smoothing the airflow around the tip. Chapter Summary Modern general aviation aircraft have what may be considered high-performance characteristics. Therefore, it is increasingly necessary 
that pilots appreciate and understand the principles upon which the art of flying is based. For additional information on the principles discussed in this chapter, visit the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Beginner's Guide to Aerodynamics at http colon slash slash www.grc.nasa.gov slash www slash k dash one two slash airplane slash index dot html End of Part Two of Chapter Three Recording by Jairus Amar Part One of Chapter Four of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 4, Part 1 Aerodynamics of Flight Forces Acting on the Aircraft Thrust, Drag, Lift, and Weight are forces that act upon all aircraft in flight. Understanding how these forces work and knowing how to control them with the use of power and flight controls are essential to flight. This chapter discusses the aerodynamics of flight, how design, weight, load factors, and gravity affect an aircraft during flight maneuvers. The four forces acting on an aircraft in straight and level unaccelerated flight are thrust, drag, lift, and weight. They are defined as follows. Thrust. The forward force produced by the power plant slash propeller or roller. It opposes or overcomes the force of drag. As a general rule, it acts parallel to the longitudinal axis. However, this is not always the case, as explained later. Drag A rearward retarding force caused by disruption of airflow by the wing, rotor, fuselage, and other protruding objects. Drag opposes thrust and acts rearward parallel to the relative wind. Weight The combined load of the aircraft itself, the crew, the fuel, and the cargo or baggage. Weight pulls the aircraft downward because of the force of gravity. It opposes lift and acts vertically downward through the aircraft's center of gravity. C.G. Lift Opposes the downward force of weight Is produced by the dynamic effect of the air acting on the airfoil and acts perpendicular to the flight path through the center of lift. In steady flight, the sum of these opposing forces is always zero. There can be no unbalanced forces in steady, straight flight based upon Newton's third law, which states that for every action or force there is an equal but opposite reaction or force. This is true whether flying level or when climbing or descending. It does not mean the four forces are equal. It means the opposing forces are equal to, and thereby cancel, the effects of each other. In Figure 4-1, the force vectors of thrust, drag, lift, and weight appear to be equal in value. The usual explanation states, without stipulating that thrust and drag do not equal weight and lift, that thrust equals drag and lift equals weight. Although basically true, this statement can be misleading. 
it should be understood that in straight, level, unaccelerated flight, it is true that the opposing lift slash weight forces are equal. They are also greater than the opposing forces of thrust slash drag that are equal only to each other. Therefore, in steady flight, the sum of all upward forces, not just lift, equals the sum of all downward forces, not just weight. The sum of all forward forces, not just thrust, equals the sum of all backward forces, not just drag. This refinement of the old thrust equals drag, lift equals weight formula, explains that a portion of thrust is directed upward in climbs, and acts as if it were lift, while a portion of weight is directed backward and acts as if it were drag. See figure 4-2 and errata. In glides, a portion of the weight vector is directed forward, and therefore acts as thrust. In other words, any time the flight path of the aircraft is not horizontal, lift, weight, thrust, and drag vectors must each be broken down into two components. Discussions of the preceding concepts are frequently omitted in aeronautical texts slash handbooks slash manuals. The reason is not that they are inconsequential, but because the main ideas with respect to the aerodynamic forces acting upon an airplane in flight can be presented in their most essential elements without being involved in the technicalities of the aerodynamicist. In point of fact, considering only level flight and normal climbs and glides in a steady state, it is still true that lift provided by the wing or roller is the primary upward force, and weight is the primary downward force. By using the aerodynamic forces of thrust, drag, lift, and weight, pilots can fly a controlled, safe flight. A more detailed discussion of these forces follows. Thrust For an aircraft to move, thrust must be exerted and be greater than drag. The aircraft will continue to move and gain speed until thrust and drag are equal. In order to maintain a constant airspeed, thrust and drag must remain equal, just as lift and weight must be equal to maintain a constant altitude. If in level flight the engine power is reduced, the thrust is lessened, and the aircraft slows down. As long as the thrust is less than the drag, the aircraft continues to decelerate until its airspeed is insufficient to support it in the air. Likewise, if the engine power is increased, thrust becomes greater than drag and the airspeed increases. As long as the thrust continues to be greater than the drag, the aircraft continues to accelerate. When drag equals thrust, the aircraft flies at a constant airspeed. Straight and level flight may be sustained at a wide range of speeds. The pilot coordinates angle of attack, AOA, the acute angle between the cord line of the airfoil and the direction of the relative wind, and thrust in all speed regimes if the aircraft is to be held in level flight. Roughly, these regimes can be grouped in three categories, low-speed flight, cruising flight, and high-speed flight. When the airspeed is low, the AOA must be relatively high if the balance between lift and weight is to be maintained. See figure 4-3. If thrust decreases and airspeed decreases, 
lift becomes less than weight, and the aircraft starts to descend. To maintain level flight, the pilot can increase the AOA an amount which will generate a lift force again equal to the weight of the aircraft. While the aircraft will be flying more slowly, it will still maintain level flight if the pilot has properly coordinated thrust and AOA. Straight and level flight in the slow speed regime provides some interesting conditions relative to the equilibrium of forces, because with the aircraft in a nose-high attitude, there is a vertical component of thrust that helps support it. For one thing, wing loading tends to be less than would be expected. Most pilots are aware that an airplane will stall, other conditions being equal, at a slower speed with the power on than with the power off. Induced airflow over the wings from the propeller also contributes to this. However, if analysis is restricted to the four forces as they are usually defined during slow speed flight, the thrust is equal to drag and lift is equal to weight. During straight and level flight, when thrust is increased and the airspeed increases, the AOA must be decreased. That is, if changes have been coordinated, the aircraft will remain in level flight, but at a higher speed when the proper relationship between thrust and AOA is established. If the AOA were not coordinated, decreased, with an increase of thrust, the aircraft would climb. But decreasing the AOA modifies the lift, keeping it equal to the weight, and the aircraft remains in level flight. Level flight at even slightly negative AOA is possible at very high speed. It is evident, then, that level flight can be performed with any AOA between stalling angle and the relatively small negative angles found at high speed. Some aircraft have the ability to change the direction of the thrust rather than changing the AOA. This is accomplished either by pivoting the engines or by vectoring the exhaust gases. See figure 4-4. Drag. Drag is the force that resists movement of an aircraft through the air. There are two basic types, parasite drag and induced drag. The first is called parasite because it in no way functions to aid flight, while the second, induced drag, is a result of airfoil developing lift. Parasite drag. Parasite drag is comprised of all the forces that work to slow an aircraft's movement. As the term parasite implies, it is the drag that is not associated with the production of lift. This includes the displacement of the air by the aircraft, turbulence generated in the airstream, or a hindrance of air moving over the surface of the aircraft and airfoil. There are three types of parasite drag, form drag, interference drag, and skin friction. Form drag. Form drag is the portion of parasite drag generated by the aircraft due to its shape and airflow around it. Examples include the engine's cowlings, antennas, and the aerodynamic shape of other components. When the air has to separate to move around a moving aircraft and its components, it eventually rejoins after passing the body. How quickly and smoothly it rejoins is representative of the resistance that it creates which requires additional force to overcome. See figure 4-5. Notice how the flat plate 
in figure 4-5 causes the air to swirl around the edges until it eventually rejoins downstream. Form drag is the easiest to reduce when designing an aircraft. The solution is to streamline as many of the parts as possible. Interference drag Interference drag comes from the intersection of airstreams that create eddy currents, turbulence, or restricts smooth airflow. For example, the intersection of the wing and the fuselage at the wing root has significant interference drag. Air flowing around the fuselage collides with air flowing over the wing, merging into a current of air different from the two original currents. The most interference drag is observed when two surfaces meet at perpendicular angles. Fairings are used to reduce this tendency. If a jet fighter carries two identical wing tanks, the overall drag is greater than the sum of the individual tanks because both of these create and generate interference drag. Fairings and distance between lifting surfaces and external components, such as radar antennas hung from wings, reduce interference drag. See figure 4-6. Skin friction drag. Skin friction drag is the aerodynamic resistance due to the contact of moving air with the surface of an aircraft. Every surface, no matter how apparently smooth, has a rough, ragged surface when viewed under a microscope. The air molecules, which come in direct contact with the surface of the wing, are virtually motionless. Each layer of molecules above the surface moves slightly faster until the molecules are moving at the velocity of the air moving around the aircraft. This speed is called the free stream velocity. The air between the wing and the free stream velocity level is about as wide as a playing card, and is called the boundary layer. At the top of the boundary layer, the molecules increase velocity and move at the same speed as the molecules outside the boundary layer. The actual speed at which the molecules move depends upon the shape of the wing. The viscosity, stickiness, of the air through which the wing or airfoil is moving, and its compressibility, how much it can be compacted. The airflow outside the boundary layer reacts to the shape of the edge of the boundary layer, just as it would to the physical surface of an object. The boundary layer gives any object an effective shape that is usually slightly different from the physical shape. The boundary layer may also separate from the body, thus creating an effective shape much different from the physical shape of the object. This change in the physical shape of the boundary layer causes a dramatic decrease in lift and an increase in drag. When this happens, the airfoil has stalled. In order to reduce the effect of skin friction drag, Aircraft designers utilize flush mount rivets and remove any irregularities which may protrude above the wing surface. In addition, a smooth and glossy finish aids in transition of air across the surface of the wing. Since dirt on an aircraft disrupts the free flow of air and increases drag, keep the surfaces of the aircraft clean and waxed. Induced drag. The second basic type of drag is induced drag. It is an established physical fact that no system that does work in the mechanical sense can be 100% efficient. This means that whatever the nature of the system, 
the required work is obtained at the expense of certain additional work that is dissipated or lost in the system. The more efficient the system, the smaller this loss. In level flight, the aerodynamic properties of a wing or roller produce a required lift, but this can be obtained only at the expense of a certain penalty. The name given to this penalty is induced drag. Induced drag is inherent whenever an airfoil is producing lift and, in fact, this type of drag is inseparable from the production of lift. Consequently, it is always present if lift is produced. An airfoil, wing or rotor blade, produces the lift force by making use of the energy of the free airstream. Whenever an airfoil is producing lift, the pressure on the lower surface of it is greater than that of the upper surface, Bernoulli's principle. As a result, the air tends to flow from the high-pressure area below the wingtip upward to the low-pressure area on the upper surface. In the vicinity of the tips, there is a tendency for these pressures to equalize resulting in a lateral flow outward from the underside to the upper surface. This lateral flow imparts a rotational velocity to the air at the tips, creating vortices, which trail behind the airfoil. When the aircraft is viewed from the tail, these vortices circulate counterclockwise about the right tip and clockwise about the left tip. Figure 4-7 Bearing in mind the direction of rotation of these vortices, it can be seen that they induce an upward flow of air beyond the tip, and a downwash flow behind the wing's trailing edge. This induced downwash has nothing in common with the downwash that is necessary to produce lift. It is, in fact, the source of induced drag. The greater the size and strength of the vortices and consequent downwash component on the net airflow over the airfoil, the greater the induced drag effect becomes. This downwash over the top of the airfoil at the tip has the same effect as bending the lift vector rearward. Therefore, the lift is slightly aft of perpendicular to the relative wind, creating a rearward lift component. This is induced drag. In order to create a greater negative pressure on the top of an airfoil, the airfoil can be inclined to a higher AOA. If the AOA of a symmetrical airfoil were zero, there would be no pressure differential, and consequently, no downwash component and no induced drag. In any case, as AOA increases, induced drag increases proportionally. To state this another way, the lower the airspeed, the greater the AOA required to produce lift equal to the aircraft's weight, and, therefore, the greater induced drag. The amount of induced drag varies inversely with the square of the air speed. Conversely, parasite drag increases as the square of the air speed. Thus, as air speed decreases to near the stalling speed, the total drag becomes greater, due mainly to the sharp rise in induced drag. Similarly, as the airspeed reaches the terminal velocity of the aircraft, the total drag again increases rapidly due to the sharp increase of parasite drag. As seen in figure 4-8, at some given airspeed, total drag is at its minimum amount. 
in figuring the maximum endurance and range of an aircraft, the power required to overcome drag is at a minimum if drag is at a minimum. Lift over drag ratio. Drag is the price paid to obtain lift. The lift to drag ratio, L over D, is the amount of lift generated by a wing or airfoil compared to its drag. A ratio of L over D indicates airfoil efficiency. Aircraft with higher L over D ratios are more efficient than those with lower L over D ratios. In unaccelerated flight with the lift and drag data study, the proportions of the CL and coefficient of drag, CD, can be calculated for specific AOA. See figure 4-9. The L over D ratio is determined by dividing the CL by the CD, which is the same as dividing the lift equation by the drag equation. All terms except coefficients cancel out. L equals lift in pounds. D equals drag. Where L is the lift force in pounds, CL is the lift coefficient. Rho is density expressed in slugs per cubic feet. V is velocity in feet per second. Q is dynamic pressure per square feet. And S is the wing area in square feet. CD equals ratio of drag pressure to dynamic pressure. Typically, at low angles of attack, the drag coefficient is low, and small changes in angle of attack create only slight changes in the drag coefficient. At high angles of attack, small changes in the angle of attack cause significant changes in drag. L equals CL times rho times V squared times S over 2. D equals CD times rho times V squared times S over 2. The above formulas represent the coefficient of lift, CL, and the coefficient of drag, CD, respectively. The shape of an airfoil and other lift-producing devices, for example flaps, affect the production of lift and alter with changes in the AOA. The lift over drag ratio is used to express the relation between lift and drag, and is determined by dividing the lift coefficient by the drag coefficient, CL over CD. Notice in figure 4-9 and errata that the lift curve, red, reaches its maximum for this particular wing section at 20 degrees AOA, and then rapidly decreases. 20 degrees AOA is therefore the stalling angle. The drag curve, yellow, increases very rapidly from 14 AOA and completely overcomes the lift curve at 21 degrees AOA. The lift over drag ratio, green, reaches its maximum at 6 degrees AOA, meaning that at this angle, the most lift is obtained for the least amount of drag. Note that the maximum lift over drag ratio, L over D max, occurs at one specific CL and AOA. If the aircraft is operated in steady flight at L over D max, the total drag is at a minimum. Any AOA lower or higher than that for L over D max reduces the L over D and consequently increases the total drag for a given aircraft's lift. Figure 4-8 depicts the L over D max 
by the lowest portion of the blue line labeled total drag. The configuration of an aircraft has a great effect on the L over D. Weight Gravity is the pulling force that tends to draw all bodies to the center of the Earth. The CG may be considered as a point at which all the weight of the aircraft is concentrated. If the aircraft were supported at its exact CG, it would balance in any attitude. It will be noted that CG is of major importance in an aircraft for its position has a great bearing upon stability. The location of the CG is determined by the general design of each particular aircraft. The designers determine how far the center of pressure, CP, will travel. They then fix the CG forward of the center of pressure for the corresponding flight speed in order to provide an adequate restoring moment to retain flight equilibrium. Weight has a definite relationship to lift. This relationship is simple, but important in understanding the aerodynamics of flying. Lift is the upward force on the wing acting perpendicular to the relative wind. Lift is required to counteract the aircraft's weight which is caused by the force of gravity acting on the mass of the aircraft. This weight, gravity, force, acts downward through the airplane's CG. In stabilized level flight, when the lift force is equal to the weight force, the aircraft is in a state of equilibrium and neither gains nor loses altitude. If lift becomes less than weight, the aircraft loses altitude. When lift is greater than weight, the aircraft gains altitude. Lift The pilot can control lift. Any time the control yoke or stick is moved, fore or aft, the AOA is changed. As the AOA increases, lift increases all other factors being equal. When the aircraft reaches the maximum AOA, lift begins to diminish rapidly. This is the stalling AOA, known as CL max critical AOA. Examine figure 4-9, noting how the CL increases until the critical AOA is reached then decreases rapidly with any further increase in the AOA. Before proceeding further with the topic of lift and how it can be controlled, velocity must be interjected. The shape of the wing or rotor cannot be effective unless it continually keeps attacking new air. If an aircraft is to keep flying, the lift-producing airfoil must keep moving. In a helicopter or gyroplane, this is accomplished by the rotation of the rotor blades. For other types of aircraft, such as airplanes, weight shift control, or gliders, air must be moving across the lifting surface. This is accomplished by the forward speed of the aircraft. Lift is proportional to the square of the aircraft's velocity. For example, an aircraft traveling at 200 knots has four times the lift as the same airplane traveling at 100 knots, if the AOA and other factors remain constant. Actually, an aircraft would not continue to travel in level flight at a constant altitude and maintain the same AOA if the velocity is increased. The lift would increase, and the aircraft would climb as a result of the increased lift force. Therefore, to maintain the lift and weight forces in balance, and to keep the aircraft straight and level, not accelerating upward, 
in a state of equilibrium, as velocity is increased, lift must be decreased. This is normally accomplished by reducing the AOA by lowering the nose. Conversely, as the aircraft is slowed, the decreasing velocity requires increasing the AOA to maintain lift sufficient to maintain flight. There is, of course, a limit to how far the AOA can be increased, if a stall is to be avoided. All other factors being constant, for every AOA there is a corresponding airspeed required to maintain altitude in steady, unaccelerated flight. True only if maintaining level flight. Since an airfoil always stalls at the same AOA, if increasing weight, lift must also be increased. The only method of increasing lift is by increasing velocity if the AOA is held constant just short of the critical or stalling AOA. Lift and drag also vary directly with the density of air. Density is affected by several factors, pressure, temperature, and humidity. At an altitude of 18,000 feet, the density of the air has one half the density of air at sea level. In order to maintain its lift at a higher altitude, an aircraft must fly at a greater true airspeed for any given AOA. Warm air is less dense than cool air, and moist air is less dense than dry air. Thus, on a hot, humid day, an aircraft must be flown at a greater true airspeed for any given AOA than on a cool, dry day. If the density factor is decreased, and so the total lift must equal the total weight to remain in flight, it follows that one of the other factors must be increased. The factor usually increased is the airspeed, or the AOA, because these are controlled directly by the pilot. Lift varies directly with the wing area, provided there is no change in the wing's planform. If the wings have the same proportion and airfoil sections, a wing with a planform area of 200 square feet lifts twice as much as the same AOA as a wing with an area of 100 square feet. Two major aerodynamic factors from the pilot's viewpoint are lift and velocity, because they can be controlled readily and accurately. Of course, the pilot can also control density by adjusting the altitude, and can control wing area if the aircraft happens to have flaps of the type that enlarge wing area. However, for most situations, the pilot controls lift and velocity to maneuver an aircraft. For instance, in straight and level flight, cruising along at a constant altitude, altitude is maintained by adjusting lift to match the aircraft's velocity or cruise airspeed, while maintaining a state of equilibrium in which lift equals weight. In an approach to landing, when the pilot wishes to land as slowly as practical, it is necessary to increase lift to near maximum to maintain lift equal to the weight of the aircraft. End of Part 1 of Chapter 4Part 2 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA 
Chapter 4, Part 2 Wing Tip Vortices Formation of Vortices The action of the airfoil that gives an aircraft lift also causes induced drag. When an airfoil is flown at a positive AOA, a pressure differential exists between the upper and lower surfaces of the airfoil. The pressure above the wing is less than atmospheric pressure, and the pressure below the wing is equal to or greater than atmospheric pressure. Since air always moves from high pressure toward low pressure, and the path of least resistance is toward the airfoil's tips, there is a spanwise movement of air from the bottom of the airfoil outward from the fuselage around the tips. This flow of air results in spillage over the tips, thereby setting up a whirlpool of air called a vortex. See figure 4-10. At the same time, the air on the upper surface has a tendency to flow in toward the fuselage and off the trailing edge. This air current forms a similar vortex at the inboard portion of the trailing edge of the airfoil. But because the fuselage limits the inward flow, the vortex is insignificant. Consequently, the deviation in flow direction is greatest at the outer tips, where the unrestricted lateral flow is the strongest. As the air curls upward around the tip, it combines with the wash to form a fast-spinning trailing vortex. These vortices increase drag because of energy spent in producing the turbulence. Whenever an airfoil is producing lift, induced drag occurs, and wingtip vortices are created. Just as lift increases with an increase in AOA, Induced drag also increases. This occurs because as the AOA is increased, there is a greater pressure difference between the top and bottom of the airfoil, and a greater lateral flow of air. Consequently, this causes more violent vortices to be set up, resulting in more turbulence and more induced drag. In Figure 4-10, it is easy to see the formation of wingtip vortices. The intensity or strength of the vortices is directly proportional to the weight of the aircraft and inversely proportional to the wingspan and speed of the aircraft. The heavier and slower the aircraft, the greater the AOA, and the stronger the wingtip vortices. Thus, an aircraft will create wingtip vortices with maximum strength occurring during the takeoff, climb, and landing phases of flight. These vortices lead to a particularly dangerous hazard to flight, wake turbulence. Avoiding wake turbulence. Wingtip vortices are greatest when the generating aircraft is heavy, clean, and slow. This condition is most commonly encountered during approaches or departures because an aircraft's AOA is at the highest to reduce the lift necessary to land or take off. To minimize the chances of flying through an aircraft's wake turbulence, avoid flying through another aircraft's flight path. Rotate prior to the point at which the preceding aircraft rotated when taking off behind another aircraft. Avoid following another aircraft on a similar flight path at an altitude within 1,000 feet. See figure 4-11. Approach the runway above a preceding aircraft's path when landing behind another aircraft, and touch down after the point at which the other aircraft wheels contacted the runway. See figure 4-12. A hovering helicopter generates a downwash from its main rotors 
similar to the vortices of an airplane. Pilots of small aircraft should avoid a hovering helicopter by at least three roller disc diameters to avoid the effects of this downwash. In forward flight, this energy is transformed into a pair of strong, high-speed trailing vortices, similar to wingtip vortices of larger fixed-wing aircraft. Helicopter vortices should be avoided because helicopter forward flight airspeeds are often very slow and can generate exceptionally strong wake turbulence. Wind is an important factor in avoiding wake turbulence because wingtip vortices drift with the wind at the speed of the wind. For example, a wind speed of 10 knots causes the vortices to drift at about 1,000 feet in a minute in the wind direction. When following another aircraft, a pilot should consider wind speed and direction when selecting an intended takeoff or landing point. If a pilot is unsure of the other aircraft's takeoff or landing point, approximately three minutes provides a margin of safety that allows wake turbulence dissipation. For more information on wake turbulence, see Advisory Circular 90-23. Ground Effect It is possible to fly an aircraft just clear of the ground, or water, at a slightly slower airspeed than that required to sustain level flight at higher altitudes. This is the result of a phenomenon better known of than understood, even by some experienced pilots. When an aircraft in flight comes within several feet of the surface, ground or water, a change occurs in the three-dimensional flow pattern around the aircraft because the vertical component of the airflow around the wing is restricted by the surface. This alters the wing's upwash, downwash, and wingtip vortices. See figure 4-13. Ground effect, then, is due to the interference of the ground or water surface with the airflow patterns about the aircraft in flight. While the aerodynamic characteristics of the tail surfaces and the fuselage are altered by ground effect. The principal effects due to proximity of the ground are the changes in the aerodynamic characteristics of the wing. As the wing encounters ground effect and is maintained at a constant lift coefficient, there is consequent reduction in the upwash, downwash, and wingtip vortices. Induced drag is a result of the airfoil's work of sustaining the aircraft, and a wing or rotor lifts the aircraft simply by accelerating a mass of air downward. It is true that reduced pressure on top of an airfoil is essential to lift, but that is only one of the things contributing to the overall effect of pushing an air mass downward. The more downwash there is, the harder the wing pushes the mass of air down. At high angles of attack, the amount of induced drag is high. Since this corresponds to lower airspeeds in actual flight, it can be said that induced drag predominates at low speed. However, the reduction of the wingtip vortices due to ground effect alters the spanwise lift distribution and reduces the induced AOA and induced drag. Therefore, the wing will require a lower AOA in ground effect to produce the same CL. If a constant AOA is maintained, an increase in CL results. See figure 4-14. Ground effect also alters the thrust required versus velocity. Since induced drag predominates at low speeds, 
the reduction of induced drag due to ground effect will cause the most significant reduction of thrust required. Parasite plus induced drag at low speeds. The reduction in induced flow due to ground effect causes a significant reduction in induced drag, but causes no direct effect on parasite drag. As a result of the reduction in induced drag, the thrust required at low speeds will be reduced. Due to the change in upwash, downwash, and wingtip vortices, there may be a change in position, installation, error, of the airspeed system associated with ground effect. In the majority of cases, ground effect will cause an increase of the local pressure at the static source and produce a lower indication of airspeed and altitude. Thus, an aircraft may be airborne at an indicated airspeed less than that normally required. In order for ground effect to be of significant magnitude, the wing must be quite close to the ground. One of the direct results of ground effect is the variation of induced drag with wing height above the ground at a constant CL. When the wing is at a height equal to its span, the reduction in induced drag is only 1.4%. However, when the wing is at a height equal to one-fourth its span, the reduction in induced drag is 23.5%, and when the wing is at a height equal to one-tenth its span, the reduction in induced drag is 47.6%. Thus, a large reduction in induced drag will take place only when the wing is very close to the ground. Because of this variation, ground effect is most usually recognized during the liftoff for takeoff or just prior to touchdown when landing. During the takeoff phase of flight, ground effect produces some important relationships. An aircraft leaving ground effect after takeoff encounters just the reverse of an aircraft entering ground effect during landing. That is, the aircraft leaving ground effect will require an increase in AOA to maintain the same CL. Experience an increase in induced drag and thrust required. Experience a decrease in stability and a nose-up change in moment. Experience a reduction in static source pressure and increase in indicated airspeed. Ground effect must be considered during takeoffs and landing. For example, if a pilot fails to understand the relationship between the aircraft and ground effect during takeoff, a hazardous situation is possible because the recommended takeoff speed may not be achieved. Due to the reduced drag in ground effect, the aircraft may seem capable of takeoff well below the recommended speed. As the aircraft rises out of ground effect with a deficiency of speed, the greater induced drag may result in marginal initial climb performance. In extreme conditions, such as high gross weight, high density altitude, and high temperature, a deficiency of airspeed during takeoff may permit the aircraft to become airborne, but be incapable of sustaining flight out of ground effect. In this case, the aircraft may become airborne initially with a deficiency of speed, and then settle back to the runway. A pilot should not attempt to force an aircraft to become airborne with a deficiency of speed. The manufacturer's recommended takeoff speed is necessary to provide adequate initial climb performance. 
it is also important that a definite climb be established before a pilot retracts the landing gear or flaps. Never retract the landing gear or flaps prior to establishing a positive rate of climb and only after achieving a safe altitude. If, during the landing phase of flight, the aircraft is brought into ground effect with a constant AOA, the aircraft experiences an increase in CL and a reduction in the thrust required, and a floating effect may occur. Because of the reduced drag and power off deceleration in ground effect, any excess speed at the point of flare may incur a considerable float distance. As the aircraft nears the point of touchdown, ground effect is most realized at altitudes less than the wingspan. During the final phases of the approach, as the aircraft nears the ground, a reduced power setting is necessary, or the reduced thrust required would allow the aircraft to climb above the desired glide path, GP. Axes of an aircraft The axes of an aircraft are three imaginary lines that pass through an aircraft's CG. The axes can be considered as imaginary axles around which the aircraft turns. The three axes pass through the CG at 90 degree angles to each other. The axis from nose to tail is the longitudinal axis. The axis that passes from wingtip to wingtip is the lateral axis, and the axis that passes vertically through the CG is the vertical axis. Whenever an aircraft changes its flight attitude or position in flight, it rotates about one or more of the three axes. See figure 4-15. The aircraft's motion about its longitudinal axis resembles the roll of a ship from side to side. In fact, the names used to describe the motion about an aircraft's three axes were originally nautical terms. They have been adapted to aeronautical terminology due to the similarity of motion of aircraft and seagoing ships. The motion about the aircraft's longitudinal axis is roll. The motion about its lateral axis is pitch. And the motion about its vertical axis is yaw. Yaw is the horizontal, left and right movement of the aircraft's nose. The three motions of the conventional airplane, roll, pitch, and yaw, are controlled by three controlled surfaces. Roll is controlled by the ailerons. Pitch is controlled by the elevators. Yaw is controlled by the rudder. The use of these controls is explained in Chapter 5, Flight Controls. Other types of aircraft may utilize different methods of controlling the movements about the various axes. For example, weight shift control aircraft control two axes, roll and pitch, using an A-frame suspended from the flexible wing attached to a three-wheeled carriage. These aircraft are controlled by moving a horizontal bar, called a control bar, in roughly the same way hang glider pilots fly. See figure 4-16. They are termed weight shift control aircraft because the pilot controls the aircraft by shifting the CG. For more information on weight shift control aircraft, See the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, Weight Shift Control Flying Handbook, FAA-H-8083-5. In the case of powered parachutes, 
aircraft control is accomplished by altering the airfoil via steering lines. A powered parachute wing is a parachute that has a cambered upper surface and a flatter undersurface. The two surfaces are separated by ribs that act as cells, which open to the airflow at the leading edge and have internal ports to allow lateral airflow. The principle at work holds that the cell pressure is greater than the outside pressure, thereby forming a wing that maintains its airfoil shape in flight. The pilot and passenger sit in tandem in front of the engine, which is located at the rear of the vehicle. The airframe is attached to the parachute via two attachment points and lines. Control is accomplished by both power and the changing of the airfoil via the control lines. See figure 4-17. Moment and Moment Arm a study of physics shows that a body that is free to rotate will always turn about its CG. In aerodynamic terms, the mathematical measure of an aircraft's tendency to rotate about its CG is called a moment. A moment is said to be equal to the product of the force applied and to the distance at which the force is applied. A moment arm is the distance from a datum, reference point or line, to the applied force. For aircraft weight and balance computations, moments are expressed in terms of the distance of the arm times the aircraft's weight, or simply, inch-pounds. Aircraft designers locate the fore and aft position of the aircraft's CG is nearly as possible to the 20% point of the mean aerodynamic cord, MAC. If the thrust line is designed to pass horizontally through the CG, it will not cause the aircraft to pitch when power is changed, and there will be no difference in moment due to thrust for a power on or power off condition of flight. Although designers have some control over the location of the drag forces, they are not always able to make the resultant drag forces pass through the CG of the aircraft. However, the one item over which they have the greatest control is the size and location of the tail. The objective is to make the moments, due to thrust, drag, and lift, as small as possible, and, by proper location of the tail, to provide the means of balancing an aircraft longitudinally for any condition of flight. The pilot has no direct control over the location of forces acting on the aircraft in flight, except for controlling the center of lift by changing the AOA. Such a change, however, immediately involves changes in other forces. Therefore, the pilot cannot independently change the location of one force without changing the effect of others. For example, a change in airspeed involves a change in lift, as well as a change in drag and a change in the up or down force on the tail. As forces such as turbulence and gusts act to displace the aircraft, the pilot reacts by providing opposing control forces to counteract this displacement. Some aircraft are subject to changes in the location of the CG with variations of load. Trimming devices are used to counteract the forces set up by fuel burn-off and loading or offloading of passengers or cargo. Elevator trim tabs and adjustable horizontal stabilizers comprise the most common devices provided to the pilot for trimming for load variations. 
over the wide ranges of balance during flight in large aircraft. The force which the pilot has to exert on the controls would become excessive and fatiguing if means of trimming were not provided. End of Part 2 of Chapter 4of chapter four of pilot's handbook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge by the faa chapter four part three Aircraft Design Characteristics Each aircraft handles somewhat differently because each resists or responds to control pressures in its own way. For example, a training aircraft is quick to respond to control applications, while a transport aircraft feels heavy on the controls and responds to control pressures more slowly. These features can be designed into an aircraft to facilitate the particular purpose of the aircraft by considering certain stability and maneuvering requirements. The following discussion summarizes the more important aspects of an aircraft's stability, maneuverability, and controllability qualities, how they are analyzed, and their relationship to various flight conditions. Stability Stability is the inherent quality of an aircraft to correct for conditions that may disturb its equilibrium and to return or to continue on the original flight path. It is primarily an aircraft design characteristic. The flight paths and attitudes an aircraft flies are limited by the aerodynamic characteristics of the aircraft, its propulsion system, and its structural strength. These limitations indicate the maximum performance and maneuverability of the aircraft. If the aircraft is to provide maximum utility, it must be safely controllable to the full extent of these limits without exceeding the pilot's strength or requiring exceptional flying ability. If an aircraft is to fly straight and steady, along any arbitrary flight path, the forces acting on it must be in static equilibrium. The reaction of any body when its equilibrium is disturbed is referred to as stability. The two types of stability are static and dynamic. Static stability Static stability refers to the initial tendency or direction of movement back to equilibrium. In aviation, it refers to the aircraft's initial response when disturbed from a given AOA, slip or bank. Positive Static Stability The initial tendency of the aircraft to return to the original state of equilibrium after being disturbed. See figure 4-18. Neutral Static Stability The initial tendency of the aircraft to remain in a new condition after its equilibrium has been disturbed. See Figure 4-18 Negative Static Stability The initial tendency of the aircraft to continue away from the original state of equilibrium after being disturbed. See Figure 4-18 Dynamic Stability Static stability has been defined as the initial tendency to return to equilibrium that the aircraft displays after being disturbed from its trimmed condition. Occasionally, the initial tendency is different or opposite from the overall tendency, so a distinction must be made between the two. Dynamic Stability refers to the aircraft response over time when disturbed from a given AOA, 
slip, or bank. This type of stability also has three subtypes. See figure 4-19. Positive dynamic stability. Over time, the motion of the displaced object decreases in amplitude and, because it is positive, the object displaced returns toward the equilibrium state. Neutral dynamic stability. Once displaced, the displaced object neither decreases nor increases in amplitude. A worn automobile shock absorber exhibits this tendency. Negative dynamic stability. Over time, the motion of the displaced object increases and becomes more divergent. Stability in an aircraft affects two areas significantly. Maneuverability. The quality of an aircraft that permits it to be maneuvered easily and to withstand the stresses imposed by maneuvers. It is governed by the aircraft's weight, inertia, size and location of flight controls, structural strength, and power plant. It, too, is an aircraft design characteristic. Controllability The capability of an aircraft to respond to the pilot's control, especially with regard to flight path and attitude. It is the quality of an aircraft's response to the pilot's control application when maneuvering the aircraft regardless of its stability characteristics. Longitudinal stability. Pitching. In designing an aircraft, a great deal of effort is spent in developing the desired degree of stability around all three axes. But longitudinal stability about the lateral axis is considered to be the most affected by certain variables in various flight conditions. Longitudinal stability is the quality that makes an aircraft stable about its lateral axis. It involves the pitching motion as the aircraft's nose moves up and down in flight. A longitudinally unstable aircraft has a tendency to dive or climb progressively into a very steep dive or climb, or even a stall. Thus, an aircraft with longitudinal instability becomes difficult and sometimes dangerous to fly. Static longitudinal stability or instability in an aircraft is dependent upon three factors. 1. Location of the wing with respect to the CG. 2. Location of the horizontal tail surfaces with respect to the CG. 3. Area or size of the tail surfaces. In analyzing stability, it should be recalled that a body, free to rotate, always turns about its CG. To obtain static longitudinal stability, the relation of the wing and tail moments must be such that, if the moments are initially balanced and the aircraft is suddenly nose up, the wing moments and tail moments change, so that the sum of their forces provides an unbalanced but restoring moment, which, in turn, brings the nose down again. Similarly, if the aircraft is nose down, the resulting change in moments brings the nose back up. The CL in most asymmetrical airfoils has a tendency to change its fore and aft positions, with a change in the AOA. The CL tends to move forward with an increase in AOA and to move aft with a decrease in AOA. This means that when the AOA of an airfoil is increased, the CL, by moving forward, tends to lift the leading edge of the wing still more. This tendency gives the wing an inherent quality of instability. Note, 
CL is also known as the center of pressure, CP. Figure 4-20 shows an aircraft in straight and level flight. The line CG, CL, T represents the aircraft's longitudinal axis from the CG to a point T on the horizontal stabilizer. Most aircraft are designed so that the wing's CL is to the rear of the CG. This makes the aircraft nose-heavy and requires that there be a slight downward force on the horizontal stabilizer in order to balance the aircraft and keep the nose from continually pitching downward. Compensation for this nose heaviness is provided by setting the horizontal stabilizer at a slight negative AOA. The downward force thus produced holds the tail down, counterbalancing the heavy nose. It is as if the line CG, CL, T were a lever with an upward force at CL, and two downward forces balancing each other, one a strong force at the CG point, and the other a much lesser force at point T, downward air pressure on the stabilizer. To better visualize this physics principle, if an iron bar were suspended at point CL, with a heavy weight hanging on it at the CG, it would take a downward pressure at point T to keep the lever in balance. Even though the horizontal stabilizer may be level when the aircraft is in level flight, there is a downwash of air from the wings. This downwash strikes the top of the stabilizer and produces a downward pressure, which at a certain speed is just enough to balance the lever. The faster the aircraft is flying, the greater this downwash, and the greater the downward force on the horizontal stabilizer, except T-tails. See figure 4-21. In aircraft with fixed position horizontal stabilizers, the aircraft manufacturer sets the stabilizer at an angle that provides the best stability or balance during flight at the design cruising speed and power setting. If the aircraft speed decreases, the speed of the airflow over the wing is decreased. As a result of this decreased flow of air over the wing, the downwash is reduced, causing a lesser downward force on the horizontal stabilizer. In turn, the characteristic nose heaviness is accentuated, causing the aircraft's nose to pitch down more. See figure 4-22. This places the aircraft in a nose-low attitude, lessening the wing's AOA and drag, and allowing the airspeed to increase. As the aircraft continues in the nose-low attitude and its speed increases, the downward force on the horizontal stabilizer is once again increased. Consequently, the tail is again pushed downward and the nose rises into a climbing attitude. As this climb continues, the airspeed again decreases, causing the downward force on the tail to decrease until the nose lowers once more. Because the aircraft is dynamically stable, the nose does not lower as far this time as it did before. The aircraft acquires enough speed in this more gradual dive to start it into another climb, but the climb is not as steep as the preceding one. After several of these diminishing oscillations, in which the nose alternately rises and lowers, the aircraft finally settles down to a speed at which the downward force on the tail exactly counteracts the tendency of the aircraft to dive. When this condition is attained, the aircraft is once again in balanced flight, 
and continues in stabilized flight as long as this attitude and airspeed are not changed. A similar effect is noted upon closing the throttle. The downwash of the wings is reduced, and the force at T in figure 4-20 is not enough to hold the horizontal stabilizer down. It seems as if the force at T on the lever were allowing the force of gravity to pull the nose down. This is a desirable characteristic because the aircraft is inherently trying to regain airspeed and re-establish the proper balance. Power or thrust can also have a destabilizing effect in that an increase of power may tend to make the nose rise. The aircraft designer can offset this by establishing a high thrust line, wherein the line of thrust passes above the CG. Figures 4-23 and 4-24. In this case, as power or thrust is increased, a moment is produced to counteract the down load on the tail. On the other hand, a very low thrust line would tend to add to the nose-up effect of the horizontal tail surface. Conclusion with CG forward of the CL and with an aerodynamic tail down force, the aircraft usually tries to return to a safe flying attitude. The following is a simple demonstration of longitudinal stability. Trim the aircraft for hands off control in level flight. Then momentarily give the controls a slight push to nose the aircraft down. If within a brief period the nose rises to the original position and then stops, the aircraft is statically stable. Ordinarily, the nose passes the original position, that of level flight, and a series of slow pitching oscillations follows. If the oscillations gradually cease, the aircraft has positive stability. If they continue unevenly, the aircraft has neutral stability. If they increase, the aircraft is unstable. Lateral stability, rolling. Stability about the aircraft's longitudinal axis, which extends from the nose of the aircraft to its tail, is called lateral stability. This helps to stabilize the lateral or rolling effect when one wing gets lower than the wing on the opposite side of the aircraft. There are four main design factors that make an aircraft laterally stable. Dihedral, sweep back, keel effect, and weight distribution. Dihedral the most common procedure for producing lateral stability is to build the wings with an angle of 1 to 3 degrees above perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. The wings on either side of the aircraft join the fuselage to form a slight V or angle called dihedral. The amount of dihedral is measured by the angle made by each wing above a line parallel to the lateral axis. Dihedral involves a balance of lift created by the wings AOA on each side of the aircraft's longitudinal axis. If a momentary gust of wind forces one wing to rise and the other to lower, the aircraft banks. When the aircraft is banked without turning, the tendency to side-slip or slide downward toward the lower wing occurs. See figure 4-25. Since the wings have dihedral, the air strikes the lower wing at a much greater AOA than the higher wing. The increased AOA on the lower wing creates more lift than the higher wing, 
increased lift causes the lower wing to begin to rise upward. As the wings approach the level position, the AOA on both wings once again are equal, causing the rolling tendency to subside. The effect of dihedral is to produce a rolling tendency to return the aircraft to a laterally balanced flight condition when a side slip occurs. The restoring force may move the low wing up too far, so that the opposite wing now goes down. If so, the process is repeated, decreasing with each lateral oscillation until a balance for wings level flight is finally reached. Conversely, excessive dihedral has an adverse effect on lateral maneuvering qualities. The aircraft may be so stable laterally that it resists an intentional rolling motion. For this reason, aircraft that require fast roll or banking characteristics usually have less dihedral than those designed for less maneuverability. Sweepback Sweepback is an addition to the dihedral that increases the lift created when a wing drops from the level position. A swept back wing is one in which the leading edge slopes backward. When a disturbance causes an aircraft with sweepback to slip or drop a wing, the low wing presents its leading edge at an angle that is perpendicular to the relative airflow. As a result, the low wing acquires more lift, rises, and the aircraft is restored to its original flight attitude. Sweepback also contributes to directional stability. When turbulence or rudder applications causes the aircraft to yaw to one side, the right wing presents a longer leading edge perpendicular to the relative airflow. The airspeed of the right wing increases, and it acquires more drag than the left wing. The additional drag on the right wing pulls it back, turning the aircraft back to its original path. Keel Effect and Weight Distribution An aircraft always has the tendency to turn the longitudinal axis of the aircraft into the relative wind. This weather vane tendency is similar to the keel of a ship and exerts a steadying influence on the aircraft laterally about the longitudinal axis. When the aircraft is disturbed and one wing dips, the fuselage weight acts like a pendulum, returning the airplane to its original attitude. Laterally stable aircraft are constructed so that the greater portion of the keel area is above and behind the CG. Figure 4-26 Thus, when the aircraft slips to one side, the combination of the aircraft's weight and the pressure of the airflow against the upper portion of the keel area, both acting about the CG, tends to roll the aircraft back to wings level flight. Vertical Stability Yawing Stability about the aircraft's vertical axis, the sideways moment, is called yawing or directional stability. Yawing or directional stability is the most easily achieved stability in aircraft design. The area of the vertical fin and the sides of the fuselage aft of the CG are the prime contributors which make the aircraft act like the well-known weather vane or arrow, pointing its nose into the relative wind. In examining a weather vane, it can be seen that if exactly the same amount of surface were exposed to the wind in front of the pivot point as behind it, the forces fore and aft would be in balance, and little or no directional movement would result. Consequently, it is necessary to have a greater surface aft of the pivot point than forward of it. 
Similarly, the aircraft designer must ensure positive directional stability by making the side surface greater aft than the head of the CG. See figure 4-27. To provide additional positive stability to that provided by the fuselage, a vertical fin is added. The fin acts similar to the feather on an arrow in maintaining straight flight. Like the weather vane and the arrow, the farther aft this fin is placed, and so the larger its size, the greater the aircraft's directional stability. If an aircraft is flying in a straight line, and a sideward gust of air gives the aircraft a slight rotation about its vertical axis, for example, the right, the motion is retarded and stopped by the fin, because while the aircraft is rotating to the right, the air is striking the left side of the fin at an angle. This causes pressure on the left side of the fin, which resists the turning motion and slows down the aircraft's yaw. In doing so, it acts somewhat like the weather vane by turning the aircraft into the relative wind. The initial change in direction of the aircraft's flight path is generally slightly behind its change of heading. Therefore, after a slight yawing of the aircraft to the right, there is a brief moment when the aircraft is still moving along its original path, but its longitudinal axis is pointed slightly to the right. The aircraft is then momentarily skidding sideways, and during that moment, since it is assumed that although the yawing motion has stopped, the excess pressure on the left side of the fin still persists, there is necessarily a tendency for the aircraft to be turned partially back to the left. That is, there is a momentary restoring tendency caused by the fin. This restoring tendency is relatively slow in developing and ceases when the aircraft stops skidding. When it ceases, the aircraft is flying in a direction slightly different from the original direction. In other words, it will not return of its own accord to the original heading. The pilot must re-establish the initial heading. A minor improvement of directional stability may be obtained through sweepback. Sweepback is incorporated in the design of the wing primarily to delay the onset of compressibility during high-speed flight. In lighter and slower aircraft, sweepback aids in locating the center of pressure in the correct relationship with the CG. A longitudinally stable aircraft is built with the center of pressure aft of the CG. Because of structural reasons, aircraft designers sometimes cannot attach the wings to the fuselage at the exact desired point. If they had to mount the wings too far forward and at right angles to the fuselage, the center of pressure would not be far enough to the rear to result in the desired amount of longitudinal stability. By building sweep back into the wings, however, the designers can move the center of pressure toward the rear. The amount of sweep back and the position of the wings then place the center of pressure in the correct location. The contribution of the wing to static directional stability is usually small. The swept wing provides a stable contribution depending on the amount of sweep back, but the contribution is relatively small when compared with other components. Free Directional Oscillations Dutch Roll Dutch Roll is a coupled lateral-slash-directional oscillation that is usually dynamically stable, but is unsafe in an aircraft because of the oscillatory nature. The damping of the oscillatory mode may be weak or strong, depending on the properties of the particular aircraft. 
if the aircraft has a right wing pushed down. The positive side slip angle corrects the wing laterally before the nose is realigned with the relative wind. As the wing corrects the position, a lateral directional oscillation can occur, resulting in the nose of the aircraft making a figure eight on the horizon as a result of two oscillations, roll and yaw, which, although of about the same magnitude, are out of phase with each other. In most modern aircraft, except high-speed swept-wing designs, these free directional oscillations usually die out automatically in very few cycles unless the air continues to be gusty or turbulent. Those aircraft with continuing Dutch roll tendencies are usually equipped with gyro-stabilized yaw dampers. Manufacturers try to reach a midpoint between too much and too little directional stability. Because it is more desirable for the aircraft to have spiral instability than Dutch roll tendencies, most aircraft are designed with that characteristic. Spiral instability Spiral instability exists when the static directional stability of the aircraft is very strong as compared to the effect of its dihedral in maintaining lateral equilibrium. When the lateral equilibrium of the aircraft is disturbed by a gust of air and a side slip is introduced, the strong directional stability tends to yaw the nose into the resultant relative wind, while the comparatively weak dihedral lags in restoring the lateral balance. Due to this yaw, the wing on the outside of the turning moment travels forward faster than the inside wing, and, as a consequence, its lift becomes greater. This produces an overbanking tendency, which, if not corrected by the pilot, results in the bank angle becoming steeper and steeper. At the same time, a strong direction of stability that yaws the aircraft into the relative wind is actually forcing the nose to a lower pitch attitude. A slow downward spiral begins, which, if not counteracted by the pilot, gradually increases into a steep spiral dive. Usually, the rate of divergence in the spiral motion is so gradual, the pilot can control the tendency without any difficulty. All aircraft are affected to some degree by this characteristic. Although they may be inherently stable, in all other normal parameters. This tendency explains why an aircraft cannot be flown hands-off indefinitely. Much research has gone into the development of controlled devices, wing leveler, to correct or eliminate this instability. The pilot must be careful in application of recovery controls during advanced stages of this spiral condition, or excessive loads may be imposed on the structure. Improper recovery from spiral instability leading to in-flight structural failures has probably contributed to more fatalities in general aviation aircraft than any other factor. Since the airspeed in the spiral condition builds up rapidly, the application of back elevator force to reduce this speed and to pull the nose up only tightens the turn, increasing the load factor. The results of the prolonged uncontrolled spiral are in-flight structural failure or crashing into the ground, or both. The most common recorded causes for pilots who get into this situation are loss of horizon reference, inability to control the aircraft by reference to instruments, or a combination of both. End of Part 3 of Chapter 4 
Part 4 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 4, Part 4 Aerodynamic Forces in Flight Maneuvers Forces in Turns If an aircraft were viewed in straight and level flight from the front, see figure 4-28, and if the forces acting on the aircraft could be seen, lift and weight would be apparent. Two forces. If the aircraft were in a bank, it would be apparent that lift did not act directly opposite to the weight. Rather, it now acts in the direction of the bank. A basic truth about turns. When the aircraft banks, lift acts inward toward the center of the turn, as well as upward. Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia, states that an object at rest or moving in a straight line remains at rest or continues to move in a straight line until acted on by some other force. An aircraft, like any moving object, requires a sideward force to make it turn. In a normal turn, this force is supplied by banking the aircraft so that lift is exerted inward, as well as upward. The force of lift during a turn is separated into two components at right angles to each other. One component, which acts vertically and opposite to the weight, gravity, is called the vertical component of lift. The other, which acts horizontally toward the center of the turn, is called the horizontal component of lift, or centripetal force. The horizontal component of lift is the force that pulls the aircraft from a straight flight path to make it turn. Centrifugal force is the equal and opposite reaction of the aircraft to the change in direction and acts equal and opposite to the horizontal component of lift. This explains why, in a correctly executed turn, the force that turns the aircraft is not supplied by the rudder. The rudder is used to correct any deviation between the straight track of the nose and tail of the aircraft. A good turn is one in which the nose and tail of the aircraft track along the same path. If no rudder is used in a turn, the nose of the aircraft yaws to the outside of the turn. The rudder is used to bring the nose back in line with the relative wind. An aircraft is not steered like a boat or an automobile. In order for an aircraft to turn, it must be banked. If it is not banked, there is no force available to cause it to deviate from a straight flight path. Conversely, when an aircraft is banked, it turns, provided it is not slipping to the inside of the turn. Good directional control is based on the fact that the aircraft attempts to turn whenever it is banked. Pilots should keep this fact in mind when attempting to hold the aircraft in straight and level flight. Merely banking the aircraft into a turn produces no change in the total amount of lift developed. Since the lift during the bank is divided into vertical and horizontal components, the amount of lift opposing gravity and supporting the aircraft's weight is reduced. Consequently, the aircraft loses altitude unless additional lift is created. This is done by increasing the AOA until the vertical component of lift is again equal to the weight. Since the vertical component of lift 
decreases as the bank angle increases, the AOA must be progressively increased to produce sufficient vertical lift to support the aircraft's weight. An important fact for pilots to remember when making constant altitude turns is that the vertical component of lift must be equal to the weight to maintain altitude. At a given airspeed, the rate at which an aircraft turns depends upon the magnitude of the horizontal component of lift. It is found that the horizontal component of lift is proportional to the angle of bank. That is, it increases or decreases respectively as the angle of bank increases or decreases. As the angle of bank is increased, the horizontal component of lift increases, thereby increasing the ROT. Consequently, at any given airspeed, the ROT can be controlled by adjusting the angle of bank. To provide a vertical component of lift sufficient to hold altitude in a level turn, an increase in the AOA is required. Since the drag of the airfoil is directly proportional to its AOA, induced drag increases as the lift is increased. This, in turn, causes a loss of airspeed in proportion to the angle of bank. A small angle of bank results in a small reduction in airspeed, while a large angle of bank results in a large reduction in airspeed. Additional thrust, power, must be applied to prevent a reduction in airspeed in level turns. The required amount of additional thrust is proportional to the angle of bank. To compensate for added lift, which would result if the airspeed were increased during a turn, the AOA must be decreased, or the angle of bank increased, if a constant altitude is to be maintained. If the angle of bank is held constant and the AOA decreased, the ROT decreases. In order to maintain a constant ROT as the airspeed is increased, the AOA must remain constant and the angle of bank increased. An increase in airspeed results in an increase of the turn radius, and centrifugal force is directly proportional to the radius of the turn. In a correctly executed turn, the horizontal component of lift must be exactly equal and opposite to the centrifugal force. As the airspeed is increased in a constant rate level turn, the radius of the turn increases. This increase in the radius of turn causes an increase in the centrifugal force, which must be balanced by an increase in the horizontal component of lift which can only be increased by increasing the angle of bank. In a slipping turn, the aircraft is not turning at the rate appropriate to the bank being used, since the aircraft is yawed toward the outside of the turning flight path. The aircraft is banked too much for the ROT, so the horizontal lift component is greater than the centrifugal force. See figure 4-29. Equilibrium between the horizontal lift component and the centrifugal force is re-established by either decreasing the bank, increasing the ROT, or a combination of the two changes. A skidding turn results from an excess of centrifugal force over the horizontal lift component, pulling the aircraft toward the outside of the turn. The ROT is too great for the angle of bank. Correction of a skidding turn thus involves a reduction in the ROT, an increase in bank, or a combination of the two changes.
to maintain a given ROT, the angle of bank must be varied with the airspeed. This becomes particularly important in high-speed aircraft. For instance, at 400 miles per hour, MPH, an aircraft must be banked approximately 44 degrees to execute a standard rate turn, 3 degrees per second. At this angle of bank, only about 79% of the lift of the aircraft comprises the vertical component of lift. This causes a loss of altitude unless the AOA is increased sufficiently to compensate for the loss of vertical lift. Forces in Climbs For all practical purposes, the wing's lift in a steady state normal climb is the same as it is in a steady level flight at the same airspeed. Although the aircraft's flight path changed when the climb was established, the AOA of the wing with respect to the inclined flight path reverts to practically the same values, as does the lift. There is an initial momentary change as shown in figure 4-30. During the transition from straight and level flight to a climb, a change in lift occurs when back elevator pressure is first applied. Raising the aircraft's nose increases the AOA and momentarily increases the lift. Lift at this moment is now greater than weight and starts the aircraft climbing. After the flight path is stabilized, on the upward incline, the AOA and lift again revert to about the level flight values. If the climb is entered with no change in power setting, the airspeed gradually diminishes because the thrust required to maintain a given airspeed in level flight is insufficient to maintain the same airspeed in a climb. When the flight path is inclined upward, a component of the aircraft's weight acts in the same direction as, and parallel to, the total drag of the aircraft, thereby increasing the total effective drag. Consequently, the total drag is greater than the power, and the airspeed decreases. The reduction in airspeed gradually results in a corresponding decrease in drag until the total drag, including the component of weight acting in the same direction, equals the thrust. See figure 4-31. Due to momentum, the change in airspeed is gradual, varying considerably with differences in aircraft size, weight, total drag, and other factors. Consequently, the total drag is greater than the thrust, and the airspeed decreases. Generally, the forces of thrust and drag, and lift and weight, again become balanced when the airspeed stabilizes, but at a value lower than in straight and level flight, at the same power setting. Since the aircraft's weight is acting not only downward, but rearward, with drag while in a climb, Additional power is required to maintain the same airspeed as in level flight. The amount of power depends on the angle of climb. When the climb is established steep enough that there is insufficient power available, a slower speed results. The thrust required for a stabilized climb equals drag plus a percentage of weight dependent on the angle of climb. For example, a 10 degree climb would require thrust to equal drag, plus 17% of weight. To climb straight up would require thrust to equal all the weight and drag. Therefore, the angle of climb for climb performance is dependent on the amount of excess power available to overcome a portion of weight. 
Note that aircraft are able to sustain a climb due to excess thrust. When the excess thrust is gone, the aircraft is no longer able to climb. At this point, the aircraft has reached its absolute ceiling. Forces in Descents As in climbs, the forces which act on the aircraft go through definite changes when the descent is entered from straight and level flight. For the following example, the aircraft is descending at the same power as used in straight and level flight. As forward pressure is applied to the control yoke to initiate the descent, the AOA is decreased momentarily. Initially, the momentum of the aircraft causes the aircraft to briefly continue along the same flight path. For this instant, the AOA decreases, causing the total lift to decrease. With the weight now being greater than lift, the aircraft begins to descend. At the same time, the flight path goes from level to a descending flight path. Do not confuse a reduction in lift with the inability to generate sufficient lift to maintain level flight. The flight path is being manipulated with available thrust in reserve and with the elevator. To descend at the same airspeed as used in straight and level flight, the power must be reduced as the descent is entered. The component of weight acting forward along the flight path increases as the angle of rate of descent increases, and conversely, decreases as the angle of rate of descent decreases. The component of weight acting forward along the flight path increases as the angle of rate of descent increases, and conversely, decreases as the angle of rate of descent decreases. Stalls An aircraft stall results from a rapid decrease in lift, caused by the separation of airflow from the wing surface brought on by exceeding the critical AOA. A stall can occur at any pitch altitude or airspeed. Stalls are one of the most misunderstood areas of aerodynamics, because pilots often believe an airfoil stops producing lift when it stalls. In a stall, the wing does not totally stop producing lift. Rather, it cannot generate adequate lift to sustain level flight. Since the CL increases with an increase in AOA, at some point the CL peaks and then begins to drop off. This peak is called the CL max. The amount of lift the wing produces drops dramatically after exceeding the CL max, or critical AOA. But, as stated above, it does not completely stop producing lift. In most straight-wing aircraft, the wing is designed to stall the wing root first. The wing root reaches its critical AOA first, making the stall progress outward toward the wingtip. By having the wing root stall first, aileron effectiveness is maintained at the wingtips, maintaining controllability of the aircraft. Various design methods are used to achieve the stalling of the wing root first. In one design, the wing is twisted to a higher AOA at the wing root. Installing stall strips on the first 20 to 25 percent of the wing's leading edge is another method to introduce a stall prematurely. The wing never completely stops producing lift in a stalled condition. If it did, the aircraft would fall to the earth. 
most training aircraft are designed for the nose of the aircraft to drop during a stall, reducing the AOA and unstalling the wing. The nose down tendency is due to the CL being aft of the CG. The CG range is very important when it comes to stall recovery characteristics. If an aircraft is allowed to be operated outside of the CG, the pilot may have difficulty recovering from a stall. The most critical CG violation would occur when operating with a CG which exceeds the rear limit. In this situation, a pilot may not be able to generate sufficient force with the elevator to counteract the excess weight aft of the CG. Without the ability to decrease the AOA, the aircraft continues in a stalled condition until it contacts the ground. The stalling speed of a particular aircraft is not a fixed value for all flight situations, but a given aircraft always stalls at the same AOA, regardless of airspeed, weight, load factor, or density altitude. Each aircraft has a particular AOA, where the airflow separates from the upper surface of the wing, and the stall occurs. This critical AOA varies from 16 degrees to 20 degrees, depending on the aircraft's design. But each aircraft has only one specific AOA, where the stall occurs. There are three flight situations in which the critical AOA can be exceeded low speed, high speed, and turning. The aircraft can be stalled in straight and level flight by flying too slowly. As the airspeed decreases, the AOA must be increased to retain the lift required for maintaining altitude. The lower the airspeed becomes, the more the AOA must be increased. Eventually, an AOA is reached which results in the wing not producing enough lift to support the aircraft which starts settling. If the airspeed is reduced further, the aircraft stalls since the AOA has exceeded the critical angle and the airflow over the wing is disrupted. Low speed is not necessary to reduce a stall the wing can be brought into an excessive AOA at any speed. For example, an aircraft is in a dive with an airspeed of 100 knots when the pilot pulls back sharply on the elevator control. See figure 4-32. Gravity and centrifugal force prevent an immediate alteration of the flight path, but the aircraft's AOA changes abruptly from quite low to very high. Since the flight path of the aircraft in relation to the oncoming air determines the direction of the relative wind, the AOA is suddenly increased, and the aircraft would reach the stalling angle at a speed much greater than the normal stall speed. The stalling speed of an aircraft is also higher in a level turn than in straight and level flight. See figure 4-33. Centrifugal force is added to the aircraft's weight and the wing must produce sufficient additional lift to counterbalance the load imposed by the combination of centrifugal force and weight. In a turn, the necessary additional lift is acquired by applying back pressure to the elevator control. This increases the wing's AOA and results in increased lift. The AOA must increase as the bank angle increases to counteract the increasing load caused by centrifugal force. If at any time during a turn the AOA becomes excessive, 
the aircraft stalls. At this point, the action of the aircraft during a stall should be examined. To balance the aircraft aerodynamically, the CL is normally located aft of the CG. Although this makes the aircraft inherently nose heavy, downwash on the horizontal stabilizer counteracts this condition. At the point of stall, when the upward force of the wings lift and the downward tail force cease, an unbalanced condition exists. This allows the aircraft to pitch down abruptly, rotating about its CG. During this nose-down attitude, the AOA decreases and the airspeed again increases. The smooth flow of air over the wing begins again, lift returns, and the aircraft is again flying. Considerable altitude may be lost before this cycle is complete. Airfoil shape and degradation of that shape must also be considered in a discussion of stalls. For example, if ice, snow, and frost are allowed to accumulate on the surface of an aircraft, the smooth airflow over the wing is disrupted. This causes the boundary layer to separate at an AOA lower than that of the critical angle. Lift is greatly reduced, altering expected aircraft performance. If ice is allowed to accumulate on the aircraft during flight, see figure 4-34, the weight of the aircraft is increased, while the ability to generate lift is decreased. As little as 0 0.8 millimeter of ice on the upper wing surface increases drag and reduces aircraft lift by 25%. Pilots can encounter icing in any season, anywhere in the country, at altitudes of up to 18,000 feet, and sometimes higher. Small aircraft, including commuter planes, are most vulnerable because they fly at lower altitudes where ice is more prevalent. They also lack mechanisms common on jet aircraft that prevent ice buildup by heating the front edges of wings. Icing can occur in clouds at any time the temperature drops below freezing, and supercooled droplets build up on an aircraft and freeze. Supercooled droplets are still liquid, even though the temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, F, or 0 degrees Celsius, C. End of Part 4 of Chapter 4 Part 5 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 4, Part 5 Basic Propeller Principles The aircraft propeller consists of two or more blades and a central hub to which the blades are attached. Each blade of an aircraft propeller is essentially a rotating wing. As a result of their construction, the propeller blades are like airfoils and produce forces that create the thrust to pull or push the aircraft through the air. The engine furnishes the power needed to rotate the propeller blades through the air at high speeds, and the propeller transforms the rotary power of the engine into forward thrust. A cross-section of a typical propeller blade is shown in Figure 4-35. This section or blade element is an airfoil 
comparable to a cross-section of an aircraft wing. One surface of the blade is cambered or curved, similar to the upper surface of an aircraft wing, while the other surface is flat like the bottom surface of a wing. The cord line is an imaginary line drawn through the blade from its leading edge to its trailing edge. As in a wing, the leading edge is the thick edge of the blade that meets the air as the propeller rotates. Blade angle, usually measured in degrees, is the angle between the cord of the blade and the plane of rotation, and is measured at a specific point along the length of the blade. See figure 4-36. Because most propellers have a flat blade face, the cord line is often drawn along the face of the propeller blade. Pitch is not blade angle, but because pitch is largely determined by blade angle, the two terms are often used interchangeably. An increase or decrease in one is usually associated with an increase or decrease in the other. The pitch of a propeller may be designated in inches. A propeller designated as a 74-48 would be 74 inches in length and have an effective pitch of 48 inches. The pitch is the distance in inches, which the propeller would screw through the air in one revolution if there were no slippage. When specifying a fixed pitch propeller for a new type of aircraft, the manufacturer usually selects one with a pitch that operates efficiently at the expected cruising speed of the aircraft. Every fixed pitch propeller must be a compromise because it can be efficient at only a given combination of airspeed and revolutions per minute, RPM. Pilots cannot change this combination in flight. When the aircraft is at rest on the ground with the engine operating or moving slowly at the beginning of takeoff, the propeller efficiency is very low because the propeller is restrained from advancing with sufficient speed to permit its fixed pitch blades to reach their full efficiency. In this situation, each propeller blade is turning through the air at an AOA that produces relatively little thrust for the amount of power required to turn it. To understand the action of a propeller, consider first its motion, which is both rotational and forward. As shown by the vectors of propeller forces in figure 4-36, each section of a propeller blade moves downward and forward. The angle at which this air, relative wind, strikes the propeller blade is its AOA. The air deflection produced by this angle causes the dynamic pressure at the engine side of the propeller blade to be greater than atmospheric pressure, thus creating thrust. The shape of the blade also creates thrust because it is cambered like the airfoil shape of a wing. As the air flows past the propeller, the pressure on one side is less than that on the other. As in a wing, a reaction force is produced in the direction of the lesser pressure. The airflow over the wing has less pressure and the force, lift, is upward. In the case of the propeller, which is mounted in a vertical instead of a horizontal plane, the area of decreased pressure is in front of the propeller, and the force, thrust, is in a forward direction. Aerodynamically, thrust is the result of the propeller shape and the AOA of the blade. Thrust can be considered also in terms of the mass of air 
handled by the propeller. In these terms, thrust equals mass of air handled multiplied by slipstream velocity minus velocity of the aircraft. The power expended in producing thrust depends on the rate of air mass movement. On average, thrust constitutes approximately 80% of the torque, total horsepower absorbed by the propeller. The other 20% is lost in friction and slippage. For any speed of rotation, the horsepower absorbed by the propeller balances the horsepower delivered by the engine. For any single revolution of the propeller, the amount of air handled depends on the blade angle, which determines how big a bite of air the propeller takes. Thus, the blade angle is an excellent means of adjusting the load on the propeller to control the engine RPM. The blade angle is also an excellent method of adjusting the AOA of the propeller. On constant speed propellers, the blade angle must be adjusted to provide the most efficient AOA at all engine and aircraft speeds. Lift versus drag curves, which are drawn for propellers as well as wings, indicate that the most efficient AOA is small, varying from positive 2 degrees to positive 4 degrees. The actual blade angle necessary to maintain this small AOA varies with the forward speed of the aircraft. Fixed pitch and ground adjustable propellers are designed for best efficiency at one rotation and forward speed. They are designed for a given aircraft and engine combination. A propeller may be used that provides the maximum efficiency for takeoff, climb, cruise, or high speed flight. Any change in these conditions results in lowering the efficiency of both the propeller and the engine. Since the efficiency of any machine is the ratio of the useful power output to the actual power input, propeller efficiency is the ratio of thrust horsepower to brake horsepower. Propeller efficiency varies from 50 to 87% depending on how much the propeller slips. Propeller slip is the difference between the geometric pitch of the propeller and its effective pitch. See figure 4-37. Geometric pitch is the theoretical distance a propeller should advance in one revolution. Effective pitch is the distance it actually advances. Thus, geometric or theoretical pitch is based on no slippage, but actual or effective pitch includes propeller slippage in the air. The reason a propeller is twisted is that the outer parts of the propeller blades, like all things that turn about a central point, travel faster than the portions near the hub. See figure 4-38. If the blades had the same geometric pitch throughout their lengths, portions near the hub could have negative AOAs, while the propeller tips would be stalled at cruise speed. Twisting or variations in the geometric pitch of the blades permits the propeller to operate with a relatively constant AOA along its length when in cruising flight. Propeller blades are twisted to change the blade angle in proportion to the differences in speed of rotation along the length of the propeller, keeping thrust more nearly equalized along this length. Usually, 1 degree to 4 degrees provides the most efficient lift-to-drag ratio, but in flight, the propeller AOA 
of a fixed pitch propeller varies, normally from zero degrees to fifteen degrees. This variation is caused by changes in the relative airstream, which in turn results from changes in aircraft speed. Thus, propeller AOA is the product of two motions, propeller rotation about its axis and its forward motion. A constant speed propeller automatically keeps the blade angle adjusted for maximum efficiency for most conditions encountered in flight. During takeoff, when maximum power and thrust are required, the constant speed propeller is at a lower propeller blade angle or pitch. The low blade angle keeps the AOA small and efficient with respect to the relative wind. At the same time, it allows the propeller to handle a smaller mass of air per revolution. This light load allows the engine to turn at high RPM and to convert the maximum amount of fuel into heat energy in a given time. The high RPM also creates maximum thrust because, although the mass of air handled per revolution is small, the RPM and slipstream velocity are high, and with the low aircraft speed, there is maximum thrust. After liftoff, as the speed of the aircraft increases, the constant speed propeller automatically changes to a higher angle, or pitch. Again, the higher blade angle keeps the AOA small and efficient with respect to the relative wind. The higher blade angle increases the mass of air handled per revolution. This decreases the engine RPM, reducing fuel consumption and engine wear, and keeps thrust at a maximum. After takeoff climb is established in an aircraft having a controllable pitch propeller, the pilot reduces the power output of the engine to climb power by first decreasing the manifold pressure and then increasing the blade angle to lower the RPM. At cruising altitude, when the aircraft is in level flight and less power is required than is used in takeoff or climb, the pilot again reduces engine power by reducing the manifold pressure and then increasing the blade angle to decrease the RPM. Again, this provides a torque requirement to match the reduced engine power. Although the mass of air handled per revolution is greater, it is more than offset by a decrease in slipstream velocity and an increase in air speed. The AOA is still small because the blade angle has been increased with an increase in airspeed. Torque and P factor. To the pilot, torque, the left turning tendency of the airplane, is made up of four elements which cause or produce a twisting or rotating motion around at least one of the airplane's three axes. These four elements are 1. Torque reaction from engine and propeller 2. Corkscrewing effect of the slipstream 3. Gyroscopic action of the propeller and 4. Asymmetric loading of the propeller P-factor Torque reaction Torque reaction involves Newton's third law of physics. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. As applied to the aircraft, this means that as the internal engine parts and propeller are revolving in one direction, an equal force is trying to rotate the aircraft in the opposite direction. See figure 4-39. 
when the aircraft is airborne, this force is acting around the longitudinal axis, tending to make the aircraft roll. To compensate for roll tendency, some of the older aircraft are rigged in a manner to create more lift on the wing than is being forced downward. The more modern aircraft are designed with the engine offset to counteract this effect of torque. Note. Most United States built aircraft engines rotate the propeller clockwise as viewed from the pilot's seat. The discussion here is with reference to those engines. Generally, the compensating factors are permanently set so that they compensate for this force at cruising speed, since most of the aircraft's operating lift is at that speed. However, aileron trim tabs permit further adjustment for other speeds. When the aircraft's wheels are on the ground during the takeoff roll, an additional turning moment around the vertical axis is induced by torque reaction. As the left side of the aircraft is being forced down by torque reaction, more weight is being placed on the left main landing gear. This results in more ground friction, or drag, on the left tire than on the right causing a further turning moment to the left. The magnitude of this moment is dependent on many variables. Some of these variables are 1. Size and horsepower of engine 2. Size of propeller and the RPM 3. Size of the aircraft and 4. Condition of the ground surface this yawing moment on the takeoff roll is corrected by the pilot's proper use of the rudder or rudder trim. Corkscrew effect. The high speed rotation of an aircraft propeller gives a corkscrew or spiraling rotation to the slipstream. At high propeller speeds and low forward speed, as in the takeoffs and approaches to power on stalls, this spiraling rotation is very compact and exerts a strong sideward force on the aircraft's vertical tail surface. See figure 4-40. When this spiraling slipstream strikes the vertical fin, it causes a turning moment about the aircraft's vertical axis. The more compact the spiral, the more prominent this force is. As the forward speed increases, however, the spiral elongates and becomes less effective. The corkscrew flow of the slipstream also causes a rolling moment around the longitudinal axis. Note that this rolling moment caused by the corkscrew flow of the slipstream is to the right, while the rolling moment caused by torque reaction is to the left. In effect, one may be counteracting the other. However, these forces vary greatly, and it is the pilot's responsibility to apply proper corrective action by use of the flight controls at all times. These forces must be counteracted regardless of which is most prominent at the time. Gyroscopic Action before the gyroscopic effect of the propeller can be understood, it is necessary to understand the basic principle of a gyroscope. All practical applications of the gyroscope are based upon two fundamental properties of gyroscopic action, rigidity in space and precession. The one of interest for this discussion is precession. Precession is the resultant action or deflection of a spinning rotor when a deflecting force is applied to its rim. As can be seen in figure 4-41, when a force is applied, 
the resulting force takes effect 90 degrees ahead of and in the direction of rotation. The rotating propeller of an airplane makes a very good gyroscope and thus has similar properties. Any time a force is applied to deflect the propeller out of its plane of rotation, the resulting force is 90 degrees ahead of and in the direction of rotation and in the direction of application, causing a pitching moment, a yawing moment, or a combination of the two, depending upon the point at which the force was applied. This element of torque effect has always been associated with and considered more prominent in tailwheel type aircraft, and most often occurs when the tail is being raised during the takeoff roll. See figure 4-42 and errata. This change in pitch attitude has the same effect as applying a force to the top of the propeller's plane of rotation. The resultant force acting 90 degrees ahead causes a yawing moment to the left around the vertical axis. The magnitude of this moment depends on several variables, one of which is the abruptness with which the tail is raised. Amount of force applied. However, precession, or gyroscopic action, occurs when the force is applied to any point on the rim of the propeller's plane of rotation. The resultant force will still be 90 degrees from the point of application in direction of rotation. Depending on where the force is applied, the airplane is caused to yaw left or right, to pitch up or down, or a combination of pitching and yawing. It can be said that, as a result of gyroscopic action, any yawing around the vertical axis results in a pitching moment, and any pitching around the lateral axis results in a yawing moment. To correct for the effect of gyroscopic action, it is necessary for the pilot to properly use elevator and rudder to prevent undesired pitching and yawing. Asymmetric loading, P factor. When an aircraft is flying with a high AOA, the bite of the downward moving blade is greater than the bite of the upward moving blade. This moves the center of thrust to the right of the prop disc area, causing a yawing moment toward the left around the vertical axis. To prove this explanation is complex, because it would be necessary to work wind vector problems on each blade, while considering both the AOA of the aircraft and the AOA of each blade. This asymmetric loading is caused by the resultant velocity, which is generated by the combination of the velocity of the propeller blade in its plane of rotation and the velocity of the air passing horizontally through the propeller disc. With the aircraft being flown at positive AOAs, the right, viewed from the rear, or downswinging blade, is passing through an area of resultant velocity which is greater than that affecting the left or upswinging blade. Since the propeller blade is an airfoil, increased velocity means increased lift. The downswinging blade has more lift and tends to pull, yaw, the aircraft's nose to the left. When the aircraft is flying at a high AOA, the downward moving blade has a higher resultant velocity, creating more lift than the upward moving blade. See figure 4-43. This might be easier to visualize if the propeller shaft was mounted perpendicular to the ground, like a helicopter. If there were no air movement at all, 
except that generated by the propeller itself. Identical sections of each blade would have the same airspeed. With air moving horizontally across this vertically mounted propeller, the blade proceeding forward into the flow of air has a higher airspeed than the blade retreating with the airflow. Thus, the blade proceeding into the horizontal airflow is creating more lift, or thrust, moving the center of thrust toward that blade. Visualize rotating the vertically mounted propeller shaft to shallower angles relative to the moving air, as on an aircraft. This unbalanced thrust then becomes proportionately smaller, and continues getting smaller, until it reaches the value of zero, when the propeller shaft is exactly horizontal in relation to the moving air. The effects of these four elements of torque vary in value with changes in flight situations. In one phase of flight, one of these elements may be more prominent than another. In another phase of flight, another element may be more prominent. The relationship of these values to each other varies with different aircraft, depending on the airframe, engine, and propeller combinations, as well as other design features. To maintain positive control of the aircraft in all flight conditions, the pilot must apply the flight controls as necessary to compensate for these varying values. End of Part 5 of Chapter 4Part 6 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 4, Part 6 Load Factors In aerodynamics, load factor is the ratio of the maximum load an aircraft can sustain to the gross weight of the aircraft. The load factor is measured in G's, acceleration of gravity, a unit of force equal to the force exerted by gravity on a body at rest, and indicates the force to which a body is subjected when it is accelerated. Any force applied to an aircraft to deflect its flight from a straight line produces a stress on its structure, and the amount of this force is the load factor. While a course in aerodynamics is not a prerequisite for obtaining a pilot's license, the competent pilot should have a solid understanding of the forces that act on the aircraft, the advantageous use of these forces, and the operating limitations of the aircraft being flown. For example, a load factor of 3 means the total load on an aircraft structure is 3 times its gross weight. Since load factors are expressed in terms of Gs, a load factor of 3 may be spoken of as 3 Gs, or a load factor of 4 as 4 Gs. If an aircraft is pulled up from a dive, subjecting the pilot to 3 Gs, he or she would be pressed down into the seat with a force equal to 3 times his or her weight. Since modern aircraft operate at significantly higher speeds than older aircraft, increasing the magnitude of the load factor, this effect has become a primary consideration in the design of the structure of an aircraft. With the structural design of aircraft planned to withstand only a certain amount of overload, a knowledge of load factors has become essential for all pilots. 
load factors are important for two reasons. One, it is possible for a pilot to impose a dangerous overload on the aircraft structures. Two, an increased load factor increases the stalling speed and makes stalls possible at seemingly safe flight speeds. Load Factors in Aircraft Design The answer to the question, how strong should an aircraft be, is determined largely by the use to which the aircraft is subjected. This is a difficult problem because the maximum possible loads are much too high for use in efficient design. It is true that any pilot can make a very hard landing or an extremely sharp pull up from a dive, which would result in abnormal loads. However, such extremely abnormal loads must be dismissed somewhat if aircraft are built to take off quickly, land slowly, and carry worthwhile payloads. The problem of load factors in aircraft design becomes how to determine the highest load factors that can be expected in normal operation under various operational situations. These load factors are called limit load factors. For reasons of safety, it is required that the aircraft be designed to withstand these load factors without any structural damage. Although the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, requires the aircraft structure be capable of supporting one and one-half times these limit load factors without failure, it is accepted that parts of the aircraft may bend or twist under these loads, and that some structural damage may occur. This 1.5 load limit factor is called the factor of safety and provides, to some extent, for loads higher than those expected under normal and reasonable operation. This strength reserve is not something which pilots should willfully abuse. Rather, it is there for protection when encountering unexpected conditions. The above considerations apply to all loading conditions, whether they be due to gusts, maneuvers, or landings. The gust load factor requirements now in effect are substantially the same as those that have been in existence for years. Hundreds of thousands of operational hours have proven them adequate for safety. Since the pilot has little control over gust load factors, except to reduce the aircraft's speed when rough air is encountered, the gust loading requirements are substantially the same for most general aviation type aircraft regardless of their operational use. Generally, the gust load factors control the design of aircraft which are intended for strictly non-acrobatic usage. An entirely different situation exists in aircraft design with maneuvering load factors. It is necessary to discuss this matter separately with respect to 1. Aircraft designed in accordance with the category system, that is, normal, utility, acrobatic, and 2. Older designs built according to requirements which did not provide for operational categories. Aircraft designed under the category system are readily identified by a placard in the flight deck, which states the operational category or categories in which the aircraft is certificated. The maximum safe load factors, limit load factors, specified for aircraft in the various categories are Category, Limit Load Factor Normal 3.8 to negative 1.52 Utility Mild acrobatics 
including spins. 4.4 to negative 1.76. Acrobatic. 6.0 to negative 3.0. For aircraft with gross weight of more than 4,000 pounds, the limit load factor is reduced. To the limit loads given above, a safety factor of 50% is added. There is an upward graduation in load factor with the increasing severity of maneuvers. The category system provides for maximum utility of an aircraft. If normal operation alone is intended, the required load factor, and consequently the weight of the aircraft, is less than if the aircraft is to be employed in training or acrobatic maneuvers, as they result in higher maneuvering loads. Aircraft that do not have the category placard are designs that were constructed under earlier engineering requirements in which no operational restrictions were specifically given to the pilots. For aircraft of this type, up to weights of about 4,000 pounds, the required strength is comparable to present-day utility category aircraft, and the same types of operation are permissible. For aircraft of this type over 4,000 pounds, the load factors decrease with weight. These aircraft should be regarded as being comparable to the normal category aircraft designed under the category system, and they should be operated accordingly. Load factors in steep turns. In a constant altitude coordinated turn in any aircraft, the load factor is the result of two forces centrifugal force and gravity. See figure 4-44. For any given bank angle, the ROT varies with the airspeed. The higher the speed, the slower the ROT. This compensates for added centrifugal force, allowing the load factor to remain the same. Figure 4-45 reveals an important fact about turns. The load factor increases at a terrific rate after a bank has reached 45 degrees or 50 degrees. The load factor for any aircraft in a coordinated level turn at 60 degrees bank is 2 Gs. The load factor in an 80 degree bank is 5.76 Gs. The wing must produce lift equal to these load factors if altitude is to be maintained. It should be noted how rapidly the line denoting load factor rises as it approaches the 90 degree bank line, which it never quite reaches because a 90 degree banked constant altitude turn is not mathematically possible. An aircraft may be banked to 90 degrees, but not in a coordinated turn. An aircraft which can be held in a 90 degree banked slipping turn is capable of straight knife-edged flight. At slightly more than 80 degrees, the load factor exceeds the limit of 6 Gs, the limit load factor of an acrobatic aircraft. For a coordinated, constant altitude turn, the approximate maximum bank for the average general aviation aircraft is 60 degrees. This bank and its resultant necessary power setting reach the limit of this type of aircraft. An additional 10 degree bank increases the load factor by approximately 1 G bringing it close to the yield point established for these aircraft. See figure 4-46. Load factors and stalling speeds. Any aircraft within the limits of its structure 
may be stalled at any airspeed. When a sufficiently high AOA is imposed, the smooth flow of air over an airfoil breaks up and separates, producing an abrupt change of flight characteristics and a sudden loss of lift, which results in a stall. A study of this effect has revealed that the aircraft's stalling speed increases in proportion to the square root of the load factor. This means that an aircraft with a normal unaccelerated stalling speed of 50 knots can be stalled at 100 knots by inducing a load factor of 4 Gs. If it were possible for this aircraft to withstand a load factor of 9, it could be stalled at a speed of 150 knots. A pilot should be aware of the danger of inadvertently stalling the aircraft by increasing the load factor, as in a steep turn or spiral, when intentionally stalling an aircraft above its design maneuvering speed, a tremendous load factor is imposed. Figures 4-45 and 4-46 shows that banking an aircraft greater than 72 degrees in a steep turn produces a load factor of 3, and the stalling speed is increased significantly. If this turn is made in an aircraft with a normal unaccelerated stalling speed of 45 knots, the airspeed must be kept greater than 75 knots to prevent inducing a stall. A similar effect is experienced in a quick pull-up or any maneuver producing load factors above 1G. This sudden, unexpected loss of control, particularly in a steep turn or abrupt application of the back elevator control near the ground, has caused many accidents. Since the load factor is squared as the stalling speed doubles, tremendous loads may be imposed on structures by stalling an aircraft at relatively high airspeeds. The maximum speed at which an aircraft may be stalled safely is now determined for all new designs. This speed is called the Design Maneuvering Speed, VA, and must be entered in the FAA-approved Airplane Flight Manual slash Pilot's Operating Handbook. AFM slash POH of all recently designed aircraft. For older general aviation aircraft, this speed is approximately 1.7 times the normal stalling speed. Thus, an older aircraft which normally stalls at 60 knots must never be stalled at above 102 knots. 60 knots times 1.7 equals 102 knots. An aircraft with a normal stalling speed of 60 knots stalled at 102 knots undergoes a load factor equal to the square of the increase in speed, or 2.89 g's. 1.7 times 1.7 equals 2.89 g's. The above figures are approximations to be considered as a guide and are not the exact answers to any set of problems. The design maneuvering speed should be determined from the particular aircraft's operating limitations provided by the manufacturer. Operating at or below design maneuvering speed does not provide structural protection against multiple full control inputs in one axis or full control inputs in more than one axis at the same time. Since the leverage in the control system varies with different aircraft, some types employ balanced control surfaces while others do not. The pressure exerted by the pilot on the controls 
cannot be accepted as an index of the load factors produced in different aircraft. In most cases, load factors can be judged by the experienced pilot from the feel of seat pressure. Load factors can also be measured by an instrument called an accelerometer, but this instrument is not common in general aviation training aircraft. The development of the ability to judge load factors from the feel of their effect on the body is important. A knowledge of these principles is essential to the development of the ability to estimate load factors. A thorough knowledge of load factors induced by varying degrees of bank and the VA aids in the prevention of two of the most serious types of accidents. 1. Stalls from steep turns or excessive maneuvering near the ground. 2. Structural failures during acrobatics or other violent maneuvers resulting from loss of control. Load Factors and Flight Maneuvers Critical load factors apply to all flight maneuvers except unaccelerated straight flight where a load factor of 1G is always present. Certain maneuvers considered in this section are known to involve relatively high load factors. Full application of pitch, roll, or yaw controls should be confined to speeds below the maneuvering speed. Avoid rapid and large alternating control inputs especially in combination with large changes in pitch, roll, or yaw. For example, large side-slip angles, as they may result in structural failures at any speed, including below VA. Turns Increased load factors are a characteristic of all banked turns. As noted in the section on load factors in steep turns, load factors become significant to both flight performance and load on wing structure as the bank increases beyond approximately 45 degrees. The yield factor of the average light plane is reached at a bank of approximately 70 degrees to 75 degrees and the stalling speed is increased by approximately one-half at a bank of approximately 63 degrees. Stalls The normal stall entered from straight and level flight, or an unaccelerated straight climb, does not produce added load factors beyond the 1G of straight and level flight. As the stall occurs, however, this load factor may be reduced toward zero, the factor at which nothing seems to have weight. The pilot experiences a sensation of floating free in space. If recovery is affected by snapping the elevator control forward, negative load factors, or those that impose a download on the wings, and raise the pilot from the seat, may be produced. During the pull-up following stall recovery, significant load factors are sometimes induced. These may be further increased inadvertently during excessive diving and consequently high airspeed and abrupt pull-ups to level flight. One usually leads to the other, thus increasing the load factor. Abrupt pull-ups at high diving speeds may impose critical loads on aircraft structures and may produce recurrent or secondary stalls by increasing the AOA to that of stalling. As a generalization, a recovery from a stall made by diving only to cruising or design maneuvering airspeed with a gradual pull-up as soon as the airspeed is safely above stalling can be affected 
with a load factor not to exceed 2 or 2.5 Gs. A higher load factor should never be necessary unless recovery has been effected with the aircraft's nose near or beyond the vertical attitude or at extremely low altitudes to avoid diving into the ground. Spins A stabilized spin is not different from a stall in any element other than rotation, and the same load factor considerations apply to spin recovery as apply to stall recovery. Since spin recoveries are usually affected with the nose much lower than is common in stall recoveries, higher air speeds and consequently higher load factors are to be expected. The load factor in a proper spin recovery usually is found to be about 2.5 Gs. The load factor during a spin varies with the spin characteristics of each aircraft, but is usually found to be slightly above the 1G of level flight. There are two reasons for this. 1. Airspeed in a spin is very low, usually within 2 knots of the unaccelerated stalling speeds. 2. Aircraft pivots rather than turns while it is in a spin. High speed stalls. The average light plane is not built to withstand the repeated application of load factors common to high speed stalls. The load factor necessary for these maneuvers produces a stress on the wings and tail structure which does not leave a reasonable margin of safety in most light aircraft. The only way this stall can be induced in an airspeed above normal stalling involves the imposition of an added load factor, which may be accomplished by a severe pull on the elevator control. A speed of 1.7 times stalling speed about 102 knots in a light aircraft with a stalling speed of 60 knots, produces a load factor of 3 Gs. Only a very narrow margin for error can be allowed for acrobatics in light aircraft. To illustrate how rapidly the load factor increases with airspeed, a high-speed stall at 112 knots in the same aircraft would produce a load factor of 4 Gs. Chandelles and Lazy 8s A chandelle is a maximum performance climbing turn beginning from approximately straight and level flight and ending at the completion of a precise 180 degrees of turn in a wings level, nose high attitude at the minimum controllable airspeed. In this flight maneuver, the aircraft is in a steep climbing turn and almost stalls to gain altitude while changing direction. A lazy eight derives its name from the manner in which the extended longitudinal axis of the aircraft is made to trace a flight pattern in the form of a figure eight lying on its side. It would be difficult to make a definite statement concerning load factors in these maneuvers, as both involve smooth, shallow dives and pull-ups. The load factors incurred depend directly on the speed of the dives and the abruptness of the pull-ups during these maneuvers. Generally, the better the maneuver is performed, the less extreme the load factor induced. A chandelle or lazy eight in which the pull-up produces a load factor greater than 2 Gs will not result in as great a gain in altitude, and in low-powered aircraft it may result in a net loss of altitude. The smoothest pull-up possible 
with a moderate load factor, delivers the greatest gain in altitude in a chandelle, and results in a better overall performance in both chandelles and lazy eights. The recommended entry speed for these maneuvers is generally near the manufacturer's design maneuvering speed, which allows maximum development of load factors without exceeding the load limits. Rough Air All standard certificated aircraft are designed to withstand loads imposed by gusts of considerable intensity. Gust load factors increase with increasing airspeed, and the strength used for design purposes usually corresponds to the highest level flight speed. In extremely rough air, as in thunderstorms or frontal conditions, it is wise to reduce the speed to the design maneuvering speed. Regardless of the speed held, there may be gusts that can produce loads which exceed the load limits. Each specific aircraft is designed with a specific G loading that can be imposed on the aircraft without causing structural damage. There are two types of load factors factored into aircraft design, limit load and ultimate load. The limit load is a force applied to an aircraft that causes a bending of the aircraft structure that does not return to the original shape. The ultimate load is the load factor applied to the aircraft beyond the limit load, and at which point the aircraft material experiences structural failure, breakage. Load factors lower than the limit load can be sustained without compromising the integrity of the aircraft structure. Speeds up to but not exceeding the maneuvering speed allows an aircraft to stall prior to experiencing an increase in load factor that would exceed the limit load of the aircraft. Most AFM slash POH now include turbulent air penetration information, which helps today's pilots safely fly aircraft capable of a wide range of speeds and altitudes. It is important for the pilot to remember that the maximum never exceed placard dive speeds are determined for smooth air only. High-speed dives or acrobatics involving speed above the known maneuvering speed should never be practiced in rough or turbulent air. VG Diagram The flight operating strength of an aircraft is presented on a graph whose vertical scale is based on load factor. See figure 4-47 and errata. The diagram is called a VG diagram, velocity versus G loads or load factor. Each aircraft has its own VG diagram, which is valid at a certain weight and altitude. The lines of maximum lift capability, curved lines, are the first items of importance on the VG diagram. The aircraft in the figure 4-47 is capable of developing no more than positive 1G at 62 mph, the wing level stall speed of the aircraft. Since the maximum load factor varies with the square of the airspeed, the maximum positive lift capability of this aircraft is 2Gs at 92 mph, 3 Gs at 112 mph, 4.4 Gs at 137 mph, and so forth. Any load factor above this line is unavailable aerodynamically. That is, the aircraft cannot fly above the line of maximum lift capability because it stalls. The same situation exists 
for negative lift flight, with the exception that the speed necessary to produce a given negative load factor is higher than that to produce the same positive load factor. If the aircraft is flown at a positive load factor greater than the positive limit load factor of 4.4, structural damage is possible. When the aircraft is operated in this region, objectionable permanent deformation of the primary structure may take place, and a high rate of fatigue damage is incurred. Operation above the limit load factor must be avoided in normal operation. There are two other points of importance on the VG diagram. One point is the intersection of the positive limit load factor and the line of maximum positive lift capability. The airspeed at this point is the minimum airspeed at which the limit load can be developed aerodynamically. Any airspeed greater than this provides a positive lift capability sufficient to damage the aircraft. Conversely, any airspeed less than this does not provide positive lift capability sufficient to cause damage from excessive flight loads. The usual term given to this speed is maneuvering speed, since consideration of subsonic aerodynamics would predict minimum usable turn radius or maneuverability to occur at this condition. The maneuver speed is a valuable reference point, since an aircraft operating below this point cannot produce a damaging positive flight load. Any combination of maneuver and gust cannot create damage due to excess air load when the aircraft is below the maneuver speed. The other point of importance on the VG diagram is the intersection of the negative limit load factor, and line of maximum negative lift capability. Any airspeed greater than this provides a negative lift capability sufficient to damage the aircraft. Any airspeed less than this does not provide negative lift capability sufficient to damage the aircraft from excessive flight loads. The limit airspeed or red line speed, is a design reference point for the aircraft. This aircraft is limited to 225 miles per hour. If flight is attempted beyond the limit airspeed, structural damage or structural failure may result from a variety of phenomena. The aircraft in flight is limited to a regime of airspeeds and Gs which do not exceed the limit or red line speed, do not exceed the limit load factor, and cannot exceed the maximum lift capability. The aircraft must be operated within this envelope to prevent structural damage and ensure the anticipated service lift of the aircraft is obtained. The pilot must appreciate the VG diagram as describing the allowable combination of airspeeds and load factors for safe operation. Any maneuver, gust or gust plus maneuver, outside the structural envelope can cause structural damage and effectively shorten the service life of the aircraft. Rate of Turn the rate of turn, ROT, is the number of degrees, expressed in degrees per second, of heading change that an aircraft makes. The ROT can be determined by taking the constant of 1091, multiplying it by the tangent of any bank angle, and dividing that product by a given airspeed in knots as illustrated in figure 4-48.
if the airspeed is increased and the RLT desired is to be constant, the angle of bank must be increased. Otherwise, the ROT decreases. Likewise, if the airspeed is held constant, an aircraft's ROT increases if the bank angle is increased. The formula in figures 4-48 through 4-50 depicts the relationship between bank angle and airspeed as they affect the ROT. Note, all airspeed discussed in this section is true airspeed, TAS. Airspeed significantly affects an aircraft's ROT. If airspeed is increased, the ROT is reduced if using the same angle of bank used at the lower speed. Therefore, if airspeed is increased as illustrated in figure 4-49, it can be inferred that the angle of bank must be increased in order to achieve the same ROT achieved in figure 4-50. What does this mean on a practicable side? If a given airspeed and bank angle produces a specific ROT, additional conclusions can be made. Knowing the ROT is a given number of degrees of change per second, the number of seconds it takes to travel 360 degrees, a circle, can be determined by simple division. For example, if moving at 120 knots with a 30 degree bank angle, the ROT is 5.25 degrees per second, and it takes 68.6 seconds, 360 degrees divided by 5.25 equals 68.6 seconds, to make a complete circle. Likewise, if flying at 240 knots TAS and using a 30 degree angle of bank, the ROT is only about 2.63 degrees per second, and it takes about 137 seconds to complete a 360 degree circle. Looking at the formula, any increase in airspeed is directly proportional to the time the aircraft takes to travel an arc. So why is this important to understand? Once the ROT is understood, a pilot can determine the distance required to make that particular turn, which is explained in radius of turn. Radius of turn. The radius of turn is directly linked to the ROT, which explained earlier is a function of both bank angle and airspeed. If the bank angle is held constant, and the airspeed is increased, the radius of the turn changes, increases. A higher airspeed causes the aircraft to travel through a longer arc due to a greater speed. An aircraft traveling at 120 knots is able to turn a 360 degree circle in a tighter radius than an aircraft traveling at 240 knots. In order to compensate for the increase in airspeed, the bank angle would need to be increased. The radius of turn, R, can be computed using a simple formula. The radius of turn is equal to the velocity squared, V squared, divided by 11.26 times the tangent of the bank angle. R equals V squared divided by 11.26 times tangent of bank angle. Using the examples provided in figures 4-48 through 4-50, the turn radius for each of the two speeds can be computed.
Note that if the speed is doubled, the radius is quadrupled. See figures 4-51 and 4-52. Another way to determine the radius of turn is speed in using feet per second, FPS, pi, 3.1415, and the ROT. Using the example on page 4-34 in the upper right column, it was determined that an aircraft with an ROT of 5.25 degrees per second required 68.6 seconds to make a complete circle. An aircraft's speed in knots can be converted to FPS by multiplying it by a constant of 1.69. Therefore, an aircraft traveling at 120 knots TAS travels at 202.8 FPS. Knowing the speed in FPS, 202.8, multiplied by the time an aircraft takes to complete a circle, 68.6 seconds, can determine the size of the circle, 202.8 times 68.6, equals 13,912 feet. Dividing by pi yields a diameter of 4,428 feet, which when divided by 2 equals a radius of 2,214 feet. See figure 4-53. A foot within that determined through use of the formula in figure 4-51. In figure 4-54, the pilot enters a canyon and decides to turn 180 degrees to exit. The pilot uses a 30 degree bank angle in his turn. End of part 6 of chapter 4. Part 7 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 4, Part 7 Weight and Balance An aircraft's weight and balance data is important information for a pilot that must be frequently re-evaluated. Although the aircraft was weighed during the certification process, this data is not valid indefinitely. Equipment changes or modifications affect the weight and balance data. Too often, pilots reduce the aircraft weight and balance into a rule of thumb, such as, If I have three passengers, I can load only 100 gallons of fuel. Four passengers, 70 gallons. Weight and balance computations should be part of every pre-fight briefing. Never assume three passengers are always of equal weight. Instead, do a full computation of all items to be loaded on the aircraft, including baggage, as well as the pilot and passenger. It is recommended that all bags be weighed to make a precise computation of how the aircraft CG is positioned. The importance of the CG was stressed in the discussion of stability, controllability, and performance. Unequal load distribution causes accidents. A competent pilot understands and respects the effect of CG on an aircraft. Weight and balance are critical components in the utilization of an aircraft to its fullest potential. 
the pilot must know how much fuel can be loaded onto the aircraft without violating CG limits, as well as weight limits to conduct long or short flights with or without a full complement of allowable passengers. For example, an aircraft has four seats and can carry 60 gallons of fuel. How many passengers can the aircraft safely carry? Can all those seats be occupied at all times with the varying fuel loads? Four people who each weigh 150 pounds leads to a different weight and balance computation than four people who each weigh 200 pounds. The second scenario loads an additional 200 pounds onto the aircraft and is equal to about 30 gallons of fuel. The additional weight may or may not place the CG outside of the CG envelope, but the maximum gross weight could be exceeded. The excess weight can overstress the aircraft and degrade the performance. Aircraft are certificated for weight and balance for two principal reasons. 1. The effect of the weight on the aircraft's primary structure and its performance characteristics. 2. The effect of the location of this weight on flight characteristics, particularly in stall and spin recovery and stability. Aircraft, such as balloons and weight shift control, do not require weight and balance computations because the load is suspended below the lifting mechanism. The CG range in these types of aircraft is such that it is difficult to exceed loading limits. For example, the rear seat position and fuel of a weight shift control aircraft are as close as possible to the hang point with the aircraft in a suspended attitude. Thus, load variations have little effect on the CG. This also holds true for the balloon basket or gondola. While it is difficult to exceed CG limits in these aircraft, pilots should never overload an aircraft because overloading causes structural damage and failures. Weight and balance computations are not required, but pilots should calculate weight and remain within the manufacturer's established limit. Effective Weight on Flight Performance The takeoff slash climb and landing performance of an aircraft are determined on the basis of its maximum allowable takeoff and landing weights. A heavier gross weight results in a longer takeoff run and shallower climb, and a faster touchdown speed and longer landing roll. Even a minor overload may make it impossible for the aircraft to clear an obstacle that normally would not be a problem during takeoff, under more favorable conditions. The detrimental effect of overloading on performance are not limited to the immediate hazards involved with takeoffs and landing. Overloading has an adverse effect on all climb and cruise performance which leads to overheating during climbs, added wear on engine parts, increased fuel consumption, slower cruising speeds, and reduced range. The manufacturers of modern aircraft furnish weight and balance data with each aircraft produced. Generally, this information may be found in the FAA-approved AFM slash POH, and easy-to-read charts for determining weight and balance data are now provided. Increased performance and load-carrying capability of these aircraft require strict adherence to the operating limitations prescribed by the manufacturer. Deviations from the recommendations can result in structural damage or complete failure of the aircraft's structure. Even if an aircraft is loaded well within the maximum weight limitations, 
it is imperative that weight distribution be within the limits of CG location. The preceding brief study of aerodynamics and load factors points out the reasons for this precaution. The following discussion is background information into some of the reasons why weight and balance conditions are important to the safe flight of an aircraft. In some aircraft, it is not possible to fill all seats, baggage compartments, and fuel tanks, and still remain within approved weight or balance limits. For example, in several popular four-place aircraft, the fuel tanks may not be filled to capacity when four occupants and their baggage are carried. In a certain two-place aircraft, no baggage may be carried in the compartment aft of the seats when spins are to be practiced. It is important for a pilot to be aware of the weight and balance limitations of the aircraft being flown, and the reasons for these limitations. Effective Weight on Aircraft Structure The effect of additional weight on the wing structure of an aircraft is not readily apparent. Airworthiness requirements prescribe that the structure of an aircraft certificated in the normal category, in which acrobatics are prohibited, must be strong enough to withstand a load factor of 3.8 Gs to take care of dynamic loads caused by maneuvering and gusts. This means that the primary structure of the aircraft can withstand a load of 3.8 times the approved gross weight of the aircraft without structural failure occurring. If this is accepted as indicative of the load factors that may be imposed during operations for which the aircraft is intended, a 100-pound overload imposes a potential structural overload of 380 pounds. The same consideration is even more impressive in the case of utility and acrobatic category aircraft, which have load factor requirements of 4.4 and 6.0 respectively. Structural failures which result from overloading may be dramatic and catastrophic, but more often they affect structural components progressively in a manner that is difficult to detect and expensive to repair. Habitual overloading tends to cause cumulative stress and damage that may not be detected during pre-flight inspections and result in structural failure later during completely normal operations. The additional stress placed on structural parts by overloading is believed to accelerate the occurrence of metallic fatigue failures. A knowledge of load factors imposed by flight maneuvers and gusts emphasizes the consequences of an increase in the gross weight of an aircraft. The structure of an aircraft about to undergo a load factor of 3 Gs, as in recovery from a steep dive, must be prepared to withstand an added load of 300 pounds for each 100 pound increase in weight. It should be noted that this would be imposed by the addition of about 16 gallons of unneeded fuel in a particular aircraft. FAA certificated civil aircraft have been analyzed structurally and tested for flight at the maximum gross weight authorized and within the speeds posted for the type of flights to be performed. Flights at weights in excess of this amount are quite possible and often are well within the performance capabilities of an aircraft. This fact should not mislead the pilot, as the pilot may not realize that loads for which the aircraft was not designed are being imposed on all or some parts of the structure. In loading an aircraft with either passengers or cargo, the structure must be considered. Seats, baggage compartments, 
and cabin floors are designed for a certain load or concentration of load and no more. For example, a light plain baggage compartment may be placarded for 20 pounds because of the limited strength of its supporting structure, even though the aircraft may not be overloaded or out of CG limits with more weight at that location. Effect of weight on stability and controllability. Overloading also affects stability. An aircraft that is stable and controllable when loaded normally may have very different flight characteristics when overloaded. Although the distribution of weight has the most direct effect on this, an increase in the aircraft's gross weight may be expected to have an adverse effect on stability, regardless of location of the CG. The stability of many certificated aircraft is completely unsatisfactory if the gross weight is exceeded. Effect of Load Distribution The effect of the position of the CG on the load imposed on an aircraft's wing in flight is significant to climb and cruising performance. An aircraft with forward loading is heavier and consequently slower than the same aircraft with the CG further aft. Figure 4-55 illustrates why this is true. With forward loading, nose-up trim is required in most aircraft to maintain level cruising flight. Nose-up trim involves setting the tail surfaces to produce a greater download on the aft portions of the fuselage, which adds to the wing loading and the total lift required from the wing if altitude is to be maintained. This requires a higher AOA of the wing, which results in more drag and in turn produces a higher stalling speed. With aft loading and nose down trim, the tail surfaces exert less down load, relieving the wing of that much wing loading and lift required to maintain altitude. The required AOA of the wing is less, so the drag is less, allowing for a faster cruising speed. Theoretically, a neutral load on the tail surfaces in cruising flight would produce the most efficient overall performance and fastest cruising speed, but it would also result in instability. Modern aircraft are designed to require a download on the tail for stability and controllability. A zero indication on the trim tap control is not necessarily the same as neutral trim because of the force exerted by downwash from the wings and the fuselage on the tail surfaces. The effects of the distribution of the aircraft's useful load have a significant influence on its flight characteristics, even when the load is within the CG limits and the maximum permissible gross weight. Important among these effects are changes in controllability, stability, and the actual load imposed on the wing. Generally, an aircraft becomes less controllable, especially at slow flight speeds, as the CG is moved further aft. An aircraft which cleanly recovers from a prolonged spin with the CG at one position may fail completely to respond to normal recovery attempts when the CG is moved aft by one or two inches. It is common practice for aircraft designers to establish an aft CG limit that is within one inch of the maximum, which allows normal recovery from a one-turn spin. When certificating an aircraft in the utility category to permit intentional spins, the aft CG limit is usually established at a point 
several inches forward of that permissible for certification in the normal category. Another factor affecting controllability, which has become more important in current designs of large aircraft, is the effect of long moment arms to the positions of heavy equipment and cargo. The same aircraft may be loaded to maximum gross weight within its CG limits by concentrating fuel, passengers, and cargo near the design CG, or by dispersing fuel and cargo loads in wingtip tanks and cargo bins, forward and aft of the cabin. With the same total weight and CG, maneuvering the aircraft or maintaining level flight in turbulent air requires the application of greater control forces when the load is dispersed. The longer moment arms to the positions of the heavy fuel and cargo loads must be overcome by the action of the controlled surfaces. An aircraft with full outboard wing tanks or tip tanks tends to be sluggish in roll when control situations are marginal while one with full nose and at cargo bins tends to be less responsive to the elevator controls. The rearward CG limit of an aircraft is determined largely by considerations of stability. The original airworthiness requirements for a type certificate specify that an aircraft in flight at a certain speed dampens out vertical displacements of the nose within a certain number of oscillations. An aircraft loaded too far rearward may not do this. Instead, when the nose is momentarily pulled up, it may alternately climb and dive, becoming steeper with each oscillation. This instability is not only uncomfortable to occupants, but it could even become dangerous by making the aircraft unmanageable under certain conditions. The recovery from a stall in any aircraft becomes progressively more difficult as its CG moves aft. This is particularly important in spin recovery, as there is a point in rearward loading of any aircraft at which a flat spin develops. A flat spin is one in which centrifugal force, acting through a CG located well to the rear, pulls the tail of the aircraft out away from the axis of the spin, making it impossible to get the nose down and recover. An aircraft loaded to the rear limit of its permissible CG range handles differently in turns and stall maneuvers and has different landing characteristics than when it is loaded near the forward limit. The forward CG limit is determined by a number of considerations. As a safety measure, it is required that the trimming device, whether tab or adjustable stabilizer, be capable of holding the aircraft in a normal glide with the power off. A conventional aircraft must be capable of a full stall power off landing in order to ensure minimum landing speed in emergencies. A tailwheel type aircraft loaded excessively nose heavy is difficult to taxi, particularly in high winds. It can be nosed over easily by use of the brakes and it is difficult to land without bouncing, since it tends to pitch down on the wheels as it is slowed down and flared for landing. Steering difficulties on the ground may occur in nose-wheel-type aircraft, particularly during the landing roll and takeoff. To summarize the effects of load distribution, the CG position influences the lift and AOA of the wing, the amount and direction of force on the tail, and the degree of deflection of the stabilizer 
needed to supply the proper tail force for equilibrium. The latter is very important because of its relationship to elevator control force. The aircraft stalls at a higher speed with a forward CG location. This is because the stalling AOA is reached at a higher speed due to increased wing loading. Higher elevator control forces normally exist with a forward CG location due to the increased stabilizer deflection required to balance the aircraft. The aircraft cruises faster with an aft CG location because of the reduced drag. The drag is reduced because a smaller AOA and a less downward deflection of the stabilizer are required to support the aircraft and overcome the nose-down pitching tendency. The aircraft becomes less stable as the CG is moved rearward. This is because when the CG is moved rearward, it causes an increase in the AOA. Therefore, the wing contribution to the aircraft's stability is now decreased, while the tail contribution is still stabilizing. When the point is reached that the wing and tail contributions balance, the neutral stability exists. Any CG movement further aft results in an unstable aircraft. A forward CG location increases the need for greater back elevator pressure. The elevator may no longer be able to oppose any increase in nose-down pitching. Adequate elevator control is needed to control the aircraft throughout the airspeed range down to the stall. A detailed discussion and additional information relating to weight and balance can be found in Chapter 9, Weight and Balance. End of Part 7 of Chapter 4Part 8 of Chapter 4 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Ship. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. High Speed Flight. Subsonic versus supersonic flow. In subsonic aerodynamics, the theory of lift is based upon the forces generated on a body and a moving gas, air, in which it is immersed. At speeds of approximately 260 knots, air can be considered incompressible in that, at a fixed altitude, its density remains nearly constant while its pressure varies. Under this assumption, air acts the same as water and is classified as a fluid. Subsonic aerodynamic theory also assumes the effects of viscosity, the property of a fluid that tends to prevent motion of one part of the fluid with respect to another, are negligible, and classifies air as an ideal fluid, conforming to the principles of ideal fluid aerodynamics such as continuity, Bernoulli's principle, and circulation. In reality, air is compressible and viscous. While the effects of these properties are negligible at low speeds, compressibility effects in particular become increasingly important as speed increases. Compressibility, and to a lesser extent viscosity, is of paramount importance at speeds approaching the speed of sound. In these speed ranges, compressibility causes a change in the density of the air around an aircraft. During flight, a wing produces lift by accelerating the airflow over the upper surface. This accelerated air can and does reach sonic speeds, even though the aircraft itself may be flying subsonic. At some extreme AOAs, in some aircraft, the speed of the air over the top surface of the wing may be double the aircraft's speed. 
It is therefore entirely possible to have both supersonic and subsonic airflow on an aircraft at the same time. When flow velocities reach sonic speeds at some location on an aircraft, such as the area of maximum camber on the wing, further acceleration results in the onset of compressibility effects, such as shockwave formation, drag increase, buffeting, stability and control difficulties. Subsonic flow principles are invalid at all speeds above this point. See figure 4-56. Speed ranges. The speed of sound varies with temperature. Under standard temperature conditions of 15 degrees C, the speed of sound at sea level is 661 knots. At 40,000 feet, where the temperature is minus 55 degrees C, the speed of sound decreases to 574 knots. In high speed flight and or high altitude flight, the measurement of speed is expressed in terms of a Mach number, the ratio of the true airspeed of the aircraft to the speed of sound in the same atmospheric conditions. An aircraft travelling at the speed of sound is travelling at Mach 1.0. Aircraft speed regimes are defined approximately as follows. Subsonic. Mach numbers below 0 0.75. Transonic, mark numbers from 0 0.75 to 1.20. Supersonic, mark numbers from 1.20 to 5.00. Hypersonic, mark numbers above 5.00. While flights in the transonic and supersonic ranges are common occurrences for military aircraft, civilian jet aircraft normally operate in a cruise speed range of Mark 0 0.7 to Mark 0 0.90. The speed of an aircraft in which airflow over any part of the aircraft or structure under consideration first reaches but does not exceed Mark 1.0 is termed critical Mark number or Mark crit. Thus, critical Mark number is the boundary between subsonic and transonic flight and is largely dependent on the wing and airfoil design. Critical Mark number is an important point in transonic flight. When shock waves form on the aircraft, airflow separation followed by buffet and aircraft control difficulties can occur. Shock waves, buffet and airflow separation take place above critical Mark number. A jet aircraft typically is most efficient when cruising at or near its critical mark number. At speeds 5 to 10 percent above the critical mark number, compressibility effects begin. Drag begins to rise sharply. Associated with the drag rise are buffet trim and stability changes and a decrease in control surface effectiveness. This is a point of drag divergence. See figure 4. Dash 57. VMO slash MMO is defined as the maximum operating limit speed. VMO is expressed in knots calibrated airspeed, KCAS, while MMO is expressed in Mark number. The VMO limit is usually associated with operations at lower altitudes and deals with structural loads and flutter. The MMO limit is associated with operations at higher altitudes and is usually more concerned with compressibility effects and flutter. At lower altitudes, structural loads and flutter are of concern. At higher altitudes, compressibility effects and flutter are of concern. Adherence to these speeds prevents structural problems due to dynamic pressure or flutter degradation in aircraft control response due to compressibility effects, e.g. mark tuck, aileron reversal or buzz, and separated airflow due to shock waves resulting in loss of lift or vibration and buffet. Any of these phenomena could prevent the pilot from being able to adequately control the aircraft. For example, an early civilian jet aircraft had a VMO limit of 306 kcas, up to approximately FL310 on a standard day. At this altitude, FL310, 
an MMO of 0.82 was approximately equal to 306 kcas. Above this altitude, an MMO of 0.82 always equaled a kcas at less than 306 kcas, and thus became the operating limit as you could not reach the VMO limit without first reaching the MMO limit. For example, at FL380, an MMO of 0.82 is equal to 261 kcas. Mark number versus airspeed. It is important to understand how airspeed varies with Mark number. As an example, consider how the stall speed of a jet transport aircraft varies with an increase in altitude. The increase in altitude results in a corresponding drop in air density and outside temperature. Suppose this jet transport is in the clean configuration, gear and flaps up, and weighs 550,000 pounds. The aircraft might stall at approximately 152 kcas at sea level. This is equal to, on a standard day, a true velocity of 152 kTAS and a Mach number of 0.23. At FL380, the aircraft will still stall at approximately 152 kCAS, but the true velocity is about 287 kTAS with a Mach number of 0.50. Although the stalling speed has remained the same for our purposes, both the Mark number and TAS have increased. With increasing altitude, the air density has decreased. This requires a faster true airspeed in order to have the same pressure sensed by the pitot tube for the same KCAS or KIAS. For our purposes, KCAS and KIAS are relatively close to each other. The dynamic pressure the wing experiences at FL380 and 287 KTAS is the same as at sea level at 152 KTAS. However, it is flying at higher Mark number. Another factor to consider is the speed of sound. A decrease in temperature in a gas results in a decrease in the speed of sound. Thus, as the aircraft climbs in altitude with outside temperature dropping, the speed of sound is dropping. At sea level, the speed of sound is approximately 661 kcas, while at FL380 it is 574 kcas. Thus, for our jet transport aircraft, the stall speed in KTAS has gone from 152 at sea level to 287 at FL380. Simultaneously, the speed of sound in KCAS has decreased from 661 to 574, and the Mark number has increased from 0.23, 152 KTAS divided by 661 KTAS, to 0.50, 287 KTAS divided by 574 KTAS. All the while, the KCAS for stall has remained constant at 152. This describes what happens when the aircraft is at a constant KCAS with increasing altitude. But what happens when the pilot keeps Mark constant during the climb? In normal jet flight operations, the climb is at 250 KIAS, or higher, e.g. heavy, to 10,000 feet, and then at a specified en route climb air speed, such as about 330 if a DC-10, until reaching an altitude in the mid-20s, where the pilot then climbs at a constant Mark number to cruise altitude. Assuming for illustration purposes that the pilot climbs at an MMO of 0.82 from sea level up to FL380, KCAS goes from 543 to 261. The KIAS at each altitude would follow the same behaviour and just differ by a few knots. Recall from the earlier discussion that the speed of sound is decreasing with a drop in temperature as the aircraft climbs. The Mark number is simply the ratio of the true airspeed to the speed of sound at flight conditions. 
The significance of this is that at a constant Mach number climb, the KCAS and KTAS or KIAS as well is falling off. If the aircraft climbed high enough at this constant MMO with a decrease in KIAS, KCAS and KTAS, it would begin to approach its stall speed. At some point, the stall speed of the aircraft in Mark number could equal the MMO of the aircraft, and the pilot would neither slow up without stalling, nor speed up without exceeding the max operating speed of the aircraft. This has been dubbed the coffin corner. Boundary layer. The viscous nature of airflow reduces the local velocities on a surface and is responsible for skin friction. As discussed earlier in the chapter, the layer of air over the wing surface that is slowed down or stopped by viscosity is the boundary layer. There are two different types of boundary layer flow, laminar and turbulent. Laminar boundary layer flow. The laminar boundary layer is a very smooth flow, while the turbulent boundary layer contains swirls or eddies. The laminar flow creates less skin friction drag than the turbulent flow, but is less stable. Boundary layer flow over a wing surface begins as a smooth laminar flow. As the flow continues back from the leading edge, the laminar boundary layer increases in thickness. Turbulent boundary layer flow. At some distance back from the leading edge, the smooth laminar flow breaks down and transitions to a turbulent flow. From a drag standpoint, it is advisable to have the transition from laminar to turbulent flow as far aft on the wing as possible, or have a large amount of the wing surface within the laminar portion of the boundary layer. The low energy laminar flow, however, tends to break down more suddenly than the turbulent layer. Boundary layer separation. Another phenomenon associated with viscous flow is separation. Separation occurs when the airflow breaks away from an airfoil. The natural progression is from laminar boundary layer to turbulent boundary layer and then to airflow separation. Airflow separation produces high drag and ultimately destroys lift. The boundary layer separation point moves forward on the wing as the AOA is increased. See figure 4-58. Vortex generators are used to delay or prevent shockwave-induced boundary layer separation encountered in transonic flight. They are small, low-aspect ratio airfoils placed at a 12-degree to 15-degree AOA to the airstream. Usually spaced a few inches apart along the wing ahead of the ailerons or other control surfaces, vortex generators create a vortex which mixes the boundary airflow with the high-energy airflow just above the surface. This produces higher surface velocities and increases the energy of the boundary layer. Thus, a stronger shock wave is necessary to produce airflow separation. Shock waves. When an airplane flies at subsonic speeds, the air ahead is warned of the airplane's coming by a pressure change transmitted ahead of the airplane at the speed of sound. Because of this warning, the air begins to move aside before the airplane arrives and is prepared to let it pass easily. When the airplane's speed reaches the speed of sound, the pressure change can no longer warn the air ahead because the airplane is keeping up with its own pressure waves. Rather, the air particles pile up in front of the airplane, causing a sharp decrease in the flow velocity directly in front of the airplane with a corresponding increase in air pressure and density. As the airplane's speed increases beyond the speed of sound, the pressure and density of the compressed air ahead of it increase the area of compression extending some distance ahead of the airplane. At some point in the airstream, the air particles are completely undisturbed, having had no advanced warning of the airplane's approach, and in the next instant the same air particles are forced to undergo sudden and drastic changes in temperature, pressure, density and velocity. The boundary between the undisturbed air and the region of compressed air is called a shock or compression wave. 
This same type of wave is formed whenever a supersonic airstream is slowed to subsonic without a change in direction, such as when the airstream is accelerated to sonic speed over the cambered portion of a wing, and then decelerated to subsonic speed as the area of maximum camber is passed. A shock wave forms as a boundary between the supersonic and subsonic ranges. Whenever a shock wave forms perpendicular to the airflow, it is termed a normal shock wave, and the flow immediately behind the wave is subsonic. A supersonic airstream passing through a normal shock wave experiences these changes. The airstream is slowed to subsonic. The airflow immediately behind the shock wave does not change direction. The static pressure and density of the airstream behind the wave is greatly increased. The energy of the airstream, indicated by total pressure, dynamic plus static, is greatly reduced. Shock wave formation causes an increase in drag. One of the principal effects of a shock wave is the formation of a dense high pressure region immediately behind the wave. The instability of the high pressure region and the fact that part of the velocity energy of the airstream is converted to heat as it flows through the wave is a contributing factor in the drag increase, but the drag resulting from airflow separation is much greater. If the shock wave is strong, the boundary layer may not have sufficient kinetic energy to withstand airflow separation. The drag incurred in the transonic region due to shockwave formation and airflow separation is known as wave drag. When speed exceeds the critical mark number by about 10%, wave drag increases sharply. A considerable increase in thrust power is required to increase flight speed beyond this point into the supersonic range where, depending on the airfoil shape and the angle of attack, the boundary layer may reattach. Normal shock waves form on the wing's upper surface and form an additional area of supersonic flow and a normal shock wave on the lower surface. As flight speed approaches the speed of sound, the areas of supersonic flow enlarge and the shock waves move nearer the trailing edge. See figure 4-59. Associated with a drag rise are Buffett, known as Mark Buffett, trim and stability changes, and a decrease in control force effectiveness. The loss of lift due to airflow separation results in a loss of downwash and a change in the position of the centre pressure on the wing. Airflow separation produces a turbulent wake behind the wing, which causes the tail surfaces to buffet, vibrate. The nose-up and nose-down pitch control provided by the horizontal tail is dependent on the downwash behind the wing. Thus, an increase in downwash decreases the horizontal tail's pitch control effectiveness, since it effectively increases the angle of attack that the tail surface is seeing. Movement of the wing CP affects the wing pitching moment. If the CP moves aft, a diving moment referred to as mark tuck, or tuck under, is produced, and if it moves forward, a nose-up moment is produced. This is the primary reason for the development of the T-tail configuration on many turbine-powered aircraft, which places the horizontal stabiliser as far as practical from the turbulence of the wings. Sweep back Most of the difficulties of transonic flight are associated with shockwave-induced flow separation. Therefore, any means of delaying or alleviating the shockwave-induced separation improves aerodynamic performance. One method is wing sweepback. Sweepback theory is based upon the concept that it is only the component of the airflow perpendicular to the leading edge of the wing that affects pressure distribution and formation of shockwaves. See figure 4-60. On a straight-wing aircraft, the airflow strikes the wing leading edge at 90 degrees, and its full impact produces pressure and lift. A wing with sweep back is struck by the same airflow at an angle smaller than 90 degrees. This airflow on the swept wing has the effect of persuading the wing into believing that it is flying slower than it really is. Thus the formation of shock waves is delayed. 
Advantages of wing sweep include an increase in critical Mark number, forced divergence Mark number, and the Mark number at which drag rises peaks. In other words, sweep delays the onset of compressibility effects. The Mark number which produces a sharp change in drag coefficient is termed the forced divergence Mark number and, for most airfoils, usually exceeds the critical Mark number by 5 to 10%. At this speed, the airflow separation induced by shockwave formation can create significant variations in the drag, lift or pitching moment coefficients. In addition to the delay of the onset of compressibility effects, sweepback reduces the magnitude in the changes of drag, lift or moment coefficients. In other words, the use of sweepback softens the force divergence. A disadvantage of swept wings is that they tend to stall at the wing tips rather than at the wing roots. See figure 4-61. This is because the boundary layer tends to flow spanwise toward the tips and to separate near the leading edges. Because the tips of a swept wing are on the aft part of the wing behind the CL, a wing tip stall causes the CL to move forward on the wing, forcing the nose to rise further. The tendency for tip stall is greatest when wing sweep and taper are combined. The stall situation can be aggravated by a T-tail configuration, which affords little or no pre-stall warning in the form of tail control surface buffet. See figure 4-62. The T-tail being above the wing wake remains effective even after the wing has begun to stall, allowing the pilot to inadvertently drive the wing into a deeper stall at a much greater AOA. If the horizontal tail surfaces then become buried in the wing's wake, the elevator may lose all effectiveness, making it impossible to reduce pitch attitude and break the stall. In the pre-stall and immediate post-stall regimes, the lift-drag qualities of a swept-wing aircraft, specifically the enormous increase in drag at low speeds, can cause an increasingly descending flight path with no change in pitch attitude, further increasing the AOA. In this situation, without reliable AOA information, a nose-down pitch attitude with an increasing airspeed is no guarantee that recovery has been effected, and up-elevator movement at this stage may merely keep the aircraft stalled. It is a characteristic of T-tail aircraft to pitch up viciously when stalled in extreme nose-high attitudes, making recovery difficult or violent. The stick pusher inhibits this type of stall, at approximately one knot above stall speed, pre-programmed stick forces automatically move the stick forward, preventing the stall from developing. A G-limiter may also be incorporated into the system to prevent the pitch down generated by the stick pusher from imposing excessive loads on the aircraft. A stick shaker, on the other hand, provides stall warning when the airspeed is 5 to 7% above stall speed. Mark Buffett Boundaries Mark Buffett is a function of the speed of the airflow over the wing, not necessarily the speed of the aircraft. Any time that too great a lift demand is made on the wing, whether from too fast an airspeed or from too high an AOA near the MMO, the high speed Buffett occurs. There are also occasions when the Buffett can be experienced at much lower speeds, known as the low speed Mark Buffett. An aircraft flown at a speed too slow for its weight and altitude, necessitating a high AOA, is the most likely situation to cause a low-speed Mark Buffett. This very high AOA has the effect of increasing airflow velocity over the upper surface of the wing until the same effects of the shock waves and Buffett occur as in the high-speed Buffett situation. The AOA of the wing has the greatest effect on inducing the Mark Buffett at either the high speed or low speed boundaries for the aircraft. The conditions that increase the AOA, the speed of the airflow over the wing and chances of Mark Buffett are High altitudes The higher an aircraft flies, the thinner the air and the greater the AOA required to produce the lift needed to maintain level flight. Heavy weights the heavier the aircraft, the greater the lift required of the wing, and all other things being equal, the greater the AOA. 
G-loading. An increase in the G-loading on the aircraft has the same effect as increasing the weight of the aircraft. Whether the increase in G-forces is caused by turns, rough control usage or turbulence, the effect of increasing the wing's AOA is the same. High-speed flight controls On high-speed aircraft, flight controls are divided into primary flight controls and secondary or auxiliary flight controls. The primary flight controls manoeuvre the aircraft about the pitch, roll and yaw axes. They include the ailerons, elevator and rudder. Secondary or auxiliary flight controls include tabs, leading edge flaps, trailing edge flaps, spoilers and slats. Spoilers are used on the upper surface of the wing to spoil or reduce lift. High-speed aircraft, due to their clean low-drag design, use spoilers as speed brakes to slow them down. Spoilers are extended immediately after touchdown to dump lift and thus transfer the weight of the aircraft from the wings onto the wheels for better braking performance. See figure 4-63. Jet transport aircraft have small ailerons. The space for ailerons is limited because as much of the wing trailing edge as possible is needed for flaps. Also, a conventional size aileron would cause wing twist at high speed. For that reason, spoilers are used in unison with ailerons to provide additional roll control. Some jet transports have two sets of ailerons, a pair of outboard low-speed ailerons and a pair of high-speed inboard ailerons. When the flaps are fully retracted after takeoff, the outboard ailerons are automatically locked out in the fared position. When used for roll control, the spoiler on the side of the upgoing aileron extends and reduces the lift on that side, causing the wing to drop. If the spoilers are extended as speed brakes, they can still be used for roll control. If they are the differential type, they extend further on one side and retract on the other side. If they are the non-differential type, they extend further on one side but do not retract on the other side. When fully extended as speed brakes, the non-differential spoilers remain extended and do not supplement the ailerons. To obtain a smooth stall and a higher AOA without airflow separation, the wing's leading edge should have a well-rounded, almost blunt shape that the airflow can adhere to at the higher AOA. With this shape, the airflow separation starts at the trailing edge and progresses forward gradually as AOA is increased. The pointed leading edge necessary for high-speed flight results in an abrupt stall and restricts the use of trailing edge flaps because the airflow cannot follow the sharp curve around the wing leading edge. The airflow tends to tear loose rather suddenly from the upper surface at a moderate AOA. To utilise trailing edge flaps and thus increase the CL max, the wing must go to a higher AOA without airflow separation. Therefore, leading edge slots, slats and flaps are used to improve the low speed characteristics during takeoff, climb and landing. Although these devices are not as powerful as trailing edge flaps, they are effective when used full span in combination with high lift trailing edge flaps. With the aid of these sophisticated high lift devices, airflow separation is delayed and the CL max is increased considerably. In fact, a 50 knot reduction in stall speed is not uncommon. The operational requirements of a large jet transport aircraft necessitate large pitch trim changes. Some requirements are a large CG range, a large speed range, the ability to perform large trim changes due to wing leading edge and trailing edge high lift devices without limiting the amount of elevator remaining, maintaining trim drag to a minimum. These requirements are met by the use of a variable incidence horizontal stabiliser. Large trim changes on a fixed tail aircraft require large elevator deflections. At these large deflections, little further elevator movement remains in the same direction. A variable incidence horizontal stabiliser is designed to take out the trim changes. The stabiliser is larger than the elevator and consequently does not need to be moved through as large an angle. This leaves the elevator streamlining the tailplane with a full range of movement up and down. The variable incidence horizontal stabiliser can be set to handle the bulk of the pitch control demand with the elevator handling the rest. 
On aircraft equipped with a variable incidence horizontal stabiliser, the elevator is smaller and less effective in isolation than it is on a fixed-tail aircraft. In comparison to other flight controls, the variable incidence horizontal stabiliser is enormously powerful in its effect. Because of the size and high speeds of jet transport aircraft, the forces required to move the control surfaces can be beyond the strength of the pilot. Consequently, the control surfaces are actuated by hydraulic or electrical power units. Moving the controls in the flight deck signals the control angle required and the power unit positions the actual control surface. In the event of complete power unit failure, movements of the control surface can be effected by manually controlling the control tabs. Moving the control tab upsets the aerodynamic balance, which causes the control surface to move. Chapter Summary In order to sustain an aircraft in flight, a pilot must understand how thrust, drag, lift and weight act on the aircraft. By understanding the aerodynamics of flight, how design, weight, load factors and gravity affect an aircraft during flight manoeuvres from stalls to high-speed flight, the pilot learns how to control the balance between these forces. For information on stall speeds, load factors and other important aircraft data, always consult the AFMPOH for specific information pertaining to the aircraft being flown. End of Part 8 of Chapter 4 Recording by Richard Shipp Part 1 of Chapter 5 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sammy Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 5 Flight Controls Introduction this chapter focuses on the flight control systems a pilot uses to control the forces of flight and the aircraft's direction and attitude. It should be noted that flight control systems and characteristics can vary greatly, depending on the type of aircraft flown. The most basic flight control system designs are mechanical and date back to early aircraft. They operate with a collection of mechanical parts such as rods, cables, pulleys, and sometimes chains to transmit the forces of the flight deck controls to the control surfaces. Mechanical flight control systems are still used today in small general and sport category aircraft, where the aerodynamic forces are not excessive. See figure 5-1. As aviation matured and aircraft designers learned more about aerodynamics, the industry produced larger and faster aircraft. Therefore, the aerodynamic forces acting upon the control surfaces increased exponentially. To make the control force required by pilots manageable, aircraft engineers designed more complex systems. At first, hydromechanical designs, consisting of a mechanical circuit and a hydraulic circuit, were used to reduce the complexity, weight, and limitations of mechanical flight control systems. See figure 5-2. As aircraft became more sophisticated, the control surfaces were actuated by electric motors, digital computers, or fiber optic cables. Called fly-by-wire, this flight control system replaces the physical connection between pilot controls and the flight control surfaces with an electrical interface. In addition, in some large and fast aircraft, controls are boosted by hydraulically or electrically actuated systems. In both the fly-by-wire and boosted controls, the feel of the control reaction is fed back to the pilot by simulated means. Current research at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Dryden Flight Research Center, involves Intelligent Flight Control Systems, IFCS. The goal of this project is to develop an adaptive, neural network-based flight control system. Applied directly to flight control system feedback errors, IFCS provides adjustments to improve aircraft performance in normal flight, as well as with system failures. With IFCS, 
A pilot is able to maintain control and safely land an aircraft that has suffered a failure to control surface or damage to the airframe. It also improves mission capability, increases the reliability and safety of flight, and eases the pilot workload. Today's aircraft employ a variety of flight control systems. For example, some aircraft in the sport pilot category rely on weight shift control to fly, while balloons use a standard burn technique. Helicopters utilize a cyclic to tilt the rotor in the desired direction, along with a collective to manipulate rotor pitch and anti-torque pedals to control yaw. See Figure 5-3. For additional information on flight control systems, refer to the appropriate handbook for information related to the flight control systems and characteristics of specific types of aircraft. Flight Control Systems Flight Controls Aircraft flight control systems consist of primary and secondary systems. The ailerons, elevator or stabilator, and rudder constitute the primary control system and are required to control an aircraft safely during flight. Wing flaps, leading edge devices, spoilers, and trim systems constitute the secondary control system and improve the performance characteristics of the airplane or relieve the pilot of excessive control forces. Primary Flight Controls Aircraft control systems are carefully designed to provide adequate responsiveness to control inputs while allowing a natural feel. At low airspeeds, the controls usually feel soft and sluggish, and the aircraft responds slowly to control applications. At higher airspeeds, the controls become increasingly firm and aircraft response is more rapid. Movement of any of the three primary flight control surfaces ailerons, elevator or stabilator, or rudder, changes the airflow and pressure distribution over and around the airfoil. These changes affect the lift and drag produced by the airfoil-slash-control surface combination and allow a pilot to control the aircraft about its three axes of rotation. Design features limit the amount of deflection of flight control surfaces. For example, control stop mechanisms may be incorporated into the flight control linkages or movement of the control column and or rudder pedals may be limited. The purpose of these design limits is to prevent the pilot from inadvertently over-controlling and overstressing the aircraft during normal maneuvers. A properly designed airplane is stable and easily controlled during normal maneuvering. Control surface inputs cause movement about the three axes of rotation. The types of stability an airplane exhibits also relate to the three axes of rotation. See figure 5-4. Ailerons. Ailerons control roll about the longitudinal axis. The ailerons are attached to the outboard trailing edge of each wing and move in the opposite direction from each other. Ailerons are connected by cables, bell cranks, pulleys, and or push-pull tubes to a control wheel or control stick. Moving the control wheel or control stick to the right causes the right aileron to deflect upward and the left aileron to deflect downward. The upward deflection of the right aileron decreases the camber, resulting in decreased lift on the right wing. The corresponding downward deflection of the left aileron increases the camber, resulting in increased lift on the left wing. Thus, the increased lift on the left wing and the decreased lift on the right wing causes the airplane to roll to the right. Adverse yaw. Since the downward deflected aileron produces more lift, as evidenced by the wing raising, it also produces more drag. This added drag causes the wing to slow down slightly. This results in the aircraft yawing toward the wing which had experienced an increase in lift and drag. From the pilot's perspective, the yaw is opposite the direction of the bank. The adverse yaw is a result of differential drag and the slight difference in the velocity of the left and right wings. See figure 5-5. Adverse yaw becomes more pronounced at low airspeeds. At these slower airspeeds, aerodynamic pressure on control surfaces are low, and larger control inputs are required to effectively maneuver the airplane. As a result, the increase in aileron deflection causes an increase in adverse yaw. The yaw is especially evident in aircraft with long wingspans.
Application of rudder is used to counteract adverse yaw. The amount of rudder control required is greatest at low air speeds, high angles of attack, and with large aileron deflections. Like all control surfaces at lower air speeds, the vertical stabilizer slash rudder becomes less effective and magnifies the control problems associated with adverse yaw. All turns are coordinated by use of ailerons, rudder, and elevator. Applying aileron pressure is necessary to place the aircraft in the desired angle of bank, while simultaneous application of rudder pressure is necessary to counteract the resultant adverse yaw. Additionally, because more lift is required during a turn than when in straight and level flight, the angle of attack, AOA, must be increased by applying elevator back pressure. The steeper the turn, the more elevator back pressure is needed. As the desired angle of bank is established, aileron and rudder pressures should be relaxed. This stops the angle of bank from increasing because the aileron and rudder control surfaces are in a neutral and streamlined position. Elevator back pressure should be held constant to maintain altitude. The rollout from a turn is similar to the roll-in, except the flight controls are applied in the opposite direction. Aileron and rudder are applied in the direction of the rollout or toward the high wing. As the angle of bank decreases, the elevator back pressure should be as relaxed as necessary to maintain altitude. In an attempt to reduce the effects of adverse yaw, manufacturers have engineered four systems: differential ailerons, freeze-type ailerons, coupled ailerons and rudder, and flaperons. Differential ailerons. With differential ailerons. One aileron is raised a greater distance than the other aileron is lowered for a given movement of the control wheel or control stick. This produces an increase in drag on the descending wing. The greater drag results from deflecting the up aileron on the descending wing to a greater angle than the down aileron on the rising wing. While adverse yaw is reduced, it's not eliminated completely. See Figure 5-6. Freeze type ailerons. With a freeze type aileron. When pressure is applied to the control wheel or control stick, the aileron that is being raised pivots on an offset hinge. This projects the leading edge of the aileron into the airflow and creates drag. It helps equalize the drag created by the lowered aileron on the opposite wing and reduces adverse yaw. See Figure 5-7. The freeze-type aileron also forms a slot so air flows smoothly over the lowered aileron, making it more effective at high angles of attack. Freeze-type ailerons may also be designed to function differentially. Like the differential aileron, the freeze-type aileron does not eliminate adverse yaw entirely. Coordinated rudder application is still needed wherever ailerons are applied. Coupled ailerons and rudder. Coupled ailerons and rudder are linked controls. This is accomplished with rudder aileron interconnect springs. Which help correct for aileron drag by automatically deflecting the rudder at the same time the ailerons are deflected. For example, when the control wheel or control stick is moved to produce a left roll, the interconnect cable and spring pulls forward on the left rudder pedal just enough to prevent the nose of the aircraft from yawing to the right. The force applied to the rudder by the springs can be overridden if it becomes necessary to slip the aircraft. See Figure 5-8. Flaperons. Flaperons combine both aspects of flaps and ailerons. In addition to controlling the bank angle of an aircraft, like conventional ailerons, flaperons can be lowered together to function much the same as a dedicated set of flaps. The pilot retains separate controls for ailerons and flaps. A mixer is used to combine the separate pilot inputs into the single set of control surfaces called flaperons. Many designs that incorporate flaperons mount the control surfaces away from the wing to provide undisturbed airflow at high angles of attack and/or low airspeeds. See Figure 5-9. Elevator. The elevator controls pitch about the lateral axis. Like the ailerons on small aircraft, the elevator is connected to the control column in the flight deck by a series of mechanical linkages. Aft movement of the control column deflects the trailing edge of the elevator surface up. This is usually referred to as up elevator. 
See figure 5-10. The up elevator position decreases the camber of the elevator and creates a downward aerodynamic force, which is greater than the normal tail-down force that exists in straight and level flight. The overall effect causes the tail of the aircraft to move down and the nose to pitch up. The pitching moment occurs about the center of gravity, CG. The strength of the pitching moment is determined by the distance between the CG and the horizontal tail surface, as well as by the aerodynamic effectiveness of the horizontal tail surface. Moving the control column forward has the opposite effect. In this case, elevator camber increases, creating more lift, less tail downforce, on the horizontal stabilizer slash elevator. This moves the tail upward and pitches the nose down. Again, the pitching moment occurs about the CG. As mentioned earlier in the coverage on stability, power, thrust line, and the position of the horizontal tail surfaces on the empennage are factors in elevator effectiveness controlling pitch. For example, the horizontal tail surfaces may be attached near the lower part of the vertical stabilizer, at the midpoint, or at the high point as in the T-tail design. T-tail In a T-tail configuration, the elevator is above most of the effects of downwash from the propeller, as well as airflow around the fuselage and or wings during normal flight conditions. Operation of the elevators in this undisturbed air allows control movements that are consistent throughout most flight regimes. T-tail designs have become popular on many light and large aircraft especially those with aft fuselage-mounted engines, because the T-tail configuration removes the tail from the exhaust blast of the engines. Seaplanes and amphibians often have T-tails in order to keep the horizontal surfaces as far from the water as possible. An additional benefit is reduced vibration and noise inside the aircraft. At slow speeds, the elevator on a T-tail aircraft must be moved through a larger number of degrees of travel to raise the nose a given amount than on a conventional tail aircraft. This is because the conventional tail aircraft has the downwash from the propeller pushing down on the tail to assist in raising the nose. Since controls on aircraft are rigged so that increasing control forces are required for increased control travel, the forces required to raise the nose of a T-tail aircraft are greater than those for a conventional tail aircraft. Longitudinal stability of a trimmed aircraft is the same for both types of configuration, but the pilot must be aware that the required control forces are greater at slow speeds during takeoffs, landings, or stalls than for similar size aircraft equipped with conventional tails. T-tail airplanes also require additional design considerations to counter the problem of flutter. Since the weight of the horizontal surfaces is at the top of the vertical stabilizer, the moment arm created causes high loads on the vertical stabilizer, which can result in flutter. Engineers must compensate for this by increasing the design stiffness of the vertical stabilizer, usually resulting in a weight penalty over conventional tail designs. When flying at a very high AOA with a low airspeed and an aft CG, the T-tail aircraft may be susceptible to a deep stall. In a deep stall, the airflow over the horizontal tail is blanketed by the disturbed airflow from the wings and fuselage. In these circumstances, elevator or stabilator control could be diminished, making it difficult to recover from the stall. It should be noted that an aft CG is often a contributing factor in these incidents, since similar recovery problems are also found with conventional tail aircraft with an aft CG. See figure 5-11. Since flight at a high AOA with a low airspeed and an aft CG position can be dangerous, many aircraft have systems to compensate for this situation. The systems range from control stops to elevator downsprings. An elevator downspring assists in lowering the nose of the aircraft to prevent a stall caused by the aft CG position. The stall occurs because the properly trimmed airplane is flying with the elevator in a trailing edge down position, forcing the tail up and the nose down. In this unstable condition, if the aircraft encounters turbulence and slows down further, the trim tab no longer positions the elevator in the nose down position. The elevator then streamlines and the nose of the aircraft pitches upward, possibly resulting in a stall.
The elevator downspring produces a mechanical load on the elevator, causing it to move toward the nose-down position if not otherwise balanced. The elevator trim tab balances the elevator downspring to position the elevator in a trimmed position. When the trim tab becomes ineffective, the downspring drives the elevator to a nose-down position. The nose of the aircraft lowers, speed builds up, and a stall is prevented. See Figure 5-12. The elevator must also have sufficient authority to hold the nose of the aircraft up during the roundout for a landing. In this case, a forward CG may cause a problem. During the landing flare, power is usually reduced, which decreases the airflow over the empennage. This, coupled with reduced landing speed, makes the elevator less effective. As this discussion demonstrates, pilots must understand and follow proper loading procedures particularly with regard to the CG position. More information on aircraft loading, as well as weight and balance, is included in Chapter 9, Weight and Balance. Stabilator As mentioned in Chapter 2, Aircraft Structure, a stabilator is essentially a one-piece horizontal stabilizer that pivots from a central hinge point. When the control column is pulled back, it raises the stabilator's trailing edge pulling the airplane's nose up. Pushing the control column forward lowers the trailing edge of the stabilator and pitches the nose of the airplane down. Because stabilators pivot around a central hinge point, they are extremely sensitive to control inputs and aerodynamic loads. Anti-servo tabs are incorporated on the trailing edge to decrease sensitivity. They deflect in the same direction as a stabilator. This results in an increase in the force required to move the stabilator, thus making it less prone to pilot-induced overcontrolling. In addition, a balance weight is usually incorporated in front of the main spar. The balance weight may project into the empennage or may be incorporated on the forward portion of the stabilator tips. See Figure 5-13. Canard The canard design utilizes the concept of two lifting surfaces the canard functioning as a horizontal stabilizer located in front of the main wings. In effect, the canard is an airfoil similar to the horizontal surface on a conventional aft tail design. The difference is that the canard actually creates lift and holds the nose up, as opposed to the aft tail design, which exerts downward force on the tail to prevent the nose from rotating downward. See figure 5-14. The canard design dates back to the pioneer days of aviation, most notably used on the Wright Flyer. Recently, the canard configuration has regained popularity and is appearing on newer aircraft. Canard designs include two types, one with a horizontal surface of about the same size as a normal aft tail design, and the other with a surface of the same approximate size and airfoil of the aft-mounted wing known as a tandem wing configuration. Theoretically, the canard is considered more efficient because using the horizontal surface to help lift the weight of the aircraft should result in less drag for a given amount of lift. Rudder The rudder controls movement of the aircraft about its vertical axis. This motion is called yaw. Like the other primary control surfaces, the rudder is a movable surface, hinged to a fixed surface, in this case to the vertical stabilizer or fin. Moving the left or right rudder pedal controls the rudder. When the rudder is deflected into the airflow, a horizontal force is exerted in the opposite direction. See figure 5-15. By pushing the left pedal, the rudder moves left. This alters the airflow around the vertical stabilizer slash rudder and creates a sideward lift that moves the tail to the right and yaws the nose of the airplane to the left. Rudder effectiveness increases with speed. Therefore, large deflections at low speeds and small deflections at high speeds may be required to provide the desired reaction. In propeller-driven aircraft, any slipstream flowing over the rudder increases its effectiveness. V-tail The V-tail design utilizes two slanted tail surfaces to perform the same functions as the surfaces of a conventional elevator and rudder configuration. The fixed surfaces act as both horizontal and vertical stabilizers. See Figure 5-16.
The movable surfaces, which are usually called rudder vators, are connected through a special linkage that allows the control wheel to move both surfaces simultaneously. On the other hand, displacement of the rudder pedals moves the surfaces differentially, thereby providing directional control. When both rudder and elevator controls are moved by the pilot, a control mixing mechanism moves each surface the appropriate amount. The control system for the V-tail is more complex than that required for a conventional tail. In addition, the V-tail design is more susceptible to Dutch roll tendencies than a conventional tail, and total reduction in drag is minimal. End of Part 1 of Chapter 5、Chapter、5 of Chapter 5 of Pilot's Handbook. By the FAA. Chapter 5 Flight Controls. Part 2 Secondary Flight Controls. Secondary flight control systems may consist of wing flaps, leading edge devices, spoilers, and trim systems. Flaps. Flaps are the most common high lift devices used on aircraft. These surfaces, Which are attached to the trailing edge of the wing increase both lift and induced drag for any given AOA. Flaps allow a compromise between high cruising speed and low landing speed because they may be extended when needed and retracted into the wing structure when not needed. There are four common types of flaps plain, split, slotted, and fowler flaps. See figure 5 17. The plain flap is the simplest of the four types. It increases the airfoil camber, resulting in a significant increase in the coefficient of lift, CL, at a given AOA. At the same time, it greatly increases drag and moves the center of pressure, CP, aft on the airfoil, resulting in a nose down pitching moment. The split flap is deflected from the lower surface of the airfoil and produces a slightly greater increase in lift than the plain flap. More drag is created because of the turbulent air pattern produced behind the airfoil. When fully extended, both plain and split flaps produce high drag with little additional lift. The most popular flap on aircraft today is a slotted flap. Variations of this design are used for small aircraft as well as for large ones. Slotted flaps increase the lift coefficient significantly more than plain or split flaps. On small aircraft, The hinge is located below the lower surface of the flap, and when the flap is lowered, a duct forms between the flap well and the wing and the leading edge of the flap. When the slotted flap is lowered, high energy air from the lower surface is ducted to the flap's upper surface. The high energy air from the slot accelerates the upper surface boundary layer and delays airflow separation, providing a higher CL. Thus, the slotted flap produces much greater increases in maximum coefficient of lift, CL max, than the plain or split flap. While there are many types of slotted flaps, large aircraft often have double and even triple slotted flaps. These allow the maximum increase in drag without the airflow over the flap separating and destroying the lift they produce. Fowler flaps are a type of slotted flap. This flap design not only changes the camber of the wing, it also increases the wing area. Instead of rotating down on a hinge, it slides backwards, on tracks. In the first portion of its extension, it increases the drag very little, but increases the lift a great deal, as it increases both the area and camber. As the extension continues, the flap deflects downward. During the last portion of its travel, The flap increases the drag with little additional increase in lift. Leading edge devices. High lift devices also can be applied to the leading edge of the airfoil. The most common types are fixed slots, movable slats, leading edge flaps, and cuffs. See figure 5 18. Fixed slots. 
fix slots direct airflow to the upper wing surface and delay airflow separation at higher angles of attack. The slot does not increase the wing camber, but allows a higher maximum CL because the stall is delayed until the wing reaches a greater AOA. Movable slats consist of leading edge segments, which move on tracks. At low angles of attack, each slat is held flush against the wing's leading edge by the high pressure that forms at the wing's leading edge. As the AOA increases, the high pressure area moves aft below the lower surface of the wing, allowing the slats to move forward. Some slats, however, are pilot operated and can be deployed at any AOA. Opening a slat allows the air below the wing to flow over the wing's upper surface, delaying airflow separation. Leading edge flaps, like trailing edge flaps, are used to increase both CL max and the camber of the wings. This type of leading edge device is frequently used in conjunction with trailing edge flaps and can reduce the nose down pitching movement produced by the latter. As is true with trailing edge flaps, a small increment of leading edge flaps increases lift to a much greater extent than drag. As greater amounts of flaps are extended, drag increases at a greater rate than lift. Leading edge cuffs, like leading edge flaps and trailing edge flaps, are used to increase both CL max and the camber of the wings. Unlike leading edge flaps and trailing edge flaps, leading edge cuffs are fixed aerodynamic devices. In most cases, leading edge cuffs extend the leading edge down and forward. This causes the airflow to attach better to the upper surface of the wing at higher angles of attack, thus lowering an aircraft's stall speed. The fixed nature of leading edge cuffs extracts a penalty in maximum cruise airspeed, but recent advances in design and technology have reduced this penalty. Spoilers Found on many gliders and some aircraft, high drag devices called spoilers are deployed from the wings to spoil the smooth airflow, reducing lift and increasing drag. On gliders, spoilers are most often used to control rate of descent for accurate landings. On other aircraft, spoilers are often used for roll control, an advantage of which is the elimination of adverse yaw. To turn right, for example, the spoiler on the right wing is raised, destroying some of the lift and creating more drag on the right. The right wing drops and the aircraft banks and yaws to the right. Deploying spoilers on both wings at the same time allows the aircraft to descend without gaining speed. Spoilers are also deployed to help reduce ground roll after landing. By destroying lift, they transfer weight to the wheels, improving braking effectiveness. See figure 5-19. Trim systems. Although an aircraft can be operated throughout a wide range of attitudes, airspeeds, and power settings, it can be designed to fly hands-off within only a very limited combination of these variables. Trim systems are used to relieve the pilot of the need to maintain constant pressure on the flight controls and usually consist of flight deck controls and small hinge devices attached to the trailing edge of one or more of the primary flight control surfaces. Designed to help minimize a pilot's workload, trim systems aerodynamically assist movement and position of the flight control surface to which they are attached. Common types of trim systems include trim tabs, balance tabs, anti-servo tabs, ground adjustable tabs, and an adjustable stabilizer. Trim tabs. The most common installation on small aircraft is a single trim tab attached to the trailing edge of the elevator. Most trim tabs are manually operated by a small vertically mounted control wheel. However, a trim crank may be found in some aircraft. The flight deck control includes the trim tab position indicator. Placing the trim control in the full nose down position moves the trim tab to its full up position. With the trim tab up and into the airstream, the airflow over the horizontal tail surface tends to force the trailing edge of the elevator down. This causes the tail of the airplane to move up and the nose to move down. See figure 5-20. If the trim tab is set to the full nose up position, the tab moves to its full down position. In this case, the air flowing under the horizontal tail surface hits the tab and forces the trailing edge of the elevator up, reducing the elevator's AOA. This causes the tail of the airplane to move down and the nose to move up. 
In spite of the opposing directional movement of the trim tab and the elevator, control of trim is natural to a pilot. If the pilot needs to exert constant back pressure on a control column, the need for nose-up trim is indicated. The normal trim procedure is to continue trimming until the aircraft is balanced and the nose-heavy condition is no longer apparent. Pilots normally establish the desired power, pitch attitude, and configuration first, and then trim the aircraft, to relieve control pressures that may exist for that flight condition. Any time power, pitch attitude, or configuration is changed, expect that retrimming will be necessary to relieve the control pressures for the new flight condition. Balance tabs. The control forces may be excessively high in some aircraft, and in order to decrease them, the manufacturer may use balance tabs. They look like trim tabs and are hinged in approximately the same places as trim tabs. The essential difference between the two is that the balancing tab is coupled to the control surface rod, so that when the primary control surface is moved in any direction, the tab automatically moves in the opposite direction. The airflow striking the tab counterbalances some of the air pressure against the primary control surface and enables the pilot to move more easily and hold the control surface in position. If the linkage between the balance tab and the fixed surface is adjustable from the flight deck, the tab acts as a combination trim and balance tab that can be adjusted to any desired deflection. Anti-servo tabs. Anti-servo tabs work in the same manner as balance tabs, except instead of moving in the opposite direction, they move in the same direction as the trailing edge of the stabilator. In addition to decreasing the sensitivity of the stabilator, an anti-servo tab also functions as a trim device to relieve control pressure and maintain the stabilator in the desired position. The fixed end of the linkage is on the opposite side of the surface from the horn on the tab. When the trailing edge of the stabilator moves up, the linkage forces the trailing edge of the tab up. When the stabilator moves down, the tab also moves down. Conversely, trim tabs on elevators move opposite of the control surface. See figure 5-21. Ground adjustable tabs. Many small aircraft have a non-movable metal trim tab on the rudder. This tab is bent in one direction or the other while on the ground to apply a trim force to the rudder. The correct displacement is determined by trial and error. Usually, small adjustments are necessary until the aircraft no longer skids left or right during normal cruising flight. See figure 5-22. Adjustable Stabilizer Rather than using a movable tab on the trailing edge of the elevator, some aircraft have an adjustable stabilizer. With this arrangement, linkages pivot the horizontal stabilizer about its rear spar. This is accomplished by use of a jack screw mounted on the leading edge of the stabilator. See figure 5-23. On small aircraft, the jack screw is cable operated with a trim wheel or crank. On larger aircraft, it is motor driven. The trimming effect and flight deck indications for an adjustable stabilizer are similar to those of a trim tab. Autopilot. Autopilot is an automatic flight control system that keeps an aircraft in level flight or on a set course. It can be directed by the pilot or it may be coupled to a radio navigation signal. Autopilot reduces the physical and mental demands on a pilot and increases safety. The common features available on an autopilot are altitude and heading hold. The simplest systems use gyroscopic attitude indicators and magnetic compasses to control servos connected to the flight control system. See figure 5-24. The number and location of these servos depends on the complexity of the system. For example, a single-axis autopilot controls the aircraft about the longitudinal axis, and a servo actuates the ailerons. A three-axis autopilot controls the aircraft about the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical axes. Three different servos actuate ailerons, elevator, and rudder. More advanced systems often include a vertical speed and or indicated airspeed hold mode. Advanced autopilot systems are coupled to navigational aids through a flight director. The autopilot system also incorporates a disconnect safety feature to disengage the system automatically or manually. These autopilots work with inertial navigation systems, global positioning systems, GPS, and flight computers to control the aircraft. 
In fly-by-wire systems, the autopilot is an integrated component. Additionally, autopilots can be manually overridden. Because autopilot systems differ widely in their operation, refer to the autopilot operating instructions in the Airplane Flight Manual, AFM, or the Pilot's Operating Handbook, POH. Chapter Summary Because flight control systems and aerodynamic characteristics vary greatly between aircraft, it is essential that a pilot become familiar with the primary and secondary flight control systems of the aircraft being flown. The primary source of this information is the AFM or the POH. Various manufacturer and owner group websites can also be a valuable source of additional information. End of Part 2 of Chapter 5「Part 1 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweiger. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 6. Aircraft Systems. Introduction. This chapter covers the primary systems found on most aircraft. These include the engine, propeller, induction, ignition, as well as the fuel, lubrication, cooling, electrical, landing gear, and environmental control systems. Power plant. An aircraft engine, or power plant, produces thrust to propel an aircraft. Reciprocating engines and turboprop engines work in combination with the propeller to produce thrust. Turbojet and turbofan engines produce thrust by increasing the velocity of air flowing through the engine. All of these power plants also drive the various systems that support the operation of an aircraft. Reciprocating engines. Most small aircraft are designed with reciprocating engines. The name is derived from the back and forth, or reciprocating, movement of the pistons which produces the mechanical energy necessary to accomplish work. Driven by a revitalization of general aviation, or GA, industry and advances in both material and engine design, reciprocating engine technology has improved dramatically over the past two decades. The integration of computerized engine management systems has improved fuel efficiency, decreased emissions, and reduced pilot workload. Reciprocating engines operate on the basic principle of converting chemical energy, fuel, into mechanical energy. This conversion occurs within the cylinders of the engine through the process of combustion. The two primary reciprocating engine designs are the spark ignition and the compression ignition. The spark ignition reciprocating engine has served as a power plant of choice for many years. In an effort to reduce operating costs, simplify design, and improve reliability, several engine manufacturers are turning to compression ignition as a viable alternative. Often referred to as jet fuel piston engines, compression ignition engines have the added advantage of utilizing readily available and lower cost diesel or jet fuel. The main mechanical components of the spark ignition and compression ignition engine are essentially the same. Both use cylindrical combustion chambers and pistons that travel the length of the cylinders to convert linear motion into the rotary motion of the crankshaft. The main difference between spark ignition and compression ignition is the process of igniting the fuel. Spark ignition engines use a spark plug to ignite a pre-mixed fuel-air mixture. Fuel-air mixture is the rate of weight of the fuel and weight of air in the mixture to be burned. A compression ignition engine first compresses the air in the cylinder, raising its temperature to a degree necessary for automatic ignition when fuel is injected into the cylinder. These two engine designs can further be classified as 1. Cylindrical arrangement with respect to the crankshaft, radial, in line, V-type, or opposed. 2. Operating cycle, 2 or 4. And 3. Method of cooling, liquid or air. Radial engines were widely used during World War II and many are still in service today. With these engines, a row or row of cylinders are arranged in a circular pattern around the crankcase. The main advantage of a radial engine is the favorable power to weight ratio, figure 6-1. Inline engines have a comparatively small frontal area, but their power-to-weight ratios are relatively low. In addition, the rearmost cylinders of an air-cooled inline engine receive very little cooling air, so the engines are normally limited to four or six cylinders. V-type engines provide more horsepower than inline engines and still retain a small frontal area. 
Continued improvements in engine design led to the development of a horizontally opposed engine, which remains the most popular reciprocating engines used on smaller aircraft. These engines always have an even number of cylinders, since a cylinder on one side of the crankcase opposes a cylinder on the other side. Figure 6-2 The majority of these engines are air-cooled and are usually mounted in a horizontal position when installed on fixed-winged airplanes. Opposed type engines have a higher power to weight ratios because they have a comparatively small lightweight crankcase. In addition, the compact cylinder arrangement reduces the fuel's frontal area and allows a streamlined installation that minimizes aerodynamic drag. Depending on the engine manufacturer, all of these arrangements can design to utilize spark or compression ignition and operate on either a two or four stroke cycle. In a two stroke engine, the conversion of chemical energy into mechanical energy occurs over a two-stroke operating cycle. The intake, compression, power, and exhaust processes occur in only two strokes of the piston rather than the more common four strokes. Because a two-stroke engine has a power stroke each revolution of the crankshaft, it typically has a higher power to weight ratio than a comparable four-stroke engine due to the inherent inefficiency and disproportionate emissions of the earliest designs, use of the two-stroke engine has been limited in aviation. Recent advances in material and engine design have reduced many of the negative characteristics associated with two-stroke engines. Modern two-stroke engines often use conventional oil sumps, oil pumps, and full-pressure-fed lubrication systems. The use of direct fuel injection and pressurized air, characteristic of advanced compression ignition engines, make two-stroke compression ignition engines a viable alternative to the more common four-stroke spark ignition designs. Figure 6-3. Spark ignition four-stroke engines remain the most common design used in aviation today. Figure 6-4. The main parts of a spark ignition reciprocating engine include the cylinders, crankcase, and accessory housing. The intake slash exhaust valves, spark plugs, and pistons are located in the cylinders. The crankshaft and connecting rods are located in the crankcase. The magnetos are normally located on the engine accessory housing. In a four-stroke engine, the conversion of chemical energy into mechanical energy occurs over a four-stroke operating cycle. The intake, compression, power, and exhaust processes occur in four separate strokes of the piston. 1. The intake stroke begins as the piston starts its downward travel. When this happens... The intake valve opens and the fuel slash air mixture is drawn into the cylinder. 2. The compression stroke begins when the intake valve closes and the piston starts moving back to the top of the cylinder. This phase of the cycle is used to obtain a much greater power output from the fuel slash air mixture once it is ignited. 3. The power stroke begins when the fuel slash air mixture is ignited. This causes a tremendous pressure increase in the cylinder and forces the piston downward away from the cylinder head, creating the power that turns the crankshaft. 4. The exhaust stroke is used to purge the cylinder of burned gases. It begins when the exhaust valve opens and the piston starts to move towards the cylinder head once again. Even when the engine is operated at a fairly low speed, the four-stroke cycle takes place several hundred times each minute. Figure 6-5 In a four-cylinder engine, each cylinder operates on a different stroke. Continuous rotation of a crankshaft is maintained by the precise timing of power strokes in each cylinder. Continuous operation of the engine depends on the simultaneous function of auxiliary systems, including the induction, ignition, fuel, oil, cooling, and exhaust systems. The latest advance in aircraft reciprocating engines was pioneered in the mid-1960s, by Frank the Alert, who looked to the automotive industry for answers on how to integrate diesel technology into an aircraft engine. The advantage of a diesel-fueled reciprocating engine lies in the physical similarity of diesel and kerosene. Aircraft equipped with a diesel piston engine runs on standard aviation fuel kerosene, which provides more independence, higher reliability, lower consumption, and operational cost saving. In 1999, Thielert formed Thielert Aircraft Engines, TAE, to design, develop, certify, and manufacture a brand new Jet A burning diesel cycle engine, also known as Jet Fueled Piston Engine, for the GA industry. By March 2001, the first prototype engine became the first certified diesel engine since World War II. TAE continues to design and develop diesel cycle engines and other engine manufacturers, such as Société de Modernisation Aeronautique, SMA, now offer jet-fueled piston engines as well. 
TAE engines can be found on the Diamond DA40 single and the DA42 twin star, the first diesel engine to be part of the type certificate of a new original equipment manufacturer, OEM, aircraft. These engines have also gained a toehold in the retrofit market with the supplemental type certificate, STC, to re-engine the Cessna 172 models and the Piper PA-28 family. The jet-fueled piston engines technology has continued to progress, and a full authority digital engine control, FADEC, discussed more fully later in this chapter, is standard on such equipped aircraft which minimizes complication of engine control. By 2007, various jet-fueled piston aircraft had logged well over 600,000 hours of service. Propeller. The propeller is a rotating airfoil subject to induced drag, stalls, and other aerodynamic principles that apply to any airfoil. It provides the necessary thrust to pull, or in some cases push, the aircraft through the air. The engine power is used to rotate the propeller, which in turn generates thrusts very similar to the manner in which a wing produces lift. The amount of thrust produced depends on the shape of the airfoil, the angle of attack of the propeller blade, and the revolutions per minute, RPM, of the engine. The propeller itself is twisted so the blade angle changes from hub to tip. The greatest angle of incidence, or highest pitch, is at the hub, while the smallest angle of incidence, or smallest pitch, is at the tip. Figure 6-6 The reason for the twist is to produce uniform lift from the hub to the tip. As the blade rotates, there is a difference in the actual speed of the various portions of the blade. The tip of the blade travels faster than the part near the hub because the tip travels a greater distance than the hub in the same length of time. Figure 6-7 Changing the angle of incidence, pitch, from the hub to the tip to correspond with the speed produces uniform lift throughout the length of the blade. A propeller blade designed with the same angle of incidence throughout its entire length would be inefficient because as air speed increases in flight, the portion near to the hub would have a negative angle of attack while the blade tip would be stalled. Small aircraft are equipped with either one or two types of propeller. One is the fixed pitch, and the other is adjustable pitch. Fixed pitch propeller. A propeller with fixed blade angles is a fixed pitch propeller. The pitch of the propeller is set by the manufacturer and cannot be changed. Since a fixed pitch propeller achieves the best efficiency only at a given combination of airspeed and RPM, the pitch setting is ideal for neither cruise nor climb. Thus, the aircraft suffers a bit in each performance category. The fixed pitch propeller is used when low weight, simplicity, and low cost are needed. There are two types of fixed pitch propellers, climb and cruise. Whether the airplane has a climb or cruise propeller installed depends upon its intended use. The climb propeller has a lower pitch, therefore less drag. Less drag results in a higher RPM and more horsepower capability, which increases performance during takeoffs and climbs, but decreases performance during cruising flight. The cruise propeller has a higher pitch, therefore more drag. More drag results in lower RPM and less horsepower capability, which decreases performance during takeoffs and climbs, but increases efficiency during cruising flight. The propeller is usually mounted on a shaft, which may be an extension of the engine crankshaft. In this case, the RPM of the propeller would be the same as the crankshaft RPM. On some engines, the propeller is mounted on a shaft geared to the engine crankshaft. In this type, the RPM of the propeller is different than that of the engine. In a fixed pitch propeller, the tachometer is an indicator of engine power. Figure 6-8 A tachometer is calibrated in hundreds of RPM and gives a direct indication of the engine and propeller RPM. The instrument is color-coded, with a green arc denoting the maximum continuous operating RPM. Some tachometers have additional markings to reflect engine and or propeller limitations. The manufacturer's recommendations should be used as a reference to clarify any misunderstanding of tachometer markings. The RPM is regulated by the throttle, which controls the fuel-slash-airflow to the engine. At a given altitude, the higher the tachometer reading, the higher the power output of the engine. When operating altitude increases, the tachometer may not show correct power output of the engine. For example, 2300 RPM at 5000 feet produces less horsepower than 2300 RPM at sea level because power output depends on air density. Air density decreases as altitude increases and a decrease in air density, higher density altitude, decreases the power output of the engine. As altitude changes, the position of the throttle must be changed to maintain the same RPM. 
As altitude is increased, the throttle must be opened further to indicate the same RPM as at a lower altitude. End of part one of chapter six. Part two of chapter six of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweiger. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 6, Part 2. Adjustable Pitch Propeller. The adjustable pitch propeller was the forerunner of the constant speed propeller. It is a propeller with blades whose pitch can be adjusted on the ground with the engine not running, but which cannot be adjusted in flight. It is also referred to as the ground adjustable propeller. By the 1930s, Pioneer aviation inventors were laying the groundwork for automatic pitch change mechanisms, which is why the term sometimes refers to modern constant speed propellers that are adjustable in flight. The first adjustable pitch propeller systems provided only two pitch settings, low and high. Today, most adjustable pitch propeller systems are capable of a range of pitch settings. A constant speed propeller is a controllable pitch propeller whose pitch is automatically varied in flight by a governor maintaining constant RPM despite varying air loads. It is the most common type of adjustable pitch propeller. The main advantage of a constant speed propeller is that it converts a high percentage of brake horsepower, BHP, into thrust horsepower, THP, over a wide range of RPM and airspeed combinations. A constant speed propeller is more efficient than other propellers because it allows selection of the most efficient engine RPM for the given conditions. An aircraft with a constant speed propeller has two controls, the throttle and the propeller control. The throttle controls power output and the propeller control regulates engine RPM. This in turn regulates propeller RPM, which is registered on the tachometer. Once a specific RPM is selected, a governor automatically adjusts the propeller blade angle as necessary to maintain the selected RPM. For example, after setting the desired RPM during cruising flight, an increase in airspeed or decrease in propeller load will cause the propeller blade angle to increase as necessary to maintain the selected RPM. A reduction in airspeed or increase in propeller load will cause the propeller blade angle to decrease. The propeller's constant speed range, defined by the high and low pitch stops, is the range of possible blade angles for a constant speed propeller. As long as the propeller blade angle is within the constant speed range and not against either pitch stop, a constant engine RPM will be maintained. If the propeller blades contact a pitch stop, the engine RPM will increase or decrease as appropriate with changes in airspeed and propeller load. For example, once a specific RPM has been selected, if aircraft speed decreases enough to rotate the propeller blades until they contact the low pitch stop, any further decrease in airspeed will cause engine RPM to decrease the same way as if a fixed pitch propeller were installed. The same holds true when an aircraft equipped with a constant speed propeller accelerates to a faster airspeed. As the aircraft accelerates, the propeller blade angle increases to maintain the selected RPM until the high pitch stop is reached. Once this occurs, the blade angle cannot increase any further, and the engine RPM increases. On aircraft equipped with a constant speed propeller, power output is controlled by the throttle and indicated by a manifold pressure gauge. The gauge measures the absolute pressure of the fuel-slash-air mixture inside the intake manifold, and is more correctly a measure of manifold absolute pressure, MAP. At a constant RPM and altitude, the amount of power produced is directly related to the fuel slash airflow being delivered to the combustion chamber. As the throttle setting is increased, more fuel and air flows to the engine and MAP increases. When the engine is not running, the manifold pressure gauge indicates ambient air pressure, i.e. 29.92 inches mercury. When the engine is started, the manifold pressure indication will decrease to a value less than ambient pressure, i.e. idle at 12 inches mercury. Engine failure or power loss is indicated on the manifold gauge as an increase in manifold pressure to a value corresponding to the ambient air pressure at an altitude where the failure occurred. See figure 6-9. The manifold pressure gauge is color-coded to indicate the engine's operating range. The face of the manifold pressure gauge contains a green arc to show the normal operating range and a red radial line to indicate the upper limit of manifold pressure. For any given RPM, there is a manifold pressure that should not be exceeded. 
If manifold pressure is excessive for a given RPM, the pressure within the cylinders could be exceeded, placing undue stress on the cylinders. If repeated too frequently, this stress can weaken the cylinder components and eventually cause engine failure. As a general rule, manifold pressure in inches should be less than the RPM. A pilot can avoid conditions that overstress the cylinders by being constantly aware of the RPM, especially when increasing the manifold pressure. Conform to the manufacturer's recommendations for power settings of a particular engine to maintain the proper relationship between manifold pressure and RPM. When both manifold pressure and RPM need to be changed, avoid engine overstress by making power adjustments in the proper order. When power settings are being decreased, reduce manifold pressure before reducing RPM. If RPM is reduced before manifold pressure, manifold pressure will automatically increase, possibly exceeding the manufacturer's tolerances. When power settings are being increased, reverse the order. Increase RPM first, then manifold pressure. To prevent damage to radial engines, minimize operating time at maximum RPM and manifold pressure, and avoid operation at maximum RPM and low manifold pressure. The engine and or airframe manufacturer's recommendations should be followed to prevent severe wear, fatigue, and damage to high-performance reciprocating engines. Induction systems. The induction system brings in air from the outside, mixes it with fuel, and delivers the fuel-slash-air mixture to the cylinder where combustion occurs. Outside air enters the induction system through an intake port on the front of the engine cowling. This port normally contains an air filter that inhibits the entry of dust and other foreign objects. Since the filter may occasionally become clogged, an alternate source of air must be available. Usually, the alternate air comes from inside the engine cowling, where it bypasses a clogged air filter. Some alternative air sources function automatically, while others operate manually. Two types of induction systems are commonly used in small aircraft engines. 1. The carburetor system, which mixes the fuel and air in the carburetor before this mixture enters the intake manifold. 2. The fuel injection system, which mixes the fuel and air immediately before entry into each cylinder or injects fuel directly into each cylinder. Carburetor systems. Carburetors are classified as either float type or pressure type. The float type of carburetor, complete with idling, accelerating, mixture control, idle cutoff, and power enrichment systems is probably the most common of all carburetor types. Pressure carburetors are usually not found on small aircraft. The basic difference between a float type and a pressure type carburetor is the delivery of fuel. The pressure type carburetor delivers fuel under pressure by a fuel pump. In the operation of the float type carburetor system, the outside air first flows through an air filter, usually located at an air intake in the front part of the engine cowling. This filtered air flows into the carburetor and through a venturi, a narrow throat in the carburetor. When the air flows through the venturi, a low pressure area is created, which forces the fuel to flow through a main fuel jet located at the throat. The fuel then flows into the airstream, where it is mixed with the flowing air. See figure 6-10. The fuel-slash-air mixture is then drawn through the intake manifold and into the combustion chambers where it is ignited. The float-type carburetor acquires its name from a float, which rests on fuel within the float chamber. A needle attached to the float opens and closes an opening at the bottom of the carburetor bowl. This meters the correct amount of fuel into the carburetor, depending upon the position of the float, which is controlled by the level of fuel in the float chamber. When the level of fuel forces the float to rise, the needle valve closes the fuel opening and shuts off fuel flow to the carburetor. The needle valve opens again when the engine requires additional fuel. The flow of the fuel-slash-air mixture to the combustion chambers is regulated by the throttle valve, which is controlled by the throttle in the flight deck. The float-type carburetor has several distinct disadvantages. In the first place, imagine the effect that abrupt maneuvers have on the float action. In the second place, the fact that its fuel must be discharged at low pressure leads to an incomplete vaporization and difficulty in discharging fuel into some types of supercharged systems. The chief disadvantage of the float carburetor, however, is its icing tendency. Since the float carburetor must discharge fuel at a point of low pressure, the discharge nozzle must be located at the venturi throat, and the throttle valve must be on the engine side of the discharge nozzle. This means that the drop in temperature due to fuel vaporization takes place within the venturi. As a result, ice readily forms in the venturi and on the throat valve. A pressure type carburetor discharges fuel into the airstream at a pressure well above atmospheric. 
This results in better vaporization and permits the discharge of fuel into the airstream on the engine side of the throttle valve. With the discharge nozzle located at this point, the drop in temperature due to fuel vaporization takes place after the air has passed the throttle valve and at a point when engine heat tends to offset it. Thus, the danger of fuel vaporization icing is practically eliminated. The effects of rapid maneuvers and rough air on the pressure type carburetors are negligible since their fuel chambers remain filled under all operating conditions. Mixture control. Carburetors are normally calibrated at sea level pressure, where the correct fuel to air mixture ratio is established with the mixture control set in the full rich position. However, as altitude increases, the density of air entering the carburetor decreases, while the density of the fuel remains the same. This creates a progressively richer mixture, which can result in engine roughness and an appreciable loss of power. The roughness is normally due to spark plug fouling from excessive carbon buildup on the plugs. Carbon buildup occurs because the rich mixture lowers the temperature inside the cylinder, inhibiting complete combustion of the fuel. This condition may occur during the pre-takeoff run-up at high elevation airports and during climb or cruise flight at high altitudes. To maintain the correct fuel-slash-air mixture, the mixture must be leaned using the mixture control. Leaning the mixture decreases fuel flow, which compensates for the decreased air density at high altitude. During a descent from high altitude, the mixture must be enriched, or it may become too lean. An overly lean mixture causes detonation, which may result in rough engine operation, overheating, and a loss of power. The best way to maintain the proper mixture is to monitor the engine temperature and enrich the mixture as needed. Proper mixture control and better fuel economy for fuel-injected engines can be achieved by the use of an exhaust gas temperature, EGT, gauge. Since the process of adjusting the mixture can vary from one aircraft to another, it is important to refer to the Airplane Flight Manual, AFM, or the Pilot's Operating Handbook, POH, to determine the specific procedures for a given aircraft. Carburetor Icing As mentioned earlier, one disadvantage of the float-type carburetor is in its icing tendency. Carburetor ice occurs due to the effect of fuel vaporization and the decrease in air pressure in the venturi which causes a sharp temperature drop in the carburetor. If water vapor in the air condenses when the carburetor temperature is at or below freezing, ice may form on internal surfaces of the carburetor, including the throttle valve. See figure 611. The reduced air pressure, as well as the vaporization of fuel, contributes to the temperature decrease in the carburetor. Ice generally forms in the vicinity of the throttle valve and in the venturi throat. This restricts the flow of the fuel-slash-air mixture and reduces power. If enough ice builds up, the engine may cease to operate. Carburetor ice is most likely to occur when temperatures are below 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, and the relative humidity is above 80%. Due to the sudden cooling that takes place in the carburetor, icing can even occur with temperatures as high as 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius and humidity as low as 50%. This temperature drop can be as much as 60 to 70 absolute versus relative degrees Fahrenheit. 70 times 100 divided by 180 equals 38.89 degrees Celsius. Remember, 180 degrees Fahrenheit from freezing to boiling versus 100 degrees for the Celsius scale. Therefore, at an outside air temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37.78 degrees Celsius, a temperature drop of an absolute 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38.89 degrees Celsius, results in an air temperature in the carburetor of 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 1 degrees Celsius. See figure 6-12. The first indication of carburetor icing in an aircraft with a fixed pitch propeller is a decrease in engine RPM, which may be followed by engine roughness. In an aircraft with a constant speed propeller, carburetor icing is usually indicated by a decrease in manifold pressure, but no reduction in RPM. Propeller pitch is automatically adjusted to compensate for loss of power. Thus, a constant RPM is maintained. Although carburetor ice can occur during any phase of flight, it is particularly dangerous when using reduced power during a descent. Under certain circumstances, carburetor ice could build unnoticed until power is added. To combat the effect of carburetor ice, engines with float-type carburetors employ a carburetor heat system. Carburetor heat. 
Carburetor heat is an anti-icing system that preheats the air before it reaches the carburetor and is intended to keep the fuel-slash-air mixture above the freezing temperature to prevent the formation of carburetor ice. Carburetor heat can be used to melt ice that has already formed on the carburetor if the accumulation is not too great, but using the carburetor heat as a preventative measure is a better option. Additionally, the use of carburetor heat as an alternate air source can be used if the intake filter clogs, such as in sudden or unexpected airframe icing conditions. Carburetor heat should be checked during the engine run-up. When using carburetor heat, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. When conditions are conducive to carburetor icing during flight, periodic checks should be made to detect its presence. If detected, full carburetor heat should be applied immediately, and it should be left in the on position until the pilot is certain all the ice has been removed. If ice is present, applying partial heat or leaving heat on for an insufficient time might aggravate the situation. In extreme cases of carburetor icing, even after the ice has been removed, full carburetor heat should be used to prevent further ice formation. If installed, a carburetor temperature gauge is useful in determining when to use carburetor heat. Whenever the throttle is closed during flight, the engine cools rapidly and vaporization of fuel is less complete than if the engine is warm. Also, in this condition, the engine is more susceptible to carburetor icing. If carburetor icing conditions are suspected and closed throttle operation anticipated, adjust the carburetor heat to the full on position before closing the throttle and leave it on during the closed throttle operation. The heat will aid in vaporizing the fuel and help prevent the formation of carburetor ice. Periodically, open the throttle smoothly for a few seconds to keep the engine warm. Otherwise, the carburetor heater may not provide enough heat to prevent icing. The use of carburetor heat causes a decrease in engine power, sometimes up to 15%, because the heated air is less dense than the outside air that has been entering the engine. This enriches the mixture. When ice is present in an aircraft with a fixed pitch propeller, and the carburetor heat is being used, there is a decrease in RPM, followed by a gradual increase in RPM as the ice melts. The engine also should run more smoothly after the ice has been removed. If ice is not present, the RPM will decrease and then remain constant. When carburetor heat is used on an aircraft with a constant speed propeller and ice is present, a decrease in the manifold pressure will be noticed, followed by a gradual increase. If carburetor icing is not present, the gradual increase in manifold pressure will not be apparent until the carburetor heat is turned off. It is imperative for a pilot to recognize carburetor ice when it forms during flight because loss of power, altitude, and or airspeed will occur. These symptoms may sometimes be accompanied by vibration or engine roughness. Once a power loss is noticed, immediate action should be taken to eliminate ice already formed in the carburetor and to prevent further ice formation. This is accomplished by applying full carburetor heat, which will cause a further reduction in power and possibly engine roughness as melted ice goes through the engine. These symptoms may last from 30 seconds to several minutes, depending on the severity of the icing. During this period, the pilot must resist the temptation to decrease carburetor heat usage. Carburetor heat must remain in the full hot position until normal power returns. Since the use of carburetor heat tends to reduce the output of the engine and to increase the operating temperature, carburetor heat should not be used when full power is required, as during takeoff or during normal engine operation, except to check for the presence or to remove carburetor ice. Carburetor air temperature gauge. Some aircraft are equipped with a carburetor air temperature gauge, which is useful in detecting potential icing conditions. Usually, the face of the gauge is calibrated to degrees Celsius, with the yellow arc indicating the carburetor air temperatures where icing may occur. This yellow arc typically ranges between negative 15 degrees Celsius and positive 5 degrees Celsius, or 5 degrees Fahrenheit and 41 degrees Fahrenheit. If the air temperature and moisture content of the air are such that carburetor icing is improbable, the engine can be operated with the indicator in the yellow range with no adverse effects. If the atmospheric conditions are conducive to carburetor icing, the indicator must be kept outside the yellow arc by application of carburetor heat. Certain carburetor air temperature gauges have a red radial, which indicates the maximum permissible carburetor inlet air temperature recommended by the engine manufacturer. If present, a green arc indicates the normal operating range. Outside air temperature gauge. Most aircraft are equipped with an outside air temperature, OAT, gauge calibrated in both degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit. It provides the outside or ambient air temperature for calculating true airspeed. It is also useful in detecting potential icing conditions. Fuel injection systems. 
In a fuel injection system, the fuel is injected directly into the cylinders, or just ahead of the intake valve. The air intake for the fuel injection system is similar to that used in a carburetor system, with an alternate air source located within the engine cowling. This source is used if the external air source is obstructed. The alternate air source is usually operated automatically, with a backup manual system that can be used if the automatic feature malfunctions. A fuel injection system usually incorporates six basic components. An engine-driven fuel pump, a fuel-slash-air control unit, fuel manifold, or fuel distributor, discharge nozzles, an auxiliary fuel pump, and fuel pressure-slash-flow indicators. See figure 6-13. An auxiliary fuel pump provides fuel under pressure to the fuel slash air control unit for engine starting and or emergency use. After starting, the engine driven fuel pump provides fuel under pressure from the fuel tank to the fuel slash air control unit. This control unit, which essentially replaces the carburetor, meters fuel based on the mixture control setting and sends it to the fuel manifold valve at a rate controlled by the throttle. After reaching the fuel manifold valve, the fuel is distributed to the individual fuel discharge nozzles. The discharge nozzles, which are located in each cylinder head, inject the fuel-slash-air mixture directly into each cylinder intake port. A fuel injection system is considered to be less susceptible to icing than the carburetor system, but impact icing on the air intake is a possibility in either system. Impact icing occurs when the ice forms on the exterior of the aircraft and blocks openings such as the air intake for the injection system. Advantages of fuel injection, reduction in evaporative icing, better fuel flow, faster throttle response, precise control of mixture, better fuel distribution, easier cold weather starts. Disadvantages, difficulty in starting a hot engine, vapor locks during ground operations on hot days, problems associated with restarting an engine that quits because of fuel starvation. End of part two of chapter six. Part 3 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweigert. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Part 3 of Chapter 6. Superchargers and Turbo Superchargers. To increase an engine's horsepower, Manufacturers have developed forced induction systems called supercharger and turbo supercharger systems. They both compress the intake air to increase its density. The key difference lies in the power supply. A supercharger relies on an engine-driven air pump or compressor, while a turbo supercharger gets its power from the exhaust stream that runs through a turbine, which in turn spins the compressor. Aircraft with these systems have a manifold pressure gauge, which displays MAP within the engine's intake manifold. On a standard day at sea level with the engine shut down, the manifold pressure gauge will indicate the ambient absolute air pressure of 29.92 inches mercury. Because atmospheric pressure decreases approximately 1 inch mercury per 1,000 feet of altitude increase, the manifold pressure gauge will indicate approximately 24.92 inches mercury at an airport that is 5,000 feet above sea level with standard day conditions. As a normally aspirated aircraft climbs, it eventually reaches an altitude where the MAP is insufficient for a normal climb. That altitude limit is the aircraft's service ceiling, and it is directly affected by the engine's ability to produce power. If the induction air entering the engine is pressurized or boosted by either a supercharger or a turbo supercharger, the aircraft's service ceiling can be increased. With these systems, an aircraft can fly at altitudes with the advantage of higher true air speeds and the increased ability to circumnavigate adverse weather. Superchargers A supercharger is an engine-driven air pump or compressor that provides compressed air to the engine to provide additional pressure to the induction air so the engine can produce additional power. It increases manifold pressure and forces the fuel-slash-air mixture into the cylinders. The higher the manifold pressure, the more dense the fuel-slash-air mixture and the more power an engine can produce. With a normally aspirated engine, it is not possible to have the manifold pressure higher than the existing atmospheric pressure. A supercharger is capable of boosting manifold pressure above 30 inches mercury. For example, at 8,000 feet, a typical engine may be able to produce 75% of the power it could produce at a mean sea level, MSL, because the air is less dense at the higher altitude. 
the supercharger compresses the air to a higher density, allowing a supercharged engine to produce the same manifold pressure at higher altitudes as it could at sea level. Thus an engine at 8,000 feet MSL could still produce 25 inches mercury of manifold pressure, whereas without a supercharger, it could produce only 22 inches mercury. Superchargers are especially valuable at high altitudes, such as 18,000 feet, where the air density is 50% that of sea level. The use of a supercharger, in many cases, will supply air to the engine at the same density as it did at sea level. With a normally aspirated engine, it is not possible to have manifold pressure higher than the existing atmospheric pressure. A supercharger is capable of boosting manifold pressure above 30 inches mercury. The components of a supercharged induction system are similar to those of a normally aspirated system, with the addition of a supercharger between the fuel metering device and intake manifold. A supercharger is driven by the engine through a gear train at 1 speed, 2 speed, or variable speeds. In addition, superchargers can have one or more stages. Each stage also provides an increase in pressure, and superchargers may be classified as single stage, two stage, or multi-stage, depending on the number of times compression occurs. An early version of a single stage, single speed supercharger may be referred to as a sea level supercharger. An engine equipped with this type of supercharger is called a sea level engine. With this type of supercharger, a single gear-driven impeller is used to increase the power produced by an engine at all altitudes. The drawback of this type of supercharger is a decrease in engine power output with an increase in altitude. Single-stage, single-speed superchargers are found on many high-powered radial engines and use an air intake that faces forward so the induction system can take full advantage of the ram air. Intake air passes through ducts to the carburetor, where fuel is metered in proportion to the airflow. The fuel-slash-air change is then ducted to the supercharger, or blower impeller, which accelerates the fuel-slash-air mixture outward. Once accelerated, the fuel-slash-air mixture passes through a diffuser, where air velocity is traded for pressure energy. After compression, the resulting high-pressure fuel-slash-air mixture is directed to the cylinders. Some of the large radial engines developed during World War II have a single-stage, two-speed supercharger. With this type of supercharger, a single impeller may be operated at two speeds. The low impeller speed is often referred to as the low blower setting, while the high impeller speed is called the high blower setting. On engines equipped with a two-speed supercharger, a lever or switch in the flight deck activates an oil-operated clutch that switches from one speed to the other. Under normal operations, takeoff is made with the supercharger in the low blower position. In this mode, the engine performs as a ground-boosted engine, and the power output decreases as the aircraft gains altitude. However, once the aircraft reaches a specified altitude, a power reduction is made, and the supercharger control is switched to the high blower position. The throttle is then reset to the desired manifold pressure. An engine equipped with this type of supercharger is called an altitude engine. See figure 6-14. Turbo Superchargers the most efficient method of increasing horsepower in an engine is by use of a turbo supercharger or turbocharger. Installed on an engine, this booster uses the engine's exhaust gases to drive an air compressor to increase the pressure of the air going into the engine through the carburetor or fuel injection system to boost power at higher altitude. The major disadvantage of a gear-driven supercharger, use of a large amount of the engine's power output for the amount of power increase produced, is avoided with a turbocharger because turbochargers are powered by the engine's exhaust gases. This means a turbocharger recovers energy from hot exhaust gases that would otherwise be lost. A second advantage of turbochargers over superchargers is the ability to maintain control over an engine's rated sea level horsepower from sea level up to the engine's critical altitude. Critical altitude is the maximum altitude at which a turbocharged engine can produce its rated horsepower. Above the critical altitude, power output begins to decrease like it does for a normally aspirated engine. Turbochargers increase the pressure of the engine's induction air, which allows the engine to develop sea level or greater horsepower at higher altitudes. A turbocharger is comprised of two main elements, a compressor and turbine. The compressor section houses an impeller that turns at a high rate of speed. As induction air is drawn across the impeller blades, the impeller accelerates the air, allowing a large volume of air to be drawn into the compressor housing. The impeller's action subsequently produces high-pressure, high-density air, which is delivered to the engine. To turn the impeller, 
The engine's exhaust gases are used to drive a turbine wheel that is mounted on the opposite end of the impeller's drive shaft. By directing different amounts of exhaust gases to flow over the turbine, more energy can be extracted, causing the impeller to deliver more compressed air to the engine. The wastegate, essentially an adjustable butterfly valve installed in the exhaust system, is used to vary the mass of exhaust gas flowing into the turbine. When closed, most of the exhaust gases from the engine are forced to flow through the turbine. When open, the exhaust gases are allowed to bypass the turbine by flowing directly through the engine's exhaust pipe. See figure 6-15. Since the temperature of a gas rises when it is compressed, turbocharging causes the temperature of the induction air to increase. To reduce this temperature and to lower the risk of detonation, many turbocharged engines use an intercooler. This small heat exchanger uses outside air to cool the hot compressed air before it enters the fuel metering device. System Operation on most modern turbocharged engines, the position of the waste gate is governed by a pressure sensing control mechanism coupled to an actuator. Engine oil directed into or away from this actuator moves the waste gate position. On these systems, the actuator is automatically positioned to produce the desired MAP simply by changing the position of the throttle control. Other turbocharging system designs use a separate manual control to position the waste gate. With manual control, the manifold pressure gauge must be closely monitored to determine when the desired MAP has been achieved. Manual systems are often found on aircraft that have been modified with aftermarket turbocharging systems. These systems require special operating considerations. For example, if the wastegate is left closed after descending from a high altitude, it is possible to produce a manifold pressure that exceeds the engine's limitations. This condition, called an overboost, may produce severe detonation because of the leaning effect resulting from increased air density during descent. Although an automatic wastegate system is less likely to experience an overboost condition, it can still occur. If takeoff power is applied while the engine oil temperature is below its normal operating range, the cold oil may not flow out of the wastegate actuator quickly enough to prevent an overboost. To prevent overboosting, advance the throttle cautiously to prevent exceeding the maximum manifold pressure limits. A pilot flying an aircraft with a turbocharger should be aware of system limitations. For example, a turbocharger turbine and impeller can operate at rotational speeds in excess of 80,000 RPM while at extremely high temperatures. To achieve high rotational speed, the bearings within the system must be constantly supplied with engine oil to reduce the frictional forces and high temperature. To obtain adequate lubrication, the oil temperature should be applied in the normal operating range before high throttle settings are applied. In addition, allow the turbocharger to cool and the turbine to slow down before shutting the engine down. Otherwise, the remaining oil in the bearing housing will boil, causing high carbon deposits to form on the bearings and shaft. These deposits rapidly deteriorate the turbocharger's efficiency and service life. For further limitations, refer to the AFM slash POH, High Altitude Performance. As an aircraft equipped with a turbocharging system climbs, the wastegate is gradually closed to maintain the maximum allowable manifold pressure. At some point, the wastegate will be fully closed and further increases in altitude will cause the manifold pressure to decrease. This is the critical altitude, which is established by the aircraft or engine manufacturer. When evaluating the performance of a turbocharging system, be aware if the manifold pressure begins decreasing before the specified critical altitude, the engine and turbocharging system should be inspected by a qualified aviation maintenance technician to verify the system's proper operation. Ignition System In a spark ignition engine, the ignition system provides a spark that ignites the fuel-slash-air mixture in the cylinders and is made up of magnetos, spark plugs, high-tension leads, and the ignition switch. See Figure 6-16 a magneto uses a permanent magnet to generate an electrical current completely independent of the aircraft's electrical system. The magneto generates sufficiently high voltage to jump a spark across the spark plug gap in each cylinder. The system begins to fire when the starter engine is engaged and the crankshaft begins to turn. It continues to operate whenever the crankshaft is rotating. Most standard certified aircraft incorporate a dual ignition system with two individual magnetos, separate sets of wires, and spark plugs to increase reliability of the ignition system. Each magneto operates independently to fire one of the two spark plugs in each cylinder. The firing of two spark plugs improves combustion of the fuel-slash-air mixture and results in a slightly higher power output. If one of the magnetos fails, the other is unaffected. 
the engine will continue to operate normally, although a slight decrease in engine power can be expected. The same is true if one of the two spark plugs in a cylinder fails. The operation of the magneto is controlled in the flight deck by the ignition switch. The switch has five positions. 1. Off. 2. R, or right. 3. L, or left. 4. Both. And 5. Start. With right or left selected, only the associated magneto is activated. The system operates on both magnetos with both selected. A manufacturing ignition system can be identified during the pre-takeoff check by observing the decrease in RPM that occurs when the ignition switch is first moved from both to right and then from both to left. A small decrease in engine RPM is normal during this check. The permissible decrease is listed in the AFM or POH. If the engine stops running when switched to one magneto or if the RPM drop exceeds the allowable limit, do not fly the aircraft until the problem is corrected. The cause could be foul plugs, broken or shorted wires between the magneto and the plugs, or improperly timed firing of the plugs. It should be noted that no drop in RPM is not normal, and in that instance, the aircraft should not be flown. Following engine shutdown, turn the ignition switch to the off position. Even with the battery and master switches off, the engine can fire and turn over if the ignition switch is left on and the propeller is moved because the magneto requires no outside source of electrical power. Be aware of the potential for serious injury in this situation. Even with the ignition switch in the off position, if the ground wire between the magneto and the ignition switch becomes disconnected or broken, the engine could accidentally start if the propeller is moved with residual fuel in the cylinder. If this occurs, the only way to stop the engine is to move the mixture lever to the idle cutoff position, then have the system checked by a qualified aviation maintenance technician. Oil Systems The engine oil system performs several important functions. Lubrication of the engine's moving parts, cooling of the engine by reducing friction, removing heat from the cylinders, providing a seal between the cylinder walls and pistons, carrying away contaminants. Reciprocating engines use either a wet sump or a dry sump oil system. In a wet sump system, the oil is located in a sump, which is an integral part of the engine. In a dry sump system, the oil is contained in a separate tank and circulated through the engine by pumps. See figure 6-17. The main component of a wet sump system is the oil pump, which draws oil from the sump and routes it to the engine. After the oil passes through the engine, it returns to the sump. In some engines, additional lubrication is supplied by the rotating crankshaft, which splashes oil onto portions of the engine. An oil pump also supplies oil pressure in a dry sump system, but the source of the oil is located external to the engine in a separate oil tank. After oil is routed through the engine, it is pumped from the various locations in the engine back to the oil tank by scavenge pumps. Dry sump systems allow for a greater volume of oil to be supplied to the engine, which makes them more suitable for very large reciprocating engines. The oil pressure gauge provides a direct indication of the oil system operation. It ensures that the pressure in pounds per square inch, or PSI, of the oil is supplied to the engine. Green indicates the normal operating range, while red indicates the minimum and maximum pressures. There should be an indication of the oil pressure during engine start. Refer to the AFM slash POH for manufacturer limitations. The oil temperature gauge measures the temperature of oil. A green area shows the normal operating range, and the red line indicates the maximum allowable temperature. Unlike oil pressure, changes in oil temperature occur more slowly. This is particularly noticeable after a starting a cold engine, when it may take several minutes or longer for the gauge to show any increase in oil temperature. Check oil temperature periodically during flight, especially when operating in high or low ambient air temperature. High oil temperature indications may single a plugged oil line, a low oil quantity, a blocked oil cooler, or a defective temperature gauge. Low oil temperature indications may signal improper oil viscosity during cold weather operations. The oil filter cap and dipstick, for measuring the oil quantity, are usually accessible through a panel in the engine cowling. If the quantity does not meet the manufacturer's recommended operating levels, oil should be added. The AFM slash POH, or placards near the access panel, provide information about the correct oil type and weight, as well as the minimum and maximum oil quantity. See figure 6-18. End of part 3 of chapter 6.
Part 4 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweigert. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 6. Part 4. Engine Cooling Systems. The burning fuel within the cylinders produces intense heat most of which is expelled through the exhaust system. Much of the remaining heat, however, must be removed, or at least dissipated, to prevent the engine from overheating. Otherwise, the extremely high engine temperatures can lead to loss of power, excessive oil consumption, detonation, and serious engine damage. While the oil system is vital to the internal cooling of the engine, an additional method of cooling is necessary for the engine's external surface. Most small aircraft are air-cooled, although some are liquid-cooled. Air cooling is accomplished by air flowing into the engine compartment through openings in the front of the engine cowling. Baffles route this air over fins attached to the engine cylinders and other parts of the engine, where the air absorbs the engine heat. Expulsion of the hot air takes place through one or more openings in the lower, aft portion of the engine cowling. See figure 6-19. The outside air enters the engine compartment through an inlet behind the propeller hub. Baffles direct it to the hottest parts of the engine, primarily the cylinders, which have fins that increase the area exposed to the airflow. The air cooling system is less effective during ground operations, takeoffs, go-arounds, and other periods of high-power, low airspeed operation. Conversely, high-speed descents provide excess air and can shock cool the engine, subjecting it to abrupt temperature fluctuations. Operating the engine at higher than its design temperature can cause loss of power, excessive oil consumption, and detonation. It will also lead to serious permanent damage, such as scoring the cylinder walls, damaging the pistons and rings, and burning and warping the valves. Monitoring the flight deck engine temperature instruments will aid in avoiding high operating temperature. Under normal operating conditions in aircraft not equipped with cowl flaps, the engine temperature can be controlled by changing the airspeed or the power output of the engine. High engine temperatures can be decreased by increasing the airspeed and or reducing the power. The oil temperature gauge gives an indirect and delayed indication of rising engine temperature, but can be used for determining engine temperature if this is the only means available. Most aircraft are equipped with a cylinder head temperature gauge, which indicates a direct and immediate cylinder temperature change. This instrument is calibrated in degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit and is usually color-coded with a green arc to indicate the normal operating range. A red line on the instrument indicates maximum allowable cylinder head temperature. To avoid excessive cylinder head temperatures, increase airspeed, enrich the mixture, and slash or reduce power. Any of these procedures help to reduce the engine temperature. On aircraft equipped with cowl flaps, use the cowl flap positions to control the temperature. Cowl flaps are hinged covers that fit over the opening through which the hot air is expelled. If engine temperature is low, the cowl flaps can be closed, thereby restricting the flow of expelled hot air and increasing engine temperature. If the engine temperature is high, the cowl flaps can be opened to permit a greater flow of air through the system, thereby decreasing the engine temperature. Exhaust Systems Engine exhaust systems vent the burned combustion gases overboard, provide heat for the cabin, Defrost the windscreen. An exhaust system has exhaust piping attached to the cylinders, as well as a muffler and a muffler shroud. The exhaust gases are pushed out of the cylinder through the exhaust valve and then through the exhaust pipe system to the atmosphere. For cabin heat, outside air is drawn into the air inlet and is ducted through a shroud around the muffler. The muffler is heated by the exiting exhaust gases and, in turn, heats the air around the muffler. This heated air is then ducted to the cabin for heat and defrost applications. The heat and defrost are controlled in the flight deck and can be adjusted to the desired level. Exhaust gases contain large amounts of carbon monoxide, which is odorless and colorless. Carbon monoxide is deadly, and its presence is virtually impossible to detect. The exhaust system must be in good condition and free of cracks. Some exhaust systems have an EGT probe. This probe transmits the EGT to an instrument in the flight deck. The EGT gauge measures the temperature of the gases at the exhaust manifold. 
This temperature varies with the ratio of fuel to air entering the cylinders and can be used as a basis for regulating the fuel-slash-air mixture. The EGT gauge is highly accurate in indicating the correct mixture setting. When using the EGT to aid in leaning the fuel-slash-air mixture, fuel consumption can be reduced. For specific procedures, refer to the manufacturer's recommendations for leaning the mixture. Starting System Most small aircraft use a direct cranking electric starter system. This system consists of a source of electricity, wiring, switches, and solenoids to operate the starter and a starter motor. Most aircraft have starters that automatically engage and disengage when operated, but some older aircraft have starters that are mechanically engaged by a lever actuated by the pilot. The starter engages the aircraft flywheel, rotating the engine at a speed that allows the engine to start and maintain operation. Electrical power for starting is usually supplied by an onboard battery, but can also be supplied by an external power through an external power receptacle. When the battery switch is turned on, electricity is supplied to the main power bus bar through the battery solenoid. Both the starter and the starter switch draw current from the main bus bar, but the starter will not operate until the starting solenoid is energized by the starter switch being turned to the start position. When the starter switch is released from the start position, the solenoid removes power from the starting motor. The starter motor is protected from being driven by the engine through a clutch in the starter drive that allows the engine to run faster than the starter motor. See Figure 6-20 and Arata. When starting an engine, the rules of safety and courtesy should be strictly observed. One of the most important is to make sure that there is no one near the propeller. In addition, the wheels should be chalked and the brakes set to avoid hazards caused by unintentional movement. To avoid damage to the propeller and property, the aircraft should be in an area where the propeller will not stir up gravel or dust. Combustion During normal combustion, the fuel-slash-air mixture burns in a very controlled and predictable manner. In a spark ignition engine, the process occurs in a fraction of a second. The mixture actually begins to burn at the point where it is ignited by the spark plugs, then burns away from the plugs until it is all consumed. This type of combustion causes a smooth buildup of temperature and pressure, and ensures that the expanding gases deliver the maximum force to the piston at exactly the right time in the power stroke. See Figure 6-21. Detonation is an uncontrolled explosive ignition of the fuel-slash-air mixture within the cylinder's combustion chamber. It causes excessive temperatures and pressures which, if not corrected, can quickly lead to the failure of the piston, cylinder, or valves. In less severe cases, detonation causes engine overheating, roughness, or loss of power. Detonation is characterized by high cylinder head temperatures and is most likely to occur when operating at high power settings. Common operational causes of detonation are use of a lower fuel grade than that specified by the aircraft manufacturer, Operation of the engine with extremely high manifold pressures in conjunction with low RPM. Operation of the engine at high power settings with an excessively lean mixture. Maintaining extended ground operations or steep climbs in which cylinder cooling is reduced. Detonation may be avoided by following these basic guidelines during the various phases of ground and flight operations. Make sure the proper grade of fuel is used. Keep the cowl flaps, if available, in the full open position while on the ground to provide the maximum airflow through the cowling. Use an enriched fuel mixture as well as a shower climb angle to increase cylinder cooling during takeoff and initial climb. Avoid extended high power steep climbs. Develop the habit of monitoring the engine's instruments to verify proper operation according to the procedures established by the manufacturer. Pre-ignition occurs when the fuel-slash-air mixture ignites prior to the engine's normal ignition event. Premature burning is usually caused by a residual hot spot in the combustion chamber, often created by a small carbon deposit on a spark plug, a cracked spark plug insulator, or other damage in the cylinder that causes a part to heat sufficiently to ignite the fuel-slash-air charge. Pre-ignition causes the engine to lose power and produces high operating temperature. As with detonation, Pre-ignition may also cause severe engine damage because the expanding gases exert excessive pressure on the piston while it is in the compression stroke. Detonation and pre-ignition often occur simultaneously and one may cause the other. Since either condition causes high engine temperature accompanied by a decrease in engine performance, 
it is often difficult to distinguish between the two. Using the recommended grade of fuel and operating the engine within its proper temperature, pressure, and RPM ranges reduce the chance of detonation or pre-ignition. Full Authority Digital Engine Control, or FADEC. FADEC is a system consisting of a digital computer and ancillary components that control the aircraft's engine and propeller. First used in turbine-powered aircraft and referred to as Full Authority Digital Electronic Control, these sophisticated control systems are increasingly being used in piston-powered aircraft. In a spark ignition reciprocating engine, the FADEC uses speed, temperature, and pressure sensors to monitor the status of each cylinder. A digital computer calculates the ideal pulse for each injector and adjusts ignition timing as necessary to achieve optimal performance. In a compression ignition engine, the FADEC operates similarly and performs all the same functions, excluding those specifically related to the spark ignition process. The FADEC systems eliminate the need for magnetos, carburetor heat, mixture controls, and engine priming. A single throttle lever is characteristic of an aircraft equipped with an FADEC system. The pilot simply positions the throttle lever to a desired detent, such as start, idle, cruise power, or max power, and the FADEC system adjusts the engine and propeller automatically for the mode selected. There is no need for the pilot to monitor or control the fuel-slash-air mixture. During aircraft starting, the FADEC primes the cylinders, adjusts the mixture, and positions the throttle based on engine temperature and ambient pressure. During cruise flight, the FADEC constantly monitors the engine and adjusts fuel flow and ignition timing individually in each cylinder. This precise control of the combustion process often results in decreased fuel consumption and increased horsepower. FADEC systems are considered an essential part of the engine and propeller control and may be powered by the aircraft's main electrical system. In many aircraft, FADEC uses power from a separate generator connected to the engine. In either case, there must be a backup electrical source available because failure of an FADEC system could result in a complete loss of engine thrust. To prevent loss of thrust, two separate and identical digital channels are incorporated for redundancy, each channel capable of providing all engine and propeller functions without limitations. End of Part 4 of Chapter 6Part 5 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweiger. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 6, Part 5. Turbine Engines. An aircraft turbine engine consists of an air inlet, compressor, combustion chambers, a turbine section, and exhaust. Thrust is produced by increasing the velocity of air flowing through the engine. Turbine engines are highly desirable aircraft power plants. They are characterized by smooth operation and a high power-to-weight ratio, and they use readily available jet fuel. Prior to recent advances in material, engine design, and manufacturing process, the use of turbine engines in small-slash-light production aircraft was cost-prohibitive. Today, Several aviation manufacturers are producing or plan to produce small-slash-light turbine-powered aircraft. These smaller turbine-powered aircraft typically seat between three and seven passengers and are referred to as very light jets, VLJs, or microjets. See figure 6-22. Types of turbine engines. Turbine engines are classified according to the type of compressors they use. There are three types of compressors, centrifugal flow, axial flow, and centrifugal axial flow. Compression of inlet air is achieved in a centrifugal flow engine by accelerating air outward perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the machine. The axial flow engine compresses air by a series of rotating and stationary airfoils, moving the air parallel to the longitudinal axis. The centrifugal axial flow design uses both kinds of compressors to achieve the desired compression. The path the air takes through the engine and how power is produced determines the type of engine. There are four types of aircraft turbine engines, turbojet, turboprop, turbofan, and turboshaft. Turbojet. 
The turbojet engine consists of four sections, compressor, combustion chamber, turbine section, and exhaust. The compressor section passes inlet air at a high rate of speed to the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber contains the fuel inlet and igniter for combustion. The expanding air drives a turbine, which is connected by a shaft to the compressor, sustaining engine operation. The accelerated exhaust gases from the engine provide thrust. This is a basic application of compressing air, igniting the fuel-air mixture, producing power to self-sustain the engine operation and exhaust for propulsion. See figure 6-23. Turbojet engines are limited in range and endurance. They are also slow to respond to throttle applications at slow compressor speeds. Turboprop. A turboprop engine is a turbine engine that drives a propeller through a reduction gear. The exhaust gases drive a power turbine connected by a shaft that drives the reduction gear assembly. Reduction gearing is necessary in turboprop engines because optimum propeller performance is achieved at much slower speeds than the engine's operating RPM. Turboprop engines are a compromise between turbojet engines and reciprocating power plants. Turboprop engines are most efficient at speeds between 250 and 400 miles per hour and altitudes between 18,000 and 30,000 feet. They also perform well at slow air speeds required for takeoff and landing, and are fuel efficient. The minimum specific fuel consumption of a turboprop engine is normally available at the altitude range of 25,000 feet to the tropopause. See figure 6-24. Turbofan. Turbofans were developed to combine some of the best features of the turbojet and the turboprop. Turbofan engines are designed to create additional thrust by diverting a secondary airflow around the combustion chamber. The turbofan bypass air generates increased thrust, cools the engine, and aids in exhaust noise suppression. This provides turbojet type cruise speed and lower fuel consumption. The inlet air that passes through a turbofan engine is usually divided into two separate streams of air. One stream passes through the engine core, while a second stream bypasses the engine core. It is this bypass stream of air that is responsible for the term bypass engine. A turbofan's bypass ratio refers to the ratio of mass airflow that passes through the fan divided by the mass airflow that passes through the engine core. See figure 6-25. Turboshaft. The fourth common type of jet engine is the turboshaft. See figure 6-26. It delivers power to a shaft that drives something other than a propeller. The biggest difference between a turbojet and turboshaft engine is that on a turboshaft engine, most of the energy produced by the expanding gases is used to drive a turbine rather than produce thrust. Many helicopters use a turboshaft gas turbine engine. In addition, turboshaft engines are widely used as auxiliary power units on large aircraft. Turbine engine instruments. Engine instruments that indicate oil pressure, oil temperature, engine speed, exhaust gas temperature, and fuel flow are common to both turbine and reciprocating engines. However, there are some instruments that are unique to turbine engines. These instruments produce indications of the engine pressure ratio, turbine discharge pressure, and torque. In addition, most gas turbine engines have multiple temperature sensing instruments, called thermocouples, which provide pilots with temperature readings in and around the turbine section. Engine pressure ratio, EPR. An engine pressure ratio, EPR, gauge, is used to indicate the power output of the turbojet slash turbofan engine. EPR is the rate of turbine discharge to compressor inlet pressure. Pressure measurements are recorded by probes installed in the engine inlet and at the exhaust. Once collected, the data is sent to a differential pressure transducer, which is then indicated on a flight deck EPR gauge. EPR system design automatically compensates for the effects of airspeed and altitude. Changes in ambient temperature require a correction be applied to EPR indications to provide accurate engine power settings. Exhaust gas temperature, EGT. A limiting factor in a gas turbine engine is the temperature of the turbine section. The temperature of a turbine section must be monitored closely to prevent overheating the turbine blades and other exhaust section components. One common way of monitoring the temperature of a turbine section is with an EGT gauge. EGT is an engine operating limit used to monitor overall engine operating conditions. Variations of EGT systems bear different names based on the location of the temperature sensors. 
Common turbine temperature sensing gauges include the turbine inlet temperature, TIT gauge, turbine outlet temperature, TOT gauge, interstage turbine temperature, ITT gauge, and turbine gas temperature, TGT gauge. Torque meter. Turboprop slash turboshaft engine power output is measured by the torque meter. Torque is a twisting force applied to a shaft. The torque meter measures power applied to the shaft. Turboprop and turboshaft engines are designed to produce torque for driving a propeller. Torque meters are calibrated in percentage units, foot-pounds, or PSI. N1 indicator. N1 represents the rotational speed of the low-pressure compressor and is presented on the indicator as a percentage of design RPM. After start, the speed of the low-pressure compressor is governed by the N1 turbine wheel. The N1 turbine wheel is connected to the low-pressure compressor through a concentric shaft. N2 indicator. N2 represents the rotational speed of the high-pressure compressor and is presented on the indicator as a percentage of design RPM. The high-pressure compressor is governed by the N2 turbine wheel. The N2 turbine wheel is connected to the high-pressure compressor through a concentric shaft. See figure 6-17. Turbine engine operational considerations. The great variety of turbine engines makes it impractical to cover specific operational procedures, but there are certain operational considerations common to all turbine engines. They are engine temperature limits, for an object damage, hot start, compressor stall, and flame out. Engine temperature limitations. The highest temperature in any turbine engine occurs at the turbine inlet. Turbine inlet temperature is therefore usually the limiting factor in turbine engine operation. Thrust variations. Turbine engine thrust varies directly with air density. As air density decreases, so does thrust. Additionally, because air density decreases with an increase in temperature, Increased temperatures will also result in decreased thrust. While both turbine and reciprocating powered engines are affected to some degree by high relative humidity, turbine engines will experience a negligible loss of thrust, while reciprocating engines a significant loss of brake horsepower. Foreign object damage, FOD. Due to the design and function of a turbine engine's air inlet, the possibility of ingestion of debris always exists. This causes significant damage, particularly to the compressor and turbine sections. When ingestion of debris occurs, it is called foreign object damage, FOD. Typical FOD consists of small nicks and dents caused by the ingestion of small objects from the ramp, taxiway, or runway, but FOD damage caused by bird strikes or ice ingestion also occur. Sometimes FOD results in total destruction of an engine. Prevention of FOD is a high priority. Some engine inlets have a tendency to form a vortex between the ground and inlet during ground operations. A vortex dissipator may be installed on these engines. Other devices, such as screens and or deflectors, may also be utilized. Pre-flight procedures include a visual inspection of any sign of FOD. Turbine engine hot slash hung start. When the EGT exceeds the safe limit of an aircraft, it experiences a hot start. It is caused by too much fuel entering the combustion chamber or insufficient turbine RPM. Anytime an engine has a hot start, refer to the AFM slash POH or an appropriate maintenance manual for inspection requirements. If the engine fails to accelerate to the proper speed after ignition or does not accelerate to idle RPM, a hung or false start has occurred. A hung start may be caused by an insufficient starting power source or fuel control malfunction. Compressor stalls. Compressor blades are small airfoils and are subject to the same aerodynamic principles that apply to any airfoil. A compressor blade has an angle of attack which is a result of the inlet air velocity and the compressor's rotational velocity. These two forces combine to form a vector, which defines the airfoil's actual angle of attack to the approaching inlet air. A compressor stall is an imbalance between the two vector quantities, inlet velocity and compressor rotational speed. Compressor stalls occur when the compressor blade's angle of attack exceeds the critical angle of attack. At this point, smooth airflow is interrupted and turbulence is created with pressure fluctuations. Compressor stalls cause air flowing in the compressor to slow down and stagnate, sometimes reversing direction. See figure 6-28. 
Compressor stalls can be transient and intermittent or steady and severe. Indications of a transient slash intermittent stall are usually an intermittent bang as backfire and flow reversal take place. If the stall develops and becomes steady, strong vibration and a loud roar may develop from the continuous flow reversal. Often, the flight deck gauges do not show a mild or transient stall, but they do indicate a developed stall. Typical instrument indications include fluctuations in RPM and an increase in exhaust gas temperature. Most transient stalls are not harmful to the engine and often correct themselves after one or two pulsations. The possibility of severe engine damage from a steady state stall is immediate. Recovery must be accomplished by quickly reducing power, decreasing the aircraft's angle of attack, and increasing airspeed. Although all gas turbine engines are subject to compressor stalls, most models have systems that inhibit them. One system uses a variable inlet guide vane, VIGV, and variable stator vanes, which direct the incoming air into the rotor blades at an appropriate angle. To prevent air pressure stalls, operate the aircraft within the parameters established by the manufacturer. If a compressor stall does develop, follow the procedures recommended in the AFM slash POH. Flameout. A flameout occurs in the operation of a gas turbine engine in which the fire in the engine unintentionally goes out. If the rich limit of the fuel slash air ratio is exceeded in the combustion chamber, the flame will blow out. This condition is often referred to as a rich flameout. It generally results from very fast engine acceleration, in which an overly rich mixture causes the fuel temperature to drop below the combustion temperature. It may also be caused by insufficient airflow to support combustion. A more common flameout occurrence is due to low fuel pressure and low engine speeds, which typically are associated with high altitude flight. This situation may also occur with the engine throttled back during a descent, which can set up the lean condition flameout. A weak mixture can easily cause the flame to die out, even with a normal airflow through the engine. Any interruption of the fuel supply can result in a flameout. This may be due to prolonged unusual attitudes, a malfunctioning fuel control system, turbulence, icing, or running out of fuel. Symptoms of a flameout normally are the same as those following an engine failure. If the flameout is due to a transitory condition, such as an imbalance between fuel flow and engine speed, an air start may be attempted once the condition is corrected. In any case, pilots must follow the applicable emergency procedures outlined in the AFM slash BOH. Generally, these procedures contain recommendations concerning altitude and airspeed where the air start is most likely to be successful. Performance Comparison It is possible to compare the performance of a reciprocating power plant and different types of turbine engines. For the comparison to be accurate, thrust horsepower, usable horsepower, for the reciprocating power plant must be used rather than the brake horsepower, and net thrust must be used for the turbine-powered engines. In addition, aircraft design configuration and size must be approximately the same. When comparing performance, the following definitions are useful. Brake horsepower, BHP. The horsepower actually delivered to the output shaft. Brake horsepower is the actual usable horsepower. Net thrust the thrust produced by a turbojet or turbofan engine. Thrust horsepower, THP, the horsepower equivalent of the thrust produced by a turbojet or turbofan engine. Equivalent shaft horsepower, ESHP. With respect to turboprop engines, the sum of the shaft horsepower, SHP, delivered to the propeller, and THP produced by the exhaust gases. Figure 6-29 shows how four types of engines compare in net thrust as airspeed is increased. This figure is for explanatory purposes only and is not for specific models of engines. The following are the four types of engines. Reciprocating power plant, turbine, propeller combination, turboprop, turbine engine incorporating a fan, turbofan, and turbojet, pure jet. By plotting the performance curve for each engine, a comparison can be made of maximum aircraft speed variation with the type of engine used. Since the graph is only a means of comparison, numerical values for net thrust, aircraft speed, and drag are not included. Comparison of the four power plants on the basis of net thrust makes certain performance capabilities evident. In the speed range shown to the left of line A, the reciprocating power plant outperforms the other three types. The turboprop outperforms the turbofan in the range to the left of line C. 
The turbofan engine outperforms the turbojet in the range of the left of line F. The turbofan engine outperforms the reciprocating power plant to the right of line B and the turboprop to the right of line C. The turbojet outperforms the reciprocating power plant to the right of line D, the turboprop to the right of line E, and the turbofan to the right of line F. The points where the aircraft drag curve intersects the net thrust curves are the maximum aircraft speeds. The vertical lines from each of the points to the baseline of the graph indicate that the turbojet aircraft can attain a higher maximum speed than aircraft equipped with the other types of engines. Aircraft equipped with the turbofan engine will attain a higher maximum speed than aircraft equipped with a turboprop or reciprocating power plant. End of part 5 of chapter 6. Part 6 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweigert. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 6. Part 6. Airframe Systems. Fuel, electrical, hydraulic, and oxygen systems make up the airframe systems. Fuel Systems The fuel system is designed to provide an uninterrupted flow of clean fuel from the fuel tanks to the engine. The fuel must be available to the engine under all conditions of engine power, altitude, attitude, and during all approved flight maneuvers. Two common classifications apply to fuel systems in small aircraft, gravity feed and fuel pump systems. Gravity Feed System the gravity feed system utilizes the force of gravity to transfer the fuel from the tanks to the engine. For example, on high-wing airplanes, the fuel tanks are installed in the wings. This places the fuel tanks above the carburetor, and the fuel is gravity-fed through the system and into the carburetor. If the design of the aircraft is such that gravity cannot be used to transfer fuel, fuel pumps are installed. For example, on low-wing airplanes, the fuel tanks in the wings are located below the carburetor. See figure 6-30. Fuel Pump System Aircraft with fuel pump systems have two fuel pumps. The main pump system is engine-driven with an electrically driven auxiliary pump provided for use in engine starting and in the event the engine pump fails. The auxiliary pump, also known as a boost pump, provides added reliability to the fuel system. The electrically driven auxiliary pump is controlled by a switch in the flight deck. Fuel Primer both gravity-fed and fuel pump systems may incorporate a fuel primer into the system. The fuel primer is used to draw fuel from the tanks to vaporize fuel directly into the cylinders prior to starting the engine. During cold weather, when engines are difficult to start, the fuel primer helps because there is not enough heat available to vaporize the fuel in the carburetor. It is important to lock the primer in place when it is not in use. If the knob is free to move, it may vibrate out during flight and can cause an excessively rich mixture. To avoid overpriming, read the priming instructions for the aircraft. Fuel tanks. The fuel tanks, normally located inside the wings of an airplane, have a filter opening on top of the wing through which they can be filled. A filler cap covers this opening. The tanks are vented to the outside to maintain atmospheric pressure inside the tank. They may be vented through the filler cap or through a tube extending through the surface of the wing. Fuel tanks also include an overflow drain that may stand alone or be co-located with a fuel tank vent. This allows fuel to expand with increases in temperature without damage to the tank itself. If the tanks have been filled on a hot day, it is not unusual to see fuel coming from the overflow drain. Fuel gauges. The fuel quantity gauges indicate the amount of fuel measured by a sensing unit in each fuel tank and is displayed in gallons or pounds. Aircraft certification rules require accuracy in fuel gauges only when they read empty. Any reading other than empty should be verified. Do not depend solely on the accuracy of fuel quantity gauges. Always visually check the fuel level in each tank during the pre-flight inspection and then compare it with the corresponding fuel quantity indication. If a fuel pump is installed in the fuel system, a fuel pressure gauge is also included. This gauge indicates the pressure in the fuel lines. The normal operating pressure can be found in the AFM slash POH or on the gauge by color coding. Fuel selectors. The fuel selector valve allows selection of fuel from various tanks. A common type of selector valve contains four positions. Left, right, both, and off. 
Selecting the left or right position allows fuel to feed only from that tank, while selecting the both position feeds fuel from both tanks. The left or right position may be used to balance the amount of fuel remaining in each wing tank. See figure 6-31. Fuel placards will show any limitations on fuel tank usage, such as level flight only and slash or both for landings and takeoffs. Regardless of the type of fuel selector in use, fuel consumption should be monitored closely to ensure that a tank does not run completely out of fuel. Running a fuel tank dry will not only cause the engine to stop, but running for prolonged periods on one tank causes an unbalanced fuel load between tanks. Running a tank completely dry may allow air to enter the fuel system and cause vapor lock, which makes it difficult to restart the engine. On fuel-injected engines, the fuel becomes so hot it vaporizes in the fuel line, not allowing fuel to reach the cylinders. Fuel strainers, sumps, and drains. After leaving the fuel tank and before it enters the carburetor, the fuel passes through a strainer which removes any moisture and other sediments in the system. Since these contaminants are heavier than aviation fuel, they settle in a sump at the bottom of the strainer assembly. A sump is a low point in a fuel system and slash or fuel tank. The fuel system may contain sump, fuel strainer, and fuel tank drains, which may be co-located. The fuel strainer should be drained before each flight. Fuel samples should be drained and checked visually for water and contaminants. Water in the sump is hazardous because in cold weather, the water can freeze and block fuel lines. In warm weather, it can flow into the carburetor and stop the engine. If water is present in the sump, more water in the fuel tanks is probable, and they should be drained until there is no evidence of water. Never take off until all water and contaminants have been removed from the engine fuel system. Because of the variation in fuel systems, become thoroughly familiar with the systems that apply to the aircraft being flown. Consult the AFM slash POH for specific operating procedures. Fuel grades. Aviation gasoline, AVGAS, is identified by an octane or performance number, grade, which designates the anti-knock value or knock resistance of the fuel mixture in the engine cylinder. The higher the grade of gasoline, the more pressure the fuel can withstand without detonating. Lower grades of fuel are used in lower compression engines because these fuels ignite at a lower temperature. Higher grades are used in higher compression engines because they ignite at higher temperatures, but not prematurely. If the proper grade of fuel is not available, use the next higher grade as a substitute. Never use a grade lower than recommended. This can cause the cylinder head temperature and engine oil temperature to exceed their normal operating ranges, which may result in detonation. Several grades of AV gas are available. Care must be exercised to ensure that the correct aviation grade is being used for the specific type of engine. The proper fuel grade is stated in the AFM slash POH on placards in the flight deck and next to the filler caps. Auto gas should never be used in aircraft systems unless the aircraft has been modified with a supplemental type certificate, STC, issued by the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA. The current method identifies AV gas for aircraft with reciprocating engines by the octane and performance number, along with the abbreviation AV gas. These aircraft use AV gas 80, 100, and 100 LL. Although AV gas 100 LL performs the same as grade 100, the LL indicates that it has low lead content. Fuel for aircraft with turbine engines is classified as Jet A, Jet A-1, and Jet B. Jet fuel is basically kerosene and has a distinctive kerosene smell. Since use of the correct fuel is critical, dyes are added to help identify the type and grade of fuel. See figure 6-32. In addition to the color of the fuel itself, the color coding system extends to decals and various fuel handling equipment. For example, all AV gas is identified by name using the white letters on a red background. In contrast, turbine fuels are identified by white letters on a black background. Fuel Contamination Accidents attributed to power plant failure from fuel contamination have often been traced to inadequate pre-flight inspection by the pilot, servicing aircraft with improperly filtered fuel from small tanks or drums, storing aircraft with partially filled fuel tanks, lack of proper maintenance. Fuel should be drained from the fuel strainer quick drain and from each fuel tank sump into a transparent container, and then checked for dirt and water. When the fuel strainer is being drained, 
Water in the tank may not appear until all the fuel has been drained from the lines leading to the tank. This indicates that the water remains in the tank and is not forcing the fuel out of the fuel lines leading to the fuel strainer. Therefore, drain enough fuel from the fuel strainer to be certain that the fuel is being drained from the tank. The amount will depend on the length of the fuel line from the tank to the drain. If water or other contaminants are found in the first sample, drain further samples until no trace appears. Water may also remain in the fuel tanks after the drainage from the fuel strainer has ceased to show any trace of water. This residual water can be removed only by draining the fuel tank sump drains. Water is the principal fuel contaminant. Suspended water droplets in the fuel can be identified by a cloudy appearance of the fuel or by the clear separation of water from the colored fuel, which occurs after the water has settled to the bottom of the tank. As a safety measure, the fuel sumps should be drained before every flight during the pre-flight inspection. Fuel tanks should be filled after each flight or after the last flight of the day to prevent moisture condensation within the tank. To prevent fuel contamination, avoid refueling from cans and drums. In remote areas or in emergency situations, there may be no alternative to refueling from sources with inadequate anti-contamination systems. While a cami skin and funnel may be the only possible means of filtering fuel, using them is hazardous. Remember, the use of a cami will not always ensure decontaminated fuel. Worn-out camis will not filter water. Neither will a new clean cami that is already water-wet or damp. Most imitation chamois skins will not filter water. Refueling Procedures Static electricity is formed by the friction of air passing over the surfaces of an aircraft in flight and by the flow of fuel through the hose and nozzle during refueling. Nylon, Dacron, or wool clothing is especially prone to accumulate and discharge static electricity from the person to the funnel or nozzle. To guard against the possibility of static electricity igniting fuel fumes, a ground wire should be attached to the aircraft before the fuel cap is removed from the tank. Because both the aircraft and refueler have different static charges, bonding both components to each other is critical. By bonding both components to each other, the static differential charge is equalized. The refueling nozzle should be bonded to the aircraft before refueling begins and should not remain bonded throughout the refueling process. While a fuel tank is used, it should be grounded prior to the fuel nozzle contacting the aircraft. If fueling from drums or cans is necessary, proper bonding and grounding connections are important. Drums should be placed near grounding posts and the following sequence of connections observed. 1. Drum to ground. 2. Ground to aircraft. 3. Bond drum to aircraft or nozzle to aircraft before the fuel cap is removed. When disconnecting, reverse the order. Passage of fuel through a chamois increases the charge of static electricity and the danger of sparks. The aircraft must be properly grounded and the nozzle, chamois filter, and funnel bonded to the aircraft. If a can is used, it should be connected to either the grounding post or the funnel. Under no circumstances should a plastic bucket or similar non-conductive container be used in this operation. Electrical System Most aircraft are equipped with either a 14 or a 28 volt direct current electrical system. A basic aircraft electrical system consists of the following components. Alternator slash generator, battery, master slash battery switch, alternator slash generator switch, bus bar, fuses, and circuit breakers, voltage regulator, ammeter slash load meter, associated electrical wiring. Engine-driven alternators or generators supply electrical current to the electrical system. They also maintain a sufficient electrical charge in the battery. Electrical energy stored in a battery provides a source of electrical power for starting the engine and a limited supply of electrical power for use in the event the alternator or generator fails. Most direct current generators will not produce a sufficient amount of electrical current at low engine RPM to operate the entire electrical system. During operations at low energy RPM, the electrical needs must be drawn from the battery, which can quickly be depleted. Alternators have several advantages over generators. Alternators produce sufficient current to operate the entire electrical system, even at slower engine speeds, by producing alternating current, which is converted to direct current. The electrical output of an alternator is more constant throughout the wide range of engine speeds. Some aircraft have receptacles to which an external ground power unit, GPU, may be connected to provide electrical energy for starting. These are very useful, especially during cold weather starting. 
follow the manufacturer's recommendations for engine starting using a GPU. The electrical system is turned on or off with a master switch. Turning the master switch to the on position provides electrical energy to all the electrical equipment circuits, except the ignition system. Equipment that commonly uses the electrical system for its source of energy includes position lights, anti-collision lights, landing lights, taxi lights, interior cabin lights, instrument lights, radio equipment, turn indicator, fuel gauges, electric fuel pump, stall warning system, pilot heat, starting motor. Many aircraft are equipped with a battery switch that controls the electrical power to the aircraft in a manner similar to the master switch. In addition, an alternator switch is installed which permits the pilot to exclude the alternator from the electrical system in the event of an alternator failure. See figure 6-33. While the alternator half of the switch is in the off position, the entire electrical load is placed on the battery. All non-essential electrical equipment should be turned off to conserve battery power. A bus bar is used as a terminal in the aircraft electrical system to connect the main electrical system to the equipment using electricity as a source of power. This simplifies the wiring system and provides a common point from which voltage can be distributed throughout the system. See figure 6-34. Fuses or circuit breakers are used in the electrical system to protect the circuits and equipment from electrical overload. Spare fuses of the proper amperage limit should be carried in the aircraft to replace defective or blown fuses. Circuit breakers have the same function as a fuse but can be manually reset rather than replaced if an overload condition occurs in the electrical system. Placards at the fuse or circuit breaker panel identify the circuit by name and show the amperage limit. An ammeter is used to monitor performance of the aircraft electrical system. The ammeter shows if the alternator slash generator is producing an adequate supply of electrical power. It also indicates whether or not the battery is receiving an electrical charge. Ammeters are designed with the zero point in the center of the face and a negative or positive indication on either side. See figure 6-35. When the pointer of the ammeter is on the plus side, it shows the charging rate of the battery. A minus indication means more current is being drawn from the battery than is being replaced. A full-scale minus deflection indicates a malfunction in the alternator slash generator. A full-scale positive deflection indicates a malfunction of the regulator. In either case, consult the AFM or POH for appropriate action to be taken. Not all aircraft are equipped with an ammeter. Some have a warning light that, when lighted, indicates a discharge in the system as a generator-slash-alternator malfunction. Refer to the AFM or POH for appropriate action to be taken. Another electrical monitoring indicate is a load meter. This type of gauge has a scale beginning with zero and shows the load being placed on the alternator-slash-generator. See figure 6-35. The load meter reflects the total percentage of the load placed on the generating capacity of the electrical system by the electrical accessories and battery. When all electrical components are turned off, it reflects only the amount of charging current demanded by the battery. A voltage regulator controls the rate of charge to the battery by stabilizing the generator or alternator electrical output. The generator slash alternator voltage output should be higher than the battery voltage. For example, a 12-volt battery should be fed by a generator-slash-alternator system of approximately 14 volts. The difference in voltage keeps the battery charged. End of Part 6 of Chapter 6 Part 7 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweigert. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Part 7. Hydraulic Systems. There are multiple applications for hydraulic use in aircraft, depending on the complexity of the aircraft. For example, hydraulics is often used on small airplanes to operate wheel brakes, retractable landing gear, and some constant speed propellers. On large airplanes, hydraulics is used for flight control systems, wing flaps, spoilers, and other systems. A basic hydraulic system consists of a reservoir, pump, either hand, electric, or engine-driven, 
a filter to keep the fluid clean, selector valve to control the direction of flow, relief valve to relieve excess pressure, and an actuator. See figure 6-36. The hydraulic fluid is pumped through the system to an actuator or servo. A servo is a cylinder with a piston inside that turns fluid power into work and creates the power needed to move an aircraft system or flight control. Servos can be either single acting or double acting based on the needs of the system. This means that the fluid can be applied to one or both sides of the servo depending on the servo type. A single acting servo provides power in one direction. The selector valve allows the fluid direction to be controlled. This is necessary for operations such as the extension and retraction of landing gear during which the fluid must work in two different directions. The relief valve provides an outlet for the system in the event of excess fluid pressure in the system. Each system incorporates different components to meet the individual needs of different aircraft. A mineral-based hydraulic fluid is the most widely used type for small aircraft. This type of hydraulic fluid, a kerosene-like petroleum product, has good lubricating properties as well as additives to inhibit foaming and prevent the formation of corrosion. It is chemically stable, has very little viscosity change with temperature, and is dyed for identification. Since several types of hydraulic fluids are commonly used, an aircraft must be serviced with the type specified by the manufacturer. Refer to the AFM slash POH or the maintenance manual. Landing gear. The landing gear forms the principal support of an aircraft on the surface. The most common type of landing gear consists of wheels, but aircraft can be equipped with floats for water operations or skis for landing on snow. See figure 6-37. The landing gear on small aircraft consists of three wheels, two main wheels, one located on each side of the fuselage, and a third wheel positioned at either the front or the rear of the airplane. Landing gear employing a rear-mounted wheel is called conventional landing gear. Airplanes with conventional landing gear are often referred to as tailwheel airplanes. When the third wheel is located on the nose, it is called a nose wheel, and the design is referred to as a tricycle gear. A steerable nose wheel or tailwheel permits the airplane to be controlled throughout all operations while on the ground. Tricycle Landing Gear Airplanes A tricycle gear airplane has three advantages. 1. It allows more forceful application of the brakes during landings at high speeds without causing the aircraft to nose over. 2. It permits better forward visibility for the pilot during takeoff, landing, and taxiing. 3. It tends to prevent ground looping, or swerving, by providing more directional stability during ground operations since the aircraft's center of gravity, CG, is forward of the main wheels. The forward CG keeps the aircraft moving forward in a straight line rather than ground looping. Nose wheels are either steerable or castering. Steerable nose wheels are linked to the rudders by cables or rods, while castering nose wheels are free to swivel. In both cases, the aircraft is steering using the rudder pedals. Aircraft with a castering nose wheel may require the pilot to combine the use of the rudder pedals with independent use of the brakes. Tailwheel Landing Gear Airplanes Tailwheel landing gear aircraft have two main wheels attached to the airframe ahead of its CG that support most of the weight of the structure. A tailwheel at the very back of the fuselage provides a third point of support. This arrangement allows adequate ground clearance for a larger propeller and is more desirable for operations on unimproved fields. See Figure 6-38 With the CG located behind the main gear, Directional control of this type aircraft becomes more difficult while on the ground. This is the main disadvantage of the tailwheel landing gear. For example, if the pilot allows the aircraft to swerve while rolling on the ground at a low speed, he or she may not have sufficient rudder control and the CG will attempt to get ahead of the main gear, which may cause the airplane to ground loop. Lack of good forward visibility when the tailwheel is on or near the ground is a second disadvantage of tailwheel landing gear aircraft. These inherent problems mean specific training is required in tailwheel aircraft. Fixed and retractable landing gear. Landing gear can also be classified as either fixed or retractable. A fixed gear always remains extended and has the advantage of simplicity combined with low maintenance. A retractable gear is designed to streamline the airplane by allowing the landing gear to be stowed inside the structure during cruising flight. See figure 6-39. Brakes. 
Airplane brakes are located on the main wheels and are applied by either a hand control or by foot pedals, toe or heel. Foot pedals operate independently and allow for differential braking. During ground operations, differential braking can supplement nose wheel slash tail wheel steering. Pressurized aircraft. Aircraft are flown at high altitudes for two reasons. First, an aircraft flown at high altitude consumes less fuel for a given airspeed than it does for the same speed at a lower altitude because the aircraft is more efficient at a high altitude. Second, bad weather and turbulence may be avoided by flying in relatively smooth air above the storms. Many modern aircraft are designed to operate at high altitudes, taking advantage of that environment. In order to fly at higher altitudes, the aircraft must be pressurized. It is important for pilots who fly these aircraft to be familiar with the basic operating principles. In a typical pressurization system, the cabin, flight compartment, and baggage compartments are incorporated in a sealed unit capable of containing air under a pressure higher than outside atmospheric pressure. On aircraft powered by turbine engines, bleed air from the engine compressor section is used to pressurize the cabin. Superchargers may be used on older model turbine-powered aircraft to pump air into the sealed fuselage. Piston-powered aircraft may use air supplied from each engine turbocharger through a sonic venturi, or flow limiter. Air is released from the fuselage by a device called an outflow valve. By regulating the air exit, the outflow valve allows for a constant inflow of air to the pressurized area. See figure 6-40. A cabin pressurization system typically maintains a cabin pressure altitude of approximately 8,000 feet at the maximum designed cruising altitude of an aircraft. This prevents rapid changes of cabin altitude that may be uncomfortable or cause injury to passengers and crew. In addition, the pressurization system permits a reasonably fast exchange of air from the inside to the outside of the cabin. This is necessary to eliminate odors and to remove stale air. See figure 6-41. Pressurization of the aircraft cabin is an accepted method of protecting occupants against the effects of hypoxia. Within a pressurized cabin, occupants can be transported comfortably and safely for long periods of time, particularly if the cabin altitude is maintained at 8,000 feet or below, where the use of oxygen equipment is not required. The flight crew in this type of aircraft must be aware of the danger of accidental loss of cabin pressure and be prepared to deal with such an emergency whenever it occurs. The following terms will aid in understanding the operating principles of pressurization and air conditioning systems. Aircraft altitude, the actual height above sea level at which the aircraft is flying. Ambient temperature, the temperature in the area immediately surrounding the aircraft. Ambient pressure, pressure in the area immediately surrounding the aircraft. Cabin altitude, cabin pressure in terms of equivalent altitude above sea level. Differential pressure, the difference in pressure between the pressure acting on one side of a wall and the pressure acting on the other side of the wall. In aircraft air conditioning and pressurizing systems, it is the difference between cabin pressure and atmospheric pressure. The cabin pressure control system provides cabin pressure regulation, pressure relief, vacuum relief, and the means for selecting the desired cabin altitude in the isobaric and differential range. In addition, dumping of the cabin pressure is a function of the pressure control system. A cabin pressure regulator, an outflow valve, and a safety valve are used to accomplish these functions. The cabin pressure regulator controls cabin pressure to a selected valve in the isobaric range and limits cabin pressure to a preset differential value in the differential range. When an aircraft reaches the altitude at which the difference between the pressure inside and outside the cabin is equal to the highest differential pressure from which the fuselage structure is designed, a further increase in aircraft altitude will result in a corresponding increase in cabin altitude. Differential control is used to prevent the maximum differential pressure for which the fuselage was designed from being exceeded. This differential pressure is determined by the structural strength of the cabin and is often by the relationship of the cabin size to the probable areas of rupture, such as window areas and doors. The cabin air pressure safety valve is a combination pressure relief, vacuum relief, and dump valve. The pressure relief valve prevents cabin pressure from exceeding a predetermined differential pressure above ambient pressure. The vacuum relief prevents ambient pressure from exceeding cabin pressure 
by allowing external air to enter the cabin when ambient pressure exceeds cabin pressure. The flight deck control switch actuates the dump valve. When this switch is positioned to ram, a solenoid valve opens, causing the valve to dump cabin air to atmosphere. The degree of pressurization and the operating altitude of the aircraft are limited by several critical design factors. Primarily, the fuselage is designed to withstand a particular maximum cabin differential pressure. Several instruments are used in conjunction with the pressurization controller. The cabin differential pressure gauge indicates the difference between inside and outside pressure. This gauge should be monitored to assure that the cabin does not exceed the maximum allowable differential pressure. A cabin altimeter is provided as a check on the performance of the system. In some cases, these two instruments are combined into one. A third instrument indicates the cabin rate of climb or descent. A cabin rate of climb instrument and a cabin altimeter are illustrated in figure 6-42. Decompression is defined as the inability of the aircraft's pressurization system to maintain its design pressure differential. This can be caused by a malfunction in the pressurization system or structural damage to the aircraft. Physiologically, decompressions fall into two categories. Explosive decompression a change in cabin pressure faster than the lungs can decompress, possibly causing lung damage. Normally, the time required to release air from the lungs without restrictions, such as masks, is 0.2 seconds. Most authorities consider any decompression that occurs in less than 0.5 seconds to be explosive and potentially dangerous. Rapid decompression a change in cabin pressure in which the lungs decompress faster than the cabin, resulting in no likelihood of lung damage. During an explosive decompression, there may be noise, and one may feel dazed for a moment. The cabin air fills with fog, dust, or flying debris. Fog occurs due to the rapid drop in temperature and the change in relative humidity. Normally, the ears clear automatically. Air rushes from the mouth and the nose due to the escape of air from the lungs, and may be noticed by some individuals. Rapid decompression decreases the period of useful consciousness because oxygen in the lungs is exhaled rapidly, reducing pressure on the body. This decreases the partial pressure of the oxygen in the blood and reduces the pilot's effective performance time by one-third to one-fourth of its normal time. For this reason, an oxygen mask should be worn when flying at very high altitudes, 35,000 feet or higher. It is recommended that the crew members select the 100% oxygen setting on the oxygen regulator at high altitude if the aircraft is equipped with a demand or pressure demand oxygen system. The primary danger of decompression is hypoxia. Quick, proper utilization of oxygen equipment is necessary to avoid unconsciousness. Another potential danger that pilots, crew, and passengers face during high-altitude decompressions is evolved gas decompression sickness. This occurs when the pressure on the body drops sufficiently, nitrogen comes out of solution, and forms bubbles that can have adverse effects on some body tissues. Decompression caused by structural damage to the aircraft presents another type of danger to the pilots, crew, and passengers being tossed or blown out of the aircraft if they are located near openings. Individuals near openings should wear safety harnesses or seatbelts at all times when the aircraft is pressurized and they are seated. Structural damage also has potential to expose them to wind blasts and extremely cold temperatures. Rapid descent from altitude is necessary if these problems are to be minimized. Automatic visual and oral warning systems are included in the equipment of all pressurized aircraft. End of Part 7 of Chapter 6 Part 8 of Chapter 6 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Schweiger Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Part 8 Oxygen Systems Most high-altitude aircraft come equipped with some type of fixed oxygen installation. If the aircraft does not have a fixed installation, portable oxygen equipment must be readily accessible during flight. The portable equipment usually consists of a container, regulator, mask outlet, and pressure gauge. 
Aircraft oxygen is usually stored in a high-pressure system containers of 1800 to 2200 PSI. When the ambient temperature surrounding an oxygen cylinder decreases, pressure within that cylinder decreases because pressure varies directly with temperature if the volume of a gas remains constant. If a drop in indicated pressure on a supplemental oxygen cylinder is noted, there is no reason to suspect depletion of the oxygen supply, which has been compacted due to storage of containers in an unheated area of the aircraft. High-pressure oxygen containers should be marked with the PSI tolerance, i.e. 1800 PSI, before filling the container to that pressure. The containers should be supplied with aviation oxygen only, which is 100% pure oxygen. Industrial oxygen is not intended for breathing and may contain impurities and medical oxygen contains water vapor that can freeze in the regulator when exposed to cold temperatures. To assure safety, periodic inspection and servicing of the oxygen system should be done. An oxygen system consists of a mask or cannula and a regulator that supplies a flow of oxygen dependent upon cabin altitude. Cannulas are not approved for flights above 18,000 feet. Regulators approved for use up to 40,000 feet are designed to provide 0% cylinder oxygen and 100% cabin air at cabin altitudes of 8,000 feet or less, with the ratio changing to 100% oxygen and 0% cabin air at approximately 34,000 feet cabin altitude. See figure 6-43. Regulators approved up to 45,000 feet are designed to provide 40% cylinder oxygen and 60% cabin air at low altitudes with the ratio changing to 100% at the higher altitude. Pilots should avoid flying above 10,000 feet without oxygen during the day and above 8,000 feet at night. Pilots should be aware of the danger of fire when using oxygen. Materials that are nearly fireproof in ordinary air may be susceptible to combustion in oxygen. Oils and greases may ignite if exposed to oxygen and cannot be used for sealing the valves and fittings of oxygen equipment. Smoking during any kind of oxygen equipment use is prohibited. Before each flight, the pilot should thoroughly inspect and test all oxygen equipment. The inspection should include a thorough examination of the aircraft oxygen equipment, including available supply, an operational check of the system, and assurance that the supplemental oxygen is readily accessible. The inspection should be accomplished with clean hands and should include a visual inspection of the mask and tubing for tears, cracks, or deterioration. The regulator for valve and lever condition and positions, oxygen quantity, and the location and functioning of oxygen pressure gauges, flow indicators, and connections. The mask should be donned and the system should be tested. After any oxygen use, verify that all components and valves are shut off. Oxygen masks. There are numerous types and designs of oxygen masks in use. The most important in oxygen mask use is to ensure the masks and oxygen system are compatible. Crew masks are fitted to the user's face with a minimum of leakage and usually contain a microphone. Most masks are the oral nasal type, which covers only the mouth and nose. A passenger mask may be a simple cup-shaped rubber molding sufficiently flexible to obviate individual fitting. It may have a simple elastic head strap or the passenger may hold it to his or her face. All oxygen masks should be kept clean to reduce the danger of infection and prolong the life of the mask. To clean the mask, wash it with a mild soap and water solution, and rinse it with clear water. If a microphone is installed, use a clean swab instead of running water to wipe off the soapy solution. The mask should also be disinfected. A gauze pad that has been soaked in a water solution of merthiolate can be used to swab out the mask. This solution should contain one-fifth teaspoon of merthiolate per quart of water. Wipe the mask with a clean cloth and air dry. Cannula A cannula is an ergonomic piece of plastic tubing which runs under the nose and is often used to administer oxygen in non-pressurized aircraft. See figure 6-44. Cannulas are typically more comfortable than masks and can be used up to 18,000 feet. Altitudes greater than 18,000 feet require the use of an oxygen mask. Many cannulas have a flow meter in the line. If equipped, a periodic check of the green flow detector should be part of a pilot's regular scan. Diluter Demand Oxygen Systems Diluter Demand Oxygen Systems supply oxygen only when the user inhales through the mask. An auto-mix lever allows the regulators to automatically mix cabin air and oxygen or supply 100% oxygen, depending on the altitude. 
The demand mask provides a tight seal over the face to prevent dilution with outside air and can be used safely up to 40,000 feet. A pilot who has a beard or mustache should be sure it is trimmed in a manner that will not interfere with the sealing of the oxygen mask. The fit of the mask around the beard or mustache should be checked on the ground for proper sealing. Pressure Demand Oxygen Systems Pressure demand oxygen systems are similar to diluter demand oxygen equipment, except that the oxygen is supplied to the mask under pressure at cabin altitudes above 34,000 feet. Pressure demand regulators create airtight and oxygen-tight seals, but they also provide a positive pressure application of oxygen to the mask face piece that allows the user's lungs to be pressurized with oxygen. This feature makes pressure demand regulators safe at altitudes above 40,000 feet. Some systems may have a pressure demand mask with the regulator attached directly to the mask, rather than mounted on the instrument panel or other area within the flight deck. The mask-mounted regulator eliminates the problem of a long hose that must be purged of air before 100% oxygen begins flowing into the mask. Continuous Flow Oxygen System Continuous flow oxygen systems are usually provided for passengers. The passenger mask typically has a reservoir bag, which collects oxygen from the continuous flow oxygen system during the time when the mask user is inhaling. The oxygen collected in the reservoir bag allows a higher aspiratory flow rate during the inhalation cycle, which reduces the amount of air dilution. Ambient air is added to the supplied oxygen during inhalation after the reservoir bag oxygen supply is depleted. The exhaled air is released to the cabin. See figure 6-45. Electrical Pulse Demand Oxygen System Portable electrical pulse demand oxygen systems deliver oxygen by detecting an individual's inhalation effort and provide oxygen flow during the initial portion of inhalation. Pulse demand systems do not waste oxygen during the breathing cycle because oxygen is only delivered during inhalation. Compared to continuous flow systems, the pulse demand method of oxygen delivery can reduce the amount of oxygen needed by 50 to 85%. Most pulse demand oxygen systems also incorporate an internal barometer that automatically compensates for changes in altitude by increasing the amount of oxygen delivered for each pulse as altitude is increased. See figure 6-46. Pulse oximeters. A pulse oximeter is a device that measures the amount of oxygen in an individual's blood, in addition to heart rate. This non-invasive device measures the color changes that red blood cells undergo when they become saturated with oxygen. By transmitting a special light beam through a fingertip to evaluate the color of red cells, a pulse oximeter can calculate the degree of oxygen saturation within 1% of directly measured blood oxygen. Because of their portability and speed, pulse oximeters are useful for pilots operating in a non-pressurized aircraft above 12,500 feet, where supplemental oxygen is required. A pulse oximeter permits crew members and passengers of an aircraft to evaluate their actual need for supplemental oxygen. See figure 6-47. Servicing of oxygen systems. Before servicing any aircraft with oxygen, consult the specific aircraft service manual to determine the type of equipment required and the procedures to be used. Certain precautions should be observed whenever aircraft oxygen systems are to be serviced. Oxygen system servicing should be accomplished only when the aircraft is located outside of the hangars. Personal cleanliness and good housekeeping are imperative when working with oxygen. Oxygen under pressure and petroleum products create spontaneous results when they are brought in contact with each other. Service people should be certain to wash dirt, oil, and grease, including lip salves and hair oil, from their hands before working around oxygen equipment. It is also essential that clothing and tools are free of oil, grease, and dirt. Aircraft with permanently installed oxygen tanks usually require two persons to accomplish servicing of the system. One should be stationed at the service equipment control valves and the other stationed where he or she can observe the aircraft system pressure cages. Oxygen system servicing is not recommended during aircraft fueling operations or while other work is performed that could provide a source of ignition. Oxygen system servicing while passengers are on board the aircraft is not recommended. Anti-ice and de-ice systems. Anti-icing equipment is designed to prevent the formation of ice, while de-icing equipment is designed to remove ice once it has formed. These systems protect the leading edge of wing and tail surfaces, pilot and static port openings, fuel tank vents, stall warning devices, windshields, and propeller blades. 
Ice detection lighting may also be installed on some aircraft to determine the extent of structural icing during night flights. Most light aircraft have only a heated pilot tube and are not certified for flight in icing. These light aircraft have limited cross-country capability in the cooler climates during late fall, winter, and early spring. Non-certified aircraft must exit icing conditions immediately. Refer to the AFM slash POH for details. Airfoil anti-ice and de-ice. Inflatable de-icing boots consist of a rubber sheet bonded to the leading edge of the airfoil. When ice builds up on the leading edge, an engine-driven pneumatic pump inflates the rubber boots. Many turboprop aircraft divert engine bleed air to the wing to inflate the rubber boots. Upon inflation, the ice is cracked and should fall off the leading edge of the wing. De-icing boots are controlled from the flight deck by a switch and can be operated in a single cycle or allowed to cycle at automatic timed intervals. See figure 6-48. In the past, it was believed that if the boots were cycled too soon after encountering ice, the ice layer would expand instead of breaking off, resulting in a condition referred to as ice bridging. Consequently, subsequent de-ice boot cycles would be ineffective at removing the ice buildup. Although some residual ice may remain after a boot cycle, bridging does not occur with any modern boots. Pilots can cycle the boots as soon as an ice accumulation is observed. Consult the AFM slash POH for information on the operation of de-ice boots on an aircraft. Many de-icing boot systems use the instrument system suction gauge and a pneumatic pressure gauge to indicate proper boot operation. These gauges have range markings that indicate the operating limits for boot operation. Some systems may also incorporate an enunciator light to indicate proper boot operation. Proper maintenance and care of de-icing boots are important for continued operation of this system. They need to be carefully inspected during pre-flight. Another type of leading edge protection is the thermal anti-ice system. Heat provides one of the most effective methods for preventing ice accumulation on an airfoil. High-performance turbine aircraft often direct hot air from the compressor section of the engine to the leading edge surfaces. The hot air heats the leading edge surfaces sufficiently to prevent the formation of ice. A newer type of thermal anti-ice system, referred to as thermowing, uses electrically heated graphite foil laminate applied to the leading edge of the wing and the horizontal stabilizer. Thermowing systems typically have two zones of heat application. One zone on the leading edge receives continuous heat. The second zone further aft receives heat in cycles to dislodge the ice allowing aerodynamic forces to remove it. Thermal anti-ice systems should be activated prior to entering icing conditions. An alternate type of leading edge protection that is not as common as thermal anti-ice and de-icing boots is known as a weeping wing. The weeping wing design uses small holes located in the leading edge of the wing to prevent the formation and buildup of ice. An anti-freeze solution is pumped to the leading edge and weeps out through the holes. Additionally, the weeping wing is capable of de-icing an aircraft. When ice is accumulated on the leading edges, application of the anti-freeze solution chemically breaks down the bond between the ice and airframe, allowing aerodynamic forces to remove the ice. See figure 6-48. Windscreen anti-ice. There are two main types of windscreen anti-ice systems. The first system directs a flow of alcohol to the windscreen. If used early enough, the alcohol will prevent ice from building up on the windscreen. The rate of alcohol flow can be controlled by a dial in the flight deck, according to procedures recommended by the aircraft manufacturer. Another method of anti-icing equipment is the electrical heating method. Small wires or other conductive material is embedded in the windscreen. The heater can be turned on by a switch in the flight deck causing an electrical current to be passed across the shield through the wires to provide sufficient heat to prevent the formation of ice on the windscreen. The heated windscreen should only be used during flight. Do not leave it on during ground operations, as it can overheat and cause damage to the windscreen. Warning: The electrical current can cause compet deviation errors by as much as 40 degrees. Propeller anti-ice Propellers are protected from icing by use of alcohol or electrically heated elements. Some propellers are equipped with a discharge nozzle that is pointed towards the root of the blade. Alcohol is discharged from the nozzles, and the centrifugal force drives the alcohol down the leading edge of the blade. The boots are also grooved to help direct the flow of alcohol. This prevents ice from forming on the leading edge of the propeller. Propellers can also be fitted with propeller anti-ice boots. 
The propeller boot is divided into two sections, the inboard and the outboard sections. The boots are embedded with electrical wires that carry current for heating the propeller. The prop anti-ice system can be monitored for proper operation by monitoring the prop anti-ice ammeter. During the pre-flight inspection, check the propeller boots for proper operation. If a boot fails to heat one blade, an unequal blade loading can result and may cause severe propeller vibration. See figure 6-49. Other anti-ice and de-ice systems. Pytot and static ports, fuel vents, stall warning sensors, and other operational equipment may be heated by electrical elements. Operational checks of the electrically heated systems are to be checked in accordance with the AFM slash POH. Operation of aircraft anti-icing and de-icing systems should be checked prior to encountering icing conditions. Encounters with structural ice require immediate action. Anti-icing and de-icing equipment are not intended to sustain long-term flight in icing conditions. Chapter Summary All aircraft have a requirement for essential systems such as the engine, propeller, induction, ignition systems, as well as the fuel, lubrication, cooling, electrical, landing gear, and environmental control systems to support flight. Understanding the aircraft systems of the aircraft being flown is critical to its safe operation and proper maintenance. Consult the AFM slash POH for specific information pertaining to the aircraft being flown. Various manufacturer and owner group websites can also be a valuable source of additional information. End of chapter 6「Part 1 of Chapter 7 of Pilot's Handbook」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 7, Part 1 Flight Instruments Introduction in order to safely fly any aircraft, a pilot must understand how to interpret and operate the flight instruments. The pilot also needs to be able to recognize associated errors and malfunctions of these instruments. This chapter addresses the pitot-static system and associated instruments, the vacuum system and related instruments, gyroscopic instruments, and the magnetic compass. When a pilot understands how each instrument works and recognizes when an instrument is malfunctioning, he or she can safely utilize the instruments to their fullest potential. Pitot-static flight instruments The pitot-static system is a combined system that utilizes the static air pressure and the dynamic pressure due to the motion of the aircraft through the air. These combined pressures are utilized for the operation of the airspeed indicator, ASI, altimeter, and vertical speed indicator, VSI, figure 7-1. Impact pressure chamber and lines. The pitot tube is utilized to measure the total combined pressures that are present when an aircraft moves through the air. Static pressure, also known as ambient pressure, is always present whether an aircraft is moving or at rest. It is simply the barometric pressure in the local area. Dynamic pressure is present only when an aircraft is in motion. Therefore, it can be thought of as a pressure due to motion. Wind also generates dynamic pressure. It does not matter if the aircraft is moving through still air at 70 knots or if the aircraft is facing a wind with a speed of 70 knots. The same dynamic pressure is generated. When the wind blows from an angle less than 90 degrees off the nose of the aircraft, dynamic pressure can be depicted on the ASI. The wind moving across the airfoil at 20 knots is the same as the aircraft moving through calm air at 20 knots. The pitot tube captures the dynamic pressure as well as the static pressure that is always present. The pitot tube 
has a small opening at the front which allows the total pressure to enter the pressure chamber. The total pressure is made up of dynamic pressure plus static pressure. In addition to the larger hole in the front of the pitot tube, there is a small hole in the back of the chamber which allows moisture to drain from the system should the aircraft enter precipitation. Both openings in the pitot tube need to be checked prior to flight to ensure that neither is blocked. Many aircraft have pitot tube covers installed when they sit for extended periods of time. This helps to keep bugs and other objects from becoming lodged in the opening of the pitot tube. The one instrument that utilizes the pitot tube is the ASI. The total pressure is transmitted to the ASI from the pitot tube's pressure chamber via a small tube. The static pressure is also delivered to the opposite side of the ASI, which serves to cancel out the two static pressures, thereby leaving the dynamic pressure to be indicated on the instrument. When the dynamic pressure changes, the ASI shows either increase or decrease, corresponding to the direction of change. The two remaining instruments, altimeter and VSI, utilize only the static pressure, which is derived from the static port. Static Pressure Chamber and Lines The static chamber is vented through small holes to the free, undisturbed air on the sides of the aircraft. As the atmospheric pressure changes, the pressure is able to move freely in and out of the instruments through the small lines which connect the instruments into the static system. An alternate static source is provided in some aircraft to provide static pressure should the primary static source become blocked. The alternate static source is normally found inside of the flight deck Due to the Venturi effect of the air flowing around the fuselage, the air pressure inside the flight deck is lower than the exterior pressure. When the alternate static source pressure is used, the following instrument indications are observed. 1. The altimeter indicates a slightly higher altitude than actual. 2. The ASI indicates an airspeed greater than the actual airspeed. 3. The VSI shows a momentary climb and then stabilizes if the altitude is held constant. Each pilot is responsible for consulting the Aircraft Flight Manual, AFM, or the Pilot's Operating Handbook, POH to determine the amount of error that is introduced into the system when utilizing the alternate static source. In an aircraft not equipped with an alternate static source, an alternate method of introducing static pressure into the system, should a blockage occur, is to break the glass face of the VSI. This most likely renders the VSI inoperative, the reason for choosing the VSI as the instrument to break is that it is the least important static source instrument for flight. Altimeter The altimeter is an instrument that measures the height of an aircraft above a given pressure level. Pressure levels are discussed later in detail. Since the altimeter is the only instrument that is capable of indicating altitude, this is one of the most vital instruments installed in the aircraft. To use the altimeter effectively, the pilot must understand the operation of the instrument, as well as the errors associated with the altimeter, and how each affect the indication. A stack of sealed aneroid wafers comprise the main component of the altimeter. An aneroid wafer is a sealed wafer that is evacuated to an internal pressure of 29.92 inches of mercury. 29.92 inches Hg. These wafers are free to expand and contract with changes to the static pressure. 
a higher static pressure, presses down on the wafers and causes them to collapse. A lower static pressure, less than 29.92 inches of mercury, allows the wafers to expand. A mechanical linkage connects the wafer movement to the needles on the indicator face, which translates compression of the wafers into a decrease in altitude, and translates an expansion of the wafers into an increase in altitude. Figure 7-2 with errata. Notice how the static pressure is introduced into the rear of the sealed altimeter case. The altimeter's outer chamber is sealed, which allows the static pressure to surround the aneroid wafers. If the static pressure is higher than the pressure in the aneroid wafers, 29.92 inches of mercury, then the wafers are compressed until the pressure inside the wafers is equal to the surrounding static pressure. Conversely, if the static pressure is less than the pressure inside of the wafers, the wafers are able to expand, which increases the volume. The expansion and contraction of the wafers moves the mechanical linkage, which drives the needles on the face of the altimeter. Principle of Operation The pressure altimeter is an aneroid barometer that measures the pressure of the atmosphere at the level where the altimeter is located and presents an altitude indication in feet. The altimeter uses static pressure as its source of operation. Air is denser at sea level than aloft. As altitude increases, atmospheric pressure decreases. This difference in pressure at various levels causes the altimeter to indicate changes in altitude. The presentation of altitude varies considerably between different types of altimeters. Some have one pointer, while others have two or more. Only the multi-pointer type is discussed in this handbook. The dial of a typical altimeter is graduated with numerals arranged clockwise from 0 to 9. Movement of the aneroid element is transmitted through gears to the three hands that indicate altitude. In figure 7-2, the long, thin needle with the inverted triangle at the end indicates tens of thousands of feet. The short, wide needle indicates thousands of feet, and the long needle on top indicates hundreds of feet. This indicated altitude is correct, however, only when the sea level barometric pressure is standard, 29.92 inches of mercury. The sea level free air temperature is standard, plus 15 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and the pressure and temperature decrease at a standard rate with an increase in altitude. Adjustments for non-standard pressures are accomplished by setting the corrected pressure into a barometric scale located on the face of the altimeter. The barometric pressure window is sometimes referred to as the Colesman window. Only after the altimeter is set does it indicate the correct altitude. The word correct will need to be better explained when referring to types of altitudes, but is commonly used in this case to denote the approximate altitude above sea level. In other words, the indicated altitude refers to the altitude read off of the altitude which is uncorrected after the barometric pressure setting is dialed into the Colesman window. The additional types of altitudes are further explained later. Effect of non-standard pressure and temperature It is easy to maintain a consistent height above ground if the barometric pressure and temperature remain constant, but this is rarely the case. The pressure and temperature can change between takeoff and landing, even on a local flight. If these changes are not taken into consideration, flight becomes dangerous. 
If altimeters could not be adjusted for non-standard pressure, a hazardous situation could occur. For example, if an aircraft is flown from a high pressure area to a low pressure area without adjusting the altimeter, a constant altitude will be displayed. But the actual height of the aircraft above the ground would be lower than the indicated altitude. There is an old aviation axiom. Going from a high to a low, look out below. Conversely, if an aircraft is flown from a low pressure area to a high pressure area without an adjustment of the altimeter, the actual altitude of the aircraft is higher than the indicated altitude. Once in flight, it is important to frequently obtain current altimeter settings in route to ensure terrain and obstruction clearance. Many altimeters do not have an accurate means of being adjusted for barometric pressures in excess of 31.00 inches of mercury, inches Hg. When the altimeter cannot be set to the higher pressure setting, the aircraft actual altitude will be higher than the altimeter indicates. When low barometric pressure conditions occur, below 28.00, Flight operations by aircraft unable to set the actual altimeter setting are not recommended. Adjustments to compensate for non-standard pressure do not compensate for non-standard temperature. Since cold air is denser than warm air, when operating in temperatures that are colder than standard, the altitude is lower than the altimeter indication. Figure 7-3 it is the magnitude of this difference that determines the magnitude of the error. It is the difference due to colder temperatures that concerns the pilot. When flying into a cooler air mass while maintaining a constant indicated altitude, true altitude is lower. If terrain or obstacle clearance is a factor in selecting a cruising altitude, particularly in mountainous terrain, Remember to anticipate that a colder-than-standard temperature places the aircraft lower than the altimeter indicates. Therefore, a higher indicated altitude may be required to provide adequate terrain clearance. A variation of the memory aid used for pressure can be employed. From hot to cold, look out below. When the air is warmer than standard, the aircraft is higher than the altimeter indicates. Altitude corrections for temperature can be computed on the navigation computer. Extremely cold temperatures will also affect altimeter indications. Figure 7-4, which was derived from ICAO formulas, indicates how much error can exist when the temperature is extremely cold. Setting the altimeter. Most altimeters are equipped with a barometric pressure setting window, or Colesman window, providing a means to adjust the altimeter. A knob is located at the bottom of the instrument for this adjustment. To adjust the altimeter for variation in atmospheric pressure, the pressure scale in the altimeter setting window calibrated in inches of mercury, inches Hg, and or millibars, Mb, is adjusted to match the given altimeter setting. Altimeter setting is defined as station pressure reduced to sea level, but an altimeter setting is accurate only in the vicinity of the reporting station. Therefore, the altimeter must be adjusted as the flight progresses from one station to the next. Air Traffic Control, ATC, will advise when updated altimeter settings are available. If a pilot is not utilizing ATC assistance, local altimeter settings can be obtained by monitoring local automated weather observing system, automated surface observation system, AWOS, slash ASOS, or 
Automatic Terminal Information Service, ATIS, broadcasts. Many pilots confidently expect the current altimeter setting will compensate for irregularities in atmospheric pressure at all altitudes. But this is not always true. The altimeter setting broadcast by ground stations is the station pressure corrected to mean sea level. It does not account for the irregularities at higher levels, particularly the effect of non-standard temperature. If each pilot in a given area is using the same altimeter setting, each altimeter should be equally affected by temperature and pressure variation errors, making it possible to maintain the desired vertical separation between aircraft. This does not guarantee vertical separation, though. It is still imperative to maintain a regimented visual scan for intruding air traffic. When flying over high mountainous terrain, certain atmospheric conditions cause the altimeter to indicate an altitude of 1,000 feet or more higher than the actual altitude. For this reason, a generous margin of altitude should be allowed, not only for possible altimeter error, but also for possible downdrafts that might be associated with high winds. To illustrate the use of the altimeter setting system, follow a flight from Dallas Love Field, Texas, to Abilene Municipal Airport, Texas, via Mineral Wells. Before taking off from Love Field, the pilot receives a current altimeter setting of 29.85 inches of mercury from the control tower, or ATIS, and sets this value in the altimeter setting window. The altimeter indication should then be compared with the known airport elevation of 487 feet. Since most altimeters are not perfectly calibrated, an error may exist. When over mineral wells, Assume the pilot receives a current altimeter setting of 29.94 inches of mercury and sets this in the altimeter window. Before entering the traffic pattern at Abilene Municipal Airport, a new altimeter setting of 29.69 inches of mercury is received from the Abilene Control Tower and set in the altimeter setting window. If the pilot desires to fly the traffic pattern at approximately 800 feet above the terrain and the field elevation of Abilene is 1,791 feet, an indicated altitude of 2,600 feet should be maintained. 1,791 feet plus 800 feet equals 2,591 feet rounded to 2,600 feet. The importance of properly setting the altimeter cannot be overemphasized. Assume the pilot did not adjust the altimeter at Abilene to the current setting and continued using the mineral well setting of 29.94 inches of mercury. When entering the Abilene traffic pattern at an indicated altitude of 2,600 feet, the aircraft would be approximately 250 feet below the proper traffic pattern altitude. Upon landing, the altimeter would indicate approximately 250 feet higher than the field elevation. Mineral Wells Altimeter Setting, 29.94 Abilene Altimeter Setting, 29.69 Difference, 0.25 since one inch of pressure is equal to approximately 1,000 feet of altitude, 0 0.25 times 1,000 feet equals 250 feet. When determining whether to add or subtract the amount of altimeter error, remember that when the actual pressure is lower than what is set in the altimeter window, the actual altitude of the aircraft is lower than what is indicated on the altimeter. The following is another method of computing the altitude deviation. 
Start by subtracting the current altimeter setting from 29.94 inches of mercury. Always remember to place the original setting as the top number. Then, subtract the current altimeter setting. Mineral Wells Altimeter Setting 29.94 Abilene Altimeter Setting 29.69 29.94 minus 29.69 equals difference 0 0.25 since one inch of pressure is equal to approximately 1,000 feet of altitude, 0 0.25 times 1,000 feet equals 250 feet. Always subtract the number from the indicated altitude. 2,600 minus 250 equals 2,350. Now, try a lower pressure setting. Adjust from altimeter setting 29.94 to 30.56 inches of mercury. Mineral Wells Altimeter Setting 29.94 Altimeter Setting 30.56 29.94 minus 30.56 equals difference. Negative 0.62 since one inch of pressure is equal to approximately 1,000 feet of altitude, 0 0.62 times 1,000 feet equals 620 feet. Always subtract the number from the indicated altitude. 2,600 minus negative 620 equals 3,220. The pilot will be 620 feet high. Notice the difference is a negative number. Starting with the current indicated altitude of 2,600 feet, subtracting a negative number is the same as adding the two numbers. By utilizing this method, a pilot should be able to better understand what is happening with the aircraft's altitude. This method always yields the correct result and tells a pilot what the altitude is and the direction. The implications of not understanding where the errors lie and in what direction are important to a safe flight. If the altitude was lower than actually indicated, an aircraft could be in danger of colliding with an obstacle. Altimeter Operation There are two means by which the altimeter pointers can be moved. The first is a change in air pressure while the other is an adjustment to the barometric scale. When the aircraft climbs or descends, changing pressure within the altimeter case expands or contracts the aneroid barometer. This movement is transmitted through mechanical linkage to rotate the pointers. A decrease in pressure causes the altimeter to indicate an increase in altitude, and an increase in pressure causes the altimeter to indicate a decrease in altitude. Accordingly, if the aircraft is sitting on the ground with a pressure level of 29.98 inches of mercury and the pressure level changes to 29.68 inches of mercury, the altimeter would show an increase of approximately 300 feet in altitude. This pressure change is most noticeable when the aircraft is left parked overnight. As the pressure falls, the altimeter interprets this as a climb. The altimeter indicates an altitude above the actual field elevation. If the barometric pressure setting is reset to the current altimeter setting of 29.68 inches of mercury, then the field elevation is again indicated on the altimeter. This pressure change is not as easily noticed in flight since aircraft fly specific altitudes. The aircraft steadily decreases true altitude while the altimeter is held constant through pilot action as discussed in the previous section. Knowing the aircraft's altitude is vitally important to a pilot. 
the pilot must be sure that the aircraft is flying high enough to clear the highest terrain or obstruction along the intended route. It is especially important to have accurate altitude information when visibility is restricted. To clear obstructions, the pilot must constantly be aware of the altitude of the aircraft and the elevation of the surrounding terrain. To reduce the possibility of a mid-air collision, it is essential to maintain altitude in accordance with air traffic rules. Types of Altitude Altitude in itself is a relevant term only when it is specifically stated to which type of altitude a pilot is referring. Normally, when the term altitude is used, it is referring to altitude above sea level, since this is the altitude which is used to depict obstacles and airspace, as well as to separate air traffic. Altitude is vertical distance above some point or level used as a reference. There are as many kinds of altitude as there are reference levels from which altitude is measured, and each may be used for specific reasons. Pilots are mainly concerned with five types of altitudes. 1. Indicated altitude. Read directly from the altimeter, uncorrected, when it is set to the current altimeter setting. 2. True altitude. The vertical distance of the aircraft above sea level. The actual altitude. It is often expressed as feet above mean sea level. MSL. Airport, terrain, and obstacle elevations on aeronautical charts are true altitudes. 3. Absolute altitude. The vertical distance of an aircraft above the terrain or above ground level. AGL. 4. Pressure altitude. The altitude indicated when the altimeter setting window, barometric scale, is adjusted to 29.92 inches of mercury. This is the altitude above the standard datum plane, which is a theoretical plane where air pressure, corrected to 15 degrees Celsius, equals 29.92 inches of mercury. Pressure altitude is used to compute density altitude, true altitude, true airspeed, TAS, and other performance data. 5. Density altitude. Pressure altitude corrected for variations from standard temperature. When conditions are standard, pressure altitude and density altitude are the same. If the temperature is above standard, the density altitude is higher than pressure altitude. If the temperature is below standard, the density altitude is lower than pressure altitude. This is an important altitude because it is directly related to the aircraft's performance. A pilot must understand how the performance of the aircraft is directly related to the density of the air. The density of the air affects how much power a naturally aspirated engine produces, as well as how efficient the airfoils are. If there are fewer air molecules, lower pressure, to accelerate through the propeller, the acceleration to rotation speed is longer and thus produces a longer takeoff roll, which translates to a decrease in performance. As an example, consider an airport with a field elevation of 5,048 feet MSL, where the standard temperature is 5 degrees Celsius. Under these conditions, pressure altitude and density altitude are the same, 5,048 feet. If the temperature changes to 30 degrees Celsius, the density altitude increases to 7,855 feet. This means an aircraft would perform on takeoff as though the field elevation were 7,855 feet at standard temperature. Conversely, a temperature of negative 25 degrees Celsius would result in a density altitude of 1,232 feet, 
and aircraft would perform much better under these conditions. Instrument check. Prior to each flight, a pilot should examine the altimeter for proper indications in order to verify its validity. To determine the condition of an altimeter, set the barometric scale to the current reported altimeter setting transmitted by the local automated flight service station, AFSS, or any other reliable source, such as ATIS, AWOS, or ASOS. The altimeter pointer should indicate the surveyed field elevation of the airport. If the indication is off more than 75 feet from the surveyed field elevation, the instrument should be referred to a certificated instrument repair station for recalibration. End of Chapter 7, Part 1「2」of Chapter 7 of Pilot's Handbook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA Chapter 7, Part 2 Vertical Speed Indicator VSI the VSI, which is sometimes called a vertical velocity indicator, VVI, indicates whether the aircraft is climbing, descending, or in level flight. The rate of climb or descent is indicated in feet per minute, FPM. If properly calibrated, the VSI indicates zero in level flight, figure 7-5. Principle of Operation Although the VSI operates solely from static pressure, it is a differential pressure instrument. It contains a diaphragm with connecting linkage and gearing to the indicator pointer inside an airtight case. The inside of the diaphragm is connected directly to the static line of the pitot-static system. The area outside the diaphragm, which is inside the instrument case, is also connected to the static line, but through a restricted orifice, calibrated leak. Both the diaphragm and the case receive air from the static line at existing atmospheric pressure. The diaphragm receives unrestricted air while the case receives the static pressure via the metered leak. When the aircraft is on the ground, or in level flight, the pressures inside the diaphragm and the instrument case are equal, and the pointer is at the zero indication. When the aircraft climbs or descends, the pressure inside the diaphragm changes immediately, but due to the metering action of the restricted passage, the case pressure remains higher or lower for a short time, causing the diaphragm to contract or expand. This causes a pressure differential that is indicated on the instrument needle as a climb or descent. When the pressure differential stabilizes at a definite ratio, the needle indicates the rate of altitude change. The VSI displays two different types of information. Trend information shows an immediate indication of an increase or decrease in the aircraft's rate of climb or descent. Rate information shows a stabilized rate of change in altitude. The trend information is the direction of movement of the VSI needle. For example, if an aircraft is maintaining level flight and the pilot pulls back on the control yoke, causing the nose of the aircraft to pitch up, the VSI needle moves upward to indicate a climb. If the pitch attitude is held constant, the needle stabilizes after a short period, six to nine seconds, and indicates the rate of climb in hundreds of FPM. The time period from the initial change in the rate of climb 
until the VSI displays an accurate indication of the new rate, is called the lag. Rough control technique and turbulence can extend the lag period and cause erratic and unstable rate indications. Some aircraft are equipped with an instantaneous vertical speed indicator, IVSI, which incorporates accelerometers to compensate for the lag in the typical VSI, figure 7-6. Instrument Check As part of a pre-flight check, proper operation of the VSI must be established. Make sure the VSI indicates near zero prior to leaving the ramp area, and again just before takeoff. If the VSI indicates anything other than zero, that indication can be referenced as the zero mark. Normally, if the needle is not exactly zero, it is only slightly above or below the zero line. After takeoff, the VSI should trend upward to indicate a positive rate of climb, and then, once a stabilized climb is established, a rate of climb can be referenced. Airspeed Indicator, ASI The ASI is a sensitive differential pressure gauge, which measures and promptly indicates the difference between pito impact slash dynamic pressure, and static pressure. These two pressures are equal when the aircraft is parked on the ground in calm air. When the aircraft moves through the air, the pressure on the pitot line becomes greater than the pressure in the static lines. This difference in pressure is registered by the airspeed pointer on the face of the instrument, which is calibrated in miles per hour, knots, nautical miles per hour, or both. Figure 7-7. The ASI is the one instrument that utilizes both the pitot as well as the static system. The ASI introduces the static pressure into the airspeed case, while the pitot pressure, dynamic, is introduced into the diaphragm. The dynamic pressure expands or contracts one side of the diaphragm, which is attached to an indicating system. The system drives the mechanical linkage in the airspeed needle. Just as in altitudes, there are multiple types of airspeeds. Pilots need to be very familiar with each type. Indicated airspeed, IAS. The direct instrument reading obtained from the ASI, uncorrected for variations in atmospheric density, installation error, or instrument error. Manufacturers use this airspeed as the basis for determining aircraft performance. Takeoff, landing, and stall speeds listed in the AFM slash POH are IAS and do not normally vary with altitude or temperature. Calibrated airspeed, CAS. IAS corrected for installation error and instrument error. Although manufacturers attempt to keep airspeed errors to a minimum, it is not possible to eliminate all errors throughout the airspeed operating range. At certain airspeeds, and with certain flap settings, the installation and instrument errors may total several knots. This error is generally greatest at low airspeeds. In the cruising and higher airspeed ranges, IAS and CAS are approximately the same. Refer to the airspeed calibration chart to correct for possible airspeed errors. True airspeed, TAS. CAS corrected for altitude and non-standard temperature. Because air density decreases with an increase in altitude, an aircraft has to be flown faster at higher altitudes to cause the same pressure difference between pitot impact pressure and static pressure. Therefore, for a given CAS, TAS increases as altitude increases. Or, for a given TAS, CAS decreases as altitude increases. 
A pilot can find TAS by two methods. The most accurate method is to use a flight computer. With this method, the CAS is corrected for temperature and pressure variation by using the airspeed correction scale on the computer. Extremely accurate electronic flight computers are also available. Just enter the CAS, pressure altitude, and temperature, and the computer calculates the TAS. A second method, which is a rule of thumb, provides the approximate TAS. Simply add 2% to the CAS for each 1,000 feet of altitude. The TAS is the speed which is used for flight planning and is used when filing a flight plan. Ground speed, GS, the actual speed of the airplane over the ground. It is TAS adjusted for wind. GS decreases with a headwind and increases with a tailwind. Airspeed indicator markings. Aircraft weighing 12,500 pounds or less, manufactured after 1945, and certificated by the FAA, are required to have ASIs marked in accordance with the standard color-coded marking system. This system of color-coded markings enables a pilot to determine at a glance certain airspeed limitations that are important to the safe operation of the aircraft. For example, if during the execution of a maneuver, it is noted that the airspeed needle is in the yellow arc and rapidly approaching the red line, the immediate reaction should be to reduce airspeed. As shown in Figure 7-8, ASIs on single-engine small aircraft include the following standard color-coded markings. White arc, commonly referred to as the flap operating range, since its lower limit represents the full flap stall speed, and its upper limit provides the maximum flap speed. Approaches and landings are usually flown at speeds within the white arc. Lower limit of white arc, VS0. The stalling speed or the minimum study flight speed in the landing configuration. In small aircraft, this is the power off stall speed at the maximum landing weight in the landing configuration, gear and flaps down. Upper limit of the white arc, VFE, the maximum speed with the flaps extended. Green arc, the normal operating range of the aircraft. Most flying occurs within this range. Lower limit of green arc, VS1, the stalling speed or the minimum steady flight speed obtained in a specified configuration. For most aircraft, this is the power off stall speed at the maximum takeoff weight in the clean configuration. Gear up, if retractable, and flaps up. Upper limit of green arc, VNO, the maximum structural cruising speed. Do not exceed this speed except in smooth air. Yellow arc, caution range. Fly within this range only in smooth air, and then only with caution. Red line, VNE, never exceeds speed. Operating above this speed is prohibited, since it may result in damage or structural failure. Other airspeed limitations. Some important airspeed limitations are not marked on the face of the ASI, but are found on placards and in the AFM slash POH. These airspeeds include Design Maneuvering Speed, VA The maximum speed at which the structural design's limit load can be imposed, either by gusts or full deflection of the control surfaces, without causing structural damage. It is important to consider weight when referencing this speed. For example, VA may be 100 knots when an airplane is heavily loaded, but only 90 knots when the load is light. Landing gear operating speed, VLO. 
the maximum speed for extending or retracting the landing gear, if flying an aircraft with retractable landing gear. Landing gear extended speed, VLE, the maximum speed at which an aircraft can be safely flown with the landing gear extended. Best angle of climb speed, VX, the airspeed at which an aircraft gains the greatest amount of altitude in a given distance. It is used during a short field takeoff to clear an obstacle. Best rate of climb speed, VY, the airspeed that provides the most altitude gain in a given period of time. Single engine best rate of climb, VYSE, the best rate of climb or minimum rate of sink in a light twin-engine aircraft with one engine inoperative. It is marked on the ASI with a blue line. VYSE is commonly referred to as blue line. Minimum control speed, VMC. The minimum flight speed at which a light twin-engine aircraft can be satisfactorily controlled when an engine suddenly becomes inoperative and the remaining engine is at takeoff power. Instrument check. Prior to takeoff, the ASI should read zero. However, if there is a strong wind blowing directly into the pitot tube, the ASI may read higher than zero. When beginning the takeoff, make sure the airspeed is increasing at an appropriate rate. Blockage of the pitot static system. Errors almost always indicate blockage of the pitot tube, the static ports, or both. Blockage may be caused by moisture, including ice, dirt, or even insects. During pre-flight, make sure the pitot tube cover is removed. Then, check the pitot and static port openings. A blocked pitot tube affects the accuracy of the ASI, but... A blockage of the static port not only affects the ASI, but also causes errors in the altimeter and VSI. Blocked PITO System The PITO system can become blocked completely, or only partially, if the PITO tube drain hole remains open. If the PITO tube becomes blocked, and its associated drain hole remains clear, Ram air no longer is able to enter the pitot system. Air already in the system vents through the drain hole, and the remaining pressure drops to ambient, outside, air pressure. Under these circumstances, the ASI reading decreases to zero, because the ASI senses no difference between ram and static air pressure. The ASI no longer operates, since dynamic pressure cannot enter the pitot tube opening. Static pressure is able to equalize on both sides, since the pitot drain hole is still open. The apparent loss of airspeed is not usually instantaneous, but happens very quickly. Figure 7-9 If both the pitot tube opening and the drain hole should become clogged simultaneously, then the pressure in the pitot tube is trapped. No change is noted on the airspeed indication should the airspeed increase or decrease. If the static port is unblocked and the aircraft should change altitude, then a change is noted on the ASI. The change is not related to a change in airspeed, but a change in static pressure. The total pressure in the pitot tube does not change due to the blockage. However, the static pressure will change. Because airspeed indications rely upon both static and dynamic pressure together, the blockage of either of these systems affects the ASI reading. Remember that the ASI has a diaphragm in which dynamic air pressure is entered. Behind this diaphragm is a reference pressure called static pressure that comes from the static ports. The diaphragm pressurizes against the static pressure and as a result, changes the airspeed indication via levers and indicators. Figure 7-10 For example, take an aircraft and slow it down to zero knots at given altitude. 
if the static port, providing static pressure, and the pitot tube, providing dynamic pressure, are both unobstructed, the following claims can be made. 1. The ASI would be zero. 2. There must be a relationship between both dynamic and static pressure. At zero speed, dynamic pressure and static pressure are the same. Static air pressure. 3. Because both dynamic and static air pressure are equal at zero speed with increased speed, dynamic pressure must include two components, static pressure and dynamic pressure. It can be inferred that airspeed indication must be based upon a relationship between these two pressures. And indeed, it is. An ASI uses the static pressure as a reference pressure, and as a result, the ASI's case is kept at this pressure behind the diaphragm. On the other hand, the dynamic pressure through the pitot tube is connected to a highly sensitive diaphragm within the ASI case. Because an aircraft in zero motion, regardless of altitude, results in a zero airspeed, the pitot tube always provides static pressure in addition to dynamic pressure. Therefore, the airspeed indication is the result of two pressures, the pitot tube static and dynamic pressure within the diaphragm, as measured against the static pressure in case. What does this mean if the pitot tube is obstructed? If the aircraft were to descend, the pressure in the pitot system, including the diaphragm, would remain constant. It is clogged, and the diaphragm is at a single pressure. But as the descent is made, the static pressure would increase against the diaphragm, causing it to compress, thereby resulting in an indication of decreased airspeed. Conversely, if the aircraft were to climb, the static pressure would decrease, allowing the diaphragm to expand, thereby showing an indication of greater airspeed. Figure 7-10 The pitot tube may become blocked during flight due to visible moisture. Some aircraft may be equipped with pitot heat for flight in visible moisture. Consult the AFM slash POH for specific procedures regarding the use of pitot heat. Blocked static system. If the static system becomes blocked but the pitot tube remains clear, the ASI continues to operate. However, it is inaccurate. The airspeed indicates lower than the actual airspeed when the aircraft is operated above the altitude where the static ports became blocked because the trapped static pressure is higher than normal for that altitude. When operating at a lower altitude, a faster than actual airspeed is displayed due to the relatively low static pressure trapped in the system. Revisiting the ratios that were used to explain a blocked pitot tube, the same principle applies for a blocked static port. If the aircraft descends, the static pressure increases on the pitot side, showing an increase on the ASI. This assumes that the aircraft does not actually increase its speed. The increase in static pressure on the pitot side is equivalent to an increase in dynamic pressure, since the pressure cannot change on the static side. If an aircraft begins to climb after a static port becomes blocked, the airspeed begins to show a decrease as the aircraft continues to climb. This is due to the decrease in static pressure on the pitot side, while the pressure on the static side is held constant. A blockage of the static system also affects the altimeter and VSI. Trapped static pressure causes the altimeter to freeze at the altitude where the blockage occurred. In the case of the VSI, a blocked static system produces a continuous zero indication, figure 7-11. Some aircraft are equipped with an alternate static source in the flight deck. In the case of a blocked static source, opening the alternate static source introduces static pressure from the flight deck back into the system. 
flight deck static pressure is lower than outside static pressure. Check the aircraft AOM slash POH for airspeed corrections when utilizing alternate static pressure. End of Part 2 of Chapter 7「Part Three of Chapter Seven of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter Seven, Part Three. Electronic Flight Display. E. F. D. Advances in digital displays and solid-state electronic components have been introduced into the flight decks of General Aviation, GA, aircraft. In addition to the improvement in system reliability, which increases overall safety, electronic flight displays, EFD, have decreased the overall cost of equipping aircraft with state-of-the-art instrumentation. Primary electronic instrumentation packages are less prone to failure than their analog counterparts. No longer is it necessary for aircraft designers to create cluttered panel layouts in order to accommodate all necessary flight instruments. Instead, Multi-panel digital flight displays combine all flight instruments onto a single screen, which is called a primary flight display, PFD. The traditional six-pack of instruments is now displayed on one liquid crystal display, LCD, screen. Airspeed Tape Configured similarly to traditional panel layouts, the ASI is located on the left side of the screen and is displayed as a vertical speed tape. As the aircraft increases in speed, the larger numbers descend from the top of the tape. The TAS is displayed at the bottom of the tape through the input to the air data computer, ADC, from the outside air temperature probe. Airspeed markings for VX, VY, and rotation speed, VR, are displayed for pilot reference. An additional pilot-controlled airspeed bug is available to set at any desired reference speed. As on traditional analog ASIs, the electronic airspeed tape displays the color-coded ranges for the flap operating range, normal range, and caution range, Figure 7-12. The number value changes color to red when the airspeed exceeds VNE to warn the pilot of exceeding the maximum speed limitation. Attitude Indicator One improvement over analog instrumentation is the larger attitude indicator on EFD. The artificial horizon spans the entire width of the PFD, figure 7-12. This expanded instrumentation offers better reference through all phases of flight and all flight maneuvers. The attitude indicator receives its information from the attitude heading and reference system, AHRS. Altimeter the altimeter is located on the right side of the PFD, figure 7-12. As the altitude increases, the larger numbers descend from the top of the display tape, with the current altitude being displayed in the black box in the center of the display tape. The altitude is displayed in increments of 20 feet. Vertical Speed Indicator, VSI the VSI is displayed to the right of the altimeter tape and can take the form of an arced indicator or a vertical speed tape, figure 7-12. Both are equipped with a vertical speed bug. Heading Indicator 
The heading indicator is located below the artificial horizon and is normally modeled after a horizontal situation indicator, HSI, figure 7-12. As in the case of the attitude indicator, the heading indicator receives its information from the magnetometer, which feeds information to the AHRS unit, and then out to the PFD. Turn indicator. The turn indicator takes a slightly different form than the traditional instrumentation. A sliding bar moves left and right below the triangle to indicate deflection from coordinated flight. Figure 7-12 and errata. Reference for coordinated flight comes from accelerometers contained in the AHRS unit. Tachometer. The sixth instrument normally associated with the six-pack package is the tachometer. This is the only instrument that is not located on the PFD. The tachometer is normally located on the multifunction display, MFD. In the event of a display screen failure, it is displayed on the remaining screen with the PFD flight instrumentation. Figure 7-13 Slip Skid Indicator The Slip Skid Indicator, Figure 7-12, is the horizontal line below the roll pointer. Like a ball in a turn and slip indicator, a bar width off center is equal to one ball width displacement. Turn Rate Indicator The Turn Rate Indicator, illustrated in Figure 7-12, is typically found directly above the rotating compass card. Tick marks to the left and right of the lever line denote the turn, standard rate versus half standard rate, typically denoted by a trend line. If the trend vector is extended to the second tick mark, the aircraft is in a standard rate turn. Individual panel displays are able to be configured for a variety of aircraft simply by installing different software packages, figure 7-14. Manufacturers are also able to upgrade existing instrument displays in a similar manner, eliminating the need to replace individual gauges in order to upgrade. Air Data Computer, ADC. Electronic flight displays utilize the same type of instrument inputs as traditional analog gauges, However, the processing system is different. The pitot-static inputs are received by an ADC. The ADC computes the difference between the total pressure and the static pressure and generates the information necessary to display the airspeed on the PFD. Outside air temperatures are also monitored and introduced into various components within the system as well as being displayed on the PFD screen, figure 7-15. The ADC is a separate solid-state device which, in addition to providing data to the PFD, is capable of providing data to the autopilot control system. In the event of system malfunction, the ADC can quickly be removed and replaced in order to decrease downtime and maintenance turnaround times. Altitude information is derived from the static pressure port, just as an analog system does. However, the static pressure does not enter a diaphragm. The ADC computes the received barometric pressure and sends a digital signal to the PFD to display the proper altitude readout. Electronic flight displays also show trend vectors, which show the pilot how the altitude and airspeed are progressing. Trend vectors. Trend vectors are magenta lines which move up and down, both the ASI and the altimeter. Figures 7-16 and 7-17. Errata. Refer to the Instrument Flying Handbook. The ADC computes the rate of change and displays the six-second projection of where the aircraft will be. 
Pilots can utilize the trend vectors to better control the aircraft's attitude. By including the trend vectors in the instrument scan, pilots are able to precisely control air speed and altitude. Additional information can be obtained by referencing the Instrument Flying Handbook or specific avionics manufacturer's training material. Gyroscopic Flight Instruments Several flight instruments utilize the properties of a gyroscope for their operation. The most common instruments containing gyroscopes are the turn coordinator, heading indicator, and the attitude indicator. To understand how these instruments operate requires knowledge of the instrument power systems, gyroscopic principles, and the operating principles of each instrument. Gyroscopic principles Any spinning object exhibits gyroscopic properties. A wheel or rotor designed and mounted to utilize these properties is called a gyroscope. Two important design characteristics of an instrument gyro are great weight for its size, or high density, and rotation at high speed with low friction bearings. There are two general types of mountings. The type used depends upon which property of the gyro is utilized. A freely or universally mounted gyroscope is free to rotate in any direction about its center of gravity. Such a wheel is said to have three planes of freedom. The wheel or rotor is free to rotate in any plane in relation to the base, and is balanced so that, with the gyro wheel at rest, it remains in the position in which it is placed. Restricted or semi-rigidly mounted gyroscopes are those mounted so that one of the planes of freedom is held fixed in relation to the base. There are two fundamental properties of gyroscopic action, rigidity in space and precession. Rigidity in space. Rigidity in space refers to the principle that a gyroscope remains in a fixed position in the plane in which it is spinning. An example of rigidity in space is that of a bicycle wheel. As the bicycle wheels increase speed, they become more and more stable in their plane of rotation. This is why a bicycle is very unstable and very maneuverable at low speeds and very stable and less maneuverable at higher speeds. By mounting this wheel, or gyroscope, on a set of gimbal rings, the gyro is able to rotate freely in any direction. Thus, if the gimbal rings are tilted, twisted, or otherwise moved, the gyro remains in the plane in which it was originally spinning. Figure 7-18 Precession Precession is the tilting or turning of a gyro in response to a deflective force. The reaction to this force does not occur at the point at which it was applied. Rather, it occurs at a point that is 90 degrees later in the direction of rotation. This principle allows the gyro to determine a rate of turn by sensing the amount of pressure created by a change in direction. The rate at which the gyro precesses is inversely proportional to the speed of the rotor and proportional to the deflective force. Using the example of the bicycle, precession acts on the wheels in order to allow the bicycle to turn. While riding at normal speed, it is not necessary to turn the handlebars in the direction of the desired turn. A rider simply leans in the direction that he or she wishes to go. Since the wheels are rotating in a clockwise direction when viewed from the right side of the bicycle, if a rider leans to the left, a force is applied to the top of the wheel to the left. The force actually acts 90 degrees in the direction of rotation, which has the effect of applying a force to the front of the tire, causing the bicycle to move to the left. There is a need to turn the handlebars at low speeds because of the instability of the slowly turning gyros and also to increase the rate of turn. Precession can also create some minor errors in some instruments. Figure 7-19 
Precession can cause a freely spinning gyro to become displaced from its intended plane of rotation through bearing friction, etc. Certain instruments may require corrective realignment during flight, such as the heading indicator. Sources of power In some aircraft, all the gyros are vacuum, pressure, or electrically operated. In other aircraft, Vacuum or pressure systems provide the power for the heading and attitude indicators, while the electrical system provides the power for the turn coordinator. Most aircraft have at least two sources of power to ensure at least one source of bank information is available if one power source fails. The vacuum or pressure system spins the gyro by drawing a stream of air against the rotor vanes to spin the rotor at high speed much like the operation of a water wheel or turbine. The amount of vacuum or pressure required for instrument operation varies, but is usually between 4.5 inches of mercury and 5.5 inches of mercury. One source of vacuum for the gyros is a vane-type engine-driven pump that is mounted on the accessory case of the engine. Pump capacity varies in different airplanes, depending on the number of gyros. A typical vacuum system consists of an engine-driven vacuum pump, relief valve, air filter, gauge, and tubing necessary to complete the connections. The gauge is mounted in the aircraft's instrument panel and indicates the amount of pressure in the system. Vacuum is measured in inches of mercury less than ambient pressure. As shown in figure 7-20, air is drawn into the vacuum system by the engine-driven vacuum pump. It first goes through a filter, which prevents foreign matter from entering the vacuum or pressure system. The air then moves through the attitude and heading indicators, where it causes the gyros to spin. A relief valve prevents the vacuum pressure, or suction, from exceeding prescribed limits. After that, the air is expelled overboard or used in other systems, such as for inflating pneumatic de-icing boots. It is important to monitor vacuum pressure during flight, because the attitude and heading indicators may not provide reliable information when suction pressure is low. The vacuum, or suction gauge, is generally marked to indicate the normal range. Some aircraft are equipped with a warning light that illuminates when the vacuum pressure drops below the acceptable level. When the vacuum pressure drops below the normal operating range, the gyroscopic instruments may become unstable and inaccurate. Cross-checking the instruments routinely is a good habit to develop. Turn Indicators Aircraft use two types of turn indicators turn and slip indicator, and turn coordinator. Because of the way the gyro is mounted, the turn and slip indicator shows only the rate of turn in degrees per second. The turn coordinator is mounted at an angle, or canted, so it can initially show roll rate. When the roll stabilizes, it indicates rate of turn. Both instruments indicate turn direction and quality, coordination, and also serve as a backup source of bank information in the event an attitude indicator fails. Coordination is achieved by referring to the inclinometer, which consists of a liquid-filled curved tube with a ball inside, figure 7-21. Turn and slip indicator. The gyro in the turn and slip indicator rotates in the vertical plane, corresponding to the aircraft's longitudinal axis. A single gimbal limits the planes in which the gyro can tilt, and a spring tries to return it to center. Because of precession, a yawing force causes the gyro to tilt left or right, as viewed from the pilot seat. The turn and slip indicator uses a pointer, called the turn needle, to show the direction and rate of turn. The turn and slip indicator is incapable of tumbling off its rotational axis because of the restraining springs. 
when extreme forces are applied to a gyro, the gyro is displaced from its normal plane of rotation, rendering its indications invalid. Certain instruments have specific pitch and bank limits that induce a tumble of the gyro. Turn coordinator. The gimbal in the turn coordinator is canted. Therefore, its gyro can sense both rate of roll and rate of turn. Since turn coordinators are more prevalent in training aircraft, this discussion concentrates on that instrument. When rolling into or out of a turn, the miniature aircraft banks in the direction the aircraft is rolled. A rapid roll rate causes the miniature aircraft to bank more steeply than a slow roll rate. The turn coordinator can be used to establish and maintain a standard rate turn by aligning the wing of the miniature aircraft with the turn index. Figure 7-22 shows a picture of a turn coordinator. There are two marks on each side, left and right, of the face of the instrument. The first mark is used to reference a wing's level zero rate of turn. The second mark, on the left and right side of the instrument, serve to indicate a standard rate of turn. A standard rate turn is defined as a turn rate of 3 degrees per second. The turn coordinator indicates only the rate and direction of turn. It does not display a specific angle of bank. End of Chapter 7, Part 3Part 4 of Chapter 7 of Pilot's Handbook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge by the FAA. Chapter 7, Part 4 Inclinometer. The inclinometer is used to depict aircraft yaw, which is the side-to-side -side movement of the aircraft's nose. During coordinated straight and level flight, the force of gravity causes the ball to rest in the lowest part of the tube, centered between the reference lines. Coordinated flight is maintained by keeping the ball centered. If the ball is not centered, it can be centered by using the rudder. To center the ball, apply rudder pressure on the side to which the ball is deflected. Use the simple rule, step on the ball, to remember which rudder pedal to press. If aileron and rudder are coordinated during a turn, the ball remains centered in the tube. If aerodynamic forces are unbalanced, the ball moves away from the center of the tube. As shown in figure 7-22, in a slip, the rate of turn is too slow for the angle of bank, and the ball moves to the inside of the turn. In a skid, the rate of turn is too great for the angle of bank, and the ball moves to the outside of the turn. To correct for these conditions, and improve the quality of the turn, remember to step on the ball. Varying the angle of bank can also help restore coordinated flight from a slip or skid. To correct for a slip, decrease bank and or increase the rate of turn. To correct for a skid, increase the bank and or decrease the rate of turn. Yaw string. One additional tool which can be added to the aircraft is a yaw string. A yaw string is simply a string or piece of yarn attached to the center of the windscreen. When in coordinated flight, the string trails straight back over the top of the windscreen. When the aircraft is either slipping or skidding, the yaw string moves to the right or left depending on the direction of slip or skid. Instrument check. During the pre-flight, Check to see that the inclinometer is full of fluid and has no air bubbles. The ball should also be resting at its lowest point. When taxiing, the turn coordinator should indicate a turn in the correct direction 
while the ball moves opposite the direction of the turn. Attitude Indicator The Attitude Indicator, with its miniature aircraft and horizon bar, displays a picture of the attitude of the aircraft. The relationship of the miniature aircraft to the horizon bar is the same as the relationship of the real aircraft to the actual horizon. The instrument gives an instantaneous indication of even the smallest changes in attitude. The gyro in the attitude indicator is mounted in a horizontal plane and depends upon rigidity and space for its operation. The horizon bar represents the true horizon. This bar is fixed to the gyro and remains in a horizontal plane as the aircraft is pitched or banked about its lateral or longitudinal axis, indicating the attitude of the aircraft relative to the true horizon. Figure 7-23 The gyro spins in the horizontal plane and resists deflection of the rotational path. Since the gyro relies on rigidity in space, the aircraft actually rotates around the spinning gyro. An adjustment knob is provided with which the pilot may move the miniature aircraft up or down to align the miniature aircraft with the horizon bar to suit the pilot's line of vision. Normally, the miniature aircraft is adjusted so that the wings overlap the horizon bar when the aircraft is in straight and level cruising flight. The pitch and bank limits depend upon the make and model of the instrument. Limits in the banking plane are usually from 100 degrees to 110 degrees, and the pitch limits are usually from 60 degrees to 70 degrees. If either limit is exceeded, the instrument will tumble or spill, and will give incorrect indications until realigned. A number of modern attitude indicators do not tumble. Every pilot should be able to interpret the banking scale illustrated in Figure 7-24. Most banking scale indicators on the top of the instrument move in the same direction from that in which the aircraft is actually banked. Some other models move in the opposite direction from that in which the aircraft is actually banked. This may confuse the pilot if the indicator is used to determine the direction of bank. This scale should be used only to control the degree of desired bank. The relationship of the miniature aircraft to the horizon bar should be used for an indication of the direction of bank. The attitude indicator is reliable and the most realistic flight instrument on the instrument panel. Its indications are very close approximations of the actual attitude of the aircraft. Heading Indicator The heading indicator is, fundamentally, a mechanical instrument designed to facilitate the use of the magnetic compass. Errors in the magnetic compass are numerous, making straight flight and precision turns to headings difficult to accomplish, particularly in turbulent air. A heading indicator, however, is not affected by the forces that make the magnetic compass difficult to interpret. Figure 7-25 The operation of the heading indicator depends upon the principle of rigidity in space. The rotor turns in a vertical plane, and fixed to the rotor is a compass card. Since the rotor remains rigid in space, the points on the card hold the same position in space relative to the vertical plane of the gyro. The aircraft actually rotates around the rotating gyro, not the other way around. As the instrument case and the aircraft revolve around the vertical axis of the gyro, the card provides clear and accurate heading information. Because of precession caused by friction, the heading indicator creeps or drifts from a heading to which it is set. Among other factors, the amount of drift 
depends largely upon the condition of the instrument. If the bearings are worn, dirty, or improperly lubricated, the drift may be excessive. Another error in the heading indicator is caused by the fact that the gyro is oriented in space and the earth rotates in space at a rate of 15 degrees in one hour. Thus, discounting precession caused by friction, the heading indicator may indicate as much as 15 degrees error per every hour of operation. Some heading indicators referred to as horizontal situation indicators, HSI, receive a magnetic north reference from a magnetic slaving transmitter and generally need no adjustment. The magnetic slaving transmitter is called a magnetometer. Attitude and Heading Reference System, AHRS. Electronic flight displays have replaced free-spinning gyros with solid-state laser systems that are capable of flight at any attitude without tumbling. This capability is the result of the development of the Attitude and Heading Reference System, AHRS. The AHRS sends attitude information to the PFD in order to generate the pitch and bank information of the attitude indicator. The heading information is derived from a magnetometer, which senses the Earth's lines of magnetic flux. This information is then processed and sent out to the PFD to generate the heading display, figure 7-26. The Flux Gate Compass System As mentioned earlier, the lines of flux in the Earth's magnetic field have two basic characteristics. A magnet aligns with them, and an electrical current is induced or generated in any wire crossed by them. The Flux Gate Compass that drives slaved gyros uses the characteristic of current induction. The flux valve is a small segmented ring, like the one in figure 7-27, made of soft iron that readily accepts lines of magnetic flux. An electrical coil is wound around each of the three legs to accept the current induced in this ring by the Earth's magnetic field. A coil wound around the iron spacer in the center of the frame has 400 hertz alternating current, AC, flowing through it. During the times when this current reaches its peak, twice during each cycle, there is so much magnetism produced by this coil that the frame cannot accept the lines of flux from the Earth's field. As the current reverses between the peaks, it demagnetizes the frame so it can accept the flux from the Earth's field. As this flux cuts across the windings in the three coils, it causes current to flow in them. These three coils are connected in such a way that the current flowing in them changes as the heading of the aircraft changes. Figure 7-28 The three coils are connected to three similar but smaller coils in a synchro inside the instrument case. The synchro rotates the dial of a radio magnetic indicator, RMI, or an HSI. Remote Indicating Compass Remote indicating compasses were developed to compensate for the errors and limitations of the older type of heading indicators. The two panel-mounted components of a typical system are the pictorial navigation indicator and the slaving control and compensator unit, figure 7-29. The pictorial navigation indicator is commonly referred to as an HSI. The slaving control and compensator unit has a push button that provides a means of selecting either the slaved gyro or free gyro mode. This unit also has a slaving meter and two manual heading drive buttons. The slaving meter indicates the difference between the displayed heading and the magnetic heading. 
A right deflection indicates a clockwise error of the compass card. A left deflection indicates a counterclockwise error. Whenever the aircraft is in a turn and the card rotates, the slaving meter shows a full deflection to one side or the other. When the system is in free gyro mode, the compass card may be adjusted by depressing the appropriate heading drive button. A separate unit, the magnetic slaving transmitter, is mounted remotely, usually in a wingtip to eliminate the possibility of magnetic interference. It contains the flux valve, which is the direction sensing device of the system. A concentration of lines of magnetic force, after being amplified, becomes a signal relayed to the heading indicator unit, which is also remotely mounted. This signal operates a torque motor in the heading indicator unit that processes the gyro unit until it is aligned with the transmitter signal. The magnetic slaving transmitter is connected electrically to the HSI. There are a number of designs of the remote indicating compass. Therefore, only the basic features of the system are covered here. Instrument pilots must become familiar with the characteristics of the equipment in their aircraft. As instrument panels become more crowded and the pilot's available scan time is reduced by a heavier flight deck workload, instrument manufacturers have worked toward combining instruments. One good example of this is the RMI in figure 7-30. The compass card is driven by signals from the flux valve, and the two pointers are driven by an automatic direction finder, ADF, and a very high-frequency, VHF, omnidirectional radio range, VOR. Heading indicators that do not have this automatic north-seeking capability are called free gyros and require periodic adjustment. It is important to check the indications frequently, approximately every 15 minutes, and reset the heading indicator to align it with the magnetic compass when required. Adjust the heading indicator to the magnetic compass heading when the aircraft is straight and level at a constant speed to avoid compass errors. The bank and pitch limits of the heading indicator vary with the particular design and make of instrument. On some heading indicators found in light aircraft, the limits are approximately 55 degrees of pitch and 55 degrees of bank. When either of these attitude limits is exceeded, the instrument tumbles or spills and no longer gives the correct indication until reset. After spilling, it may be reset with the caging knob Many of the modern instruments used are designed in such a manner that they do not tumble. An additional precession error may occur due to a gyro not spinning fast enough to maintain its alignment. When the vacuum system stops producing adequate suction to maintain the gyro speed, the heading indicator and the attitude indicator gyros begin to slow down. As they slow they become more susceptible to deflection from the plane of rotation. Some aircraft have warning lights to indicate that a low vacuum situation has occurred. Other aircraft may have only a vacuum gauge that indicates the suction. Instrument check. As the gyro spools up, make sure there are no abnormal sounds. While taxiing, the instrument should indicate turns in the correct direction, and precession should not be abnormal. At idle power settings, the gyroscopic instruments using the vacuum system might not be up to operating speeds, and precession might occur more rapidly than during flight. End of Chapter 7, Part 4